Part 6. Hell Freezes. Dirtworts, the Waiting Magnum, Zulu Warrior, the Elemental Fist, Dealing with the Fat Man, Paradise, the Sound of Somebody Being Reborn. Chapter 34. Torches whipped in the cold wind on the desert flatland thirty miles northwest of Salt Lake City's crater. Some three hundred ragged, half-starved people huddled on the shore of the Great Salt Lake, in a makeshift city of cardboard boxes, broken-down automobiles, tents, and trailers. The torchlight carried for miles over the flat terrain and drew scattered bands of survivors who were struggling eastward from the ruined cities and towns of California and Nevada. Every day and night groups of people, their belongings strapped to their backs, carried in their arms, lugged in suitcases, or pushed in wheelbarrows and grocery carts, came into the encampment and found a space of hard, bare earth to crouch on. The more fortunate ones came with tents and knapsacks of canned food and bottled water, and had guns to protect their supplies. The weakest ones curled up and expired when their food and water was either used up or stolen, and the bodies of suicides floated in the great salt lake like grim, bobbing logs. But the smell of the salt water and the wind drew bands of wanderers as well. Those without fresh water tried to drink it, and those suffering from festered wounds and burns sought its cleansing, agonizing embrace with the single-minded desire of religious flagellants. At the western edge of the encampment, on rough and rock-stubbled ground, over a hundred corpses lay where they'd collapsed. The bodies had been stripped naked by scavengers who lived in pits in the dirt and were contemptuously called dirt warts by the people who lived closest to the lake shore. Strewn out almost to the western horizon was a junkyard of cars, RVs, campers, jeeps, and motorcycles that had run out of gas or whose engines had locked for want of oil. The scavengers scrambled out, tore the seats out of cars, took the tires off, ripped the doors and hoods and trunks away to make their own bizarre dwellings. Gas tanks were drained by parties of armed men from the main encampment. The gas set aside to fuel the torches, because light had become strength, an almost mystic protection against the horrors of the dark. Two figures, both laden with backpacks, trudged across the desert toward the light of the torches, about a half mile ahead. It was the night of August 23rd, one month and six days after the bombs. The two figures walked through the junkyard of vehicles, not hesitating as they stepped on the occasional nude corpse. Over the odors of corruption they could smell the salt lake. Their own car, a BMW stolen from a lot in the ghost town of Carson City, Nevada, had run out of gas about twelve miles back, and they'd been walking all night, following the glow of the lights reflected off low-lying clouds. Something rattled off to the side, behind the scavenged wreck of a Dodge Charger. The figure in the lead stopped and drew a forty-five automatic from a shoulder holster under a blue goose-down parka. The sound did not repeat itself, and after a silent moment the two figures began to walk toward the encampment again, their pace faster. The lead figure had taken about five more steps when a hand burst from the loose dirt and sand at his feet and grabbed his left ankle, jerking him off balance. His shout of alarm and the forty-five went off together, but the gun fired toward the sky. He hit hard on his left side, the air whooshing from his lungs with the shock, and a human shape scrabbled like a crab from a pit that had opened in the earth. The crab thing fell upon the man with the knapsack, planted a knee in his throat, and began to batter his face with a left-hand fist. The second figure screamed, a woman's scream, then turned and started running through the junkyard. She heard footsteps behind her sensing something gaining on her, and as she turned her head to look back she tripped over one of the naked corpses and went down on her face. She tried to scramble up, but suddenly a sneakered foot pressed on the back of her head, forcing her nostrils and mouth into the dirt. Her body thrashing, she began to suffocate. A few yards away the crab thing shifted, using the left knee to pin the young man's gun hand to the ground, the right knee pressed into his chest. The young man was gasping for air, his eyes wide and stunned over a dirty blonde beard. And then the crab thing drew with its left hand a hunting knife from a leather sheath under a long, dusty black overcoat. The hunting knife slashed fast and deep across the young man's throat, once again, a third time. The young man stopped struggling, and his lips pulled back from his teeth in a grimace. The woman fought for life. She got her head turned, 
her cheek mashed into the ground, and she begged, Please, don't kill me. I'll give you, give you what you want. Please don't. The sneakered foot suddenly drew back. The point of what felt like an ice pick pricked her cheek just below her right eye. No tricks. It was a boy's voice, high and reedy. Understand? The ice pick jabbed for emphasis. Yes, she answered. The boy grabbed a handful of her long, raven-black hair and pulled her up to a sitting position. She was able to make out his face in the dim wash of the distant lights. He was just a kid, maybe thirteen or fourteen years old, wearing an oversized, filthy brown sweater and gray trousers with holes where the knees had been. He was skinny to the point of emaciation, his high cheekboned face pale and cadaverous. His dark hair was plastered to his skull with grime and sweat, and he wore a pair of goggles, the kind of goggles trimmed in battered leather that she figured World War II fighter pilots might have worn. The lens magnified his eyes as if through fish bowls. Don't hurt me, okay? I swear I won't scream. Roland Croninger laughed. That was about the stupidest fucking thing he'd ever heard. You can scream if you want to. Nobody gives a shit whether you scream or not. Take the pack off. You got him? Colonel Macklin called from where he crouched to talk the other body. Yes, sir, Roland answered. It's a woman. Bring her over here. Roland picked up the pack and stepped backward. Start moving. She started to rise, but he shoved her down again. No, not on your feet. Crawl. She started crawling through the dirt over the festering bodies. A scream was locked behind her teeth, but she didn't let it get loose. Rudy, she called weakly. Rudy, you okay? And then she saw the figure in the black coat ripping open Rudy's backpack, and she saw all the blood, and she knew they'd stepped into deep shit. Roland tossed the other pack over to Colonel Macklin, then put his ice pick away in the elastic waistband of the trousers he'd stripped from the corpse of a boy about his age and size. He pried the automatic out of Rudy's dead fingers as the woman sat nearby, numbly watching. Good gun, he told the king. We can use it. Got to have more clips, Macklin answered, digging through the pack with one hand. He pulled out socks, underwear, toothpaste, an army surplus mess kit, and a canteen that sloshed when he shook it. Water, he said. Oh, Jesus, it's fresh water. He got the canteen between his thighs and unscrewed the cap, then took several swigs of sweet, delicious water. It ran down through the gray-swirled stubble of his new beard and dripped to the ground. You got a canteen, too? Roland asked her. She nodded, pulling the canteen strap from her shoulder under the ermine coat she'd taken from a Carson City boutique. She was wearing leopard-spotted designer jeans and expensive boots, and around her neck were ropes of pearls and diamond chains. Give it here. She looked into his face and drew her back up straight. He was just a punk, and she knew how to handle punks. Fuck you, she told him and she uncapped it and started drinking, her hard blue eyes challenging him over the canteen's rim. Hey, someone called from the darkness. The voice was hoarse, scabrous sounding. You catch a woman over there? Roland didn't answer. He watched the woman's silken throat working as she drank. I've got a bottle of whiskey, the voice continued. I'll trade you. She stopped drinking. The Perrier suddenly tasted foul. A bottle of whiskey for thirty minutes, the voice said. I'll give her back to you when I'm through, deal? I've got a carton of cigarettes, another man called from off to the left beyond an overturned jeep. Fifteen minutes for a carton of cigarettes. She hurriedly capped the canteen and threw it at the kid's sneakered feet. Here, she said, keeping her eyes fixed on his. You can have it all. Ammo clips, Macklin exclaimed, pulling three of them out of Rudy's pack. We've got ourselves some firepower. Roland opened the canteen, took a few swallows of water, recapped it, and slid the strap over his shoulder. From all around them drifted the voices of other dirt warts, offering caches of liquor, cigarettes, matches, candy bars, and other valuables for time with the newly snared woman. Roland remained quiet, listening to the rising bids with the pleasure of an auctioneer who knows he has a prize of real worth. He studied the woman through the eyeglass goggles he'd made for himself, gluing the appropriate strength lenses, 
found in the wreckage of a Pocatello optometry shop, and to Army Surplus Tank Commander Goggles. She was unmarked, except for several small healing gashes on her cheeks and forehead, and that alone made her a very special prize. Most of the women in the encampment had lost their hair and eyebrows, and were marked with keloid scars of various colors, from dark brown to scarlet. This woman's black hair cascaded around her shoulders. It was dirty, but there were no bald patches in it, the first signs of radiation poisoning. She had a strong square-chinned face, a haughty face, Roland thought, the face of roughneck royalty. Her electric blue eyes moved slowly from the gun to Rudy's corpse and back to Roland's face, as if she were figuring the precise points of a triangle. Roland thought she might be in her late twenties or early thirties, and his eyes slid down to the mounds of her breasts, swelling a red T-shirt with rich bitch stenciled across it and rhinestones underneath the ermine coat. He thought he detected her nipple sticking out, as if the danger and death had revved her sexual engine. He felt a pressure in his stomach, and he quickly lifted his gaze from her nipples. He had suddenly wondered what one of them might feel like between his teeth. Her full-lipped mouth parted. Do you like what you see? A flashlight, one of the dirt warts offered. I'll give you a flashlight for her. Roland didn't respond. This woman made him think of the pictures in the magazines he'd found in the bottom drawer of his father's dresser back in his other long-ago life. His belly was tightening, and there was a pounding in his nuts as if they were being squeezed by a brutal fist. "'What's your name?' "'Sheila,' she answered. "'Sheila Fontana. What's yours?' She had determined with the cold logic of a born survivor that her chances were better here with this punk kid and the man with one hand, then out in the dark with those other things. The one-handed man cursed and dumped the rest of Rudy's pack on the ground. Roland Croninger. Roland, she repeated, making it sound like she was licking a lollipop. You're not going to give me to them, are you, Roland? Was he your husband? Roland prodded Rudy's body with his boot. No, we traveled together, that's all. Actually, they had lived together for almost a year, and he'd done some pimping for her back in Oakland. But there was no need to confuse the kid. She looked at Rudy's bloody throat and then quickly away. She felt a pang of regret, because he had been a good business manager, a fantastic lover, and he'd kept them supplied with plenty of blow. But he was just dead meat now, and that was how the world turned. As Rudy himself would have said, you cover your own ass at all and any cost. Something moved on the ground behind Sheila, and she turned to look. A vaguely human shape was crawling toward her. It stopped about seven or eight feet away, and a hand covered with open running sores lifted a paper bag. "'Candy bars?' a mangled voice offered. Roland fired the automatic, and the noise of the shot made Sheila jump. The thing on the ground grunted and then made a sound like a yelping dog. It scrambled to its knees and scurried away amid the junked vehicles. Sheila knew the kid wasn't going to turn her over to them, after all. Hoarse, garbled laughter came from other hidden pits in the dirt. Sheila had seen plenty of hell since she and Rudy had left a coke dealer's cabin in the Sierras, where they'd been hiding from the San Francisco cops when the bombs had hit, but this was by far the worst. She looked down into the kid's goggled eyes, because her height approached six feet. She was as big-boned as an Amazon warrior but all curves and compliance when it met her needs, and she knew he was hooked through the cock. "'What the hell is this shit?' Macklin said, leaning over the items he'd pulled out of Sheila's backpack. Sheila knew what the one-handed man had found. She approached him, disregarding the kid's forty-five, and saw what he was holding, a plastic bag full of snow-white, extra-fine Colombian sugar." Scattered around him were three more plastic bags of high-grade cocaine and about a dozen plastic bottles of poppers, black beauties, yellow jackets, bombers, red ladies, PCP, and LSD tabs. That's my medicine bag, friend, she told him. If you're looking for food, I've got a couple of old whoppers and some fries in there, too. You're welcome to it. But I want my stash back. Drugs, Macklin realized. What is this? Cocaine? He dropped the bag and picked up one of the bottles, 
lifting his filthy, blood-splattered face toward her. His crew cut was growing out, the dark brown hair peppered with gray. His eyes were deep holes carved in a rock-like face. Pills, too? What are you, an addict? I'm a gourmet, she replied calmly. She figured the kid wasn't going to let this crazy one-handed fucker hurt her, but her muscles were tensed for fight or flight. What are you? His name is Colonel James Macklin, Roland told her. He's a war hero. Looks to me like the war is over, and we lost. Hero, she said, staring directly into Macklin's eyes. Take what you want, but I need my stash back. Macklin sized the young woman up, and he decided he might not be able to throw her to the ground and rape her as he had intended until this instant. She might be too much to take with one hand, unless he wrestled her down and got the knife to her throat. He didn't want to try and fail in front of Roland, though his penis had begun to pound. He grunted and dug for the hamburgers. When he found them, he flung the pack to Sheila, and she started gathering up the packets of Coke and the pill bottles. Macklin crawled over and pulled the shoes off Rudy's feet. He worked a gold Rolex wristwatch from the corpse's left wrist and put it on his own. "'How come you're out here?' Sheila asked Roland, who was watching her pack the cocaine and pills away. "'How come you're not over there, closer to the light?' "'They don't want dirt warts,' Macklin replied. "'That's what they call us, dirt warts.' He nodded toward the rectangular hole a few feet away. It had been covered with a tarpaulin, impossible to detect in the darkness, and looked to Sheila to be about five feet deep. The corners of the tarp were held down with stones. They don't think we smell good enough to be any closer. Macklin's grin held madness. How do you think I smell, lady? She thought he smelled like a hog in heat. But she shrugged and motioned toward a can of right guard deodorant that had fallen out of Rudy's pack. Macklin laughed. He was unbuckling Rudy's belt in preparation to pull the trousers off. See, we live out here on what we can get and what we can take. We wait for new ones to pass through on their way to the light. He motioned with a nod of his head toward the lake shore. Those people have the power. Guns, plenty of canned food and bottled water, gas for their torches. Some of them even have tents. They roll around in that salt water, and we listen to them scream. They won't let us near it. Oh, no. They think we'd pollute it or something. He got Rudy's trousers off and flung them into the pit. See, the hell of all this is that the boy and I should be living in the light right now. We should be wearing clean clothes and taking warm showers and having all the food and water we want. Because we were prepared. We were ready. We knew the bombs were going to fall. Everybody in Earth House knew it. Earth House? What's that? It's where we came from, Macklin said, crouching on the ground. Up in the Idaho mountains. We walked a long way, and we saw a lot of death. And Roland figured that if we could get to the Great Salt Lake, we could wash ourselves in it, clean all the radiation off, and the salt would heal us. That's right, you know. Salt heals. Especially this. He held up his bandaged stump. The blood-caked bandages were hanging down, and some of them had turned green. Sheila caught the reek of infected flesh. I need to bathe it in that salt water, but they won't let us any closer. They say that we live off the dead, so they shoot at us when we try to cross open ground. But now, now we've got our own firepower. He nodded toward the automatic Roland held. It's a big lake, Sheila said. You don't have to go through that encampment to get there. You could go around it. No. Two reasons. Somebody would move into our pit while we were gone and take everything we have, and second, nobody keeps Jimbo Macklin from what he wants. He grinned at her, and she thought his face resembled a skull. They don't know who I am or what I am, but I am going to show them. Oh, yes, I am going to show all of them. He turned his head toward the encampment, sat staring at the distant torches for a moment, then looked back at her. You wouldn't want to fuck, would you? She laughed. He was about the dirtiest, most repulsive thing she'd ever seen. But even as she laughed, she knew it was a mistake. She stopped her laugh in mid-note. Roland, Macklin said quietly, bring me the gun. Roland hesitated. He knew what was about to happen, 
Still the king had delivered a command, and he was a king's knight and could not disobey. He took a step forward, hesitated again. Roland, the king said. This time Roland walked to him and delivered the pistol to his outstretched left hand. Macklin awkwardly gripped it and pointed it at Sheila's head. Sheila lifted her chin defiantly, hooked the pack strap over her shoulder, and stood up. I'm going to start walking toward the camp, she said. Maybe you can shoot a woman in the back, war hero. I don't think you can. So long, guys. It's been fun. She made herself step over Rudy's corpse, then started walking purposefully through the junkyard, her heart pounding and her teeth gritted as she waited for the bullet. Something moved off to her left. A figure in rags ducked down behind the wreckage of a Chevy station wagon. Something else scrambled across the dirt about twenty feet in front of her and she realized she'd never make the camp alive. "'They're waiting for you,' Roland called. "'They'll never let you get there.' Sheila stopped. The torches seemed so far away, so terribly far. And even if she reached them without being raped, or worse, there was no certainty she wouldn't be raped in the camp. She knew that without Rudy she was walking meat, drawing flies. "'Better come back,' Roland urged. "'You'll be safer with us.' Safer, Sheila thought sarcastically. Sure. The last time she'd been safe was when she was in kindergarten. She'd run away from home at seventeen with the drummer and a rock band, had landed in Hollyweird, and gone through phases of being a waitress, a topless dancer, a masseuse, and a sunset strip parlor, had done a couple of porno flicks, and then had latched up with Rudy. The world had become a crazy pinwheel of coke, poppers, and faceless johns, but the deep truth was that she enjoyed it. For her there was no whining of might have beens, no crawling on her knees for forgiveness. She liked danger, liked the dark side of the rock where the night things hid. Safety was boredom, and she'd always figured she could only live once, so why not blow it out? Still she didn't think running the gauntlet of those crawling shapes would be too much fun. Someone giggled off in the darkness. It was a giggle of insane anticipation, and the sound of it put the lid on Sheila's decision. She turned around and walked back to where the kid and the one-handed war hero waited, and she was already figuring out how to get that pistol and blow both their heads off. The pistol would help her get to the torches at the edge of the lake. "'Get on your hands and knees,' Macklin commanded, his eyes glittering above his dirty beard. Sheila smiled faintly and shrugged her pack off to the ground. "'What the hell?' It would be no worse than some of the other Johns off the strip, but she didn't want to let him win so easily. Be a sport, war hero, she said, her hands on her hips. Why don't you let the kid go first? Macklin glanced at the boy, whose eyes behind the goggles looked like they were about to burst from his head. Sheila unbuckled her belt and started to peel the leopard-spotted pants off her hips, then her thighs, then over the cowboy boots. She wore no underwear. She got down on her hands and knees, opened the pack, and took out a bottle of Black Beauties. She popped a pill down her throat and said, Come on, honey. It's cold out there. Macklin suddenly laughed. He thought the woman had courage, and though he didn't know what was to be done with her after they'd finished, he knew she was of his own kind. Go ahead, he told Roland. Be a man. Roland was scared shitless. The woman was waiting and the king wanted him to do it. He figured this was an important rite of manhood for a king's knight to pass through. His testicles were about to explode, and the dark mystery between the woman's thighs drew him toward her like a hypnotic amulet. Dirt warts crawled closer to get a view of the festivities. Macklin sat watching, his eyes hooded and intense, and he stroked the automatic's barrel back and forth beneath his chin. He heard hollow laughter just over his left shoulder, and he knew the shadow soldier was enjoying this too. The shadow soldier had come down from Blue Dome Mountain with them, had walked behind them and off to the side, but always there. The shadow soldier liked the boy. The shadow soldier thought the boy had a killer instinct that bore developing. Because the shadow soldier had told Macklin, in the silence of the dark, that his days of making war were not over yet. This new land was going to need warriors and warlords. Men like Macklin were going to be in demand again, as if they had ever gone out of demand. All this the shadow soldier told him, 
and Macklin believed. He started laughing then, too, at the sight in front of him, and his laughter and that of the shadow soldier intertwined, merged, and became as one. Chapter 35 Over two thousand miles away, Sister sat next to the hearth. Everyone else was asleep on the floor around the room, and it was Sister's night to watch over the fire, to keep it banked and the embers glowing so they wouldn't have to waste matches. The space heater had been turned low to save their dwindling supply of kerosene, and cold had begun to sneak through chinks in the walls. Mona Ramsey muttered in her sleep, and her husband shifted his position and put his arm around her. The old man was dead to the world. Artie lay on a bed of newspapers, and every so often Steve Buchanan snored like a chainsaw. But Sister was disturbed by the wheeze of Artie's breathing. She'd noticed him holding his ribs, but he'd said he was okay— that he was sometimes short of breath, but otherwise feeling, as he put it, as smooth as pickles and cream. She hoped so, because if Artie was hurt somewhere inside, maybe when that damned wolf had slammed into him on the highway about ten days ago, there was no medicine to stave off infection. The duffel bag was beside her. She loosened the drawstring and reached inside, found the glass ring, and drew it out into the ember glow. Its brilliance filled the room. The last time she'd peered into the glass circle, during her fire-watch duty four nights before, she'd gone dream-walking again. One second she was sitting right there, holding the circle just as she was doing now, and the next she'd found herself standing over a table, a square table, with what appeared to be cards arranged on its surface. The cards were decorated with pictures, and they were unlike any cards sister had ever seen before. One of them in particular caught her attention, the figure of a skeleton on a rearing skeletal horse, swinging a scythe through what seemed to be a grotesque field of human bodies. She thought there were shadows in the room, other presences, the muffled voices of people speaking, and she thought as well that she heard someone coughing, but the sound was distorted, as if heard through a long echoing tunnel and when she came back to the cabin she realized it was Artie coughing and holding his ribs. She had thought often of that card with the scythe-swinging skeleton. She could still see it lodged behind her eyes. She thought also of the shadows that had seemed to be in the room with her. Insubstantial things, but maybe that was because all her attention had been focused on the cards. Maybe if she had concentrated on giving form to the shadows, she might have seen who was standing there. Right, she thought. You're acting like you really go somewhere when you see pictures in the glass circle, and that's only what they were, of course. Pictures, fantasy, imagination, whatever. There was nothing real about them at all. But she did know that dreamwalking and coming back from dreamwalking was getting easier. Not every time she peered into the glass was a dreamwalk, though. Most often it was just an object of fiery light, no dream pictures at all. Still, the glass ring held an unknown power. Of that she was certain. If it wasn't something with a powerful purpose, why had the doyle Halland thing wanted it? Whatever it was, she had to protect it. She was responsible for its safety, and she could not, she dared not, lose it. Jesus and suspenders, what's that? Startled, Sister looked up. Paul Thorson, his eyes swollen from sleep, had come through the green curtain, he pushed back his unruly hair and stood open-mouthed, as the ring pulsed in rhythm with Sister's heartbeat. She almost shoved it back into the duffel bag, but it was too late. "'That thing's on fire,' he managed to say. "'What is it?' "'I'm not sure yet. I found it in Manhattan. My God, the colors!' He knelt down beside her, obviously overwhelmed. A flaming circle of light was about the last thing he had expected to find when he'd stumbled in to warm himself by the embers. What makes it pulse like that? It's picking up my heartbeat. It does that when you hold it. What is it, some kind of Japanese thing? Does it run on batteries? Sister smiled wryly. I don't think so. Paul reached out and poked it with a finger. He blinked. It's glass. That's right. Wow he whispered. Then, would it be okay if I held it, just for a second? She was about to answer yes, but Doyle Halland's promise stopped her. That monster could make itself look like anyone. 
Any of the people in this room could be the Doyle Hallam thing, even Paul himself. But no, they'd left the monster behind them, hadn't they? How did such a creature travel? I followed the line of least resistance, she recalled him saying. If he wore human skin, then he traveled as a human too. She shuddered, imagining him walking after them in a pair of dead man's shoes, walking day and night without a rest, until the shoes flayed right off his feet, and then he stopped to yank another pair off a corpse because he could make any size fit. "'Can I?' Paul urged. "'Where was Doyle Halland?' Sister wondered. "'Out there in the dark right now, passing by on I-80? "'Up ahead a mile or two, running down another pair of shoes?' Could he fly in the wind with black cats on his shoulders and his eyes filled with flame? Or was he a tattered highway hiker who looked for campfires burning in the night? He was behind them, wasn't he? Sister took a deep breath and offered the glass ring to Paul. He slid his hand around it. The light remained constant. The half that Paul held took on a new quickened rhythm. He drew it to himself with both hands, and Sister let her breath out. "'Tell me about this,' he said. "'I want to know.' Sister saw the gems reflected in his eyes. On his face was a childlike amazement, as if the years were peeling rapidly away. In another few seconds he appeared a decade younger than his forty-three years. She decided then to tell him all of it. He was quiet for a long time when she'd finished. The ring's pulsing had speeded up and slowed down all through the telling. "'Tarot cards!' Paul said, still admiring the ring. The skeleton with the scythe stands for death. With an effort he looked up at her. You know all that sounds crazy as hell, don't you? Yes, I do. Here's the scar where the crucifix was torn off. Artie saw the thing's face change, too, though I doubt he'll admit it to you. He hasn't mentioned it since it happened, and I guess that's for the best. And here's the glass circle missing one spike. Uh-huh. You haven't been slipping into my Johnny Walker, have you? You know better. I know I see things when I look into the glass, not every time, but enough to tell me I've either got a hummer of an imagination or... or what? Or, Sister continued, there's a reason for me to have it. Why should I see a cookie monster doll lying in the middle of a desert? Or a hand coming out of a hole? Why should I see a table with tarot cards on it? Hell, I don't even know what the damn things are. They're used to tell the future by gypsies, or witches. He summoned a half-smile that made him almost handsome. It faded when she didn't return it. Listen, I don't know anything about demons with roaming eyeballs or dream-walking, but I do know this is one hell of a piece of glass. A couple of months ago this thing would have been worth... He shook his head. Wow, he said again. The only reason you've got it is that you were in the right place at the right time. That's magic enough, isn't it? But you don't believe what I've told you, right? I want to say the radiations unscrewed your bolts, or maybe the nukes blew the lid right off hell itself, and who can say what slithered out? He returned the ring to her, and she put it back in the bag. You take care of that. It may be the only beautiful thing left. Across the room, Artie winced and sucked in his breath when he changed position, then lay still again. "'He's hurt inside,' Paul told her. "'I've seen blood in his crap bucket. I figure he's got a splintered rib or two, probably cutting something.' He worked his fingers, feeling the warmth of the glass circle in them. "'I don't think he looks too good.' "'I know. I'm afraid whatever's wrong may be infected.' "'It's possible.' Shit, with these living conditions, you could die from biting your fingernails. And there's no medicine? Sorry, I popped the last Tylenol about three days before the bombs hit. The poem I was writing fell to pieces. So what are we going to do when the kerosene runs out? Paul grunted. He'd been expecting that question, and he'd known no one would ask it but her. We've got another week's supply, maybe. I'm more worried about the batteries for the radio. When they're dead, these folks are going to freak. I guess then we'll get out the scotch and have a party. His eyes were old again. 
Just play spin the bottle, and whoever gets lucky can check out first. Check out? What's that supposed to mean? I've got a three fifty seven Magnum in that footlocker, lady, he reminded her, and a box of bullets. I've come close to using it on myself twice. Once, when my second wife left me for a kid half my age, took all my money and said my cock wasn't worth two cents in a depression, and the other time when the poems I'd been working on for six years burned up along with the rest of my apartment. That was just after I got kicked off the staff at Millersville State College for sleeping with a student who wanted an A on her English lit final. He continued working his knuckles, avoiding sister's stare. I'm not what you'd call a real good luck type of guy. As a matter of fact, just about everything I've ever tried to do turned into a shit cake. So that magnum's been waiting for me for a long time. I'm overdue. Sister was shocked by Paul's matter-of-factness. He talked about suicide like the next step in a natural progression. My friend, she said firmly, if you think I've come all this way to blow my brains out in a shack, you're as crazy as I used to. She bit her tongue. Now he was watching her with heightened interest. So what are you going to do then? Where are you going to go? Down to the supermarket for a few steaks and a six-pack? How about a hospital to keep Artie from bleeding to death inside? In case you haven't noticed, there's not much left out there. Well, I never would have taken you for a coward. I thought you had guts, but it must have been just sawdust stuffing. Couldn't have said it better myself. What if they want to live? Sister motioned toward the sleeping figures. They look up to you. They'll do what you tell them. So you're going to tell them to check out? They can decide for themselves. But like I say, where are they going to go? Out there, she said, and she nodded at the door. Into the world. What's left of it, at least. You don't know what's five or ten miles down the highway. There might be a civil defense shelter, or a whole community of people. The only way to find out is to get in your pickup truck and drive west on I-80. I didn't like the world as it used to be. I sure as hell don't like it now. Who asked you to like it? Listen, don't jive me. You need people more than you want to believe. Sure, he said sarcastically. Love them, every one. If you don't need people, sister challenged, why do you go up to the highway? Not to kill wolves. You can do that from the front door. You went up to the highway looking for people, didn't you? Maybe I wanted a captive audience for my poetry readings. Uh-huh. Well, when the kerosene's gone, I'm heading west. Artie's going with me. The wolves will like that, lady. They'll be happy to escort you. I'm also taking your rifle, she said, and the rifle bullets. Thanks for asking my permission. She shrugged. All you need is the magnum. I doubt if you'll have to worry much about the wolves after you're dead. I'd like to take the pickup truck, too. Paul laughed without mirth. In case you've forgotten, I told you it doesn't have much gas, and the brakes are screwed up. The radiator's probably frozen solid by now, and I doubt if there's a gasp in the battery. Sister had never met anybody so full of reasons to sit on his ass and rot. Have you tried the truck lately? Even if the radiator's frozen, we can light a fire under the damn thing. You've got it all figured out, huh? Going to make it to the highway in a broken-down old truck, and right around the bend will be a shining city, full of civil defense people, doctors, and policemen doing their best to put this fine country back together again. Bet you'll find all the king's horses and all the king's men there, too. Lady, I know what's around the bend. More fucking highway, that's what. He was working his knuckles harder, a bitter smile flickering at the edges of his mouth. I wish you luck, lady. I really do. I don't want to wish you luck, she told him. I want you to come with me. He was silent. His knuckles cracked. If there's anything left out there, he said, it's going to be worse than Dodge City, Dante's Inferno, the Dark Ages, and No Man's Land all rolled up in one. You're going to see things that'll make your demon with the roaming eyeballs look like one of the seven dwarves. You like to play poker. But you're not much of a gambler, are you? Not when the odds have teeth. I'm going west, 
sister said, giving it one last shot. I'm taking your truck, and I'm going to find some help for Artie. Anybody who wants can go with me. How about it? Paul stood up. He looked at the sleeping figures on the floor. They trust me, he thought. They'll do what I say. But we're warm here, and we're safe, and— And the kerosene would last only a week longer. I'll sleep on it, he said huskily, and he went through the curtain to his own quarters. Sister sat listening to the shriek of the wind. Artie made another gasp of pain in his sleep, his fingers pressed to his side. From off in the distance came the thin, high howling of a wolf, the sound quavering like a violin note. Sister touched the glass circle through the duffel bag's canvas and turned her thoughts toward tomorrow. Behind the green curtain, Paul Thorson opened the footlocker and picked up the three fifty seven Magnum. It was a heavy gun, blue-black, with a rough, dark brown grip. The gun felt as if it had been made for his hand. He turned the barrel toward his face and peered into its black, dispassionate eye. One squeeze, he thought, and it would all be over. So simple, really. The end of a fucked-up journey, and the beginning of... What? He drew a deep breath, released it, and put the gun down. His hand came up with a bottle of scotch, and he took it to bed with him. Chapter 36 Josh dug the grave with a shovel from Leona Skelton's basement, and they buried Davy in the backyard. While Leona bowed her head and said a prayer that the wind took and tore apart, Swan looked up and saw the little terrier sitting about twenty yards away, its head cocked to one side and its ears standing straight up. For the last week she'd been leaving scraps of food for it on the porch steps. The dog had taken the food, but he never got close enough for Swan to touch. She thought that the terrier was resigned to living off scraps, but it wasn't enough of a beggar yet to fawn and wag its tail for handouts. Josh had finally taken his bath. He could have sewn a suit from the dead skin that peeled away, and the water looked like he had dumped a shovelful of dirt into it. He had washed the crusted blood and dirt away from the nub where his right ear had been. The blood had gotten down deep into the canal, and it took him a while to swab it all out. Afterward he realized he'd only been hearing through one ear. Sounds were startlingly sharp and clear again. His eyebrows were still gone, and his face, chest, arms, hands, and back were striped and splotched with the loss of black pigment, as if he'd been caught by a bucket full of beige paint. He consoled himself with the idea that he resembled a Zulu warrior chieftain in battle regalia or something. His beard was growing out and it, too, was streaked with white. Blisters and sores were healing on his face, but on his forehead were seven small black nodules that looked like warts. Two of them had connected with each other. Josh tried to scrape them off with his finger, but they were too tough, and the pain made his entire skull ache. Skin cancer, he thought. But the warts were just on his forehead, nowhere else. I'm a zebra toad frog, he thought. But those nodules, for some reason, disturbed him more than any of his other injuries and scars. He had to put his own clothes back on, because nothing in the house would fit him. Leona washed them and went over the holes with a needle and thread, but they were in pretty sorry shape. She did supply him with a new pair of socks, but even those were much too tight. Still his own socks were bags of holes held together with dried blood, totally useless. After the body was buried— Josh and Swan left Leona alone beside her husband's grave. She gathered a threadbare brown corduroy coat around her shoulders and turned her face from the wind. Josh went to the basement and began to prepare for the journey they'd agreed on. He brought a wheelbarrow upstairs and filled it with supplies, canned food, some dried fruit, petrified corn muffins, six tightly sealed mason jars full of well water, blankets, and various kitchen utensils and covered the whole thing with a sheet, which he lashed down with heavy twine. Leona, her eyes puffy from crying, but her spine rigid and strong, finally came in and started packing a suitcase. The first items to go in were the framed photographs of her family that had adorned the mantel, and those were followed by sweaters, socks, and the like. She packed a smaller bag full of Joe's old clothes for Swan, and as the wind whipped around the house, 
Leona walked from room to room and sat for a while in each one, as if drawing from them the aromas and memories of the life that had inhabited them. They were going to head for Matheson at first light. Leona had said she'd take them there, and on their way they'd pass across a farm that belonged to a man named Homer Jaspin and his wife Maggie. The Jaspin farm, Leona told Josh, lay about midway between Sullivan and Matheson, and there they would be able to spend the night. Leona packed away several of her best crystal balls, and from a box on a closet shelf she took out a few yellowed envelopes and birthday cards. Courting letters from Davy, she told Swan, and cards Joe had sent her. Two jars of salve for her rheumatic knees went into her suitcase, and though Leona had never said so, Josh knew that walking that distance, at least ten miles to the Jaspin farm, was going to be sheer torture for her. But there were no available vehicles, and they had no choice. The deck of tarot cards went into Leona's suitcase as well, and then she picked up another object and took it out to the front room. Here, she told Swan, I want you to carry this. Swan accepted the dowsing rod that Leona offered her. We can't leave Crybaby here all alone, can we? Leona asked. Oh, my, no. Crybaby's work isn't done yet, not by a far sight. The night passed, and Josh and Swan slept soundly in beds they were going to regret leaving. He awakened with gloomy gray light staining the window. The wind's force had died down, but the window glass was bitterly cold to the touch. He went into Joe's room and woke Swan up, and then he walked out into the front room and found Leona sitting before the cold hearth, dressed in overalls, clod hoppers, a couple of sweaters, the corduroy coat and gloves. Bags sat on either side of her chair. Josh had slept in his clothes, and now he shrugged into a long overcoat that had belonged to Davy. During the night, Leona had ripped and re-sewn the shoulders and arms so he could get it on, but he still felt like an overstuffed sausage. "'I guess we're ready to go,' Josh said when Swan emerged, carrying the dowsing rod and clad in a pair of Joe's blue jeans, a thick dark blue sweater, a fleece-lined jacket, and red mittens. "'Just a minute more.' Leona's hands were clamped together in her lap. The wind-up clock on the mantel was no longer ticking. "'Oh, Lordy,' she said, "'this is the best house I've ever lived in.' "'We'll find you another house,' Josh promised. A wisp of a smile surfaced. "'Not like this one. This one's got my life in its bricks.' "'Oh, Lordy, oh, Lordy.' Her head sank down into her hands. Her shoulders shook, but she made no sound. Josh went to a window, and Swan started to put her hand on Leona's arm, but at the last second she did not. The woman was hurting, Swan knew, but Leona was preparing herself, too, getting ready for what was to come. After a few minutes, Leona rose from her chair and went to the rear of the house. She returned with her pistol and a box of bullets, and she tucked both of those under the sheet that covered the wheelbarrow. "'We might need those,' she said. "'Never can tell.' She looked at Swan, then lifted her eyes to Josh. "'I think I'm ready now.' She picked up the suitcase, and Swan took the smaller bag. Josh lifted the wheelbarrow's handles. They weren't so heavy now, but the day was fresh. Suddenly Leona's suitcase thumped to the floor again. "'Wait,' she said, and she hurried into the kitchen. She came back with a broom, which she used to sweep ashes and dead embers from the floor into the hearth. "'All right.' She put the broom aside. I'm ready now. They left the house and started in a northwesterly direction through the remains of Sullivan. The little gray-haired terrier followed them at a distance of about thirty yards, his stubby tail straight up to balance against the wind. Chapter 37 Darkness found them short of the Jaspin farm. Josh tied the bull's-eye lantern to the front of the wheelbarrow with twine. Leona had to stop every half hour or so, and while she laid her head in Swan's lap, Josh gently massaged her legs. The tears Leona was weeping from the pain in her rheumatic knees crisscrossed the dust that covered her cheeks. Still she made no sound, no complaint. After she'd rested for a few minutes, she would struggle up again, and they'd continue on across rolling grassland, burned black and oily by radiation. The lantern's beam fell upon a rail fence about four feet tall and half blown down by the wind. 
I think we're near the house, Leona offered. Josh manhandled the wheelbarrow over the fence, then lifted Swan over and helped Leona across. Facing them was a black cornfield, the diseased stalks standing as high as Josh and whipping back and forth like strange seaweed at the bottom of a slimy pool. It took them about ten minutes to reach the far edge of the field, and the lantern's beam hit the side of a farmhouse that had once been painted white, now splotched brown and yellow like lizard skin. "'That's Homer and Maggie's place,' Leona shouted against the wind. The house was dark, not a candle or lantern showing. There was no sign of a car or truck anywhere around either. But something was making a loud, irregular banging noise off to the right, beyond the light's range. Josh untied the lantern and walked toward the sound. About fifty feet behind the house was a sturdy-looking red barn, one of its doors open and the wind banging it against the wall. Josh returned to the house and aimed the light at the front door. It was wide open, the screen door unlatched and thumping back and forth in the wind as well. He told Swan and Leona to wait where they were, and he entered the dark Jaspin farmhouse. Once inside, he started to ask if anyone was home, but there was no need. He smelled the rank odor of decomposing flesh and almost gagged on it. He had to wait for a moment, bent over a decorative brass spittoon with a dead bunch of daisies in it, before he was sure he wouldn't throw up. Then he began to move through the house, sweeping the light slowly back and forth, looking for the bodies. Outside, Swan heard a dog barking furiously in the black cornfield they'd just come through. She knew that the terrier had shouted them all day, never coming closer than twenty feet, darting away when Swan bent down to summon it nearer. The dogs found something out there, Swan thought, or something's found it. The barking was urgent, a come-see-what-I've-got kind of bark. Swan set her bag down and leaned Crybaby against the wheelbarrow. She took a couple of steps toward the black swaying cornfield. Leona said, Child, Josh said to stay right here. It's all right, she answered, and she took three more steps. Swan, Leona warned when she realized where the little girl was heading. She started to go after her, but immobilizing pain shot through her knees. You'd best not go in there. The terrier's barking summoned Swan, and she stepped into the cornfield. The black stalks closed at her back. Leona shouted, Swan! In the farmhouse, Josh followed the beam of light into a small dining area. A cupboard had been flung open, and the floor was littered with chips and pieces of shattered crockery. Chairs had been smashed against the wall. A dining table hacked apart. The smell of decay was stronger. The light picked out something scrawled on the wall. All shall praise Lord Alvin. Written in brown paint, Josh thought. But no, no. The blood had run down the wall and gathered in a crusty little patch on the floor. A doorway beckoned him. He took a deep breath, straining the horrid smell through his clenched teeth, and walked through the doorway. He was in a kitchen with yellow-painted cupboards and a dark rug. And there he found them. What was left of them? They had been tied to chairs with barbed wire. The woman's face, framed with blood-streaked gray hair, resembled a bloated pincushion, punctured by an assortment of knives, forks, and the little two-pronged handles that stick into the ends of corn on the cob. On the man's bared chest someone had drawn a target in blood and gone to work with a small-caliber pistol or rifle. The head was missing. Oh, my God! Josh croaked, and this time he couldn't hold back the sickness. He stumbled across the kitchen to the sink and leaned over it. But the lantern's light, swinging in his hand, showed him that the sink's basin was already occupied. As Josh shouted in terror and revulsion, the hundreds of roaches that covered Homer Jaspin's severed head broke apart and scurried madly over the sink and countertop. Josh staggered backward, the bile burning in his throat, and his feet slipped out from under him. He fell to the floor where the dark rug lay, and felt crawling things on his arms and legs. The floor, he realized. The floor. The floor around the bodies was an inch deep in surging, scrambling roaches. 
As the roaches swarmed over his body, Josh had a sudden ridiculous thought. You can't kill those things. Not even a nuclear disaster can kill them. He leaped up from the floor, sliding on roaches, and started running from that awful kitchen, swatting at the things as he ran, swiping them off his clothes and skin. He fell to the carpet in the front room and rolled wildly on it. Then he got up again and barreled for the screen door. Leona heard the noise of splintering wood and ripping screen, and she turned toward the house in time to see Josh bring the whole door with him like a charging bull. There goes another screen door, she thought. And then she saw Josh fling himself to the ground and start rolling, swatting and squirming, as if he'd run into a nest of hornets. What is it? she called, hobbling toward him. What the hell's wrong with you? Josh got up on his knees. He was still holding the lantern, while the other hand flopped and flipped here and there all over his body. Leona stopped in her tracks because she'd never seen such terror in human eyes in her life. What is it? Don't go in there. Don't you go in there, he babbled, squirming and shaking. A roach ran over his cheek, and he grabbed it and flung it away with a shiver. You stay out of that damned house. I will, she promised, and she peered at the dark square where the door had been. A bad odor reached her. She'd smelled that reek before, back in Sullivan, and she knew what it was. Josh heard a dog barking. Where's Swan? He stood up, still dancing and jerking. Where'd she go? In there, Leona pointed toward the black cornfield. I told her not to. Damn, Josh said, because he'd realized that whoever had done such a job on Homer and Maggie Jaspin might still be in the area. Maybe was even in that barn, watching and waiting. Maybe was out in that cornfield with the child. He dug the pistol and the box of bullets out of the wheelbarrow and hurriedly slid three shells into their cylinders. You stay right here he told Leona, and don't you go in that house. Then, lantern in one hand and pistol in the other, he sprinted into the cornfield. Swan was following the terriers barking. The sound ebbed and swelled with the wind, and around her the long-dead cornstalks rustled and swayed, grabbing at her clothes with leathery tendrils. She felt as if she were walking through a cemetery where all the corpses were standing upright, but the dog's frantic summons pulled her onward. There was something important in the field— something the dog wanted known, and she was determined to find out what it was. She thought the barking was off to the left, and she began to move in that direction. Behind her she heard Josh shout, Swan! And she replied, Over here! But the wind turned. She kept going, her hands up to shield her face from the whipping stalks. The barking was closer. No, Swan thought. No, it was moving to the right again. She continued on, thought she heard Josh calling her again. "'I'm here!' she shouted, but she heard no reply. The barking moved again, and Swan knew the terrier was following something, or someone. The barking said, "'Hurry, hurry, come see what I've found!' Swan had taken six more steps when she heard something crashing toward her through the field. The terrier's voice got louder, more urgent. Swan stood still, watching and listening. Her heart had begun to pound, and she knew that whatever was out there was coming in her direction and getting closer. "'Who's there?' she shouted. The crashing noise was coming right at her. "'Who's there?' The wind flung her voice away. She saw something coming toward her through the corn, something not human, something huge. She couldn't make out its shape or what it was, but she heard a rumbling noise and backed away, her heart about to hammer through her chest. The huge misshapen thing was coming right at her, faster and faster now, cleaving right through the dead, swaying stalks, and in another few seconds it would be upon her. She wanted to run, but her feet had rooted to the ground, and there was no time because the thing was crashing at her, and the terrier was barking an urgent warning. The monster tore through the cornstalks and towered over her, and Swan cried out, got her feet uprooted and stumbled back, back, was falling, hit the ground on her rear and sat there while the monster's legs pounded toward her. Swan! Josh shouted, bursting through the stalks behind her and aiming his light at what was about to trample her. Dazzled by the light's beam, the monster stopped in its tracks and reared up on its hind legs, blowing steam through its widened nostrils. And both Swan and Josh saw what it was. A horse! A piebald black-and-white blotched horse, with frightened eyes and oversized shaggy hooves. 
The terrier was yapping tenaciously at its heels, and the piebald horse whinnied with fear, dancing on its hind legs for a few seconds before it came down again inches from where Swan sat in the dirt. Josh hooked Swan's arm and yanked her out of harm's way as the horse pranced and spun, the terrier darting around its legs with undaunted courage. Swan was still shaking, but she knew in an instant that the horse was more terrified. It turned this way and that, confused and dazed, looking for a way of escape. The dog's barking was scaring it further, and suddenly Swan pulled free from Josh and took two steps forward, almost under the horse's nose. She lifted her hands and clapped her palms together right in front of the horse's muzzle. The horse flinched, but ceased jittering around. Its fear-filled eyes were fixed on the little girl, steam curling from its nostrils, its lungs rumbling. Its legs trembled as if they might give way or take flight. The terrier kept yapping, and Swan pointed a finger at it. Hush, she said. The dog scrambled away a few feet, but caught back the next bark. Then, as if deciding it had come too close to the humans and compromised its independence, darted away into the cornfield. It stood its distance and continued to bark intermittently. Swan's attention was aimed at the horse, and she kept its eyes locked with her own. Its large, less-than-lovely head trembled, wanting to pull away from her, but it either would not or could not. "'Is it a boy or a girl?' Swan asked Josh. "'Huh?' He still thought he felt roaches running up and down his backbone, but he shifted the lantern's beam. "'A boy,' he said. "'And a whopper of a boy,' he thought. "'He hasn't seen people for a long time, I bet. Look at him. He doesn't know whether to be glad to see us or to run away.' "'He must have belonged to the Jaspins,' Josh said. "'Did you find them in the house?' She kept watching the horse's eyes. Yes. I mean, no, I didn't. I found signs of them. They must have packed up and gone. There was no way he was letting Swan into that house. The horse rumbled nervously, its legs moving from side to side for a few steps. Swan slowly lifted her hand toward the horse's muzzle. Be careful, Josh warned. You'll snap your fingers right off. Swan continued to reach upward, slowly and surely. The horse backed away, its nostrils wide and its ears flicking back and forth. It lowered its head, sniffing the ground, then pretended to be looking off in another direction. But Swan saw the animal appraising her, trying to make up his mind about them. "'We're not going to hurt you,' Swan said quietly, her voice soothing. She stepped toward the horse, and he snorted a nervous warning. "'Watch out! He might charge you or something!' Josh knew absolutely nothing about horses, and they'd always scared him. This one was big and ugly and ungainly, with shaggy hooves and a floppy tail, and a swayed back that looked like he'd been saddled with an anvil. "'He's not too sure about us,' Swan told Josh. "'He's still making up his mind whether to run or not, but I think he's kind of glad to see people again.' "'What are you, an expert on horses?' "'No.' I can just tell from the set of his ears and the way his tail is swishing back and forth. Look at how he's smelling us. He doesn't want to seem too friendly. Horses have got a lot of pride. I think this one likes people, and he's been lonely. Josh shrugged. I sure can't tell any of that. My mom and I lived in a motel one time next to a pasture where somebody's horses grazed. I used to climb over the fence and walk around with them, and I guess I learned how to talk to them, too. Talk to them? Come on. Well, not human talk, she amended. A horse talks with his ears and tail, and how he holds his head and his body. He's talking right now, she said as the horse snorted and gave a nervous whinny. What's he saying? He's saying that he wants to know what we're talking about. Swan continued to lift her hand toward the animal's muzzle. Watch your fingers. The horse retreated to pace. Swan's hand continued to rise, slowly, slowly. "'No one's going to hurt you,' Swan said in a voice that sounded to Josh like the music of a lute or a lyre, or some instrument that people had forgotten how to play. Its soothing quality almost made him forget the horrors tied to chairs back in the Jaspin farmhouse. "'Come on,' Swan urged. "'We won't hurt you.' Her fingers were inches away from the muzzle, and Josh started to reach out and pull her back before she lost them to crunching teeth. The horse's ears twitched and slanted forward. He snorted again. 
pawed at the ground and lowered his head to accept Swan's touch. That's right, Swan said. That's right, boy. She scratched his muzzle, and he pushed inquisitively at her arm with his nose. Josh wouldn't have believed it if he hadn't seen it. Still, Swan was probably right. The horse simply missed people. I think you've made a friend. Doesn't look like much of a horse, though. Looks like a swayback mule in a clown suit. I think he's kind of pretty. Swan rubbed between the horse's eyes, and the animal obediently lowered his head so she wouldn't have to stretch up so far. The horse's eyes were still frightened, and Swan knew if she made a sudden move he'd bolt into the cornfield and probably not return, so she kept all her movements slow and precise. She thought that the horse was likely old, because there was a weary patience in the droop of his head and flanks, as if he was resigned to a life of pulling a plow across the very field in which they stood. His dappled skin jittered and jumped, but he allowed Swan to rub his head and made a low noise in his throat that sounded like a sigh of relief. "'I left Leona over by the house,' Josh said. "'We'd better get back.' Swan nodded and turned away from the horse, following Josh through the field. She'd taken about a half-dozen steps when she sensed, rather than heard, the heavy footfalls in the dirt behind her. She looked over her shoulder. The horse stopped, freezing like a statue. Swan continued after Josh, and the horse followed at a respectful distance, at its own ambling pace. The terrier darted out and yapped a couple of times, just for the sake of being nettlesome, and the piebald horse kicked its hind hooves backward in disdain and showered the dog with dirt. Leona was sitting on the ground, massaging her knees. Josh's light was coming, and when they reappeared from the field she saw Swan and the horse in the beam's backwash. Lord Almighty, what did you find? This thing was running wild out there, Josh told her, helping her to her feet. Swan charmed the horseshoes right off him, got him settled down. Oh? Leona's eyes found the little girl's, and she smiled knowingly. Did she? Leona hobbled forward to look at the horse. Must have belonged to Homer. He had three or four horses out here. Well, he's not the handsomest animal I have ever seen, but he's got four strong legs, don't he? Looks like a mule to me, Josh said. Those hooves are as big as skillets. He caught a whiff of decay from the Jasmine farmhouse. The horse's head jerked, and he whinnied as if he'd smelled death as well. We'd better get out of this wind. Josh motioned toward the barn with his lantern. He put the pistol and the lantern back in the wheelbarrow and went on ahead to make sure whoever had killed Homer and Maggie Jaspin wasn't hiding in there, waiting for them. He wondered who Lord Alvin was, but he was surely in no hurry to find out. Behind him, Swan picked up her bag and crybaby, and Leona followed with her suitcase. Trailing them at a distance was the horse and the terrier yapped at their backs and began to roam around the farmyard like a soldier on patrol. Josh checked the barn out thoroughly and found no one else there. Plenty of hay was strewn about, and the horse came inside with them and made himself at home. Josh unpacked the blankets from the wheelbarrow, hung the lantern from a wall, and opened a can of beef stew for their dinner. The horse sniffed around them for a while, more interested in hay than in canned stew, he returned when Josh opened a mason jar of well water, and Josh poured a bit out for him in an empty bucket. The horse licked it up and came back for more. Josh obliged him, and the animal pawed the ground like a newborn colt. "'Get out of here, mule,' Josh said when the horse's tongue tried to slip into the mason jar. After most of the stew was gone and just the juice remained, Swan took the can outside and left it for the terrier as well as the rest of the water from the mason jar. The dog came to within ten feet, then waited for Swan to go back into the barn before coming any closer. Swan slept under one of the blankets. The horse, which Josh had christened Mule, ambled back and forth, chomping on hay and peering out through the cracked door at the dark farmhouse. The terrier continued to patrol the area for a while longer, then it found a place to shelter against one of the outside walls and lay down to rest. Both of them were dead, Leona said as Josh sat against a post with a blanket draped over his shoulders. Yeah. Do you want to talk about it? No, and neither do you. We've got another long, hard day tomorrow. 
She waited for a few minutes to see if he would tell her or not, but she really didn't want to know. She pulled her blanket over her and went to sleep. Josh was afraid to close his eyes because he knew what was waiting for him behind the lids. Across the barn, Mule rumbled quietly. It was an oddly reassuring sound, like the noise of heat coming through a vent into a cold room, or a town crier signaling that all was well. Josh knew he had to get some sleep, and he was about to close his eyes when he detected a small movement just to his right. He stared and saw a little roach crawling slowly over the scattered bits of hay. Josh balled up his fist and started to slam it down on the insect, but his hand paused in midair. Everything alive's got its own way of speaking and knowing, Swan had said. Everything alive. He stayed the killing blow, watching the insect struggling tenaciously onward, getting caught in pieces of hay and working itself loose, plowing forward with stubborn, admirable determination. Josh opened his fist and drew his arm back. The insect kept going, out of the light's range and into the darkness on its purposeful journey. Who am I to kill such a thing? he asked himself. Who am I to deliver death to even the lowest form of life? He listened to the keening of the wind whistling through holes in the walls, and he pondered the thought that there might be something out there in the dark, god or devil or something more elemental than either, that looked at humankind as Josh had viewed the roach, less than intelligent, certainly nasty, but struggling onward on its journey, never giving up, fighting through obstacles or going around them, doing whatever it had to do to survive. And he hoped that if the time ever came for that elemental fist to come crashing down, its wielder might take a moment of pause as well. Josh drew the blanket around himself and lay down in the straw to sleep. Chapter 38 This is our power, Colonel Macklin said, holding up the forty-five automatic he'd taken off the dead young man from California. No, Roland Croninger replied, this is our power and he held up one of the bottles of pills from Sheila Fontana's drug cache. Hey! Sheila grabbed at it, but Roland held it out of her reach. That's my stash. You can't— Sit down, Macklin told her. She hesitated, and he rested the pistol on his knee. Sit down, he repeated. She cursed quietly and sat down in the filthy pit, while the kid continued to tell the one-handed war hero how the pills and cocaine were stronger than any gun could ever be. Dawn came with a cancerous yellow sky and needles of rain. A black-haired woman, a man with one hand and a dirty overcoat, and a boy wearing goggles trudged across the landscape of rotting corpses and wrecked vehicles. Sheila Fontana was holding up a pair of white panties as a flag of truce, and close behind her, Macklin kept the forty-five aimed at the small of her back. Roland Croninger, bringing up the rear, carried Sheila's knapsack. He remembered how the woman's hair had felt in his hands, how her body had moved like a roller coaster ride. He wanted to have sex again, and he would hate it if she made a wrong move now and had to be executed, because, after all, they'd shown her the highest chivalry last night. They'd saved her from the rabble and they'd given her some food. Dog biscuits they'd been living on from the wreck of a camper, the dog's carcass having been consumed long ago, and a place to rest after they were done with her. They reached the edge of the dirt wart land and started to cross open territory. Ahead of them lay the tents, cars, and cardboard shelters of the privileged people who lived on the lake shore. They were about halfway across, heading for a battered, dented, airstream trailer at the center of the encampment, when they heard the warning shout, "'Dirt Wart's coming in! Wake up! Dirt Wart's coming in!' "'Keep going,' Macklin told Sheila when she faltered. "'Keep waving those panties, too!' People started coming out of their shelters. In truth, they were every bit as ragged and dirty as the Dirt Warts. But they had guns and supplies of canned food and bottled water, and most of them had escaped serious burns. The majority of dirt warts, on the other hand, were severely burned, had contagious illnesses, or were insane. Macklin understood the balance of power. It was centered within the Airstream trailer, a shining mansion amid the other hovels. Turn back, fuckers, 
a man hollered from a tense entrance. He aimed a high-velocity rifle at them. "'Go back!' a woman shouted, and someone threw an empty can that hit the ground a few feet in front of Sheila. She stopped, and Macklin pushed her on with a shove of the automatic. "'Keep moving! And smile!' "'Go back, you filth!' a second man, wearing the remnants of an Air Force uniform and a coat stained with dried blood, shouted. He had a revolver, and he came within twenty feet of them. "'You grave robbers!' he shouted. "'You dirty, lice-ridden heathen!' Macklin didn't worry about him. He was a young man, maybe in his mid-twenties, and his eyes kept sneaking toward Sheila Fontana. He wasn't going to do anything." Other people approached them, shouting and jeering, brandishing guns and rifles, knives, and even a bayonet. Rocks, bottles, and cans were thrown, and though they came dangerously close, none of them connected. "'Don't you bring your diseases in here!' a middle-aged man in a brown raincoat and woolen cap hollered. He was holding an axe. "'I'll kill you if you take another goddamn step!' Macklin wasn't worried about him, either. The men were puzzled by Sheila Fontana's presence, but he recognized the lust on their faces as they surged around, hollering threats. He saw a thin young woman with stringy brown hair, her body engulfed in a yellow raincoat, and her sunken eyes fixed on Sheila with deadly intent. She was carrying a butcher knife, fingering the blade. Macklin did feel a pang of worry about her, and he guided Sheila away from the young woman. An empty can hit him in the side of the head and glanced off. Someone came close enough to spit on Roland. "'Keep going, keep going,' Macklin said quietly, his eyes narrowed and ticking back and forth. Roland heard shouts and taunting laughter behind them, and he glanced over his shoulder. Back in the dirt wart land, about thirty or forty dirt warts had crawled from their holes and were jumping up and down, screaming like animals in expectation of a slaughter. Macklin smelled salt water. Before him, through the misting rain and beyond the encampment, the great salt lake stretched to the far horizon. It smelled antiseptic, like the halls of a hospital. The stump of Macklin's wrist burned and seethed with infection, and he longed to plunge it into the healing water to baptize himself in cleansing agony. A burly, bearded, red-haired man in a leather jacket and dungarees, a bandage plastered to his forehead, stepped in front of Sheila. He aimed a double-barreled shotgun at Macklin's head. "'That's as far as you go.' Sheila stopped, her eyes wide. She waved the pair of panties in front of his face. "'Hey, don't shoot. We don't want any trouble.' "'He won't shoot,' Macklin said easily, smiling at the bearded man. "'See, my friend, I've got a gun pointed at the young lady's back. If you blow my head off—' And if any of you dumb fucks shoot either me or the boy, my finger's going to twitch on this trigger and sever her spine. Look at her, fellas. Just look. Not a burn on her. Not a burn anywhere. Oh, yeah, fill your eyes full, but don't touch. Isn't she something? Sheila had the impulse to pull her T-shirt up and give the gawkers a tit show. If the war hero had ever decided to give pimping a try, he'd have racked up. But this whole experience was so unreal, it was almost like flying on a tab of LSD, and she found herself grinning about to laugh. The filthy men who stood around her, with their guns and knives, just stared, and further behind them was a collection of skinny, dirty women who watched her with absolute hatred. Macklin saw they were about fifty feet from the Airstream trailer. We want to see the fat man, he told the guy with the beard. Sure. The other man hadn't lowered his shotgun yet. His mouth curled sarcastically. He sees dirt warts all the time. Serves them champagne and caviar, he snorted. Who the fuck do you think you are, mister? My name is Colonel James B. Macklin. I served in Vietnam as a pilot, and I was shot down and spent one year in a hole that makes this place look like the Ritz-Carlton. I'm a military man, you dumb bastard. Ackland's face was reddening. Discipline and control, he told himself. Discipline and control makes the man. He took a couple of deep breaths. Around him several people jeered at him, and someone's spit landed on his right cheek. We want to see the fat man. He's the leader here, isn't he? He's the one with the most food and guns. Run him out. 
a stocky, curly-haired woman shouted, brandishing a long barbecue fork. We don't want their damned diseases! Roland heard a pistol being cocked, and he knew someone was holding a gun just behind his head. He flinched, but then he turned slowly around, grinning rigidly. A blond-haired boy about his age, wearing a bulky plaid jacket, was aiming a thirty-eight right between his eyes. "'You stink!' the blond-haired kid said, his dead brown eyes challenging Roland to make a move. Roland stood very still, his heart going like a jackhammer. "'I said we want to see the fat man,' Macklin repeated. "'Do you take us, or what?' The bearded man laughed harshly. "'You've got a lot of guts for a dirt wart.' His eyes flickered toward Sheila Fontana, lingered on her body and breasts, then went back to the pistol Macklin held. Roland slowly lifted his hand in front of the blonde kid's face, then just as slowly brought his hand down and reached into the pocket of his trousers. The blonde boy's finger was on the trigger. Roland's hand found what he was after, and he began to draw it out. "'You can leave the woman, and we won't kill you,' the bearded man told Macklin. "'Just walk out and go back to your hole. We'll forget that you even—' A little plastic bottle hit the ground in front of his left foot. "'Go ahead.' Roland told him. Pick it up. Take a sniff. The man hesitated, glanced around at the others, who were still shouting and jeering and eating Sheila Fontana alive with their eyes. Then he knelt down, picked up the bottle Roland had tossed over, uncapped it, and sniffed. What the hell? Want me to kill him, Mr. Lowry? The blonde kid asked hopefully. No. Put that damned gun down. Lowry sniffed the contents of the bottle again, and his wide blue eyes began to water. "'Put the gun down!' he snapped, and the boy obeyed reluctantly. "'You going to take us to the fat man?' Macklin asked. "'I think he'd like to get a sniff, don't you?' "'Where'd you get this shit?' "'The fat man, now!' Lowry capped the vial. He looked around at the others, looked back at the Airstream trailer, and paused, trying to make up his mind. He blinked, and Roland could tell the man didn't exactly have a mainframe computer between his ears. Okay. He motioned with the shotgun. Move ass. Kill him, the stocky woman shrieked. Don't let him contaminate us. Now listen, all of you. Lowry held the shotgun at his side and kept the plastic vial gripped tightly in his other hand. They're not burned or anything. I mean, they're just dirty. They're not like the other dirt warts. I'll take responsibility for them. Don't let them in, another woman shouted. They don't belong. Move, Lowry told Macklin. You try anything funny and I swear to God you'll be one headless motherfucker. Got it? Macklin didn't answer. He pushed Sheila forward and Roland followed him toward the large silver trailer, a pack of people stalked at their heels, including the trigger-happy kid with the thirty-eight revolver. Lowry ordered them to stop when they'd gotten ten feet from the trailer. He walked up a few bricks that had been set up as steps to the trailer's door and knocked on it with the butt of his shotgun. A high, thin voice from inside asked, "'Who is it?' "'Lowry, Mr. Kempka. I've got something you need to see.' There was no reply for a moment or so. Then the whole trailer seemed to tremble, to creak over a few degrees, as Kempka, the fat man, who Macklin had learned from another dirt wart, was the leader of the lakeshore encampment, approached the door. A couple of bolts snapped back. The door opened, but Macklin was unable to see who had opened it. Lowry told Macklin to wait where he was, then he entered the trailer. The door shut. As soon as he was gone, the curses and jeers got louder, and again bottles and cans were flung. "'You're crazy, war hero,' Sheila said. "'You'll never get out of here alive.' "'If we go, so do you.' She turned on him, disregarding the pistol, and her eyes flashed with anger. "'So kill me, war hero. As soon as you pull that trigger, those horny bastards will take you apart piece by piece. And who said you could use my stash, huh?' That's high-grade Colombian sugar you're throwing around, man. Macklin smiled thinly. You like to take chances, don't you? He didn't wait for the answer because he already knew it. You want food and water? You want to sleep with a roof over your head and not expect somebody to kill you in the night? You want to be able to wash and not squat on your own shit? I want those things, too. And so does Roland. 
We don't belong out there with the dirt warts. We belong here, and this is a chance we've got to take. She shook her head, and though she was infuriated at losing her stash, she knew he was right. The kid had shown real smarts in suggesting it. You're crazy. We'll see. The trailer's door opened. Lowry stuck his head out. Okay, come on up. But you give me the gun first. No deal. The gun stays with me. You heard what I said, mister. I heard. The gun stays with me. Lowry looked over his shoulder at the man inside the trailer, then, Okay, come on, and be quick about it. They went up the steps into the trailer, and Lowry closed the door behind Roland, sealing off the shouts of the mob. Lowry swung his shotgun up at Macklin's head. A blob wearing a food-stained T-shirt and overalls was sitting at a table on the other side of the trailer. His hair was dyed orange and stood up in inch-high spikes on his scalp and he had a beard streaked with red and green food coloring. His head looked too small for his chest and massive belly, and he had four chins. His eyes were beady black holes and a pallid, flabby face. Scattered around the trailer were cases of canned food, bottled Cokes and Pepsis, bottled water, and about a hundred six-packs of Budweiser stacked up against one wall. Behind him was a storehouse of weapons, a rack of seven rifles, one with a sniper scope, an old Thompson machine gun, a bazooka, and a variety of pistols hanging on hooks. Before him on the table he had sifted a small mound of cocaine from the plastic vial and was rubbing some of it between his fleshy fingers. Within reach of his right hand was a luger, its muzzle pointed in the direction of his visitors. He lifted some of the cocaine to his nostrils and sniffed delicately, as if testing French perfume. "'Do you have names?' he asked, in a voice that was almost girlish. "'My name is Macklin, Colonel James B. Macklin, ex-United States Air Force. "'This is Roland Croninger and Sheila Fontana.' Kemka picked up another bit of cocaine and let it drift back down. "'Where did this come from, Colonel Macklin?' "'My stash,' Sheila said. "'She thought she'd seen all the repulsive things in the world,' but even in the low yellow light of the two lamps that illuminated the trailer, she could hardly bear the fat man. He looked like a circus freak, and from each of his long, fat earlobes hung diamond-studded earrings. "'And this is the extent of that stash?' "'No,' Macklin replied. "'Not nearly all. There's plenty more cocaine, and all kinds of pills, too.' "'Pills,' Kempka repeated, his black eyes aimed at Macklin. What kind of pills? All kinds. LSD, PCP, painkillers, tranquilizers, uppers and downers. Sheila snorted. War hero, you don't know shit about goodies, do you? She took a step toward Kempka, and the fat man's hand rested on the Luger's butt. Black beauties, yellow jackets, blue angels, bennies, poppers, and red stingers. All high-quality floats. Is that so? "'Were you in the business, young lady?' "'Yeah, I guess so.' She looked around at the messy, cluttered trailer. "'What kind of business were you in? Pig farming?' Kemka stared at her. Then slowly his belly began to wobble, followed by his chins. His entire face shook like a plate full of jello, and a high, feminine laugh squeaked between his lips. "'He he,' he said, his cheeks reddening. "'He he! Pig farming! He he! He waved a fat hand at Lowry, who forced a nervous laugh as well. When he'd stopped laughing, Kempka said, "'No, dear one, it was not pig farming. I owned a gun shop in Rancho Cordova, just east of Sacramento. Fortunately, I had time to pack up some of my stock and get out when the bombs hit the Bay Area. I also had the presence of mind to visit a little grocery store on the way east.' Mr. Lowry was a clerk at my store, and we found a place to hide for a while in the El Dorado National Forest. The road brought us here, and other people started arriving. Soon we had a little community. Most of the people came to soak themselves in the lake. There's a belief that bathing in the salt water washes off the radiation and makes you immune. He shrugged his fleshy shoulders. 
Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. In any case, I kind of enjoy playing King of the Hill and the Godfather. If someone doesn't do as I say, I simply banish them to the dirt wart land, or I kill them. He giggled again, his black eyes sparkling merrily. You see, I make the laws here. Me, Freddy Kemka, lately of Kemka's Shootist Supermarket Incorporated. Oh, I'm having a real ball. Good for you. Sheila muttered. Yes, good for me. He rubbed cocaine between his fingers and sniffed a bit up each nostril. My, my, that is a potent dust, isn't it? He licked his fingers clean, and then he looked at Roland Croninger. What are you supposed to be, a space cadet? Roland didn't answer. I'll zap your big fat ass, he thought. Kemka giggled. How come you to be out in the dirt wartland, Colonel? Macklin told him the whole story how Earth House had collapsed, and how he and the boy had gotten out. Macklin made no mention of the Shadow Soldier, because he knew the Shadow Soldier didn't like to be talked about to strangers. "'I see,' Kemka said when he'd finished. "'Well, like they say, the best laid plans often go shitty, don't they? Now, I suppose you came here and brought this potent dust for a purpose. What is it?' "'We want to move into the encampment.' We want a tent, and we want a supply of food. The only tents that are here were brought on people's backs. They're all filled up. No room in the inn, Colonel. Make room. We get a tent and some food, and you get a weekly ration of cocaine and pills. Call it rent. What would I do with drugs, sir? Roland laughed, and Kempka regarded him through hooded eyes. Come on, mister. Roland stepped forward. You know you can sell those drugs for whatever you want. You can buy people's minds with that stuff, because everybody will pay to forget. They'll pay anything you ask. Food, guns, gasoline, anything. I already have those things. Maybe you do, Roland agreed. But are you sure you've got enough of them? What if somebody in a bigger trailer comes into the encampment tomorrow? What if they've got more guns than you do? What if they're stronger and meaner? Those people out there, he nodded toward the door, are just waiting for somebody strong to tell them what to do. They want to be commanded. They don't want to have to think for themselves. Here's a way to put their minds in your pocket. He motioned to the snowy mound. Kemka and Roland stared at each other for a silent moment, and Roland had the sensation of looking at a giant slug, Kemka's black eyes bored into Roland's, and finally a little smile flickered across his wet mouth. "'Would these drugs,' he said, "'buy me a sweet young space cadet?' Roland didn't know what to say. He was stunned, and it must have shown on his face, because Kemka snorted and laughed. When his laughter was spent, the fat man said to Macklin, "'What's to keep me from killing you right now and taking your precious drugs, Colonel?' "'One simple thing.' The drugs are buried out on the dirt wart land. Roland's the only one who knows where they are. He'll go out and bring you a ration once a week, but if anybody follows him or tries to interfere, they get their brains blown out. Kemka tapped his fingers on the tabletop, looking from the mound of cocaine to Macklin and Roland, contemptuously dismissing the girl, and then back to the Colombian sugar. We could use that stuff, Mr. Kemka, Lowry offered. "'Fellow came in yesterday with a gas heater that sure would warm this trailer up. "'Another guy's got some whiskey he lugged along in a tow sack. "'We're going to need tires for the truck, too. "'I would have already taken that heater and the bottles of Jack Daniels, "'but both of those new arrivals are armed to the teeth. "'Might be a good idea to trade the drugs for their guns, too. "'I'll decide what's a good idea and what's not.' "'Kempka's face folded up as he frowned thoughtfully. He drew a long breath and exhaled it like a bellows. Find them a tent, close to the trailer, and spread the word that if anybody touches them, they answer to Freddy Kemka. He smiled broadly at Macklin. Colonel, I believe you and your friends are going to be very interesting additions to our little family. I guess we could call you pharmacists, couldn't we? I guess so. Macklin waited until Lowry had lowered his shotgun, and then he in turn lowered the automatic. There. Now we're all happy, aren't we? 
and his black ravenous eyes found Roland Croninger. Lowry took them to a small tent staked down about thirty yards from the Airstream trailer. It was occupied by a young man and a woman who held an infant with bandaged legs. Lowry stuck the shotgun in the young man's face and said, Get out. The man, drawn and gaunt, hollow-eyed with fatigue, scrabbled under his sleeping bag. His hand came up with a hunting knife, but Lowry stepped forward and caught the man's thin wrist beneath his boot. Lowry put all his weight down, and Roland watched his eyes as he broke the man's bones. They were empty, registering no emotion, even when the snapping noise began. Lowry was simply doing what he'd been told. The infant started crying, and the woman was screaming, but the man just hugged his broken wrist and stared numbly up at Lowry. Out! Lowry put the shotgun's barrel to the young man's skull. Are you deaf, you dumb bastard? The man and woman wearily got to their feet. He paused to gather up their sleeping bags and a knapsack with his uninjured hand, but Lowry grabbed him by the scruff of the neck and hauled him out, throwing him to the ground. The woman sobbed and cringed at her husband's side. A crowd was gathering to watch, and the woman shrieked, You animals! You dirty animals! That's our tent! It belongs to us! Not any more. Lowry motioned with the shotgun toward the dirt wart land. Start walking. It's not fair. Not fair, the woman sobbed. She looked around imploringly at the people who were gathering. Roland, Macklin, and Sheila did, too, and they all saw the same thing in those faces, an impassive, uninvolved curiosity, as if they were watching television violence. Though there were faint expressions of disgust and pity here and there, the majority of the onlookers had already been shocked, devoid of all emotion. Help us, the woman begged. Please, somebody help us. Several of the people had guns, but none of them intervened. Macklin understood why. It was the survival of the fittest. Freddy Kemka was the emperor here, and Lowry was his lieutenant probably one of many lieutenants Kemke used as his eyes and ears. "'Get out,' Lowry told the couple. The woman kept shrieking and crying, but finally the man stood up, and his eyes, dead and defeated, began to trudge slowly toward the grim land of car hulks and decaying corpses. Her expression turned to hatred. She stood up with the wailing infant in her arms and shouted to the crowd, "'It'll happen to you. You'll see. They'll take everything you have.' They'll come and drag you out of... Lowry struck out with the stock of the shotgun. It crunched into the infant's skull, the force of the blow knocking the young woman to the ground. The infant's crying abruptly stopped. She looked down into her child's face and made a weak, choking sound. Sheila Fontana couldn't believe what she'd just witnessed. She wanted to turn away, but the scene had a dark hold on her. Her stomach churned with revulsion and she could still hear the infant's cry echoing over and over in her mind. She put her hand over her mouth and pressed. The young man, a corpse in clothes, was walking on across the plain, not even bothering to look back. Finally, with a shuddering gasp, the woman rose to her feet, the silent infant clasped to her chest. Her hideous, hollowed-out eyes met Sheila's and lingered. Sheila felt as if her soul had been burned to a cinder. If only the baby had stopped crying, Sheila thought. If only— The young mother turned and began to follow her husband into the mist. The onlookers drifted away. Lowry wiped the stock of his shotgun on the ground and motioned toward the tent. Looks like we just got a vacancy, Colonel. Did you have to do that? Sheila asked. Inside she was trembling and sick but her face showed no sign of it, her eyes cold and flinty. Every once in a while they forget who makes the rules. Well, do you want the tent or not? We do, Macklin said. There you go, then. Even got a couple of sleeping bags and some food in there. Cozy is home, huh? Macklin and Roland entered the tent. Where am I supposed to live? Sheila asked Lowry. He smiled, examined her up and down. Well, I've got an extra sleeping bag over in the trailer. See, I bunk with Mr. Kemka, but I'm not funny. He likes young boys, couldn't give a shit about women. 
What do you say? She smelled his body odor and couldn't decide whose was worse, his or the war hero's. Forget it, she said. I'll stay here. Suit yourself. I'll get you sooner or later. When hell freezes. He licked a finger and held it up to catch the wind. It's getting pretty frosty, darling. Then he laughed and sauntered off toward the trailer. Sheila watched him go. She looked in the direction of the dirtwort land, and she saw the vague outlines of the young couple heading into the mist, into the unknown that lay beyond it. Those two wouldn't have spit's chance out there, she thought. But maybe they already knew that. The baby would have died anyway, she told herself. Sure, the kid was half dead already. But that incident had knocked her off her tracks more than anything ever had before, and she couldn't help thinking that a few minutes before there was a living person where a ghost was now, and it had happened because of her drugs, because she'd come in there with the war hero and the punk playing big shots. The young couple disappeared into the gray rain. As Rudy said, you cover your own ass. And in this day and time, those were words to live by. Sheila turned her back on the dirtwort land and slipped into the tent. Chapter 39 Light! Josh shouted, pointing into the distance. Look at that! There's light ahead! They'd been following a highway over gently rolling country, and now they saw the light that Josh pointed toward, a bluish-white illumination reflecting off low-lying turbulent clouds. That's Matheson, Leona said from her bareback perch atop mule. Lord Almighty, they've got the electricity on in Matheson. How many people live there? Josh asked her, speaking loudly over the rush and pull of the wind. Thirteen, fourteen thousand. It's a regular city. Thank God. They must have fixed their power lines. We're going to have hot meals tonight. Thank God. He started shoving the wheelbarrow with newfound energy, as if his heels had sprouted wings. Swan followed him, carrying the dowsing rod under a small bag, and Leona kicked her heels into Mule's sides to urge the horse onward. Mule obeyed without hesitation, glad to be of use again. Behind them the little terrier sniffed the air and growled quietly, but followed nevertheless. Flickers of lightning shot through the cloud cover over Matheson, and the wind brought the rumble of thunder. They'd left the Jaspin farm early that morning, had walked all day along the narrow highway. Josh had tried to put a saddle and bridle on Mule, but though the horse stood docilely, Josh couldn't get the damn things on right. The saddle kept slipping, and he couldn't figure out how to get the bridle on at all. Every time Mule had even grumbled, Josh had jumped back out of the way, expecting the animal to buck and rear, and finally he gave the job up as a lost cause. Still the horse accepted Leona's weight without complaint. He had also borne Swan for a few miles. The horse seemed content to follow Swan, almost like a puppy. And off in the darkness the terrier yapped every once in a while, to let them know he was still around. Josh's heart was hammering. That was one of the most beautiful lights he'd ever seen, next to the glorious flashlight beam that had speared through the basement. Oh, Lord, he thought, a hot meal, a warm place to sleep, and— Glory of glories, maybe even a real toilet again. He smelled ozone in the air. A thunderstorm was approaching, but he didn't care. They were going to rest in the lap of luxury tonight. Josh turned his face toward Swan and Leona. Lord God, we made it back to civilization. He let out a loud whoop that put the wind to shame and even made Mule jump. But the smile froze on Leona's face. Slowly it began to slide off. Her fingers curled through Mule's coarse black mane. She wasn't sure what she'd seen, wasn't sure at all. It had been a trick of the light, she told herself. A trick of the light, yes, that's all. Leona thought she'd seen a skull where Josh Hutchins's face had been. But it had been so fast, there and then gone in an eye blink. She stared at the back of Swan's head. Oh, God, Leona thought. What'll I do if the child's face is like that, too? It took her a while to gather her courage, and then she said, Swan, in a thin, scared voice. Swan glanced back. Ma'am? Leona was holding her breath. Ma'am? 
Swan repeated. Leona found a smile. Oh, nothing, she said, and she shrugged. The vision of a skull beneath the skin was not there. I just wanted to see your face, Leona told her. My face? Why? Oh, I was just thinking. How pretty you must have been. She stammered at her own error. I mean, how pretty you're going to be again, once your skin heals up. And it will, too. Skin's a real tough thing, you know. Sure is. It'll heal up pretty as a picture. Swan didn't answer. She remembered the horror that had stared back at her from the bathroom mirror. I don't think my face will ever heal up, she said matter-of-factly. A sudden awful thought struck her. You don't think— She paused, unable to spit it out. Then— You don't think— I'll scare people in Matheson, do you? Of course not. And don't you even think such a thing. In truth, Leona hadn't considered that before. But now she could envision residents of Matheson cringing away from Josh and Swan. Your skin'll heal up soon enough, Leona assured her. Besides, that's just your outside face. My outside face? Yep. Everybody's got two faces, child. The outside face and the inside face. The outside face is how the world sees you, but the inside face is what you really look like. It's your true face, and if it was flipped to the outside, you'd show the world what kind of person you are. Flipped to the outside? How? Leona smiled. Well, God hasn't figured a way to do that yet, but he will. Sometimes you can see a person's inside face, but only for a second or two. If you look close and hard enough, the eyes give away the inside face, and likely as not it's a whole lot different than the mask that's stuck on the outside. She nodded, looking toward the lights of Matheson. Oh, I've met some mighty handsome people who had monstrous ugly faces on the inside, and I've met some homely folks with buck teeth and big noses and the light of heaven in their eyes, and you know that if you saw their inside faces, the beauty would knock you right to your knees. I kind of figure it might be like that for your inside face, child, and Josh's as well. So what does it matter about your outside face? Swan pondered for a moment. I'd like to believe that. Then take it as true. Leona said, and Swan was quiet. The light beckoned them onward. The highway climbed over one more hill, then began to curve gently down toward the town. Lightning jumped across the horizon. Beneath Leona, Mule snorted and whinnied. Swan heard a nervous note in the horse's whinny. Mule's excited, because we're going to find more people, she thought. But no, no, that hadn't been a sound of excitement. Swan had heard it as distrust, edginess. She began to pick up the horse's nervousness, to feel a little wary herself, like the time she had been strolling across a wide golden field, and a farmer in a red cap had yelled, "'Hey, little girl, watch out for rattlers and them weeds!' Not that she was afraid of snakes, far from it. Once, when she was five years old, she'd picked up a colorful snake right out of the grass, run her fingers across the beautiful diamonds on its back, and the bony-looking ridges on its tail. Then she'd set the snake down and watched as it crawled unhurriedly away. It was only later, when she'd told her mama and gotten a rear-blistering whipping in return, that Swan had realized she was supposed to be afraid. Mule made a whickering sound and tossed his head. The road flattened out as it approached the outskirts of town, where a green sign proclaimed, Welcome to Matheson, Kansas. We're strong, proud, and growing. Josh stopped, and Swan almost bumped into him. What is it? Leona asked him. Look, Josh motioned toward the town. The houses and buildings were dark. No light came from their windows or front porches. There were no street lights, no headlights of cars, no traffic lights. The glow that reflected up off the low clouds was coming from deeper within the town, beyond the dead, dark structures that were scattered on both sides of the main highway. There was no sound but the shrill whine of the wind. I think that light's coming from the center of town, he told Swan and Leona. 
But if the electricity's back on, why aren't there lights in the house windows, too? Maybe everybody's in one place, Leona offered. Like at the auditorium, or City Hall, or somewhere. Josh nodded. There ought to be cars, he decided. Ought to be traffic lights working. I don't see any. Maybe they're saving the electricity. Maybe the wires aren't too strong yet. Maybe, Josh replied. But there was something spooky about Matheson. Why were there no lights in the windows, yet something at the center of Matheson ablaze with light? And everything was so still, so very still. He had the feeling that they should turn back, but the wind was cold, and they had come so far. There had to be people here. Sure, they're all in one place, like Leona had suggested. Maybe they're having a town meeting or something. In any case, there was no turning back. He started pushing the wheelbarrow again. Swan followed him, and the horse that bore Leona followed Swan. And off to the left, the terrier kept to the tall weeds and ran ahead. Another roadside sign advertised the Matheson Motel, swimming pool, cable TV. And a third sign said the best coffee and steaks in town could be found at the High Tower restaurant on Cavanagh Street. They followed the road between ploughed fields and past a dark softball diamond and a public pool where the lounge chairs and umbrellas were blown into a chain-link fence. A final roadside sign announced the July firecracker sale at the Kmart on Billups Street, and then they entered Matheson. It had been a pretty town, Josh thought, as they walked along the center line. The buildings were either made of stones or logs, meant to resemble a frontier town. The houses were made of brick, most of them one story, nothing fancy but nice enough. A statue of somebody on his knees, one hand covering what might have been a Bible, and the other extended toward the sky, stood atop a pedestal in a district of small shops and stores that reminded Josh of that Mayberry show with Andy Griffith. A canopy flapping over a store with a barber pole in front of it, and the windows of the Matheson First Citizens Bank were broken out. Furniture had been dragged out of a furniture store, piled in a heap in the street, and set afire. Nearby was an overturned police car, also burned to a halt. Josh did not look inside. Thunder growled overhead, and lightning danced across the sky. Further on they found a used car lot. Trade at Uncle Roy's, the sign urged. Under rows of flapping multicolored banners were six dusty cars. Josh began to check them all, one by one, as Swan and Leona waited behind, and Mule grumbled uneasily. Two of them were sitting on flat tires, and a third's windshield and windows were shattered. The other three, an Impala, a Ford Fairlane, and a red pickup truck, seemed in pretty good shape. Josh walked to the small office building, found the door wide open, and with the light of the bull's-eye lantern located the keys to all three vehicles on a pegboard. He took the keys out to the lot and methodically tried them. The Impala wouldn't make a sound. The pickup truck was dead, and the Fairlane's engine popped and stuttered, made a noise like a chain being dragged along gravel, and then went silent. Josh opened the Fairlane's hood and found that the engine had been attacked with what might have been an axe. The wiring, belts, and cables hacked apart. Damn it, Josh swore, and then his lantern revealed something written in dried grease on the inside of the hood. All shall praise Lord Alvin. He stared at the scrawled writing, remembering that he'd seen the same thing, though written in a different hand and in a different substance, at the Jaspin farmhouse the night before. He walked back to Swan and Leona, and he said, Those cars are shot. I think somebody wrecked them on purpose. He looked toward the light, which was much closer now. Well, he said finally, I guess we go find out what that is, right? Leona glanced at him, then quickly away. She wasn't sure that she hadn't seen the skull again, but in this strange light she couldn't tell. Her heart had begun to pump harder, and she didn't know what to do or say. Josh pushed the wheelbarrow forward. Off in the distance they heard the terrier bark a few times, then silence. They continued along the main street, passing more stores with broken windows, more overturned and burned vehicles. The light pulled them onward, and though they all had their private concerns, they were drawn to that light like moths to a candle. 
On a corner was a small sign that pointed to the right and said, Pathway Institute, two miles. Josh looked in that direction and saw nothing but darkness. That's the asylum, Leona said. The asylum? The word lanced him. What asylum? The crazy house. You know, where they put folks who go off their rockers. That one's famous all over the state, full of people too crazy to go to prison. You mean the criminally insane? Yeah, that's right. Great, Josh said. The sooner they were out of this town, the better. He didn't like being even two miles from an asylum full of lunatic murderers. He peered off into the darkness where the Pathway Institute was, and he felt the flesh ripple all up and down his backbone. And then they went through another area of silent houses, passing the dark Matheson Motel and the High Tower Restaurant, and they entered a huge paved parking lot. Before them, every light illuminated and blazing, was a Kmart, and next to it, a similarly lit food giant supermarket. God Almighty, Josh breathed. A shopping center. Swan and Leona just stared, as if they'd never seen such light or huge stores before. Dark, sensitive photon lamps cast a yellow glow over the parking lot, which held perhaps fifty or sixty cars, campers, and pickup trucks, all covered with Kansas dust. Josh was completely stunned and had to catch his balance before the wind knocked him over. It was running through his head that if the electricity was on, then the freezers in the supermarket would be operating too, and inside would be steaks, ice cream, cold beer, eggs, bacon, ham, and God only knew what else. He looked at the brilliantly lit Kmart, his brain reeling. What sort of treasures would be in there? Radios and batteries, flashlights and lanterns, guns, gloves, kerosene heaters, raincoats. He didn't know whether to laugh or sob with joy, but he pushed the wheelbarrow aside and started walking toward the Kmart as if in a delirious daze. Wait, Leona called. She got down off mule and hobbled after Josh. Hold up a minute. Swan set her bag down, but kept hold of Crybaby, and followed Leona. Behind her, Mule plodded along. The terrier barked a couple of times, then slipped under an abandoned Volkswagen and stayed there, watching the humans moving across the parking lot. "'Wait!' Leona called again, but she couldn't keep pace with him, and he was heading for the Kmart like a steam engine. Swan said, "'Josh, wait for us!' and she hurried to catch him. Some of the windows were broken out of the Kmart, but Josh figured the wind had done that. He had no idea why the lights were on there and nowhere else. The Kmart and the supermarket next to it were akin to water holes in a burning desert. His heart was about to blast through his chest. Candy bars, he thought wildly. Cookies, glazed donuts. He feared his legs would collapse before he reached the Kmart, or that the entire vision would tremble and dissolve as he went through one of the front doors. But it didn't, and he did. And there he stood inside the huge store, with the treasures of the world on racks and displays before him. The magic phrases, snacks and candy, and sporting goods, and automotives, and housewares, on wooden arrows pointing into various sections of the store. My God! Josh said, half drunk with ecstasy. Oh, my God! Swan came in, then Leona. As the door was swinging shut, a blurred form darted in, and the terrier shot past Josh and vanished along the center aisle. Then the door shut, and they stood together in the glare, while Mule whinnied and pawed the concrete outside. Josh strode past a display of outdoor grills and bags of charcoal to a counter full of candy bars. His desire for chocolate fanned to a fever. He sucked three Milky Ways right out of their wrappers and started on a half-pound bag of M&Ms. Leona went to a table piled with thick athletic socks. Swan wandered amid the counters, dazzled by the amount of merchandise and the brightness of the lights. His mouth crammed with gooey chocolate, Josh turned to a display of cigarettes, cigars, and pipe tobacco. He chose a pack of Hava Tampa jewels, found some matches nearby, stuck one of the cigars between his teeth and lit it, inhaling deeply. He felt as if he had stepped into paradise, and the pleasures of the supermarket were yet to be experienced. From far back in the store, the terrier yapped several times in rapid succession, 
Swan looked back along the aisle, but couldn't see the dog. She didn't like the sound of that barking, though. It carried a warning, and as the terrier began to bark again, she heard it yip, as if it had been kicked. A barrage of barking followed. Josh? Swan called. A cocoon of cigar smoke obscured his head. He puffed on the stogie and chewed more candy bars. His mouth was so full he couldn't even answer Swan. He just waved to her. Swan walked slowly toward the back of the store as the terrier continued to bark. She came to three mannequins, all wearing suits. The one in the middle had on a blue baseball cap, and Swan thought it didn't go at all with the suit, but it might be made to fit her own head. She reached up and plucked it off. The entire waxen-fleshed head toppled from the mannequin's shoulders right out of the stiff white shirt collar and fell to the floor at Swan's feet with a sound like a hammer whacking a watermelon. Swan stared wide-eyed, the baseball cap in one hand and crybaby in the other. The head had thinning gray hair and dark-socketed eyes that had rolled upward, and on its cheeks and chin was a stubble of gray whiskers. Now she could see the dried red matter and the yellowed nub of bone where it had been hacked off the human neck. She blinked and looked up at the other two mannequins. One of them had the head of a teenage boy, his mouth slack and tongue lolling, both eyeballs turned to the ceiling and a crust of blood at the nostrils. The third one's head was that of an elderly man, his face heavily lined and the color of chalk. Swan stepped back across the aisle and hit a fourth and fifth mannequin dressed in women's clothes, the severed heads of a middle-aged woman and a little girl with red hair fell out of the collars and thumped to the floor on either side of her. The little girl's face was directed up at Swan, the awful blood-drained mouth open in a soundless cry of terror. Swan screamed, screamed long and loud, and couldn't stop screaming. She backpedaled away from the human head, still screaming, and as she spun around she saw another mannequin nearby, and another, and another some of the heads beaten and battered, and the others painted and prettied with makeup to give them false and obscene smiles. She thought that if she couldn't stop screaming, her lungs would burst, and as she ran for Josh and Leona, the scream died, because all her air was gone. She pulled in breath and raced away from the grisly heads, and over Josh's shout she heard the terrier give a yip, yip, yip of pain from the rear of the Kmart. Swan! Josh yelled spitting out half-chewed candy. He saw her coming toward him, her face as yellow as the Kansas dust, and tears streaming down her cheeks. What is— Blue Light Special! A merry voice sang over the Kmart's intercom system. Attention, shoppers! Blue Light Special! Three new arrivals at the front! Hurry for the best bargains! They heard the rough roar of a motorcycle's engine firing. Josh scooped Swan up as a motorcycle hurtled at them along the center aisle, its driver dressed like a traffic cop, except for his Indian headdress. Look out! Leona shouted, and Josh leaped across a counter full of ice cube trays with Swan in his arms, the motorcycle skidding past them into a display of transistor radios. More figures were running toward them along the other aisles, and there was an ungodly whooping and hollering that drowned out the blue light special being repeated over the intercom. Here came a mountainous black-bearded man, pushing a gnarled dwarf in a shopping cart, followed by other men of all ages and descriptions, wearing all kinds of clothing, from suits to bathrobes, some of them wearing streaks of war paint on their faces, others daubed white with powder. Josh realized, sickeningly, that most of them were carrying weapons, axes, picks, hoes, garden shears, pistols and rifles, knives and chains. The aisles were a crawl with them, and they jumped over the counters, grinning and yelling. Josh, Swan, and Leona were driven together and ringed by a shouting mob of forty or more men. Protect the child, Josh thought, and as one of the men darted in to grab Swan's arm, Josh delivered a kick to his ribs that snapped bones and sent him flying back into the rabble. The move brought more gleeful cheers. The gnarled dwarf in the shopping cart, whose wrinkled face was decorated with orange lightning bolts, crowed, Fresh meat! Fresh meat! The others took up the shout. An emaciated man plucked at Leona's hair, and someone else grabbed her arm to pull her into the crowd. She became a wildcat, kicking and biting, driving her tormentors back. 
A heavy body landed on Josh's shoulders, raking at his eyes, but he twisted and flung the man off into the sea of leering faces. Swan struck out with Crybaby, hit one of those ugly faces in the nose and saw it pop open. "'Fresh meat!' the dwarf yelled. "'Come get your fresh meat!' The black-bearded man began to clap his hands and dance. Josh hit someone square in the mouth, and two teeth flew like dice in a crap game. "'Get away!' he roared. "'Get away from us!' But they were closing in now, and there were just too many. Three men were pulling Leona into the throng, and Josh caught a glimpse of her terrified face. A fist rose and fell, and Leona's legs buckled. "'Damn it!' Josh raged, kicking the nearest maniac in the kneecap. "'Protect the child! I've got to protect the—' A fist struck him in the kidneys. His legs were kicked out from under him, and he lost his grip on Swan as he fell. Fingers gouged at his eyes. A fist crashed into his jaw. Shoes and boots pummeled his sides and back, and the whole world seemed to be in violent motion. "'Swan!' he shouted, trying to get up. Men clung to him like rats. He looked up through a red haze of pain and saw a man with bulging fish-like eyes standing over him, lifting an axe. He flung his arm up in an ineffectual gesture to ward it off, but he knew the axe was about to fall, and that would be the end of it. Oh, damn, he thought, as blood trickled from his mouth. What a way to go. He braced for the blow, hoping that he could stand up with his last strength and knock the bastard's brains out. The axe reached its zenith, poised to fall. And a booming voice shouted over the tumult, Cease! The effect was like a bullwhip being cracked over the heads of wild animals. Almost to a man they flinched and drew back. The fish-eyed man lowered the axe, and the others released Josh. He sat up, saw Swan a few feet away, and drew her to him. She was still holding on to Crybaby, her eyes swimming with shock. Leona was on her knees nearby, blood oozing from a cut above her left eye, and a purple swelling coming up on her cheekbone. The mob backed away, open to make passage for someone. A heavy-set, fleshy, bald-headed man in overalls and cowboy boots, his chest bare and his muscular arms decorated with weird multicolored designs, walked into the circle. He was carrying an electric bullhorn, and he looked down at Josh with dark eyes beneath a protruding Neanderthal brow. Oh, shit, Josh thought. The guy was at least as big as some of the heavyweight wrestlers he'd grappled. But then behind the bald-headed Neanderthal came two other men with painted faces, supporting a toilet between them, hoisted up on their shoulders, and on that toilet sat a man draped in a deep purple robe, his hair a blonde, shoulder-length mane of loose curls. He had a downy beard of fine blonde hair, covering a gaunt, narrow face, and under thick blonde brows his eyes were murky olive green. The color reminded Josh of the water of a swimming hole near his childhood home, where two young boys had drowned on a summer morning. It was said, he recalled, that monsters lay coiled in wait at the bottom of that cloudy green water. The young man, who might have been anywhere from twenty to twenty-five, wore white gloves, blue jeans, Adidas sneakers, and a red plaid shirt. On his forehead was a green dollar sign. On his left cheekbone was a red crucifix, and on his right was a black devil's pitchfork. The Neanderthal lifted the bullhorn to his mouth and roared, All shall praise Lord Alvin! Chapter 40 Macklin had heard the siren song of screaming in the night, and now he knew it was time. He eased out of his sleeping bag, careful not to jostle Roland or Sheila. He didn't want either of them to go with him. He was afraid of the pain, and he didn't want them to see him weak. Macklin walked out of the tent into the cold, sweeping wind. He began to head in the direction of the lake. Torches and campfires flickered all around him, and the wind tugged at the greenish-black bandages that trailed off the stump of Macklin's right wrist. He could smell the sickly odor of his own infection. And for days the wound had been oozing gray fluid. He put his left palm over the handle of the knife and the waistband of his trousers. He was going to have to open the wound again, and expose the flesh to the healing agony of the great salt lake. Behind him Roland Croninger had sat up as soon as Macklin left the tent. The forty-five was gripped in his hand. He always slept with it, he even kept hold of it when Sheila Fontana let him do the dirty thing to her. He liked to watch also when Sheila took the king on. 
In turn, they fed Sheila and protected her from the other men. They were becoming a very close trio. But now he knew where the king was going and why. The king's wound had been smelling very bad lately. Soon there would be another scream in the night, like the others they heard when the encampment got quiet. He was a king's knight, and he thought he should be at the king's side to help him, but this was something the king wanted to do alone. Roland lay back down, the pistol resting on his chest. Sheila muttered something and flinched in her sleep. Roland listened for the cry of the king's rebirth. Macklin passed other tents, cardboard box shelters, and cars that housed whole families. The smell of the salt lake stung his nostrils, promised a pain and a cleansing beyond anything Macklin had ever experienced. The land began to slope slightly downward toward the water's edge, and lying on the ground around him were blood-caked clothes, rags, crutches, and bandages torn off and discarded by other supplicants before him. He remembered the screams he'd heard in the night, and his nerve faltered. He stopped less than twenty feet from where the lake rippled up over the rocky shore. His phantom hand was itching, and the stump throbbed painfully with his heartbeat. I can't take it, he thought. Oh, dear God, I can't. Discipline and control, mister, a voice said off to his right. The shadow soldier was standing there, white, bony hands on hips, the moonlike face streaked with commando grease paint under the helmet's rim. You lose those, and what have you got? Macklin didn't answer. The lapping of the water on the shore was both seductive and terrifying. Your nerve going bye-bye, Jimmy boy? The shadow soldier asked, and Macklin thought that the voice was similar to his father's. It carried the same note of taunting disgust. Well, I'm not surprised, the shadow soldier continued. You sure pulled a royal fuck-up at Earth House, didn't you? Oh, you really did a fine job. No, Macklin shook his head. It wasn't my fault. The shadow soldier laughed quietly. You knew, Jimmy boy. You knew something was wrong in Earth House, and you kept packing the suckers in because you smelled the green of the Osley cash, didn't you? Man, you killed all those poor chumps. You buried them under a few hundred tons of rock and saved your own ass, didn't you? No, Macklin thought it really was his father's voice, and he thought that the shadow soldier's face was beginning to resemble the fleshy, hawk-nosed face of his long-dead father as well. I had to save myself, Macklin replied, his voice weak. What was I supposed to do, lie down and die? Shit, that kid's got more sense and guts than you do, Jimmy boy. He's the one who got you out. He kept you moving, and he found food to keep your ass alive. If it wasn't for that kid... You wouldn't be standing here right now shaking in your shoes because you're afraid of a little pain. That kid knows the meaning of discipline and control, Jimmy boy. You're just a tired old cripple who ought to go out in that lake, duck your head under, and take a quick snort like they did. The shadow soldier nodded toward the lake where the bloated bodies of suicides floated in the brine. You used to think being head honcho at Earth House was the bottom of the barrel, but this is the bottom, Jimmy boy, right here. You're not worth a shit, and you've lost your nerve. No, I haven't, Macklin said. I haven't. A hand gestured toward the Great Salt Lake. Prove it. Roland sensed someone outside the tent. He sat up, clicking the safety off the automatic. Sometimes the men came around at night, sniffing for Sheila, and they had to be scared off. A flashlight shone in his face, and he aimed the pistol at the figure who held it. Hold it, the man said. I don't want any trouble. Sheila cried out and sat bolt upright, her eyes wild. She drew herself away from the man with the light. She'd been having that nightmare again, of Rudy shambling to the tent, his face bleached of blood, and the wound at his throat gaping like a hideous mouth. And from between his purple lips came a rattling voice that asked, "'Killed any babies lately, Sheila, darling?' "'You get trouble if you don't back off.' Roland's eyes were fierce behind the goggles. He held the pistol ready, his finger poised on the trigger. "'It's me, Judd Lowry.' He shone the flashlight on his own face. "'See?' "'What do you want?' Lowry pointed the light at Macklin's empty sleeping bag. "'Where'd the colonel go?' "'Out.' 
What do you want? Mr. Kemka wants to talk to you. What about? I delivered the ration last night. He wants to talk, Bowery said. He says he's got a deal for you. A deal? What kind of deal? A business proposal. I don't know the details. You'll have to see him. I don't have to do anything, Roland told him. And whatever it is can wait until daylight. Mr. Kempke, Lowry said firmly, wants to do business right now. It's not important that Macklin be there. Mr. Kempke wants to deal with you. He thinks you've got a good head on your shoulders. So are you coming or not? Not. Lowry shrugged. Okay, then, I guess I'll tell him you're not interested. He started to back out of the tent, then stopped. Oh, yeah. He wanted me to give you this. And he dropped a box full of Hershey bars on the ground in front of Roland. He's got plenty of stuff like that over in the trailer. Jesus! Sheila's hand darted into the box and plucked out some of the chocolate bars. Man, it's been a long time since I've had one of these. I'll tell him what you said, Lowry told Roland, and again he started to leave the tent. Wait a minute, Roland blurted out. What kind of deal does he want to talk about? Like I say, you'll have to see him to find out. Roland hesitated, but he figured whatever it was couldn't hurt. I don't go anywhere without the gun, he said. Sure, why not? Roland got out of his sleeping bag and stood up. Sheila, already finishing one of the chocolate bars, said, Hey, hold on, what about me? Mr. Kemka just wants the boy. Kiss my ass. I'm not staying out here alone. Lowry shrugged the strap of his shotgun off his shoulder and handed it to her. Here, and don't blow your head off by accident. She took it, realizing too late that it was the same weapon he'd used to kill the infant. Still, she wouldn't dare be left out there alone without a gun. Then she turned her attention to the box of Hershey bars, and Roland followed Judd Lowry to the Airstream trailer, where yellow lantern light crept through the slats of the drawn window blinds. On the edge of the lake, Macklin took off his black overcoat and the filthy blood-stained T-shirt he wore. Then he began to unwrap the bandages from the stump of his wrist, as the shadow soldier watched in silence. When he was done, he let the bandages fall. The wound was not pretty to look at, and the shadow soldier whistled at the sight. "'Discipline and control, mister,' the shadow soldier said. "'That's what makes a man.' Those were the exact words of Macklin's father. He had grown up hearing them pounded into his head, had fashioned them into a motto to live by. Now, though, to make himself walk into that salty water and do what had to be done— was going to take every ounce of discipline and control he could summon. The shadow soldier said in a sing-song voice, Up, two, three, four, up, two, three, four, get it in gear, mister. Oh, Jesus, Macklin breathed. He stood with his eyes tightly shut for a few seconds. His entire body shook with the cold wind and his own dread. Then he took the knife from his waistband and walked down toward the chuckling water. "'Sit down, Roland,' the fat man said as Lowry escorted Roland into the trailer. A chair had been pulled up in front of the table that Kemka sat behind. "'Shut the door!' Lowry obeyed him, and Roland sat down. He kept his hand on the pistol and the pistol in his lap. Kemka's face folded into a smile. "'Would you like something to drink?' Pepsi? Coke? Seven-Up? How about something stronger? He laughed in his high, shrill voice, and his many chins wobbled. You are of legal age, aren't you? I'll take a Pepsi. Ah, good. Judd, would you get us two Pepsis, please? Lowry got up and went to another room, which Roland figured must be a kitchen. What did you want to see me about? Roland asked. A business deal. A proposition. Kempka leaned back, and his chair popped and creaked like fireworks going off. He wore an open-collared sport shirt that showed wiry brown hair on his flabby chest, and his belly flopped over the belt line of his lime-green polyester trousers. Kempka's hair had been freshly pomaded and combed, 
and the interior of the trailer smelled like cheap sweet cologne. You strike me as a very intelligent young boy, Roland. Young man, I should say, he grinned. I could tell right off that you had intelligence. And fire, too. Oh, yes, I like young men with fire. He glanced at the pistol Roland held. You can put that aside, you know. I want to be your friend. That's nice. Roland kept the pistol aimed in Freddy Kempka's direction. On the wall behind the fat man, the many rifles and handguns on their hooks caught the baleful yellow lamplight. Well, Kempka shrugged, we can talk anyway. Tell me about yourself. Where are you from? What happened to your parents? My parents, Roland thought. What had happened to them? He remembered them all going into Earth House together, remembered the earthquake in the cafeteria. Thought everything else was still crazy and disjointed. He couldn't even recall exactly what his mother and father had looked like. They had died in the cafeteria, he thought. Yes, both of them had been buried under rock. He was a king's knight now, and there was no turning back. That's not important, he decided to say. Is that what you wanted to talk about? No, it's not. I wanted to— Ah, here are our refreshments. Lowry came in with Pepsis and two plastic glasses— he set one glass in front of Kempka and handed Roland the other. Lowry started to walk behind Roland, but the boy said sharply, Stay in front of me while I'm in here. And Lowry stopped. The man smiled, lifted his hands in a gesture of peace, and sat on a pile of boxes against the wall. As I say, I like young men with fire. Kempka sipped at his drink. It had been a long time since Roland had tasted a soft drink, and he chugged almost half the glass full down without stopping. The drink had lost most of its fizz, but it was still about the best stuff he'd ever tasted. So what is it? Roland asked. Something about the drugs? No, nothing about that. He smiled again, a fleeting smile. I want to know about Colonel Macklin. He leaned forward, and the chair squalled. He rested his forearms on the table and laced his thick fingers together. I want to know what Macklin offers you that I can't. What? Look around, Kemka said. Look what I've got here. Food, drink, candy, guns, bullets, and power, Roland. What does Macklin have? A wretched little tent. And you know what? That's all he'll ever have. I run this community, Roland. I guess you could say I'm the law, the mayor, the judge, and the jury all rolled up into one, right? He glanced quickly at Lowry, and the other man said, Right, with the conviction of a ventriloquist's dummy. So what does Macklin do for you, Roland? Kemka lifted his eyebrows. Or should I ask what you do for him? Roland almost told the fat man that Macklin was the king, shorn of his crown and kingdom now, but destined to return to power some day, and that he had pledged himself as a king's knight. But he figured Kemka was about as smart as a bug and wouldn't understand the grand purpose of the game. So Roland said, We travel together. And where are you going? To the same garbage dump Macklin is headed toward? No, I think you're smarter than that. What do you mean? I mean that I have a large and comfortable trailer, Roland. I have a real bed. He nodded toward a closed door. It's right through there. Would you like to see it? It suddenly dawned on Roland what Freddy Kemka had been getting at. No, he said, his gut tightening. I wouldn't. Your friend can't offer you what I can, Roland, Kemka said in a silken voice. He has no power. I have it all. Do you think I let you in here just because of the drugs? No. I want you, Roland. I want you here, with me. Roland shook his head. Dark motes seemed to spin before his eyes, and his head felt heavy, as if he couldn't balance it any longer on his neck. You're going to find that power rules this world. Kemke's voice sounded to Roland like a record played too fast. It's the only thing that's worth a damn any more. Not beauty, not love, nothing but power. And the man who has it can take anything he wants. Not me, Roland said. The words felt like marbles rolling off his tongue. 
He thought he was about to puke, and there was a needles and pins sensation in his legs. The lamplight was hurting his eyes, and when he blinked it took an effort to lift his lids again. He looked down into the plastic glass he held, and he could see grainy things floating at the bottom. He tried to stand up, but his legs gave way, and he fell to his knees on the floor. Someone was bending over him, and he felt the forty-five being taken from his nerveless fingers. Too late he tried to grasp it back, but Lowry was grinning and stepping out of reach. "'I found a use for some of those drugs you brought me.' Now Kemka's voice was slow and murky, an underwater slur. "'I mashed up a few of those pills and made a nice little mixture. I hope you enjoy your trip.' and the fat man began to rise ponderously from his chair and stalk across the room toward Roland Croninger, while Lowry went outside to smoke a cigarette. Roland shivered, though sweat was bursting out on his face, and scurried away from the man on his hands and knees. His brain was doing flip-flops. Everything was lurching, speeding up and then slowing to a crawl. The whole trailer wobbled as Kemka went to the door and threw the latches. Roland squeezed himself into a corner like a trapped animal, and when he tried to shout for the king to help him, his voice almost blew his eardrums out. "'Now,' Kemka said, "'we'll get to know each other better, won't we?' Macklin stood in cold water up to the middle of his thighs, the wind whipping into his face and wailing off beyond the encampment. His groin crawled, and his hand gripped the knife so hard his knuckles had gone bone white. He looked at the infected wound— saw the dark swelling that he needed to probe with the knife's gleaming tip. Oh, God, he thought. Dear God, help me. Discipline and control. The shadow soldier was standing behind him. That's what makes a man, Jimmy boy. My father's voice, Macklin thought. God bless dear old Dad, and I hope the worms have riddled his bones. Do it, the shadow soldier commanded. Macklin lifted the knife, took aim, drew in a breath of frigid air, and brought the point of the blade down, down, down into the festered swelling. The pain was so fierce, so white-hot, so all-consuming, that it was almost pleasure. Macklin threw back his head and screamed, and as he screamed, he dug the blade deeper into the infection, deeper still, and the tears were running down his face, and he was on fire between pain and pleasure. He felt his right arm becoming lighter as the infection drained out of it, and as his scream went up into the night where the other screams had gone before his, Macklin threw himself forward into the salt water and immersed the wound. Ah! The fat man stopped a few feet from Roland and cocked his head toward the door. Kemke's face was flushed, his eyes shining. The scream was just drifting away. Listen to that music, he said. That's the sound of somebody being reborn. He began to unbuckle his belt and draw it through the many loops of his huge waistband. The images tumbling through Roland's brain were a mixture of funhouse and haunted house. In his mind he was hacking at the wrist of the king's right arm, and as the blade severed the hand a spray of blood-red flowers shot from the wound. A chorus line of mangled corpses in top hats and tuxedos kicked their way down the wrecked corridor of Earth House, he and the king were walking on a superhighway under a sullen scarlet sky, and the trees were made of bones, and the lakes were steaming blood, and half-rotted remnants of human beings sped past in battered cars and tractor-trailer trucks. He was standing on a mountaintop as the gray clouds boiled above him. Below, armies fought with knives, rocks, and broken bottles. A cold hand touched his shoulder, and a voice whispered, "'It can all be yours, Sir Roland.' He was afraid to turn his head and look at the thing that stood behind him, but he knew he must. The power of hideous hallucination forced his head around, and he stared into a pair of eyes that wore army surplus goggles. The flesh of that face was mottled with brown, leprous growths, the lips all but eaten away to reveal misshapen, fanged teeth. The nose was flat, the nostrils wide and ravaged. The face was his own, but distorted, ugly, reeking evil and bloodlust. And from that face his own voice whispered, It can all be yours, Sir Roland, and mine too. Towering over the boy, Freddy Kemka tossed his belt to the floor and began to shimmy out of his polyester trousers. His breathing sounded like the rumbling of a furnace. Roland blinked, squinted up at the fat man, 
The hallucinatory visions were tumbling madly away, but he could still hear the things whisper. He was shaking, couldn't stop. Another vision whirled up from his mind, and he was on the ground, trembling, as Mike Armbruster towered over him, about to beat him to a bloody pulp, as the other high school kids and football jocks shouted and jeered. He saw Mike Armbruster's crooked grin, and Roland felt a surge of maniacal hatred more powerful than anything he'd ever known. Mike Armbruster had already beaten him once, had already kicked him and spat on him as he was sobbing in the dust, and now he wanted to do it all over again. But Roland knew he was far different, far stronger, far more cunning than the little pansy-assed wimp who'd let himself be beaten until he'd peed in his pants. He was a king's knight now, and he'd seen the underside of hell. He was about to show Mike Armbruster how a king's knight gets even. Kemka had one leg out of his pants. He was wearing red silk boxer shorts. The boy was staring up at him, eyes slitted behind those damned goggles, and now the boy began to make a deep animalish sound down in his throat, a cross between a growl and an unearthly moan. Stop that, Kemka told him. That noise gave him the creeps. The boy didn't stop, and the awful sound was getting louder. Stop it, you little bastard! He saw the boy's face changing, tightening into a mask of utter brutal hatred, and the sight of it scared the shit out of Freddy Kemke. He realized that the mind-altering drugs were doing something to Roland Croninger that he hadn't counted on. Stop it! he shouted, and he lifted his hand to slap Roland across the face. Roland leaped forward, and like a battering ram his head plowed into Kemke's bulging stomach. The fat man cried out and fell backward, his arms windmilling. The trailer rocked back and forth, and before Kemka could recover, Roland plowed into him again with a force that sent Kemka crashing to the floor. Then the boy was all over him, punching and kicking and biting. Kemka shouted, "'Lowry, help me!' But even as he said it, he remembered that he had double-bolted the door to keep the boy from escaping. Two fingers jabbed into his left eye and almost ripped it from the socket. A fist crunched into his nose. And Roland's head came forward in a vicious butting blow that hit Kemka full in the mouth, split his lips, and knocked two of his front teeth into his throat. Help me! he shrieked, his mouth full of blood. He hit Roland with a flailing forearm and swiped him off, then flopped over on his stomach and began to crawl toward that locked door. Help me, Lowry! he yelled through his cracked lips. Something went around Kemka's throat and tightened, catching the blood in the fat man's head and reddening his face like an overripe tomato. He realized, panic-stricken, that the lunatic boy was strangling him with his own belt. Roland rode on Kemka's back like Ahab on the white whale. Kemka gagged, fighting to pry the belt loose. The blood pulsed in his head with a force that he feared would blow his eyeballs out. There was a hammering at the door, and Lowry's voice shouted, "'Mr. Kemka, what is it?' The fat man reared up, twisted his shuddering body, and slammed Roland against the wall. But still the boy held on. Kemka's lungs strained for air, and again he threw his body to the side. This time he heard the boy's cry of pain, and the belt loosened. Kemka squalled like a hurt pig, scrabbling wildly toward the door. He reached up to release one of the latches, and a chair smashed him across the back, splintering and shooting agony up his spine. Then the boy was beating at him with a chair leg, hitting him in the head and face, and Kemka screamed, He's gone crazy! He's gone crazy! Lowry pounded at the door. Let me in! Kemka took a dazing blow to the forehead, felt blood running down his face, and he struck out blindly at Roland. His left fist connected, and he heard the breath whoosh out of the boy. Roland collapsed to his knees. Kemka wiped blood out of his eyes, reached up and tried to slide the first bolt back. There was blood on his fingers, and he couldn't get a good grip. Lowry was pounding on the door, trying to force it open. "'He's crazy!' Kemka wailed. "'He's trying to kill me!' "'Hey, you dumb fuck!' the boy snarled behind him. Kemka looked back and whined with terror. Roland had picked up one of the kerosene lamps that illuminated the trailer. He was grinning madly, his goggles streaked with blood. "'Here you go, Mike!' he yelled, and he flung the lamp. It hit the fat man's skull and shattered, dousing his face and chest with kerosene that rippled into flame, setting his beard, hair, and the front of his sport shirt on fire. "'Burning me! Burning me!' Kemka squalled, rolling and thrashing. The door shuddered as Lowry kicked it. 
but the Airstream trailer people had built it to be strong. As Kemka jitterbugged horizontally and Lowry kicked at the door, Roland turned his attention to the rack of rifles and the handguns on their hooks. He had not finished showing Mike Armbruster how a king's night gets even. Oh, no, not yet. He walked around the table and chose a beautiful thirty-eight special with a mother-of-pearl handle. He opened the cylinder and found three bullets inside. He smiled. On the floor the fat man had beaten the fire out. His face was a mass of scorched flesh, burned hair, and blisters, his eyes so swollen he could hardly see. But he could see the boy well enough, approaching him with the gun in his hand. The boy was smiling, and Kemka opened his mouth to scream, but a croak came out. Roland knelt in front of him. The boy's face was covered with sweat, and a pulse beat at his temple. He cocked the thirty-eight and held the barrel about three inches from Kemka's skull. Please, Kemka begged, please, Roland, don't. Roland's smile was rigid, his eyes huge behind the goggles. He said, Sir, Roland, and don't you forget it. Lowry heard a shot. Then about ten seconds later there was a second shot. He gripped the boy's automatic in his right hand and threw his shoulder against the door. It still wouldn't give. He kicked at it again, but the damn thing was stubborn. He was about to start shooting through the door when he heard the bolts being thrown back. The door opened. The boy was standing there, a thirty-eight dangling in his hand. Gore splattered across his face and in his hair. He was grinning, and he said in a fast, excited, drugged voice, "'It's over. I did it. I did it. I showed him how a king's knight gets even. I did it.' Lowry lifted the automatic to blow the boy away. But the twin barrels of a shotgun probed the back of his neck. "'Uh-uh,' Sheila Fontana said. She'd heard the commotion and had come over to see what was happening, and other people were coming through the dark as well, carrying lanterns and flashlights. "'Drop it, or you get dropped.' The automatic hit the ground. "'Don't kill me.' Lowry whimpered. Okay. I just worked for Mr. Kemka. That's all. I just did what he said, okay? Want me to kill him? Sheila asked Roland. The boy just stared and grinned. He's shit-faced, she thought. He's either drunk or stoned. Listen, I don't care what the kid did to Kemka. Lowry's voice cracked. He wasn't anything to me. I just drove for him, just followed his orders. Listen, I can do the same for you if you want. You, the kid, and Colonel Macklin. I can take care of things for you. Keep everybody around here in line. I'll do whatever you say to do. You say jump, I'll ask how high. I showed him I sure did, Roland rattled on, beginning to weave on his feet. I showed him. Listen, you and the kid and Colonel Macklin are the head honchos around here, as far as I can see, Lowry told Sheila. I mean, if Kemka's dead... Let's go take a look, then. Sheila poked his neck with the shotgun, and Lowry eased past Roland into the trailer. They found the fat man crumpled in a bloody heap against one wall. There was the smell of burnt skin in the air. Kemka had been shot through the skull and through the heart at close range. All the guns, the food, and everything are yours now, Lowry said. I just do what I'm told. You just tell me what to do, I'll do it. I swear to God. Drag that fat carcass out of our trailer, then. Startled, Sheila looked toward the door. Macklin stood there, leaning against the door frame, shirtless and dripping. The black overcoat was draped over his shoulders, the stump of his right arm hidden in its folds. His face was pale, his eyes sunken in violet hollows. Roland stood beside him, weaving and swaying, about to collapse. I don't know what the hell happened here. Macklin said, speaking with an effort. But if everything belongs to us now, we're moving into the trailer. Get that thing out of here. Lowry looked stricken. By myself? I mean, he's going to be damned heavy. Either drag him or join him. Lowry went to work. And clean up this mess when you get through, Macklin told him, going over to the rack of rifles and handguns. God, what an arsenal, he thought. He had no idea what had transpired here, but Kemka was dead and somehow they were in control. The trailer was theirs, the food, the water, the arsenal. The whole encampment was theirs. He was stunned, 
still exhausted by the pain he'd endured, but he felt somehow stronger, too, somehow cleaner. He felt like a man again instead of a sniveling, scared dog. Colonel James B. Macklin had been reborn. Lowry had almost manhandled the corpse to the door. I can't make it, he protested, trying to catch his breath. He's too heavy. Macklin whirled around and walked toward Lowry, stopping only when their faces were about four inches apart. Macklin's eyes were bloodshot, and they bored into the other man's with furious intensity. You listen to me, slime, Macklin said menacingly. Lowry listened. I'm in charge here now. Me. What I say goes, without question. I'm going to teach you about discipline and control, mister. I'm going to teach everybody about discipline and control. There will be no questions, no hesitations when I give an order. Or there will be executions, public executions. You care to be the first? No, Lowry said in a small, scared voice. No. What? No, sir, was the reply. Good. But you spread the word around, Lowry. I am going to get these people organized and off their asses. If they don't like my way of doing things, they can get out. Organized? Organized for what? You think there won't come a time when we'll have to fight to keep what we've got? Mister, there are going to be plenty of times we'll have to fight. If not to keep what we have, then to take what we want. We're not any fucking army, Lowry said. You will be, Macklin promised, and he motioned toward the arsenal. You're going to learn to be, mister, and so is everybody else. Now get that piece of shit out of here. Corporal? Huh? Corporal Lowry, that's your new rank. And you'll be living in the tent out there. This trailer is for headquarters staff. Oh, Christ, Lowry thought. This guy's gone wacko. But he kind of liked the idea of being a corporal. That sounded important. He turned away from the colonel and started hauling Kemka's body again. A funny thought hit him, and he almost giggled, but he held it back. The king is dead, he thought. Long live the king. He hauled the corpse down the steps, and the trailer door shut. He saw several men standing around, attracted by all the ruckus, and he began barking orders at them to pick up Freddy Kemke's corpse and carry it out to the edge of the dirt wartland. They obeyed him like automatons, and Judd Lowry figured he might grow to enjoy playing soldiers. Part 7. Thinking About Tomorrow Heads Will Roll, The Straight Jacket Game, Suicide Mission, My People, A Smoky Old Glass, Christian and a Cadillac, Green Froth. Chapter 41. My name is Alvin Mangrum. I'm Lord Alvin now. Welcome to my kingdom. The young blonde madman, sitting on his toilet throne, motioned with a slender hand. Do you like it? Josh was sickened by the smell of death and decay. He, Swan, and Leona were sitting together on the floor of the Kmart's pet department at the rear of the store and the small cages around them were dozens of dead canaries and parakeets, and dead fish lay moldering in their tanks. Beyond a glassed-in display area, a few kittens and puppies were drawing flies. He longed to bash that grinning, blonde-bearded face, but his wrists and ankles were chained and padlocked. Both Swan and Leona were bound by ropes. Around them stood the bald-headed Neanderthal, the man with bulging fish eyes, and about six or seven others. The black-bearded man and the dwarf in the shopping cart lurked nearby, the dwarf clutching Swan's dowsing rod in his stubby fingers. "'I fixed the juice,' Lord Alvin offered, reclining on his throne and eating grapes. "'That's why the lights are on.' His murky green eyes shifted from Josh to Swan and back again. Leona was still bleeding from the gash in her head, and her eyes fluttered as she fought off shock. I hooked a couple of portable generators up to the electrical system. I've always been good with electricity. And I'm a very good carpenter, too. Jesus was a carpenter, you know. He spat out seeds. Do you believe in Jesus? Yes, Josh managed to croak. I do, too. 
I had a dog named Jesus once. I crucified him, but he didn't come back to life. Before he died, he told me what to do to the people in the brick house. Off went their heads. Josh sat very still, looking up into those green, bottomless eyes. Lord Alvin smiled, and for a moment he resembled a choir boy, all draped in purple and ready to sing. I fixed the lights here so we'd attract plenty of fresh meat, like you folks. Plenty of play toys. See, everybody left us at Pathway. All the lights went out, and the doctors went home. But we found some of them, like Dr. Baylor. And then I baptized my disciples in the blood of Dr. Baylor and sent them out into the world, and the rest of us stayed here. He cocked his head to one side, and his smile faded. It's dark outside he said. It's always dark, even in the daytime. What's your name, friend? Josh told him. He could smell his own scared sweat over the odor of dead animals. Josh, Lord Alvin repeated. He ate a grape. Mighty Joshua, blew those old walls of Jericho right fucking down, didn't you? He smiled again and motioned at a young man with slicked back black hair and red paint circling his eyes and mouth. The young man came forward, holding a jar of something. Swan heard some of the men giggle with excitement. Her heart was still pounding, but the tears were gone now, and so was the molasses that had been jamming up her brain gears. She knew these crazy men had escaped from the pathway place, and she knew that death was before her, sitting on a toilet. She wondered what had happened to Mule, and since she'd bumped into the mannequins, she shoved that memory quickly aside. There had been no sight or sound of the terrier. The young man with red paint on his face knelt in front of Josh, unscrewed the lid of the jar, and revealed white grease paint. He got a dab of the stuff on his forefinger and reached toward Josh's face. Josh jerked his head back, but the Neanderthal gripped Josh's skull and held it steady as the grease paint was applied. "'You're going to look pretty, Josh,' Lord Alvin told him. "'You're going to enjoy this.' Through the waves of pain in her legs and the numbing frost of shock, Leona watched the grease paint going on. She realized the young man was painting Josh's face to resemble a skull. "'I know a game,' Lord Alvin said. "'A game called Straight Jacket. I made it up. Know why?' Dr. Baylor said, "'Come on, Alvin. Come get your pill like a good boy. And I had to walk down that long, stinking corridor every day.' He held up two fingers. Twice a day. I'm a very good carpenter, though. He paused, blinking slowly as if trying to get his thoughts back in whack. I used to build dog houses. Not just ordinary dog houses. I built mansions and castles for dogs. I built a replica of the Tower of London for Jesus. That's where they chopped the heads of witches off. The corner of his left eye began ticking. He was silent staring into space as the finishing touches were put to the grease-paint skull that covered Josh's face. When the job was done, the Neanderthal released Josh's head. Lord Alvin finished his grapes and licked his fingers. "'In the straitjacket game,' he said between licks, "'you get taken to the front of the store. The lady and the kids stay here. Now you get a choice. What do you want freed, your arms or your legs? What's the point of this shit?' Lord Alvin waggled an admonishing finger. Arms or legs, Josh? I need my legs free, Josh reasoned. Then, no, I can always hop or hobble. I've got to have my arms free. No, my legs. It was impossible to decide without knowing what was going to happen. He hesitated, trying to think clearly. He felt Swan watching him. He looked at her, but she shook her head, could offer no help. My legs. Josh finally said. Good. That didn't hurt, did it? Again there was a giggle and rustle of excitement from the onlookers. Okay. You get taken up to the front and your legs are freed. Then you get five minutes to make it all the way through the store back here. He pulled up the right sleeve of his purple robe. On his arm were six wristwatches. See? I can keep the time to the exact second. Five minutes from when I say go, and not one second more, Josh.' Josh released a sigh of relief. 
Thank God he'd chosen his legs to be freed. He could see himself crawling and hobbling through the Kmart and this ridiculous farce. Oh, yes, Lord Alvin continued. My subjects are going to try their best to kill you between the front of the store and here. He smiled cheerfully. They'll be using knives, hammers, axes, everything except guns. See, guns wouldn't be fair. Now, don't worry too much. You can use the same things, if you find them, and if you can get your hands on them. Or you can use anything else to protect yourself with, but you won't find any guns out there. Not even a pellet rifle. Isn't that a fun game? Josh's mouth tasted like sawdust. He was afraid to ask, but he had to. What if I don't get back here in five minutes? The dwarf jumped up and down in the shopping cart and pointed the dowsing rod at him like a jester's scepter. Death, 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 he yelled. Thank you, imp, Lord Alvin said. Josh, you've seen my mannequins, haven't you? Aren't they pretty? So lifelike, too. Want to know how we make them? He glanced up at someone behind Josh and nodded. Immediately there was a guttural growl that ascended into a high-pitched whining. Josh smelled gasoline. He already knew what the sound was, and his gut clinched. He looked over his shoulder and saw the Neanderthal, standing there holding a whirring chainsaw that was streaked and clumped with dried gore. "'If you don't beat the clock, friend Josh,' Lord Alvin said, leaning forward, the lady and the child will join my mannequin collection. Their heads will, I mean. He lifted a finger, and the chainsaw rattled to a halt. Heads will roll! Imp jumped and grinned. Heads will roll! Of course, the madman in the purple robe added. If they kill you out there, it won't matter very much, will it? We'd have to find a big body to go along with your head, wouldn't we? Well... Are we ready? Ready, Imp shouted. Ready, the black-bearded brute said. Ready, the others hollered, dancing and capering. Ready. Lord Alvin reached over and took the dowsing rod from Imp. He tossed it to the floor about three feet away. Cross that line, friend Josh, and you shall know wonders. He'll kill us anyway, Josh knew but he had no choice. His eyes met Swan's. She stared at him calmly and resolutely, and she tried to send the thought, I believe in you, to him. He gritted his teeth. Protect the child. Yeah, I've done a damn fine job, haven't I? The black-bearded man and another of the lunatics hauled Josh to his feet. Kick ass, Leona whispered, the pain in her skull all but blinding her. Josh was half carried, half dragged out of the pet department, through the housewares, the sporting goods, and then out along the center aisle to the row of cash registers at the front. A third man was waiting, armed with a double-barreled shotgun and a ring of keys dangling from his belt. Josh was thrown to the floor, the breath whistling between his teeth. Legs, he heard the bearded man say, and the one with the keys bent down to unsnap the padlocks. Josh was aware of a steady roaring noise, and he looked at the windows. A torrential rain was falling, some of it sweeping in through the broken glass. There was no sign of the horse, and Josh hoped it would find a dry place to die in. God help us all, he thought. Though he hadn't seen any of the other maniacs when he was being brought to the front, he knew they were out there in the store, hiding, waiting, getting ready for the game to begin. Protect the child! The rasping voice that had come from Pawpaw's throat was fresh in his mind. Protect the child. He had to get across that line in five minutes, no matter what the crazy shitters threw at him. He would have to use all the moves he remembered from his football days, have to make those rusty knees young again. Oh, Lord, he prayed, if you ever smiled on a dumb fool, show those pearly whites right now. The last padlock was unsnapped, and the chains were removed from Josh's legs. He was pulled to his feet, his wrists still shackled tightly together. The chain curled around his forearms and hands as well. He could open and close his left hand, but the right was balled shut and immobile. 
He looked toward the rear of the Kmart, and his heart lurched. The damned place seemed as long as ten football fields. In the pet department, Swan had laid her head on Leona's shoulder. The woman was breathing erratically, fighting to keep her eyes open. Swan knew Josh was going to do all he could to reach them, but she knew also that he might fail. Lord Alvin was smiling at her beatifically, like a saint's smile on a stained-glass window. He regarded the watches on his wrist, then pointed the electric bullhorn toward the front and blared, Let the straitjacket game start now. Five minutes, friend Josh. Swan flinched and waited for what would be. Chapter 42 Josh jumped at the sound of the bullhorn. Before he could take one stride forward, an arm clamped around his neck from behind and started squeezing. It was old Blackbeard, he realized. Bastards trying to nail me right off. Instinctively, Josh threw his head backward in what was known as a reverse coconut butt in the ring. But this time he let it go full throttle. His skull smacked into Blackbeard's forehead, and suddenly the restraining arm was gone. Josh spun around to finish the job and found Blackbeard sitting on his ass, his eyes glazed and his forehead already purpling. The other lunatic swung the shotgun up. Go, he ordered, and he grinned with green teeth. Josh had no time to waste. He turned and started running full bore along the center aisle. He'd taken six long strides when a baseball bat swung out along the floor and clipped his right ankle. He fell, hit the floor on his belly, and slid another eight feet across the linoleum. Instantly he twisted to face his attacker, who'd been hiding behind a counter of socks and underwear. The man, who wore a red football helmet, rose up and rushed Josh, swinging the bat for a game-ending home run. Josh drew his knees to his chest, kicked out and up, and caught the maniac right in the stomach with both feet, lifting him about four feet in the air. The man came down on his tailbone, and Josh scrambled up to kick him in the groin, as if he were making a fifty-yard field goal. As the man contorted into a shivering ball, Josh got his left hand around the bat and snatched it up. He worked his grip down to the handle, and though he had no real leverage, at least he had a weapon. He turned to continue along the aisle and faced a skinny dude with an axe and another bastard with a blue-painted face who was carrying a sledgehammer. No way, Josh thought, and he darted along one of the other aisles, intending to swing toward the pet department from a different angle. He skidded into a female mannequin, and the brown-haired head tumbled off the shoulders to the floor. Four minutes, friend Josh, Lord Alvin's voice announced. A figure with an upraised butcher knife burst from amid a rack of dresses in Josh's path. Can't stop, Josh knew, unable to lock his knees in time. Instead, he plowed forward, threw himself off his feet in a body block that slammed into the knife wielder and drove him into the dress rack, which collapsed around them. The man struck with the knife, missed, struck again, and snagged the blade in fabric. Josh got astride his chest and brought the bat's shaft down on the man's skull, once, twice, and a third time. The body quivered as if plugged into an electric socket. A stabbing pain hit Josh in the neck. He looked around and saw a dungareed, leering maniac holding a fishing rod. The line was taut between them, and Josh knew there was a hook in his skin. The lunatic fisherman wrenched on the rod as if he were landing a prize marlin, and the hook ripped out of Josh's neck. The rod was snapped again, the hook flashing toward Josh's face, but he ducked it and scrambled out of the dresses, regaining his feet and running for the pet department again. Three minutes left, friend Josh. No, Josh thought. No! The bastard was cheating. Another minute couldn't have passed yet. He sprinted past a well-dressed mannequin in the men's department, but suddenly the mannequin came to life and leapt on his back, fingers clawing at his eyes. He kept running as the man held on, the jagged fingernails carving Josh's cheeks, and ahead of him stood a lean, bare-chested black man with a screwdriver in one hand and a garbage can lid in the other. Josh ran full steam at the waiting assassin, then abruptly stopped, sliding across the floor. He hunched over and spun his shoulders. The man on his back lost his grip and hurtled through the air. But Josh's aim was off. Instead of crashing into the black man, as Josh had hoped, the well-dressed lunatic sailed over a counter full of summer shirts and hit the floor. The black man attacked, moving like a panther. Josh swung the bat, but the garbage can lid was there to deflect it. 
The screwdriver drove in at Josh's stomach. He twisted away, and the weapon grazed his ribs. They fought at close quarters, Josh desperately avoiding the thrusts of the screwdriver and trying vainly to get a good strike with his bat. As they grappled, Josh caught movement on both sides, more of them coming in for the kill. He knew he was finished if he couldn't get away from this crazy bro, because a husky man with garden shears was almost upon him. The black man's teeth snapped at Josh's cheek. Josh saw his opening and dropped to his knees, scooting between the man's legs like a greased pig. When the bro whirled around, he was met by a blow that crumpled his face and knocked teeth through the air. He took two wobbly steps and fell like a tree. Josh kept going, the breath wheezing in his lungs. Two minutes, Lord Alvin crowed. Faster, Josh urged himself. Faster, damn it. The pet department was still so far away, and the son of a bitch was rushing time. Protect the child. Got to protect. A maniac with a white powdered face rose up from behind a counter and slammed a tire iron across Josh's left shoulder. Josh cried out in pain and tumbled into a display of Quaker State oil cans, agony shooting from his shoulder to his fingertips. He'd lost the baseball bat. It was rolling across the aisle, way out of reach. The white-faced madman attacked him, flailing wildly with a tire iron, while Josh fought in a frenzy. The tire iron smashed down beside Josh's head and burst one of the cans open, and then they were fighting like two animals, kill or be killed. Josh caught the man in the ribs with a knee and drove him back, but he leapt in again. They rolled in motor oil across the floor, Josh's opponent squirming like an eel. And then the man was up on his feet. He charged Josh, the tire iron upraised for a blow to the skull. But his shoes slipped out from under him in the oil, and he crashed to the floor on his back. At once Josh got astride him, one knee trapping the tire iron, and the other knee pressed to the man's throat. He lifted both hands and heard himself bellow with fury as he brought the chain down, at the same time putting all his weight on the throat. He felt his knee break through something soft, and the scarlet imprint of the chain was left on the distorted face like a tattoo. Josh struggled to his feet, his lungs heaving. His shoulder pounded with excruciating pain, but he couldn't give in to it. Keep going, he told himself. Move, you fool. A hammer sailed past him, clattering into a display of hubcaps. He slipped, fell to his knees. Blood was in his mouth and crawling down his face, and the seconds were ticking. He thought of the roach on the barn floor, the survivor of insecticides and stomping boots and a nuclear holocaust. If such a thing as that had the will to live, then he damned well did, too. Josh stood up. He ran along the aisle, saw three more figures coming toward him. He jumped over a counter into another aisle. A left turn and a clear aisle lined with housewares, pots and pans stretched before him. And way down at the end of it sat Lord Alvin, watching from his throne. On the wall behind him was the sign, Pets. Josh could see the dwarf jumping up and down in the shopping cart, and Swan's face was turned toward him. Crybaby lay so close, but so far away. One minute, Lord Alvin announced through the bullhorn. I've made it, Josh realized. Dear God, I'm almost there. It can't be more than forty feet to the dowsing rod. He started forward, but he heard the low growl and the rising whine, and the Neanderthal with the chainsaw stepped into the aisle to block his way. Josh stopped with a jolt. The Neanderthal, his bald head shining under the lights, smiled faintly and waited for him, the chainsaw's teeth a blur of deadly metal. Josh looked around for some other way to go. The housewares aisle was an unbroken sweep of kitchen items, glasses and crockery, except for an aisle that turned to the right about ten feet away, and three maniacs guarded that portal, all armed with knives and garden tools. He turned to retrace his path, and about five yards away stood the madman with the fishing rod and the green-toothed lunatic with the shotgun. He saw more of them coming, taking positions to watch the finale of the straitjacket game. The ass is grass, Josh knew. But not just his. Swan and Leona were dead if he didn't reach the finish line. There was no way except through the Neanderthal. Forty seconds, friend Josh. The Neanderthal swiped at the air with the chainsaw, daring Josh to come on. Josh was almost used up. The Neanderthal handled that chainsaw with childish ease. Had they come all this way to die in a damned Kmart full of escaped fruitcakes? Josh didn't know whether to laugh or cry. 
so he just said, Shit. Well, he decided, if they were going to die, he was going to do his best to take the Neanderthal with him. And Josh stood to his full height, swelled out his chest, and let loose a roaring laugh. The Neanderthal grinned, too. Thirty seconds, Lord Alvin said. Josh threw his head back, released a war whoop at the top of his lungs, and then he charged like a runaway Mack truck. The Neanderthal stood his ground, braced his legs, and swung the chainsaw. But Josh suddenly juked back out of range, the chainsaw's breeze brushing his face as it swept past. The other man's ribcage was an open target, and before the Neanderthal could bring the chainsaw back around, Josh kicked those ribs like he was aiming at next week. The man's face scrunched up with pain, and he went back a few feet, but did not go down. Then he was balanced again, and now he was rushing forward, and the chainsaw was coming at Josh's head. Josh had no time to think, just to act. He flung his arms up in front of his face. The saw's teeth hit the chains around his wrists, shooting sparks. The vibration sent Josh and the Neanderthal reeling in opposite directions, but still neither one fell. Twenty seconds, the bullhorn blared. Josh's heart was hammering, but he was strangely calm. It was reached the finish line or not, and that was it. He crouched and warily advanced, hoping to trip the other man up somehow. And then the Neanderthal sprang forward faster than Josh had expected the big man to move, and the chainsaw slashed at Josh's skull. Josh started to leap back, but the chainsaw strike was a feint. The Neanderthal's booted right foot came up and caught Josh in the stomach, knocking him along the aisle. He crashed into the counter of pots, pans, and kitchen tools, clattering around him in a shower of metal. Roll! Josh screamed mentally. And as he whipped aside, the Neanderthal brought the chainsaw down where he'd been lying, carving a foot-long trench across the floor. Quickly, Josh twisted back to the other side and kicked upward, hitting his opponent just under the jawbone. The Neanderthal was lifted off his feet, and then he too crashed into the housewares display. But he kept tight hold of the saw, and started getting to his feet as blood dribbled from both corners of his mouth. The audience hooted and clapped. Ten seconds! Josh was on his knees before he realized what was scattered around him. Not only pots and pans, but an array of carving knives. One with a blade about eight inches long lay right in front of him. He put his left hand around its grip and forced the fingers shut with sheer willpower, and the knife was his. The Neanderthal, his eyes clouded with pain, spat out teeth and what might have been part of his tongue. Josh was on his feet. Come on! he shouted, fainting with the knife. Come on, you crazy asshole! The other man obliged him. He began stalking down the aisle toward Josh sweeping the chainsaw back and forth in a deadly arc. Josh kept moving backward. He glanced quickly over his shoulder, saw the mad fisherman and the shotgun wielder about five feet behind him. In a fraction of a second, he realized that Green Teeth was holding his shotgun in a loose, casual grip. The ring of keys dangled at the man's belt. The Neanderthal was advancing steadily, and when he grinned, blood drooled out. "'You're going the wrong way, friend Josh,' Lord Alvin said. It doesn't matter anyway. Time's up. Come on and take your pill. Kiss my ass, Josh shouted. And then he whirled around in a blur of motion and drove the blade up to the hilt in Green Teeth's chest, just above the heart. As the madman's mouth opened in a shriek, Josh clamped his left hand around the shotgun's trigger guard, wrenching the weapon loose. The man fell to the floor in a spray of arterial blood. The Neanderthal charged. Josh turned in what seemed like nightmarish slow motion. He fought to hold the shotgun steady, trying to get his finger on the trigger. The Neanderthal was almost on him, and the saw was coming up for a vicious, side-swiping slash. Josh braced the butt of the shotgun against his chest, felt the awful breeze of the chainsaw. His finger found the trigger, and he squeezed. The Neanderthal was within three feet, the chainsaw about to bite flesh. But in the next instant... A fist-sized hole opened in his stomach, and half his back blew out. The force of the blast shook Josh and almost knocked the Neanderthal out of his boots. The chainsaw flashed past Josh's face, its weight spinning the dead man like a top along the bloody-floored aisle. "'No fair!' Lord Alvin shouted, jumping up from his throne. "'You didn't play right!' 
The corpse hit the floor, still gripping the chainsaw, and the metal teeth chewed a circle in the linoleum. Josh saw Lord Alvin throw aside the bullhorn and reach into his robes. The madman's hand emerged with an extra gleaming finger, a crescent-bladed hunting knife, like a miniature scythe. Lord Alvin turned upon Swan and Leona. With the shotgun's blast, the other psychos had fled for cover. Josh had one shell left, and he couldn't afford to waste it. He sprinted forward, leaped over the jittering body, and barreled for the pet department, where Lord Alvin, his face contorted with a mixture of rage and what might have been pity, knelt before Swan and grasped the back of her neck with his free hand. "'Death! Death!' Imp shrieked. Swan looked up into Lord Alvin's face and knew she was about to die. Tears burned her eyes, but she lifted her chin defiantly. "'Time to go to sleep,' Lord Alvin whispered. He lifted the crescent blade. Josh slipped on the bloody floor and went down, skidding into a counter six feet short of the dowsing rod. He scrambled to get up, but he knew that he'd never make it. Lord Alvin smiled, two tears rolling from his murky green eyes. The crescent blade was poised, about to fall. Sleep, he said. But a small gray form had already streaked out from behind sacks of dog food and kitty litter, and growling like a hound from hell, it leaped toward Lord Alvin's face. The terrier snapped his teeth around Alvin Mangrum's thin and delicate nose, crunched through flesh and cartilage, and snapped the man's head back. Lord Alvin fell on his side, writhing and screaming, frantically trying to push the animal away, but the terrier kept hold. Josh jumped over Crybaby, saw Swan and Leona still alive, saw the terrier gnawing on Lord Alvin's nose, and the madman flailing with his hunting knife. Josh aimed the shotgun at Lord Alvin's skull, but he didn't want to hit the dog, and he knew he'd need that shell. The terrier suddenly freed Lord Alvin and scrambled back with bloody flesh between his teeth, and planted his paws and let out a fusillade of barks. Lord Alvin sat up, what remained of his nose hanging from his face, and his eyes wide with shock, shrieking, "'Blasphemy! Blasphemy!' He bolted to his feet and ran, still screaming, out of the pet department. Nearby, Imp was the last of Lord Alvin's subjects left in the vicinity. The dwarf was hissing curses at Josh, who lunged over to the shopping cart, spun it around, and sent it flying down the aisle. Imp bailed out a few seconds before it crashed into fish tanks and upended. Alvin Mangrum had left his knife behind, and Josh spent a couple of anxious minutes cutting the ropes loose from Swan and Leona. When Swan's hands were freed, she put her arms around Josh's neck and held tight, her body shaking like a tough sapling in a tornado. The terrier came close enough for Josh to touch and sat back on its haunches, its muzzle scarlet with Lord Alvin's blood. For the first time Josh saw that the dog was wearing a flea collar, and on it was a little metal name tag that said, Killer. Josh knelt over Leona and shook her. The woman's eyelids fluttered, her face slack, a terrible purple swelling around the gash over her left eye. Concussion. Josh realized, or worse. She lifted a hand to touch the smeared grease paint on Josh's face, and then her eyes opened. She smiled weakly. You done good, she said. He helped her up. They had to get out fast. Josh braced the shotgun against his belly and started along the aisle where the Neanderthal lay. Swan retrieved the dowsing rod, grasped Leona's hand, and pulled her forward like a sleepwalker. Still barking, Killer darted ahead. Josh came to Green Teeth's body and took the ring of keys. He'd worry later about which key unlocked his wrist chains. Right now they had to get out of this asylum before Lord Alvin rallied the maniacs. They sensed furtive movements on both sides of the aisle as they continued through the Kmart, but Lord Alvin's subjects had no initiative of their own. Someone threw a shoe, and a red rubber ball came bouncing at them, but otherwise they made the front doors without incident. Cold rain was still pouring down, and within seconds they were drenched. The parking lot lamps cast harsh yellow halos over the abandoned cars. Josh felt the weight of exhaustion creeping up on him. They found their wheelbarrow overturned, their supplies either stolen or scattered. Their bags and belongings were gone, including Swan's Cookie Monster doll. Swan looked down and saw a few of Leona's tarot cards lying on the wet pavement, along with broken shards of her crystal ball collection. Lord Alvin's subjects had left them nothing but the soaked clothes sticking to their bodies. 
Swan glanced back toward the Kmart and felt horror like a cold hand placed to a burn. They were coming out the doors. Ten or eleven figures, led by one in a purple robe that blew around his shoulders. Some of them were carrying rifles. Josh! she shouted. He kept walking about ten feet ahead. He hadn't heard her for the storm. Josh! she shouted again. And then she sprinted the distance between them and whacked him across the back with Crybaby. He spun around, eyes stricken. And then he saw them coming, too. They were thirty yards away, zigzagging between the cars. There was a flash of gunfire, and the rear windshield of a Toyota van behind Josh exploded. Get down! he yelled, shoving Swan to the pavement. He grabbed Leona as more pinpoints of fire sparked. Another car's windshield blew out. But by then, Josh, Swan, and Leona were huddled in the shelter of a blue Buick with two flat tires. Bullets ricocheted, and glass showered around them. Josh crouched, waiting for the bastards to come closer before he reared up and fired the last shell. A hand grasped the shotgun's barrel. Leona's face was drawn and weary, but the heat of life shone in her eyes. She gripped the shotgun firmly, trying to pull it away from him. He resisted, shaking his head. Then he saw the blood that trickled from a corner of Leona's mouth. He looked down. The bullet wound was just below her heart. Leona smiled wanly, and Josh could just make out what she said from the movement of her lips. Go. She nodded toward the far expanse of the rain-swept parking lot. Now, she told him. He'd already seen how much blood she was losing. She knew, too. It was in her face. She wouldn't let go of the shotgun, and she spoke again. Josh couldn't hear her, but he thought it might have been, Protect the child. The rain was streaming down Josh's face. There was so much to say, so much, but neither of them could hear the other over the voice of the storm, and words were flimsy. Josh glanced at Swan, saw that she'd seen the wound, too. Swan lifted her gaze to Leona's, then to Josh's, and she knew what had been decided. No! she shouted. I won't let you! She grabbed Leona's arm. A shotgun blasted the side window of a pickup truck nearby. More bullets hit the truck's door, blew out the front tire, and whined off the wheel. Josh looked into the woman's eyes. He released the shotgun. She pulled it to her and put her finger on the trigger, then motioned for them to go. Swan clung to her. Leona grasped Crybaby and pushed the dowsing rod firmly against Swan's chest, then deliberately pulled her arm free from Swan's fingers. The decision was made. Now Leona's eyes were clouding, the flow of blood fast and fatal. Josh kissed her cheek, hugged her tight to him for a few seconds, and then he mouthed the words, Follow me, to Swan, and started off in a half-crawl, half-crouch between the cars. He couldn't bear to look at Leona again, but he would remember every line in her face until the day he died. Leona ran the fingers of one hand over Swan's cheek and smiled, as if she'd seen the child's inside face and held it like a cameo in her heart. Then Swan saw the woman's eyes go hard, preparing for what was ahead. There was nothing more. Swan lingered as long as she dared before she followed Josh into the maze of vehicles. Leona rose to a crouch. The pain below her heart was an irritating sting compared to her rheumatic knees. She waited, the rain pounding down on her, and she was not afraid. It was time to fly from this body now, time to see clearly what she'd only beheld through a dark glass. She waited a moment longer, and then she stood up and stepped out from behind the Buick, facing the Kmart like a gunfighter at the O.K. Corral. Four of them were standing about six feet away, and behind them were two others. She didn't have time to make sure the one in the purple robe was there. She aimed the shotgun in their midst and pulled the trigger, even as two of the madmen fired their guns at her. Josh and Swan broke from the cover of the cars and ran across the open lot. Swan almost looked back, almost, but did not. Josh staggered, the exhaustion about to drive him down. Off to the side, the terrier kept pace with them, looking like a drowned rat. Swan wiped rain from her eyes. There was motion ahead. Something was coming through the storm. Josh had seen it, too. Couldn't tell what it was. But if the lunatics had circled around them, they were finished. The piebald horse broke from a sweeping curtain of rain, charging toward them. But it didn't appear to be the same animal. This horse looked stronger, somehow more valiant, 
with a straighter back and courage in its forward thrust neck. Josh and Swan both could have sworn they saw mules' hooves striking showers of sparks off the pavement. The horse careened to a stop in front of them, reared and pawed at the air. When the animal came down again, Josh grabbed Swan's arm by his free hand and flung her up onto Mule. He wasn't sure which he was more scared of, riding the horse or facing the madman. But when he dared to look around, he saw figures running through the rain, and he made up his mind right quick. He swung up behind Swan and kicked Mule's ribs with both heels. The horse reared again, and Josh saw the pursuing figures abruptly stop. The one in the lead wore purple, had long, wet, blonde hair, and a mangled nose. Josh had a second to lock stairs with Lord Alvin, the hatred flaming through his bones, and he thought, Some day, you son of a bitch, some day you'll pay. Gunfire leapt. Mule whirled around and raced out of the parking lot as if he were going for the roses in the Kentucky Derby. Killer followed behind, plowing through the storm. Swan gripped hold of Mule's mane to guide him, but the horse was deciding their direction. They sped away from the Kmart, away from the dead town of Matheson, through the rain along a highway that stretched into darkness. But in the last of the light from the lunatic Kmart, they saw a roadside sign that read, Welcome to Nebraska, the corn husker state. They passed it in a blur, and Swan wasn't sure what it had said. The wind blew into her face, and she held Crybaby in one hand and Mule's mane with the other, and they seemed to be cleaving a fiery path through the dark and leaving a sea of sparks in their wake. I don't think we're in Kansas any more, Swan shouted. Damn straight, Josh answered. They raced into the storm, heading toward a new horizon, and a couple of minutes after they'd passed, the terrier came bounding after them. Chapter 43 A wolf with yellow eyes darted in front of the pickup truck. Paul Thorson instinctively hit the brake, and the truck slewed violently to the right, narrowly missing the burned wreckage of a tractor-trailer rig and a Mercedes-Benz in the middle of I-80's westbound lanes before the worn tires gripped pavement again. The truck's engine racketed and snorted like an old man having a bad dream. In the passenger seat, Steve Buchanan stuck the magnum's barrel through the slit of his rolled-down window and took aim. But before he could fire, the animal had vanished into the woods again. "'Jesus H. Christ,' Steve said. Those fuckers are coming out of the woodwork now. This is a suicide mission, man. Another wolf ran in front of the truck, taunting them. Paul could have sworn the bastard smiled. His own face was set like stone as he concentrated on weaving a path through the wreckage. But inside he was lanced by an icy fear of a kind he'd never known. There would not be enough bullets to hold off the wolves when the time came. The people in the truck would look to him for help, but he would fail them. I'm afraid. Oh, dear God, I'm afraid. He picked up the bottle of Johnny Walker Red that sat between himself and the teenager, uncapped it with his teeth, and took a swig that made his eyes water. He handed it to Steve, who drank some courage of his own. For perhaps the hundredth time in the last five minutes, Paul glanced at the gas gauge. The needle was about three hairs shy of the big red E. They'd passed two gas stations in the last fifteen miles, and Paul's worst nightmares were coming true. One of the stations had been razed to the ground, and the other had a sign that said, No gas, no guns, no money, no nothing. The pickup labored west under a leaden sky. The highway was a junkyard of wrecked hulks and frozen wolf-gnawn corpses. Paul had seen a dozen or so wolves trailing them, waiting for us to start walking, he knew. They can smell that tank drying up. Damn it to hell! Why did we leave the cabin? We were safe. We could have stayed there. Forever? he wondered. A gust of wind hit the pickup broadside, and the vehicle shuddered right down to its slick treads. Paul's knuckles turned white as he fought the wheel. The kerosene had run out a day earlier, and the day before that Artie Wisco had begun coughing up blood. The cabin was twenty miles behind them now. They'd passed a point of no return. Everything around them desolate, and as gray as Undertaker's fingers. I should never have listened to that crazy woman, he thought, taking the bottle from Steve. She'll get us all killed yet. Suicide mission, man, Steve repeated, a crooked grin carved across his burned, scarred face. Sister sat beside Artie in the rear of the truck, 
both of them protected from the wind by a blanket. She was holding on to Paul's rifle. He would taught her how to load and fire it, and had told her to blow hell out of any wolves that got too close. The fifteen or so that were following slipped back and forth between the wreckage, and Sister decided not to waste bullets. Nearby, also covered by a blanket, were the Ramses and the old man who had forgotten his name. The old man clutched the shortwave radio, though the batteries had died days ago. Over the engine's racket, Sister could hear Artie's agonized breathing. He held his side, blood flecking his lips, his face contorted with pain. The only chance for him was to find medical help of some kind, and Sister had come too far with him to let him die without a struggle. Sister had one arm around the duffel bag. The previous night she had looked into the shining jewels of the glass circle and seen another strange image, what appeared to be a roadside sign at night, dimly illuminated by a distant glow, that read, Welcome to Matheson, Kansas. We're strong, proud, and growing. She'd had the impression of dream-walking along a highway that led toward a light, reflected off the bellies of low clouds. There were figures around her, but she couldn't quite make out who they were. Then abruptly she'd lost her grip on the vision, and she was back in the cabin sitting in front of a dying fire. She'd never heard of Matheson, Kansas before, if there was really such a place. Looking into the depths of the glass ring caused the imagination to boil like soup in a stockpot. And why should what bubbled out of it have any connection with reality? But what if there was a Matheson, Kansas? she'd asked herself. Would that mean her visions of a desert where a cookie monster doll lay, and of a table where fortune-telling cards were arranged, were also real places? No, of course not. I used to be crazy, but I'm not crazy any more, she'd thought. It was all imagination, all wisps of fantasy that the colors of the glass circle created in her mind. I want it, the thing in its Doyle Hallam disguise had said back in that bloody room in New Jersey. I want it. And I have it, sister thought. Me, of all possible people. Why me? She answered her own question. Because when I want to hold on to something, even the devil himself can't pry it loose, that's why. Going to Detroit, Artie said. He was smiling, his eyes bright with fever. About time I got home, don't you think? You're going to be all right. She took his hand. The flesh was wet and hot. We're going to find some medicine for you. Oh, she's going to be so mad at me, he continued. I was supposed to call her that night. I went out with the boys. Supposed to call her. Let her down. No, you didn't. It's all right. You just be quiet and... Mona Ramsey screamed. Sister looked up. A yellow-eyed wolf the size of a Doberman had scrambled up on the rear bumper and was trying to hitch itself over the tailgate. The animal's jaws snapped wantonly at the air. Sister had no time to aim or fire. She just clubbed the beast's skull with the rifle barrel, and the wolf yelped and dropped back to the highway. It was gone into the woods before Sister could get her finger on the trigger. Four others who had been shadowing the truck scattered for cover. Mona Ramsey was babbling hysterically. Hush, Sister demanded. The young woman stopped her jabbering and gaped at her. You're making me nervous, dear, Sister said. I get very cranky when I'm nervous. The pickup swerved over ice, its right side scraping along the wreckage of a six-car pileup before Paul could regain control. He threaded a passageway between wrecks, but the highway ahead was an auto graveyard. More animals skulked at the edges of the road, watching the pickup rumble past. The gas gauge's needle touched E. We're running on fumes, Paul said, and he wondered how far they could get on the Johnny Walker Red. Hey, look there! Steve Buchanan pointed. To the right, over the leafless trees, was a tall Shell gas station sign. They rounded a curve, and they both saw the Shell station, abandoned, with, Repent, Hell is on Earth, painted in white across the windows. Which was just as well, Paul reasoned, because the off-ramp was blocked by the mangled hulk of a bus and two other crashed vehicles. Good shoes, Artie said in the rear of the truck, 
Sister dragged her gaze away from the message, or warning, on the shell station's windows. Nothing beats a pair of good, comfortable walking shoes. He lost his breath and began coughing, and Sister cleaned his mouth with an edge of the blanket. The pickup truck stuttered. Paul felt the blood drain from his face. Come on, come on. They'd just started up a hill. Its top was about a quarter mile away, and if they could make it, they could coast down the other side. Paul leaned forward against the steering wheel as if to shove the truck the rest of the way. The engine rattled and wheezed, and Paul knew it was about to give up the ghost. The tires kept turning, though, and the truck was still climbing the hill. Come on! he shouted as the engine caught, sputtered, and then died. The tires rolled on about twenty yards, getting slower and slower before the truck stopped. Then the tires began to roll backward. Paul plunged his foot on the brake, pulled up the parking brake, and put the gears into first. The truck halted about a hundred yards from the hilltop. Silence fell. That's that, Paul said. Steve Buchanan was sitting with one hand on the magnum and the other strangling the scotch bottle's neck. What now, man? Three choices. We sit here for the rest of our lives, we go back to the cabin, or we start walking ahead. He took the bottle, got out into the cold wind, and walked around to the tailgate. Tour's over, friends. We're out of gas. He snapped a sharp glance at Sister. You satisfied, lady? We've still got legs. Yeah, so do they. He nodded toward the two wolves that were standing at the edge of the forest, watching intently. I think they'd beat us in a foot race, don't you? How far is it back to the cabin? Kevin Ramsey asked, his arms around his shivering wife. Can we make it before dark? No. He regarded sister again. Lady, I'm one damn fool for letting you talk me into this. I knew the gas stations were going to be shut down. Then why'd you come? Because, because I wanted to believe, even though I knew you were wrong. He sensed motion to his left, saw three more wolves coming through the wrecks on the eastbound lanes. We were safe in the cabin. I knew there wasn't anything left. All the people who passed this way had to be going somewhere, she insisted. You would have sat in that cabin until your ass grew roots. We should have stayed, Mona Ramsey wailed. Oh, Jesus, we're going to die out here. Can you stand up? Sister asked Artie. He nodded. Do you think you can walk? Got good shoes, he rasped. He sat up, pain stitched across his face. Yeah, I think I can. She helped him to his feet, then lowered the tailgate and just about lifted Artie to the pavement. He clutched at his side and leaned against the truck. Sister slung the rifle strap around her shoulder, hefted the duffel bag carefully to the ground, and stepped down from the truck bed. She looked Paul Thorson in the face. We're going that way, she motioned toward the hilltop. Are you coming with us or staying here? Her eyes were the color of steel against her sallow, burn-blotched face. Paul realized that she was either the craziest or toughest mother he'd ever met. There's nothing over there but more nothing. There's nothing where we came from. Sister picked up the duffel bag, and with Artie leaning on her shoulder, started walking up the hill. Give me the rifle, Paul told her. She stopped. The rifle, he repeated. That won't do you a damn bit of good. By the time you get it unslung, you'll be hash. Here, he offered her the bottle. Take a long swig. Everybody gets a drink before we start, and for God's sake, keep those blankets around you. Protect your faces as much as you can. Steve, bring the blanket from the front seat. Come on, hurry it up. Sister drank from the bottle, gave Artie a swallow, and then returned it and the rifle to Paul. We keep together, he told all of them. We stay in a tight group, just like the wagons when the Indians attacked, right? He watched the converging wolves for a moment, lifted the rifle, aimed, and shot one through the side. It fell, snapping, and the others leapt upon it, tearing it to pieces. Okay, Paul said. Let's get on down this damned road. They began walking, the wind whipping around them in vicious cross-currents. 
Paul took the lead, and Steve Buchanan brought up the rear. They'd gone no more than twenty feet when a wolf lunged out from behind an overturned car and shot across their path. Paul raised his rifle, but the animal had already found cover beyond another hulk. "'Watch our backs!' he shouted to Steve. The animals were coming in from all sides. Steve counted eight, scurrying up from the rear. He eased back the magnum's hammer, his heart whacking like a black flag drumbeat. Another wolf ran in from the left, a streak of motion headed for Kevin Ramsey. Paul whirled and fired. The bullet sang off the pavement, but the animal turned away. Instantly two more darted in from the right. "'Look out!' Sister shouted, and Paul turned in time to shatter a wolf's leg with one slug. The animal danced crazily across the highway, before four others dragged it down. He pumped shots at them, and hit two, but the rest fled. "'Bullets!' he called, and Sister dug a handful out of the box he'd given her to carry in her duffel bag. He hastily reloaded, but he'd given his gloves to Mona Ramsey, and his sweaty skin was sticking to the rifle's cold metal. The rest of the bullets went into his coat pocket. They were seventy yards from the top of the hill. Artie leaned heavily on Sister. He coughed blood and staggered, his legs about to fold. "'You can make it,' she said. "'Come on, keep moving.' "'Tired,' he said. He was as hot as a furnace, and he spread warmth to the others gathered around him. "'Oh, I'm so—' A wolf's head lunged from the open window of a burned Oldsmobile at their side, the jaws snapping at Artie's face. Sister jerked him aside, and the teeth came together with a crack that was almost as loud as Paul's rifle shot a second later. The wolf's head spewed blood and brains, and the beast slithered down into the car. "'Tired,' Artie finished. Steve watched two wolves racing in from behind. He lifted the magnum with both hands, his palms slick on the butt, though he was freezing. One of the animals shot off to the side, but the other kept coming. He was just about to fire when it closed within ten feet, snarled, and ran behind a wrecked Chevy. He could have sworn the snarl had spoken his name. There was motion on his left. He started to turn, but he knew he was too late. He screamed as a wolf shape hit him, knocking his legs out from under him. The magnum went off, jumping out of his hands and sliding away across the ice. A large silver-gray wolf at Steve's right ankle and started dragging him toward the woods. "'Help me!' he shouted. "'Help me!' The old man acted faster than Paul. He took three running steps, lifted the shortwave radio between his hands, and smashed it down on the wolf's skull. The radio burst apart in a confetti spray of wires and transistors, and the wolf released Steve's ankle. Paul shot it through the ribs, and it, too, was jumped by three more. Steve limped over to get the magnum, the old man staring horrified at the metallic mess in his hands. Then Steve guided him back to the group, and the old man let the last of the radio fall. Upwards of fifteen wolves were swirling around them, stopping to ravage the dying or wounded. More were coming from the forest. Holy Jesus, Paul thought, as the army of wolves circled them. He took aim at the nearest. A form squirmed out from beneath a car hulk on the side away from his rifle. Paul! Sister shrieked, and she saw the wolf leap for him before she could do or say anything else. He twisted violently around, but he was hit and knocked down under a clawing, snarling weight. The beast's jaws strained for his throat and clamped shut on the rifle that Paul had thrown up to guard his face. Sister had to let go of Artie to rush the wolf, and she kicked the thing in the side with all her strength. The wolf released Paul's rifle, snapped at her foot, and tensed to spring at her. She saw its eyes, maddened, defiant, like the eyes of Doyle Halland. The wolf leaped. There were two cannon-like explosions, and the bullets from Steve's magnum almost tore the wolf in half. Sister dodged aside as the wolf sailed past her, its teeth still snapping and its guts trailing behind it. She drew a breath, turned toward Artie, and saw two wolves hit him at once. No! she shouted as Artie fell. She bashed one of the animals with her duffel bag and knocked it about eight feet across the pavement. The second chewed on his leg and started dragging him. Mona Ramsey screamed and bolted from the group, running past Steve in the direction they'd come. Steve tried to grab her but missed, and Kevin went after her, caught her around the waist and lifted her off her feet, 
just as a wolf sprang from beneath a wreck and trapped her left foot between its teeth. Kevin and the beast pulled Mona in a deadly tug of war, as the woman screamed and thrashed, and more wolves ran out of the woods. Steve tried to fire, but he feared hitting the man or woman. He hesitated, cold sweat freezing to his face, and he was still in a trance when a seventy-pound wolf hit him in the shoulder like a diesel train. He heard the sound of his shoulder breaking, and he lay writhing in pain as the wolf doubled back and began gnawing at his gun hand. The things were everywhere now, darting in and leaping. Paul fired, missed, had a duck a shape that came flying at his head. Sister swung her duffel bag at the wolf that had Artie's leg, struck its skull, and drove it back. Kevin Ramsey had lost the tug of war. The wolf wrenched Mona out of his grasp and was attacked by another that wanted the same prize. They fought as Mona frantically tried to crawl away. Paul fired and hit a wolf that was about to jump Sister from behind, and then claws were on his shoulders, and he was slammed face first into the pavement. The rifle spun away. Three wolves converged on Sister and Artie. The old man was kicking wildly at the animal that was attacking Steve's hand and arm. Sister saw Paul down, his face bleeding, and the beast on top of him trying to claw through his leather jacket. She realized they were less than ten yards from the top of the hill, and this was where they were going to die. She hauled Artie up like a sack of laundry. The three wolves came in slowly, biding their time. Sister braced herself, ready to swing the duffel bag and kick for all she was worth. Over the snarls and shouts, she heard a deep bass growling noise. She glanced toward the hilltop. The sound was coming from the other side. It must be a horde of wolves, racing for their share she realized. Or the monster of all wolves awakened from its lair. Well, come on, she shouted at the three who were creeping up on her. They hesitated, perhaps puzzled by her defiance, and she felt craziness pulling at her mind again. Come on, you motherfu— Its engine growling, a yellow snowplow came over the hilltop, its treads crunching over debris— Clinging to the outside of the glass-enclosed cab was a man in a hooded green parka, and he was carrying a rifle with a sniper scope. Following behind the plow was a white jeep, like the kind used by postmen. Its driver zipped the vehicle around the wrecks, and another man with a rifle leaned out the jeep's passenger side, shouting and firing into the air. The man riding shotgun on the snowplow carefully aimed and squeezed off a shot. The middle of the three wolves dropped and the other two turned tail. The animal on Paul's back looked up, saw the oncoming vehicles, and fled. Another rifle shot sang off the pavement near the two fighting over Mona Ramsey, and they ran for the forest as well. Mona reached her husband and flung her arms around him. The wolf that had made a bloody mess of Steve's arm gave it one last shake and ran as a bullet zipped past its skull. Steve sat up, shouting, "'Fuckers! You fuckers!' in a high, hysterical voice. The white jeep skidded to a halt in front of Paul, who was still struggling to get the air back in his lungs. He got to his knees, his jaw and forehead scraped raw, and his nose broken, gushing blood. The driver and the man with the rifle stepped out of the postman's jeep. On the snowplow, the sharpshooter was still popping off bullets at the wolves heading into the woods, and he hit three of them before the highway was cleared of living animals. The jeep's driver was a tall, ruddy-cheeked man who wore dungarees under a fleece-lined coat. On his head was a cap that advertised Stroh's Beer. His dark brown eyes shifted back and forth over the tattered group of survivors. He looked at all the dead and dying wolves, and he grunted. Then he reached work-weathered fingers into a pocket of his dungarees, withdrew something, and offered it to Paul Thorson. Gum? he asked. Paul looked at the pack of Wrigley Spearmint and had to laugh. Sister was stunned. She walked past the white jeep, still bearing Artie's weight on her shoulder. Artie's shoes scraped on the pavement. She walked past the snowplow and reached the top of the hill. Off to the right, through dead trees, smoke was rising from the chimneys of wood-framed houses on the streets of a small village. She saw the steeple of a church, saw United States Army trucks, parked on a softball field, saw a Red Cross banner hanging from the side of a building, saw tents and cars and campers by the thousands scattered in the village streets or through the hills around it. 
A roadside sign just over the hilltop announced, Homewood, next exit. Artie's body began to slide to the ground. No, she said very firmly, and she held him standing with all her strength. She was still holding him up when they came to help her to the white jeep. Chapter 44 By the light of an oil lamp, Colonel Macklin admired himself in the mirror of the Airstream trailer's bathroom. The gray-green Nazi uniform was a bit tight around the chest and midsection, but the sleeves and trouser legs were long enough. At his waist was a black leather holster and a loaded luger. On his feet were Nazi hobnailed boots. Again, just a bit too small, but Macklin was determined to make them do. Medals and ribbons adorned the uniform's jacket, and though Macklin didn't know what any of them were for, he thought they looked very impressive. The closet and the pigsty of the late Freddy Kemke's bedroom had been full of Nazi uniforms, flak jackets, boots, holsters, and the like. A Nazi flag was fixed to the wall over the bed, and a bookcase held volumes such as The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, Military Strategy and Maneuver, Medieval Warfare, and A History of Torture. Roland had gotten hold of the books and had been devouring them with pure passion. Sheila Fontana slept in the other bedroom, staying mostly to herself, except when Macklin needed her. She seemed content to do her duty, though she lay cold and unmoving, and several times Macklin had heard her cry out in the night, as if waking up from a dark dream. During the few days they'd occupied the trailer, Macklin had made a thorough inventory of what Freddy Kemka had collected. There was enough junk food and soft drinks to feed an army, plenty of bottled water and canned food as well, but Macklin and Roland were most interested in the weapons. Kemka's bedroom was an arsenal of machine guns, rifles, pistols, a crate of flares, smoke grenades and fragmentation grenades, and boxes and bags and clips of ammunition scattered around like gold in a royal treasure house. The shadow soldier didn't have to tell Macklin that he had found paradise. Macklin regarded his face in the mirror. His beard was growing out, but it was so gray it made him look old. Kemka had left a straight razor behind, and Macklin decided he would give himself a shave. Also, his hair was too long and scraggly. He preferred the close-cropped military look. Kemka had also left a pair of scissors that would do the job very well. He leaned forward, staring into his own eyes. They were still deep-sunken and bore the memory of the pain that had ripped through his wound in the Great Salt Lake, a pain so soul-shattering that it had sloughed away the old dead skin that had confined him for so long. He felt new, reborn, and alive again, and in his icy blue eyes he saw the Jimbo Macklin that used to be, back in the days when he was young and fast. He knew the Shadow Soldier was proud of him, because he was a whole man again. He did miss his right hand, but he was going to learn how to use a machine gun or a rifle just as effectively with the left. After all, he had all the time in the world. The wound was bound up with strips of bedsheet, and it was still draining, but the heaviness was gone. Macklin knew the salt water had burned the infection out. He thought he looked very handsome, very, yes, kingly, in the Nazi uniform. Maybe it had been a German colonel's uniform, he mused. It was in fine shape, just a few moth holes in the silk lining. Kemka obviously had taken great care of his collection. There seemed to be more lines in his face, but something about that face was wolfish and dangerous. He figured he'd lost twenty-five pounds or more since the disaster at Earth House. Still, there was just one small thing about his face that bothered him. He lifted his hand and touched what seemed to be a brown scab, about the size of a quarter, just under his left eye. He tried to peel it off, but it was melted tightly to the skin. On his forehead were four dime-sized scabs that he had at first taken for warts, but those couldn't be peeled off either. Maybe it's skin cancer, he thought. Maybe the radiation caused it. But he'd noticed a similar scab-like growth, also the size of a dime, on Roland's chin. Skin cancer, he thought. Well, he would take the straight razor and slice them off when he shaved, and that would be the end of it. 
His hide was too tough for skin cancer. But it was strange, he thought, that the little round scabs were only on his face, not his hands or his arms or anywhere else, just his face. He heard a knock on the trailer door, and he left the bathroom to answer it. Roland and Lowry, both carrying rifles, had returned from the recon mission they'd been on with three other able-bodied soldiers. Last night one of the perimeter sentries had seen the flicker of lights to the south, three or four miles across the desert. Two trailers, Lowry reported, trying not to stare too hard at the Nazi uniform the colonel wore. Kemka had always been too fat to squirm into it. Pulled by a Chevy van and a Pontiac. All the vehicles look in pretty good shape. How many people? Macklin asked, opening one of the jugs of bottled water and offering it to Lowry. We saw sixteen people, Roland told him. Six women, eight men, and two children. They seem to have plenty of gas, food, and water, but all of them are burn-scarred. Two of the men can hardly walk. They have guns? Yes, sir. Roland took the jug of water from Lowry and drank. He thought the uniform looked wonderful on the king, and he wished there had been one his size to wear. He couldn't remember much of what had happened that night with Freddy Kemke, but he recalled having a vivid dream in which he killed Mike Armbruster. One of the men had a rifle. Just one rifle? Why do you think they haven't come here? You know they've seen our lights. They might be afraid, Roland said. They might think we'll take what they have. Macklin took the jug back, recapped it, and set it aside. A door opened and closed, and Sheila Fontana walked through the corridor into the room. She stopped short when she saw the uniform. We could use the trailers and the vehicles, Macklin decided. But we don't need anybody with burn marks. I don't want anybody with burn marks in our camp. Colonel, there are already about thirty or more people here who were burned in, you know— Lowry said. I mean, what does it matter? I've thought a lot about this, Corporal Lowry, he replied, and though he had not, it sounded impressive. I think people with burn marks, keloids, he said, remembering the technical term of atomic-induced burns, are detrimental to the morale of our camp. We don't need to be reminded of ugliness, do we? And people with burn marks are not going to keep themselves as clean as the rest of us, because they're ashamed of the way they appear, and they're already demoralized. He found himself staring at the scab on Roland's chin. It was the size of a quarter. Hadn't it been smaller just a few days ago? His gaze shifted. There were three other small scabs at Roland's hairline. People with burns are going to be disease spreaders, he told Corporal Lowry. He looked over Lowry's face, but saw none of the scabs. We're going to have enough trouble as it is, keeping disease out of our camp. So, in the morning I want you to round up the ones with the burn scars and take them out of the camp. I don't want them returning, understand? Lowry started to smile, because he thought the colonel was kidding. But Macklin's blue eyes bored into him. Sir, you don't mean kill all of them, do you? Yes, that's what I mean. But why not just banish them? I mean, tell them to go somewhere else. Because, Roland Croninger, who saw to the heart of the matter, said, they won't go anywhere else. At night they'll slip back into the camp and try to steal food and water. They might help the dirt warts attack us. Right, Macklin agreed. So that's the new law of this camp. No one is admitted who has burn marks and you will take those others out in the morning, and they will not come back. Roland will go with you. I can do it myself. Roland will go with you, Macklin said, quietly but firmly, and Judd Lowry looked at the floor. Now another thing. I want you to organize a work detail in the morning and distribute some of this to my people. He nodded toward the cartons of soft drinks, potato chip bags, cookies, and cakes, my people, he realized he'd said. I want them to be happy. Do that after you've finished the first duty. What about those people with the trailers out there? Macklin deliberated. Oh, he thought, the shadow soldier was going to be so proud of him. 
How many soldiers do you need to go out and take those vehicles? he asked. I don't know. Maybe four or five, I guess. Good. Then go out and bring them back, but not the people. We don't need people who aren't healthy. What do we need the trailers for? Sheila asked. We're okay as we are. She couldn't bear to look at Judd Lowry's face because he haunted her nightmares along with an infant that kept crying. A decayed corpse named Rudy crawled through the dust in her dreams right up into her bed, and she thought she was going crazy. Because, Macklin said, turning toward her, we're not going to stay here forever. As soon as we get organized and healthy, as soon as we get our morale high, we're moving out. Moving out? She laughed. Moving to where, war hero? The fucking moon? No, across the country. Maybe east. We can forage as we go. You mean everybody moving east? What the hell for? Where is there to go? The cities, Macklin answered. Or what's left of them. The towns, the villages. We can build our own cities, if we please. We can start to put things back together again. Like they should have been in the first place, before this shit happened. You've cracked, friend, Sheila said. It's over. Can't you dig it? It's not over. It's just beginning. We can build things back, but better than they were. We can have law and order. And we can enforce the laws. What laws? Yours? The kids? Who's going to make the laws? The man with the most guns, Roland said. Colonel Macklin turned his attention back to Judd Lowry. You're dismissed, he said. Have the trailers here within two hours. Lowry left the trailer. Outside he grinned at the night sky and shook his head. The soldier shit had gone to the colonel's brain. But maybe he was right about getting rid of everybody who had burn scars. Lowry didn't like looking at those burns and being reminded of the Holocaust anyway. The burn marks were ugly. Keep America beautiful, he thought. Kill a Scarface today. He walked on into the camp to select four men for the mission, but he knew it would be a piece of cake. He'd never felt so important in his life. Before the disaster, he'd just been a clerk in a gun store, and now he was a corporal in Colonel Macklin's army. This was like waking up in a new skin. It's not over, Colonel Macklin had said. It's just beginning. Lowry liked the ring of that. In the Airstream trailer, Sheila Fontana approached Macklin and looked him up and down. She saw the Nazi swastika on several of the badges he was wearing. What are we going to start calling you? Adolf? Macklin's hand came out and caught her chin. His eyes flared angrily, and she realized she'd gone too far. The strength in that hand felt like it was about to crack her jaw. If you don't like something here he told her quietly. You know where the door is, and if you don't watch your mouth, I'll throw you to the dirt warts. Oh, I'm sure they'd love to have company. Aren't you, Roland? Roland shrugged. He could see that the king was hurting Sheila, and that bothered him. Macklin released her. You're a fool, he said. You don't see what could be, do you? Sheila rubbed her jaw. Man, the game is done. You're talking rebuilding and all that crap? We're lucky to have a pot to piss in. You'll see. His gaze searched her face for the small scabs. I've got plans, important plans. You'll see. He found no evidence of the cancers on Sheila's face. She'd noted his roving eyes. What's wrong? I washed my hair yesterday. Wash it again, he said. It stinks. He looked at Roland. A sudden inspiration struck him. "'The Army of Excellence,' he said. "'How does that sound?' "'Fine.' Roland liked it. There was a sweeping, grand Napoleonic sound to it. "'It's good.' "'The Army of Excellence,' Macklin repeated. "'We've got a long way to go. We're going to have to find more able-bodied men and women. We'll need more vehicles, and we'll have to carry our food and water with us. We can do it if we put our minds and our muscle to the job. His voice rose with excitement. We can build things back, but better than they ever were. Sheila thought he was off his bird. The army of excellence, my ass. But she held her tongue, figuring it was best to just let Macklin blow off steam. 
People will follow me, he continued. As long as I give them food and protection, they'll follow me, and they'll do whatever I say. They don't have to love me. They don't even have to like me. But they'll follow me all the same, because they'll respect me. Isn't that right? he asked Roland. Yes, sir, the boy answered. People want to be told what to do. They don't want to make the decisions. Behind his goggles, Roland's eyes had begun to glint with excitement as well. He could see the vast picture the king was painting, a massive army of excellence, moving across the land on foot, in cars, and in trailers, overrunning and absorbing other encampments and communities, swelling stronger, but only with healthy, unmarked men and women who are willing to rebuild America. He grinned. Oh, what a game of King's Night this had turned out to be. People will follow me, Colonel Macklin said, nodding. I'll make them follow me. I'll teach them all about discipline and control, and they'll do anything I say, right? His eyes blazed at Sheila. She hesitated. Both the war hero and the kid were watching her. She thought of her warm bed, all the food and the guns that were here, and then she thought of the cold dirt wart land and the things that slithered in the dark. Right, she said. Anything you say. Within two hours, Lowry and his raiding party returned with the Chevy van, the Pontiac, and the two trailers. The small camp was taken by surprise, and there had been no wounds or casualties to Macklin's army of excellence. Lowry delivered several knapsacks full of canned goods and more bottled water, plus three cans of gasoline and a carton of engine oil. He emptied his pockets of wristwatches, diamond rings, and a money clip full of twenties and fifties. Macklin let him keep one of the watches and told him to distribute extra rations to the rest of the raiding party. The largest of the diamond rings he offered to Sheila Fontana, who stared at it for a moment as it glittered on Macklin's palm, and then took it from him. It was inscribed, From Daniel to Lisa, Love Forever. Only after she had put it on and was admiring it by lamplight did she realize that grains of dried blood were stuck down in the setting, giving the diamonds a dirty cast. Roland found a road map of Utah on the rear floorboard of the Buick, and from the glove compartment he retrieved several flare pens and a compass. He gave all the booty to the king, and Macklin rewarded him with one of the medals adorned with the swastika. Roland immediately pinned it on his shirt. In the lamplight, Colonel Macklin spread the road map out on the table in his command headquarters and sat down to study it. After a few moments of silent deliberation, he picked up a red flare pen and began to draw a jagged arrow pointing east. "'My main man,' the shadow soldier said, leaning over Macklin's shoulder. And in the morning, under thick gray clouds, scudding slowly eastward, Roland and Lowry and ten hand-picked soldiers escorted thirty-six burn-scarred men, women, and children out to the edge of the dirt wart land. After the shooting was over, the dirt warts emerged from their holes and scuttled forward to claim the corpses. Chapter 45 Swan and Josh had been following the railroad tracks through a Nebraska dust storm for three days when they found the wrecked train— they didn't see the train until they were almost upon it, and then there it was, railroad cars scattered everywhere, some of them riding piggyback. Most of the cars were broken to pieces, except for a caboose and a couple of freight cars. Swan slid down off Mule, following Josh as he walked carefully over the debris. "'Watch out for nails,' he warned her, and she nodded. Killer had been turned the color of chalk by all the dust— and he advanced before Josh, sniffing warily at the splintered planks under his paws. Josh stopped, shielding his eyes from the dust with one hand, and he looked up at the side of a freight car. The storm had almost scoured all the paint off, but he could still make out a faded panorama of clowns, lions, and three rings under a big top. Scrolled red letters spelled out, Rydell Circus, Incorporated. It's a circus train he told Swan, probably going somewhere to set up when it got knocked off the tracks. He motioned toward the caboose. Let's see what we can find. For the past three nights they'd slept in barns and deserted farmhouses, and once the railroad tracks had taken them to the outskirts of a moderate-sized town, but the wind brought such a smell of decay from the town 
that they dared not enter it. They'd circled the town, picking up the tracks on the other side and continuing across the open plains. The caboose's door was unlocked. It was gloomy within, but at least it was shelter. Josh figured both the horse and terrier could fend for themselves, and he stepped in. Swan followed, closing the door behind her. Josh bumped into a small desk, making little bottles and jars clink. The air was warmer the further he went, and he made out the shape of a cot to his right. His groping fingers touched warm metal, a cast-iron freestanding stove. "'Somebody's been here,' he said. "'Hasn't been gone very long, either.' He found the grate and opened it. Inside, a few coals had burned down to ashes, and an ember glowed like a tiger's eye. He continued to feel his way around the caboose, almost tripping over a bundle of blankets lying in a corner, and made his way back to the desk. His eyes were getting used to the dim yellow murk that came through the caboose's filmy windows, and he discovered a half-burned candle stuck with wax to a saucer. Near it was a box of kitchen matches. He struck one and lit the candle's wick, and the light spread. Swan saw what appeared to be crayons and lipsticks atop the desk. A curly red wig sat on the wig stand. In front of the desk's folding metal chair was a wooden box about the size of a shoebox, decorated with little intricately carved lizards. Their tiny eyes were formed of multifaceted glass, and they sparkled in the candlelight. Next to the cot, Josh found an open bag of gravy-trained dog food and a plastic jug that sloshed when he nudged it with his foot. Swan stepped closer to the stove. On a wall rack were gaudy suits with spangles, oversized buttons, and floppy lapels. There was a pile of newspapers, shards of timber and coals ready for the fire. She looked toward the far corner, where the bundle of blankets lay, except there was something else over there, too, something only half covered by the blankets. Josh, she pointed. What's that? He brought the candle over. The light fell on the rigid smile of a clown's face. At first Josh was startled, but then he realized what it was. A dummy. It's a life-size dummy. The thing was sitting up with white grease paint on its face and bright red lips. A green wig was perched on its scalp, and its eyelids were closed. Josh leaned forward and poked the dummy's shoulder. His heart kicked. He gingerly touched the thing's cheek and smeared off some of the grease paint. Under it was sallow flesh. The corpse was cold and stiff, and had been dead at least two or three days. Behind them the caboose door suddenly swung open, letting in a whirlwind of dust. Josh spun around, stepping in front of Swan to shield her from whoever or whatever was coming in. He saw a figure standing there, but dust in his eyes blinded him. The figure hesitated, and one hand was a shovel. There was a long, tense silence, and then the man in the doorway said, Howdy, in a thick western drawl. You folks been here long? He closed the door, shutting off the storm. Josh watched him warily as the man walked across the caboose, his cowboy boots clomping on the planked floor, and leaned the shovel against a wall. Then the man untied a bandana from around his nose and mouth. Well, can you two speak English? Or am I going to have to do all the talking? He paused a few seconds, then answered himself in a high, mocking voice. Yes, sir, we surely do speak English, but our eyeballs are about to bug out of our heads, and if we flap our tongues, they'll go flying out like fried eggs. He pronounced it eggs. We can speak, Josh replied. It's just, you surprised us. Reckon I did. But the last time I walked out that door, Leroy was alone, so I'm a mite surprised myself. He took off his cowboy hat and swatted it against one denim-covered thigh. Dust welled into the air. That's Leroy. He motioned toward the clown in the corner. Leroy Satterwaite. He died a couple nights ago and he was the last of them. I've been out digging a hole for him. The last of them? Josh prompted. Yep, last of the circus people. One of the best clowns you ever laid your eyes on. Man, he could have made a stone crack a grin. 
He sighed and shrugged. Well, it's over now. He was the last of them. Except me, you mean. Josh stepped toward the man and held the candle and saucer out to illuminate his face. The man was thin and lanky, his scraggly, grizzled face as long and narrow as if it had been pressed in a vice. He had curly, light brown hair spilling over his high forehead almost to his bushy brown eyebrows. Beneath them his eyes were large and liquid, a shade between hazel and topaz. His nose was long and thin, in keeping with the rest of him, but it was the mouth that was the centerpiece of his face. The lips were thick, rubbery folds of flesh, designed to pull miraculous mugs and grins. Josh hadn't seen such a pair of lips since he'd been served a big mouth bass in a restaurant in Georgia. The man wore a dusty denim jacket, obviously much used and abused, a dark blue flannel shirt and jeans. His lively, expressive eyes moved from Josh to Swan, lingered a few seconds, then returned to Josh. "'Name's Rusty Weathers,' he said. "'Now who in blazes are you, and how do you get out here?' "'My name is Josh Hutchins, and this is Swan Prescott. "'We haven't had any food or water in three days. Can you help us?' Rusty Weathers nodded toward the plastic jug. "'Help yourselves. That's water from a creek a couple of hundred yards from the tracks. "'Can't say how clean it is, but I've been drinking it for about—' "'He frowned, walked over to the wall, and felt for the notches he'd carved there with his penknife. "'He ran a finger along them. Forty-one days, give or take. Josh opened the jug, sniffed at it, and took a tentative swallow. The water tasted oily, but otherwise okay. He drank again and gave the jug to Swan. Only food I've got left is gravy train, Rusty said. Fella and his wife had a dog act. Jumped French poodles through hoops and all. He plopped the cowboy hat on top of the red wig, pulled the folding chair to him, turned it around, and sat down with his arms crossed on the backrest. "'Been a time, I'll tell you. Train was moving pretty as you please one minute. The next minute the sky looked like the inside of a mine shaft, and the wind started whipping cars right off the tracks. We get twisters back in Oklahoma, but damned if this wasn't the granddaddy of them all!' He shook his head, rattling loose the memories. "'You got any cigarettes?' "'No, sorry.' Damn! Man, I could just about eat a carton of smokes right now. He narrowed his eyes, examining both Josh and Swan in silence. You two look like you've been stomped by a few dozen Brahma bulls. You hurtin'? Not any more, Josh said. What's going on out there? There ain't been another train along this track in forty-one days. The dust just keeps on blowing. What's happening? Nuclear war. I think the bombs fell just about everywhere. Probably hit the cities first. From what we've seen so far, I don't think there's much left. Yeah. Rusty nodded, his eyes vacant. I kind of figured it must be that. A few days after the wreck, me and some of the others started walking, trying to find help. Well, the dust was a lot thicker and the wind stronger back then, and we made it about fifty feet before we had to come back. So we sat down to wait. But the storm didn't stop, and nobody came. He stared at a window. Nicky Rinaldi, the lion tamer, and Stan Timbrello decided to follow the tracks. That was a month ago. Leroy was busted up inside, so I stayed here with him and Roger. All of us were clowns, you see. The Three Musketeers. Oh, we put on a good show. We really made him laugh. His eyes teared up suddenly, and it was a moment before he could speak again. Well, he said finally, me and the others who were left started digging graves. The wreck killed a lot of folks outright, and there were dead animals all over the place. Dead elephants lined up the tracks a ways, but he's all dried up now. Man, you couldn't believe what that smelled like. But who in hell has got the strength to dig a grave for an elephant? We got a regular circus cemetery not too far from here. He nodded vaguely off to the right. 
dirt softer once you get away from the tracks. I had managed to find some of my gear, and I moved in here with Leroy, Roger, and a few of the others. Found my makeup case. He touched the wooden box with its carved, creeping lizards. Found my magic jacket, too. A finger hooked toward the rack where the clothes hung. I wasn't hurt too bad. Just bruises on bruises. And this. He lifted that big upper lip to display the space where a front tooth had been knocked out. But I was okay. Then everybody started dying. He sat looking at the candle. It was the damnedest thing, he said. People who were fine one day were dead the next. One night, his eyes glazed over like pond ice, and the memories had him again. One night, we were all sleeping, and I woke up cold. The stove was going and the caboose was warm, but I was shivering, and I swear to God, I knew the shadow of death was here, moving from person to person, figuring out who to take next. I think whatever it was passed near enough to me to freeze my bones, and then it moved on, and when daylight came, Roger was dead with his eyes open, and he'd been telling jokes the day before. You know what that crazy Leroy says? He says, Rusty, let's you and me put a happy face on that some bitch before we send him off. So we painted him up. But it wasn't a disrespectful thing. Oh, no. Rusty shook his head. We loved that old scudder. We just gave him the face he was most comfortable wearing. Then me and Eddie Roscoe carried him out and buried him. Seems like I helped dig a hundred graves in a week's time until it was just me and Leroy. He smiled faintly, looking past Swan and Josh into the corner. Looking good, old buddy. Hell, I thought I'd been the one long gone before now. There's no one else here but you? Swan asked. Just me. I'm the last of the Rydell Circus. He looked at Josh. Who won? Who won what? The war. Who won the war, us or the Russians? I don't know. If Russia looks anything like what Swan and I have seen, God help those people, too. Well, you got to fight fire with fire, Rusty said. That's something my mama used to tell me. Fight fire with fire. So maybe there's one good thing about this. Maybe everybody shot all their bombs and missiles off, and there ain't any more. The fires just fought it out. And the old world's still here, ain't it? Yes, Josh agreed. The world's still here, and so are we. I reckon the world's going to be a might change, though. I mean, if everywhere's like here, I believe the luxuries of life are going to be suffering some. Forget luxuries, Josh told him. This caboose and that stove are luxuries, friend. Rusty grinned, showing the hole where his tooth had been. Yep, I got a real palace here, don't I? He gazed at Swan for a few seconds, then got up, went to the rack, and took from its hanger a black velvet suit jacket. He winked at her, shrugged out of his denim jacket, and put on the one made of black velvet. In the breast pocket was a white handkerchief. I'll tell you what's still here, too. Something that'll never change, little lady. Magic. You believe in magic, hun? Yes, she said. Good. He whipped the white handkerchief out, and suddenly there was a bouquet of brightly colored paper flowers in his hand. He offered them to Swan. You look like a lady who might appreciate some pretty flowers. Of course, we'd better water them, too. If flowers don't get their water, they might just swoon away. He thrust his other hand forward, snapped his wrist in the air, and he was holding a small red plastic pitcher. He tipped it over the flowers. But instead of water... A trickle of yellow dust came out and floated to the floor. Oh, Rusty said, feigning disappointment. Then his eyes brightened. Well, maybe that's magic dust, little lady. Sure, magic dust will keep flowers alive just as good as water will. What do you think? Even though the corpse in the corner gave her the creeps, Swan had to smile. Sure, she said. I bet it will, too. Rusty waved his slim hand in the air before Swan's face. 
She suddenly saw a red ball appear between the first and second fingers, and then another ball seemingly grew between his thumb and forefinger. He took one ball in each hand and began tossing them up in the air from hand to hand. "'Think we're missing something, don't you?' he asked her, and when the balls were in mid-air he reached with his right hand toward Swan's ear. She heard a soft pop, and his hand withdrew with a third red ball. He juggled the three of them back and forth. "'There you go. Knew I'd find that thing somewhere.' She felt her ear. "'How'd you do that?' "'Magic!' he explained. He plopped one ball in his mouth, then the second and third. His empty hand caressed the air, and Swan saw Rusty's throat gulp as he swallowed the balls. "'Mighty tasty,' he said. "'Want to try him?' He offered his palm to her. In it were the three red balls. "'I saw you eat them!' Swan exclaimed. "'Yep, I did. These are three more. That's what I've been living on, see? Gravy train and magic balls.' His smile faltered, began to fade. His eyes flickered over toward the corpse, and he put the three balls in his pocket. "'Well,' he said, "'I reckon that's enough magic for one day.' "'You're pretty good,' Josh said. "'So you're a clown, a magician, and a juggler. What else do you do?' "'Oh, I used to ride broncos in the rodeos.' He took off the velvet jacket and hung it up like putting an old friend to bed. "'Used to be a rodeo clown. Used to short-order cook in a carnival. Worked on a cattle ranch once. Jack of all trades and master of none, I reckon. But I've always loved magic. Hungarian magician named Fabrioso took me under his wing when I was sixteen and taught me the craft back when I was shilling with the carny. Said I had hands that could either pick pockets or pull dreams out of the air. Rusty's eyes danced with light. That Fabrioso was something else, I'll tell you. He talked to the spirits, and they sure enough answered him and did what he said, too. Is this magic, too? Swan touched the wooden box covered with lizards. That was Fabrioso's box of tricks. I keep my makeup and stuff in it now. Fabrioso got it from a magician in Istanbul. Know where that is? Turkey. And that magician got it from one in China, so I reckon it kind of has a history. Like Crybaby does, Swan said, and she held up the dowsing rod. Crybaby? That's what you call that dowser? A woman. Josh hesitated. The loss of Leona Skelton was still too raw. A very special woman gave that to Swan. Did Fabrioso give you the magic jacket? Swan asked. No, nah, I bought that in a magic store in Oklahoma City. But he gave me the box and one other thing. He unlatched and opened the carved box. Inside were jars, crayons, and rags smeared with a thousand colors. He dug down toward the bottom. Fabrioso said this came with the box in a set, so it was right that it went where the box did. Here it is. He withdrew his hand. In it was a simple oval mirror framed in black with a scuffed black handle. There was only one ornamentation. Where the handle was attached to the mirror were two small black mask-like faces peering in opposite directions. The glass was a smoky color, streaked and stained. Fabrioso used this to put on his stage makeup. There was a note of awe in Rusty's voice. He said it showed a truer picture than any mirror he'd ever looked into. I don't use it, though. The glass has gone too dull. He held it out to Swan, and she took it by the handle. The thing was as light as a buttermilk biscuit. Fabrioso was ninety when he died, and he told me he got the mirror when he was seventeen. I'll bet it's two hundred years old if it's a day. Wow. Something that old was beyond Swan's comprehension. She peered into the glass, but could see her face there only dimly, as if through a curtain of mist. Even so, the burn marks still jarred her, and there was so much dust on her face she thought she resembled a clown herself. She was never going to get used to not having hair, either. She looked closer. On her forehead were two more of those strange, dark, wart-like things she'd noticed at Leona's. 
had those always been there, or had they just come up? I guess Fabrioso was kind of vain, Rusty admitted. I used to catch him looking in that mirror all the time, except he was usually holding it at arm's length like this. He stuck his own hand in front of his face as if his palm was a looking-glass. Swan thrust her arm out. The mirror was aimed at the left side of her face and her left shoulder. Now her head was only an outline in the glass. I can't see myself like— There was a movement in the glass, a quick movement, and not her own. A face with an eye in the center of its head, a gaping mouth where the nose should have been, and skin as yellow as dried-up parchment paper rose behind her left shoulder like a leprous moon. Swan dropped the mirror. It clinked to the floor, and she spun around to her left. There was no one there, of course. Swan? Rusty had gotten to his feet. What is it? Josh put the candle and saucer aside and laid his hand on Swan's shoulder. She pressed into his side, and he could feel her racing heartbeat. Something had scared the stew out of her. He leaned over and picked up the mirror, expecting it to be shattered to pieces, but it was still whole. Looking into the glass, he was repelled by his own face, but he lingered long enough to see that there were four new warts on his chin. He handed the mirror back to Rusty. Good thing it didn't break. I guess that would have been seven years' bad luck. I saw Fabrioso drop it a hundred times. Once he flung it down as hard as he could on a concrete floor. It didn't even crack. See, he used to tell me this mirror was magic, too. Only he didn't really understand it, so he never told me why he thought it was magic. Rusty shrugged. I just think it looks like a smoky old glass. But since it went with the box, I decided to hold on to it. He turned his attention to Swan, who still stared uneasily at the mirror. Don't fret. Like I say, the thing won't break. Hell, it's stronger than plastic. He laid the mirror down on the tabletop. You okay? Josh asked. She nodded. Whatever monster she'd seen behind her in that mirror, she did not care to lay eyes on it again. Whose face had that been, down in the depths of the glass? Yes, she replied, and she made her voice sound like she meant it. Rusty built a fire in the stove, and then Josh helped him carry the corpse out to the circus cemetery. Killer yapped along at their heels. And while they were gone, Swan approached the mirror again. It called her, just like the tarot cards had at Leona's. She slowly picked it up, and holding it at arm's length, angled it toward her left shoulder as she had before. But there was no monster face. There was nothing. Swan turned the mirror toward her right. Again nothing. She missed Leona deeply, and she thought of the devil card and the tarot deck, that face with the awful eye in the center of its head, and a mouth that looked like a hallway to hell, had reminded her of the figure on that card. Oh, Leona, Swan whispered, why do you have to leave us? There was a quick red glint in the mirror, just a flash and then gone. Swan looked over her shoulder. The stove was behind her, and red flames were crackling in the grate. She peered into the mirror again. It was dark, and she realized it was not angled toward the stove after all. A pinpoint of ruby-red light flickered and began to grow. Other colors flashed, like distant lightning, emerald green, pure white, deep midnight blue. The colors strengthened, merging into a small pulsating ring of light that Swan at first thought was floating in the air— but in the next moment she thought she could make out a hazy, indistinct figure holding that ring of light, but she couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman. She almost turned around, but did not, because she knew there was nothing behind her but a wall. No, this sight was only in the magic mirror, but what did it mean? The figure seemed to be walking, wearily but with determination, as if whoever it was knew he or she had a long journey to finish. Swan sensed that the figure was a long way off, maybe not even in the same state. But for a second she might have been able to make out the facial features, and it might have been the hard-edged face of a woman. Then it went all hazy again, and Swan couldn't tell. The figure seemed to be searching, bearing a ring brighter than firefly lights. 
and behind her there might have been other searching figures, too, but again Swan couldn't quite separate them from the mist. The first figure and the glowing circle of many colors began to fade away, and Swan watched until it had dwindled into a point of light like the burning spear of a candle. Then it winked out like a falling star and was gone. "'Come back,' she whispered. "'Please come back.' But the vision did not. Swan aimed the mirror to her left, and behind that shoulder reared a skeletal horse, and on that horse was a rider made of bones and dripping gore, and in his skeleton arms was a scythe that he lifted for a slashing, killing blow. Swan turned. She was alone, all alone. She was trembling, and she set the mirror glass side down on the desk. She had had enough magic to last her a while. Everything's changed now, she remembered Leona saying. All that was is gone. Maybe the whole world's just like Sullivan, blowing away, changing, turning into something different than it was before. She needed Leona to help her figure out these new pieces of the jigsaw puzzle, but Leona was gone. Now it was her and Josh, and Rusty Weathers, too if he decided to go with them to wherever they were headed. But what did the visions in the magic mirror mean, she wondered. Were they things that were going to happen, or things that might? She decided to keep the visions to herself until she'd thought about them some more. She didn't know Rusty Weathers well enough yet, though he seemed okay. When Josh and Rusty returned, Josh asked the other man if they could stay for a few days, share the water and gravy train, and Swan wrinkled her nose, but her belly growled. "'Where do you two figure to be going?' Rusty inquired. "'I don't know yet. We've got a strong-backed horse and the gutsiest damned mutt you ever saw, and I guess we'll keep going until we find a place to stop. That could be a long time. You don't know what's out there. I know what's behind us. What's ahead can't be much worse. You hope.' Rusty said. Yeah. He glanced at Swan. Protect the child, he thought. He was going to do his damnedest, not only because he was obeying that commandment, but because he loved the child and would do all in his power to make sure she survived whatever was ahead. And that, he realized, might be like a walk through hell itself. I reckon I'll tag along, if you don't mind, Rusty decided. All I've got are the clothes on my back, my magic jacket, the box, and the mirror. I don't think there's much of a future here, do you? Not much, Josh said. Rusty looked through a filmy window. Lord, I hope I just live long enough to see the sun come out again, and then I'm going to kill myself with cigarettes. Josh had to laugh, and Rusty cackled too. Swan smiled, but her smile faded fast. She felt a long way from the little girl who'd walked with her mother into Pawpaw Briggs's grocery store. She would be ten on the third of November, but right now she felt real old, like at least thirty, and she didn't know anything about anything, she thought. Before the bad day, her world had been confined to motels and trailers and little cinder-block houses. What had the rest of the world been like, she wondered. And now that the bad day had come and gone, what was left? The world'll keep turning, Leona had said. Oh, God gave this world a mighty spin, he did. And he put mighty tough minds and souls in a lot of people, too. People like you, maybe. She thought of Papa Briggs sitting up and speaking. That was something she hadn't wanted to think about too much. But now she wanted to know what that had meant. She didn't feel special in any way. She just felt tired and beat up and dusty. And when she let her thoughts drift toward her mama, all she wanted to do was break down and cry. But she did not. Swan wanted to know more about everything. To learn to read better, if books could be found. To ask questions and learn to listen. To learn to think and reason things out. But she never wanted to grow up all the way, because she feared the grown-up world. It was a bully with a fat stomach and a mean mouth who stomped on gardens before they had a chance to grow. No, Swan decided. I want to be who I am, and nobody's going to stomp me down. And if they try, 
They might just get themselves a foot full of stickers. Rusty had been watching the child as he mixed their dinner of dog food. He saw she was deep in concentration. Penny for your thoughts, he said, and he snapped the fingers of his right hand, bringing up between his thumb and forefinger the coin he'd already palmed. He tossed it to her, and Swan caught it. She saw it wasn't a penny. It was a brass token about the size of a quarter, and it had Rydell Circus written on it above the smiling face of a clown. Swan hesitated, looked at Josh, and then back to Rusty. She decided to say, I'm thinking about tomorrow. And Josh sat with his back against the wall, listening to the shrill whine of the wind, and hoping that somehow they would survive the forbidding corridor of tomorrows that stretched ahead of them. Chapter 46 The Homewood High School Gymnasium had become a hospital, and Red Cross and Army personnel had rigged up generators that kept the electricity going. A haggard Red Cross doctor named Eichelbaum led Sister and Paul Thorson through the maze of people lying on cots and mattresses on the floor. Sister kept the duffel bag at her side. She had not gone more than five feet from it in the three days since their gunshots had been heard by a group of sentries. A hot meal of corn, rice, and steaming coffee had tasted to Sister like gourmet delicacies. She had gone into a cubicle in a building marked Incoming, and had submitted to being stripped by a nurse in a white suit and mask who had run a Geiger counter over her body. The nurse had jumped back three feet when the counter's needle almost went off the scale. Sister had been scrubbed with some kind of white grainy powder, but still the counter cackled like a hen in heat. A half dozen more scrubbings brought the reading down to an acceptable level, but when the nurse had said, "'We'll have to dispose of this,' and reached for the duffel bag, Sister had grabbed her by the back of the neck and asked her if she still liked living. The Red Cross doctors and a couple of army officers who looked like Boy Scouts, except for the livid burns across their faces, couldn't pry the bag away from Sister, and finally Dr. Eichelbaum had thrown up his arms and shouted, "'Just scrub the shit out of the damn thing, then!' The duffel bag had been scrubbed several times, and the powder had been sprayed liberally over its contents. "'You just keep that damn bag closed, lady,' Eichelbaum fumed. One side of his face was covered with blue burns, and he had lost the sight in one eye. "'If I see you open it once, it goes in the incinerator.' Both Sister and Paul Thorson had been given baggy white coveralls. Most of the others wore them, and rubber boots as well. But Eichelbaum informed them that all the anti-radiation footgear had been given out several days before. Dr. Eichelbaum had put a Vaseline-like substance over the burn marks on her face, and he had examined closely a thickened patch of skin just underneath her chin that looked like a scab surrounded by four small wart-like bumps. He had found another two warts at the jawline under her left ear, and a seventh right at the fold of her left eye. He had told her that about sixty-five percent of the survivors bore similar marks, most probably skin cancer, but there was nothing he could do about them. Slicing them off with a scalpel, he'd told her, only made them grow back larger, and he showed her the angry black scab-like mark that was creeping up from the point of his own chin. The most peculiar thing about the marks, he'd said, was that they appeared only on or near the facial area. He hadn't seen any that were below the neck, or on a survivor's arms, legs, or any other area of skin exposed to the blasts. The makeshift hospital was full of burn victims, people who had radiation sickness, and people in shock and depression. The worst cases were kept in the school auditorium, Eichelbaum had told her, and their mortality rate was about 99 percent. Suicide was also a major problem, and as the days passed and people seemed to understand more about the disaster's scope, Dr. Eichelbaum said the number of people found hanging from trees increased. The day before, Sister had gone to the Homewood Public Library and found the building deserted, most of the books gone, used as fuel in the fires that kept people alive. The shelves had been ripped out, the tables and chairs carried off to be burned. Sister turned down one of the few aisles where shelves of books remained, and found herself staring at the anti-radiation footgear of a woman who had climbed up a stepladder and hanged herself from a light fixture. But she'd found what she was looking for, 
Amid a pile of encyclopedias, American history books, farmers' almanacs, and other items that had been spared burning, and in it she'd seen for herself. Here he is, Dr. Eichelbaum said, weaving through a few last cots to the one where Artie Wisco lay. Artie was sitting up against a pillow, a tray table between his cot and the one to his left, and he was engrossed in playing poker with a young black man whose face was covered with white triangular burns, so precise they looked like they'd been stamped on the skin. Hiya, Artie said, grinning at Sister and Paul as they approached. Full house. He turned his cards over, and the black man said, Shit, you cheatin', man. But he forked over some toothpicks from a pile on his side of the tray. Look at this. Artie pushed the sheet back and showed them the heavy tape that crisscrossed his ribs. Robot here wants to play tic-tac-toe on my belly. Robot? Sister asked, and the black youth raised a finger to tip an imaginary hat. How are you doing today? the doctor asked Artie. Did the nurse take your urine sample? Sure did, Robot said, and he hooted. Little fool's got a cot that'd hang from here to Philly. There's not much privacy here, Artie explained to Sister, trying to keep his dignity. They have to take the samples in front of God and everybody. Some of these women round here see what you got, fool. They gonna be praying on their knees, I be telling you. Oh, jeez. Artie squirmed with embarrassment. Will you shut up? You look a lot better, Sister offered. His flesh was no longer gray and sickly, and though his face was a mass of bandages and livid scarlet burn marks, keloids, Dr. Eichelbaum called them, she even thought he had healthy color in his cheeks. Oh, yeah, I'm getting handsomer all the time. Gonna look in the mirror one of these days and see Cary Grant staring back. Ain't no mirrors around here, fool, Robot reminded him. All the mirrors done broke. Artie's been responding pretty well to the penicillin we've been pumping into him. Thank God we've got the stuff, or most of these people here would be dead from infections, Dr. Eichelbaum said. He's still got a way to go yet before he's out of the woods, but I think he'll be okay. How about the Buchanan kid and Mona Ramsey? Paul asked. I'll have to check the list, but I don't think either one of them is critical. He looked around the gymnasium and shook his head. There are so many I can't keep up with them. His gaze returned to Paul. If we had the vaccine, I'd put every one of you into rabies shots, but we don't, so I can't. You'd just better hope none of the wolves out there were rabid, folks. Hey, Doc, Artie asked. When do you think I can get out of here? Four or five days at the minimum. Why? You planning on going somewhere? Yeah, Artie replied without hesitation. Detroit. The doctor cocked his head, so the one good eye was fixed firmly on Artie Wisco. Detroit, he repeated. I've heard Detroit was one of the first cities hit. I'm sorry, but I don't think there is a Detroit anymore. Maybe not, but that's where I'm going. That's where my home is, and my wife. Geez, I grew up in Detroit. Whether it was hit or not, I've got to go back there and find out what's left. Probably the same as Philly, Robot said quietly. Man, there ain't a cinder left in Philly. I have to go home, Hardy said, his voice resolute. That's where my wife is. He looked up at Sister. I saw her, you know. I saw her in the glass ring. And she looked just like she did when she was a teenager. Maybe that meant something. Like I had to have the faith to keep going to Detroit, to keep looking for her. Maybe I'll find her. And maybe I won't. But I have to go. You're going to go with me, aren't you? Sister paused. Then she smiled faintly and said, No, Artie, I can't. I've got to go somewhere else. He frowned. Where? I've seen something in the glass ring, too and I've got to find out what it means. I have to, just like you have to go to Detroit. I don't know what the hell you're talking about, Dr. Eichelbaum said. But where do you think you're going? Kansas. Sister saw the doctor's single eye blink. A town called Matheson. It's on the Rand McNally Road, Atlas. 
She had disobeyed the doctor's orders and opened her bag long enough to stuff the road atlas down into it next to the powder-covered circle of glass. Do you know how far it is to Kansas? How are you going to get there? Walk? That's right. You don't seem to understand this situation, the doctor said calmly. Sister recognized the tone of voice as the way the attendants had addressed the crazy women in the asylum. The first wave of nuclear missiles hit every major city in this country, he explained. The second wave hit air force and naval bases. The third wave hit the smaller cities and rural industries. Then the fourth wave hit every other damn thing that wasn't already burning. From what I've heard, there's a wasteland east and west of about a fifty-mile radius of this point. There's nothing but ruins, dead people, and people who are wishing they were dead. And you want to walk to Kansas? Sure. The radiation would kill you before you made a hundred miles. I lived through the blast in Manhattan. So did Artie. How come the radiation hasn't already killed us? Some people seem to be more resistant than others. It's a fluke. But that doesn't mean you can keep absorbing radiation and shrug it off. Doctor, if I was going to die from radiation, I'd be bones by now. And the air's full of the shit anyway. You know it as well as I do. The stuff's everywhere. The wind carries it, yes, he admitted. But you're wanting to walk right back into a super-contaminated area. Now, I don't know your reasons for wanting to go to— No, you don't, she said, and you can't. So save your breath. I'm going to rest here for a while, and then I'm leaving. Dr. Eichelbaum started to protest again. Then he saw the determination in the woman's stare, and he knew there was nothing more to be said. Still, it was in his nature to have the last word. You're crazy. Then he turned and stalked away, figuring he had better things to do than trying to keep another fruitcake from committing suicide. Kansas, Artie Wisco said softly. That's a long way from here. Yeah, I'm going to need a good pair of shoes. Suddenly Artie's eyes glistened with tears. He reached out and grasped Sister's hand, pressing it against his cheek. God bless you, he said. Oh, God bless you. Sister leaned down and hugged him, and he kissed her cheek. She felt the wetness of a tear, and her own heart ached for him. "'You're the finest lady I've ever known,' he told her. "'Next to my wife, I mean.' She kissed him, and then she straightened up again. Her eyes were wet, and she knew that in the years ahead she would think of him many times, and in her heart she would say a prayer for him. "'You go to Detroit,' she said. "'You find her. You hear?' Yeah, I hear. He nodded, his eyes as bright as new pennies. Sister turned away, and Paul Thorson followed her. Behind her she heard Robot say, Man, I had an uncle in Detroit. I was kind of thinking about... Sister wound her way through the hospital and out the doors. She stood staring at the football field, which was covered with tents, cars, and trucks. The sky was dull gray, heavy with clouds, off to the right, in front of the high school and under a long red canopy, was a large bulletin board where people stuck messages and questions. The board was always jammed, and Sister had walked along it the day before, looking at the pleas scribbled on scratch paper. Searching for daughter Becky Rollins, age 14, lost in Shenandoah area, July 17th. Anybody with information about the De Batista family, from Scranton, please leave... Looking for Reverend Bowden, First Presbyterian Church of Hazelton, services urgently needed. Sister walked to the fence that surrounded the football field, set the duffel bag on the ground beside her, and wound her fingers tightly through the mesh. Behind her came the sound of a woman wailing at the bulletin board, and Sister flinched. Oh, God, Sister thought, what have we done? Kansas, huh? What the hell do you want to go way out there for? Paul Thorson was beside her, leaning against the fence. There was a splint along the bridge of his broken nose. Kansas, he prompted. What's out there? A town called Matheson. I saw it in the glass ring, and I found it in the road atlas. That's where I'm going. Yeah, but why? 
He pulled up the collar of his battered leather jacket against the cold. He'd fought to keep the jacket as hard as Sister had fought for her double bag, and he wore it over the clean white coveralls. Because— She paused, and then she decided to tell him what she'd been thinking since she'd found the road atlas. Because I feel like I'm being led toward something, or someone. I think the things I've been seeing in that glass are real. My dream-walking has been to real places— I don't know why or how. Maybe the glass ring is like, I don't know, like an antenna or something, or like radar, or a key to a door I never even knew existed. I think I'm being led for some reason, and I've got to go. No, you're talking like the lady who saw a monster with roaming eyeballs. I don't expect you to understand. I don't expect you to give a shit. And I didn't ask you. What are you doing hanging around me anyway? Didn't they assign you a tent? Yeah, they did. I'm in with three other men. One of them cries all the time, and another one can't stop talking about baseball. I hate baseball. What don't you hate, Mr. Thorson? He shrugged and looked around, watching an elderly man and woman, both of their faces streaked with keloids, supporting each other as they staggered away from the bulletin board. I don't hate being alone, he said finally. I don't hate depending on myself. And I don't hate myself, though sometimes I don't like myself too much. I don't hate drinking. That's about it. Good for you. Well, I want to thank you for saving my life and Artie's too. You took good care of us, and I appreciate that. So she stuck out her hand, but he didn't shake it. What have you got that's worth a damn? he asked her. Huh? Something valuable. Do you have anything worth trading? Trading for what? He nodded toward the vehicles parked on the field. She saw he was looking at a dented old army jeep with a patched convertible top painted with camouflage colors. You got anything in that bag you could trade for a jeep? No, I don't. And then she remembered that deep down in her duffel bag were the chunks of jewel-encrusted glass she'd picked up, along with the ring, in the ruins of Steuben Glass and Tiffany's. She had transferred them from the Gucci bag and forgotten them. "'You're going to need transportation,' he said. "'You can't walk from here to Kansas. And what are you going to do about gasoline, food, and water? You'll need a gun, matches, a good flashlight, and warm clothes.' Like I say, lady, what's out there is going to be like Dodge City and Dante's Inferno rolled into one. Maybe it will be. But why should you care? I don't. I'm just trying to warn you, that's all. I can take care of myself. Yeah, I'll bet you can. I'll bet you were the bitch of the ball. Hey! Somebody called. Hey, I've been looking for you, lady. Approaching them was the tall man in the fleece-lined coat and Stroh's beer cap who had been on sentry duty and heard the gunshots. "'Been looking for you,' he said as he chewed a couple of sticks of gum. "'Eichelbaum said you were around. You found me. What is it?' "'Well,' he said, "'I kind of thought you was familiar the first time I seen you. He said you'd be carrying a big leather bag, though, so I guess that's what threw me.' What are you talking about? It was two, three days before you folks got here. Bella just come riding along I-80 like he was out on a Sunday afternoon. He was on one of them French racing bicycles with the handlebars slung low. Oh, I remember him, cause old Bobby Coates and me was up in the church tower on lookout, and Bobby punches me in the arm and says, Cleve, look at that shit. Well, I looked and I seen it, but I still didn't believe it. "'Speak English, friend,' Paul snapped. "'What was it?' "'Oh, it was a man, peddling that bike along I-80. "'But what was real weird was that he about had thirty or forty wolves following him, "'almost at his heels, just parading along. "'And just before he gets to the top of the hill, "'this fellow gets off his bike and turns around, "'and them wolves cower and slink like they was face to face with God.' Then they broke and ran, and this fellow walks his bike to the top of the hill. Cleve shrugged, 
puzzlement scrawled across his bovine face. Well, we went out to get him. Big fella, husky. Hard to tell how old he was, though. He had white hair, but his face was young. Anyway, he was wearing a suit and tie and a gray raincoat. Didn't seem to be hurt or anything. He had on two-toned shoes. I remember that real well. Two-toned shoes. Cleve grunted, shook his head, and directed his gaze at Sister. He asked about you, lady. Asked if we'd seen a lady with a big leather bag. Said you was a relative, and that he had to find you. He seemed real eager and interested to find you, too. But me and Bobby didn't know nothing about you, of course. And this fellow asked the other sentries, but they didn't know you either. Said we'd take him into Homewood, give him a meal and shelter, and let the Red Cross folks look him over. Sister's heart had begun pounding, and she felt very cold. What happened to him? Oh, he went on, thanked us kindly, and said he had miles to go yet. Then he wished us well and pedaled on out of sight, heading west. How do you know this guy was looking for her? Paul asked. He could have been searching for some other woman carrying a leather bag. Oh, no, Cleve answered and smiled. He described this lady here so well I could see her face right in my head, just like a picture. That's why I thought you looked familiar at first, but I just this morning put it together. See, you didn't have a leather bag, and that's what threw me. He looked at Sister. Did you know him, ma'am? Yes, she replied. Oh, yes, I know him. Did he... Give you his name. Hallmark. Daryl. Dow. Dave. Something like that. Well, he's gone west. Don't know what he'll find out there. Too bad you two missed each other so near. Yes. Sister felt as if her ribs had been laced with steel bands. Too bad. Cleve tipped his hat and went on about his business. Sister felt as if she were about to faint, and she had to lean against the fence for support. "'Who was he?' Paul asked, but the tone of his voice said that he was afraid to know. "'I've got to go to Kansas,' Sister said firmly. "'I've got to follow what I've seen in the glass ring. He's not going to give up looking for me, because he wants the glass ring, too. He wants to destroy it, and I can't let him get his hands on it, or I'll never know what I'm supposed to find.' or who I'm looking for. You're going to need a gun. Paul was spooked by both Cleve's story and the terror in Sister's eyes. Nobody human could have gotten through those wolves without a scratch, he thought. And on a French racing bicycle? Was it possible that everything she'd told him was true? A real big gun, he added. There's not one big enough. She picked up her duffel bag and started walking away from the high school, up the hill toward the tent she'd been assigned to. Paul stood watching her go. Shit, he thought. What's going on here? That lady's got a ton of guts, but she's going to get herself slaughtered out there on old I-80. He thought she had about as much chance to get to Kansas alone as a Christian and a Cadillac had of getting to heaven. He looked around at the hundreds of tents in the wooded hills, at the little campfires and burning lanterns that surrounded Homewood, and he shuddered. This damned town's got too many people in it, he thought. He couldn't stand having to live in a tent with three other men. Everywhere he turned there were people. They were all over the place, and he knew that pretty soon he'd have to hit the road or go crazy. So why not go to Kansas? Why not? Because, he answered himself, we'll never get there. So, were you planning on living forever? I can't let her go alone, he decided. Jesus Christ, I just can't. Hey, he called after her, but she kept going. Didn't even look back. Hey, maybe I'll help you get a jeep. But that's all. Don't expect me to do anything else. Sister kept walking, burdened with thought. Okay, I'll help you get some food and water, too, Paul told her. But you're on your own with the gun and gasoline. One step at a time, she was thinking. One step at a time gets you where you're going. And, oh, Lord, I've got such a long way to go. Okay, damn it, I'll help you. 
Sister finally heard him. She turned toward Paul. What did you say? I said I'd help you. He shrugged and started walking toward her. I might as well add another layer to the shit cake, eh? Yes, she said, and a smile played at the corners of her mouth. You might as well. Darkness came, and an icy rain fell on Homewood. In the woods the wolves howled, and the wind blew radiation across the land, and the world turned toward a new day. Chapter 47 The bicycle's tires made a singing sound in the dark. Every so often they thumped over a corpse or veered around a wrecked car, but the legs that powered them had places to go. Two-toned shoes on the pedals. The man leaned forward and pumped along Interstate 80, about twelve miles east of the Ohio line. The ashes of Pittsburgh flecked his suit. He'd spent two days amid the ruins, had found a group of survivors there, and looked into their minds for the face of the woman with the circle of glass. But it wasn't on any of their heads, and before he'd left he'd convinced them all that eating the burned meat of dead bodies was a cure for radiation poisoning. He'd even helped them start on the first one. Bon appétit, he thought. Below him his legs pumped like pistons. Where are you? he wondered. You can't have come this far. Not yet. Unless you're running day and night because you know I'm on your ass. When the wolves had come out to first snap and then fawn at his heels, he thought they had gotten her, way back in eastern Pennsylvania. But if that were so, where was the leather bag? Her face hadn't been in the minds of the sentries back at Homewood, either. And if she'd been there, they would be the ones to know. So where was she? And, most importantly, where was the glass thing? He didn't like the idea of its being out there somewhere. Didn't know what it was or why it had come to be. But whatever it was, he wanted to smash it beneath his shoes, wanted to break it into tiny fragments and grind those pieces into the woman's face. Sister, he thought, and he sneered. His fingers clenched the handlebars. The glass circle had to be found. Had to be. This was his party now and such things were not allowed. He didn't like the way the woman had looked at it, and he didn't like the way she'd fought for it, either. It gave her false hope. So it was a humane thing, really, to find the glass circle and smash it and make her eat the shards. There was no telling how many others she could infect if she wasn't stopped. Maybe she was already dead. Maybe one of her own kind had killed her and stolen her bag. Maybe, maybe, maybe. There were too many maybes. But no matter who had it, or where it was, he had to find the glass circle, because such a thing as that should not be. And when it had gone dark and cold in his grip, he'd known it was reading his soul. This is my party, he shouted and he drove over a dead man lying in his path. But there were so many places to search, so many highways to follow. She must have turned off I-80 before she'd reached Homewood. But why would she? He remembered her saying, We keep going west. And she would follow the line of least resistance, wouldn't she? Could she have taken shelter in one of the small hamlets between Jersey City and Homewood? If so, that would mean she was behind him, not ahead. But everything and everyone was dead east of Homewood, and that damned Red Cross station, right? He slowed down, passing a crumpled sign that said, Newcastle, next left. He was going to have to pull off and find a map somewhere, maybe retrace his route along another highway. Maybe she'd gone south and missed Homewood entirely. Maybe she was on a rural road somewhere, right now crouched by a fire and playing with that damned glass thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe. It was a big country. But he had time, he reasoned, as he swung off I-80 at the Newcastle exit. He had tomorrow, and the next day, and the day after that. It was his party now, and he made the rules. He'd find her. Oh, yes. Find her and shove that glass ring right up her... 
he realized the wind had died down. It wasn't blowing as hard as it had been even a few hours before. That was why he hadn't been able to search properly yet. He had trouble searching when the wind was so rough. But the wind was his friend, too, because it spread the party dust. He licked a finger with a cat-ruffed tongue and held it up. Yes, the wind had definitely weakened, though errant gusts still blew in his face and brought the smell of burned meat. It was time, past time, to get started. His mouth opened, stretched, and began to stretch wider still, while his black eyes stared from a handsome face. A fly crawled out onto his lower lip. It was a shiny, ugly green, the kind of fly that might explode from the nostrils of a bloated corpse. It waited there, its iridescent wings twitching. Another fly crawled from his mouth, then a third, a fourth, and a fifth. Six more scrabbled out and clung to his lower lip. A dozen others seeped out like a green tide. In another few seconds there were fifty or more flies around his mouth, a green froth that hummed and twitched with eager anticipation. "'Away!' he whispered, and the movement of his lips sent the first group of them into the air, their wings vibrating against the wind until they found their balance. Others took off, nine or ten at a time, and their formations flew to all points of the compass. They were part of him, and they lived down in the damp cellar of his soul where such things grew. And after they made their slow radius of two or three miles, they'd return to him, as if he were the center of the universe. And when they came back, he'd see what they'd seen. A fire burning, sparking off a ring of glass. Or her face, asleep in a room where she thought she was safe. If they didn't find her tonight, there was always tomorrow. And the next day, sooner or later, they would find a chink in a wall that brought him down on her. And this time he'd Watusi on her bones. His face was rigid, his eyes black holes in a face that would scare the moon. The last two things that resembled flies, but were extensions of his ears and eyes, pushed from between his lips and lifted off, turning toward the southeast. And still his two-toned shoes pumped the pedals, and the bike's tires sang, and the dead were ground under where they lay. Book Two Part Eight Toad Frog with Golden Wings the Last Apple Tree, Flee the Mark of Cain, The Good Deed Done, Job's Mask, Solitary Journeyer, A New Right Hand, White Blossoms. Chapter 48 Snow tumbled from the sullen sky, sweeping across a narrow country road in what had been, seven years before, the state of Missouri. A piebald horse, old and sway-backed, but still strong-hearted and willing to work, pulled a small, crudely built wagon, covered with a patched, dark green canvas dome that was a strange amalgam of Conestoga and U-Haul trailer. The wagon's frame was made of wood, but it had iron axles and rubber tires. The canvas dome was a two-man, all-weather tent that had been stretched over curved wooden ribs. On each side of the canvas, painted in white, was the legend, Travelin' Show and beneath that smaller letters proclaimed Magic, Music, and Beat the Masked Mephisto. A couple of thick boards served as a seat and footrest for the wagon's driver, who sat draped in a heavy woolen coat that was beginning to come apart at the seams. He wore a cowboy hat, its brim heavy with ice and snow, and on his feet were battered old cowboy boots. The gloves on his hands were essential to ward off the stinging wind, and a woolen plaid scarf was wrapped around the lower part of his face, just his eyes, a shade between hazel and topaz, and a slice of rough, wrinkled skin were exposed to the elements. The wagon moved slowly across a snow-covered landscape, past black, dense forests, stripped bare of leaves. On each side of the road an occasional barn or farmhouse had collapsed under the weight of seven years of winter, and the only signs of life were black crows, that pecked fitfully at the frozen earth. 
A few yards behind the wagon, a large figure in a long, billowing gray overcoat trudged along, booted feet crunching on snow. He kept his hands thrust into the pockets of his brown corduroy trousers, and his entire head was covered with a black ski mask. The eyes and mouth ringed with red. His shoulders were bent under the whiplash of wind, and his legs ached with the cold. About ten feet behind him, a terrier followed, its coat white with snow. I smell smoke, Rusty Weathers thought, and he narrowed his eyes to peer through the white curtain before him. Then the wind shifted direction, gnawing at him from another angle, and the smell of wood smoke, if it had really been there at all, was gone. But in another few minutes he thought they must be getting near civilization. On the right, scrawled in red paint on the broad trunk of a leafless oak tree, was, "'Burn your dead.' Signs like that were commonplace, usually announcing that they were coming into a settled area. There could be either a village ahead or a ghost town full of skeletons, depending on what the radiation had done. The wind shifted again, and Rusty caught that aroma of smoke. They were going up a gentle grade, mule laboring as best he could, but in no hurry. Rusty didn't push him. What was the use? If they could find shelter for the night, fine. If not, they'd make do somehow. Over the course of seven long years, they had learned how to improvise and use what they could find to the best advantage. The choice was simple. It was either survive or die. And many times Rusty Weathers had felt like giving up and lying down, but either Josh or Swan had kept him going with jokes or taunts, just as he had kept both of them alive over the years. They were a team that included Mule and Killer as well. And on the coldest nights, when they'd had to sleep with minimal shelter, the warmth of the two animals had kept Rusty, Josh, and Swan from freezing to death. After all, Rusty thought with a faint grim smile beneath the plaid scarf, the show must go on. As they reached the top of the grade and started down on the winding road, Rusty caught a yellow glint through the falling snow off to the right. The light was obscured by dead trees for a minute, but then there it was again, and Rusty felt sure it was the glint of a lantern or a fire. He knew calling to Josh was useless, both because of the wind and because Josh's hearing wasn't too good. He reined Mule in and pressed down with his boot on a wooden lever that locked the front axle. Then he climbed down off the seat and went back to show Josh the light and tell him he was going to follow it. Josh nodded. Only one eye showed through the black ski mask. The other was obscured by a gray, scab-like growth of flesh. Rusty climbed back onto the wagon's seat, released the brake, and gave a gentle flick to the reins. Mule started off without hesitation, and Rusty figured he'd smelled the smoke and knew shelter might be near. Another road, narrower yet and unpaved, curved to the right over snow-covered fields. The glint of light got stronger, and soon Rusty could make out a farmhouse ahead, light glowing through a window. Other outbuildings were set off beside the house, including a small barn. Rusty noted that the woods had been cut away from around the house in all directions, and hundreds of stumps stuck up through the snow. There was just one dead tree remaining, small and skinny, standing about thirty yards in front of the house. He smelled the aroma of burning wood, and figured that the forest was being consumed in somebody's fireplace. But burning wood didn't smell the same as it had before the 17th of July, and radiation had seeped into the forests. The smoke had a chemical odor, like burning plastic. Rusty remembered the sweet aroma of clean logs in a fireplace, and he figured that particular scent was lost forever, just like the taste of clean water. Now all the water tasted skunky and left a film on the inside of the mouth. Drinking water from melted snow, which was about all the remaining supply, brought on headaches, stomach pains, and blurred vision if consumed in too large a dose. Fresh water, like from a well or a bottled supply, was as valuable now as any fine French wine in the world that used to be. Rusty pulled Mule up in front of the house and braked the wagon. His heart was beating harder. Here comes the tricky part, he thought. 
Plenty of times they'd been fired on when they stopped to ask for shelter, and Rusty carried the scar of a bullet crease across his left cheek. There was no movement from the house. Rusty reached back and partially unzipped the tent's flap. Within, distributed around the wagon so as to keep its weight balanced, was their meager total of supplies. A few plastic jugs of water, some cans of beans, a bag of charcoal briquettes, extra clothes and blankets. Their sleeping bags and the old Martin acoustic guitar Rusty was teaching himself to play. Music always drew people, gave them something to break the monotony. In one town, a grateful woman had given them a chicken when Rusty had painstakingly picked out the chords of Moon River for her. He'd found the guitar and a pile of songbooks in the dead town of Sterling, Colorado. "'Where are we?' the girl asked from the tent's interior. She'd been curled up in her sleeping bag, listening to the restless whine of the wind. Her speech was garbled, but when she spoke slowly and carefully, Rusty could understand it. "'We're at a house. Maybe we can use their barn for the night.' He glanced over to the red blanket that was wrapped around three rifles. A thirty-eight pistol and boxes of bullets lay in a shoebox within easy reach of his right hand. Like my old mama always told me, he thought, you've got to fight fire with fire. He wanted to be ready for trouble, and he started to pick up the thirty-eight to hide under his coat when he approached the door. Swan interrupted his thoughts by saying, you're more likely to get shot if you take the gun. He hesitated, recalling that he'd been carrying a rifle when that bullet had streaked across his cheek. Yeah, I reckon so, he agreed. Wish me luck. He zipped the flap again and got down off the wagon, took a deep breath of wintry air, and approached the house. Josh stood by the wagon, watching, and Killer relieved himself next to a stump. Rusty started to knock on the door, but as he raised his fist, a slit opened in the door's center, and the barrel of a rifle slid smoothly out to stare him in the face. Oh, shit, he thought. But his legs had locked, and he stood helplessly. Who are you, and what do you want? A man's voice asked. Rusty lifted his hands. Name's Rusty Weathers. Me and my two friends out there need a place to shelter before it gets too dark. I saw your light from the road, and I see you've got a barn, so I was wondering if— Where'd you come from? West of here. We passed through Howes Mill and Bixby. Ain't nothing left of them towns. I know. Please, mister, all we want is a place to sleep. We've got a horse that sure could use a roof over his head. Take off that kerchief and let me see your face. Who you trying to look like, Jesse James? Rusty did as the man told him. There was silence for a moment. "'It's awful cold out here, mister,' Rusty said. The silence stretched longer. Rusty could hear the man talking to someone else, but he couldn't make out what was being said. Then the rifle barrel was suddenly withdrawn into the house, and Rusty let his breath out in a white plume. The door was unbolted. Several bolts were thrown back, and then it opened. A gaunt, hard-looking man, about sixty or so, with curly white hair and the untrimmed white beard of a hermit, stood before him, the rifle held at his side but still ready. The man's face was so tough and wrinkled it resembled carved stone, and his dark brown eyes moved from Rusty to the wagon. "'What's that say on the side there? Travelin' show? What in the name of Judas is that?' just what it says. We're, we're entertainers. An elderly white-haired woman in blue slacks and a heavy white sweater peered warily over the man's shoulder. Entertainers, the man repeated, and he frowned as if he'd smelled something bad. His gaze came back to Rusty. You entertainers got any food? We've got some canned food, beans and stuff. We've got a pot of coffee and a little bit of salt pork. Put your wagon in the barn and bring your beans. Then he closed the door in Rusty's face. 
When Rusty had driven the wagon into the barn, he and Josh untied Mule's traces so the horse could get to a small pile of straw and some dried corn cobs. Josh poured water into a pail for Mule and found a discarded mason jar for killers to drink water from. The barn was well constructed and kept the wind out, so neither animal would be in danger of freezing when the light went out and the real cold descended. What do you think? Josh asked Rusty quietly. Can she go in? I don't know. They seem okay, but a might jittery. She can use the heat, if they've got a fire going. Josh blew into his hands and bent over to massage his aching knees. We can make them understand it's not contagious. We don't know it's not. You haven't caught it, have you? If it was contagious, you'd have caught it long before now, don't you think? Rusty nodded. Yeah, but how are we going to make them believe that? The rear flap of the wagon's canvas dome was suddenly unzipped from the inside. Swan's mangled voice said from within, I'll stay here. There's no need for me to scare anybody. They've got a fire in there, Josh told her, walking toward the rear of the wagon. Swan was standing up, crouched over and silhouetted by the dim lamplight. I think it's all right if you go in. No, it's not. You can bring my food to me out here. It's better that way. Josh looked up at her. She had a blanket around her shoulders and shrouding her head. In seven years she had shot up to about five feet nine, gangly and long-limbed. It broke his heart that he knew she was right. If the people in that house were jittery, it was for the best that she stay here. "'Okay,' he said in a strangled voice. "'I'll bring you out some food.' Then he turned away from the wagon before he had to scream. "'Pass me down a few cans of those beans, will you?' Rusty asked her. She picked up Crybaby and tapped the cans with it, then moved over to pick up a couple. She put them into Rusty's hands. "'Rusty, if they can spare some books—' I sure would be grateful, she said. Anything will do. He nodded, amazed that she could still read. We won't be long, Josh promised, and he followed Rusty out of the barn. When they had gone, Swan lowered the wooden tailgate and put a little stepladder down to the ground. Probing with the dowsing rod, she descended the ladder and walked to the barn door, her head and face still shrouded by the blanket. Killer walked along at her booted feet, tail wagging furiously, and barked for attention. His bark was not as sprightly as it had been seven years earlier, and age had taken the bounce out of the terrier's step. Swan paused, laid Crybaby aside, and picked Killer up. Then she cracked the barn door open and cocked her head way over to the left, peering out through the falling snow. The farmhouse looked so warm, so inviting— but she knew it was best that she stay where she was. In the silence her breathing sounded like an asthmatic rasp. Through the snow she could make out that single remaining tree by the spill of light from the front window. Why just one tree? she wondered. Why did he cut the rest of them down and leave that one standing alone? Killer strained up and licked into the darkness where her face was. She stood looking at that single tree for a minute longer. And then she closed the barn door, picked up Crybaby, and probed her way over to Mule to rub his shoulders. In the farmhouse, a fire blazed in a stone hearth. Over the flames, a cast-iron pot of salt pork was bubbling in a vegetable broth. Both the stern-faced elderly man and his more timid wife flinched noticeably when Josh Hutchins followed Rusty through the front door. It was his size more than the mask that startled them, for though he'd lost a lot of flabby weight in the last few years, he'd gained muscle, and was still a formidable sight. Josh's hands were streaked with white pigment, and the elderly man stared uncomfortably at them until Josh stuck them in his pockets. "'Here are the beans,' Rusty said nervously, offering them to the man. He'd noted that the rifle leaned against the hearth, well within reach, if the old man decided to go for it. The cans of beans were accepted— and the old gent gave them to the woman. 
She glanced nervously at Josh and then went back to the rear of the house. Rusty peeled off his gloves and coat, laid them over a chair, and took his hat off. His hair had turned almost completely gray, and there were streaks of white at his temples, though he was only forty years old. His beard was ribboned with gray, the bullet scar a pale slash across his cheek. Around his eyes were webs of deep cracks and wrinkles. He stood in front of the hearth, basking in its wonderful warmth. "'Good fire you got here,' he said. "'Sure takes the chill off.' The old man was still staring at Josh. "'You can take that coat and mask off, if you like.' Josh shrugged out of his coat. Underneath he wore two thick sweaters, one on top of the other. He made no move to take off the black ski mask. The old man walked closer to Josh, then abruptly stopped when he saw the gray growth obscuring the giant's right eye. "'Josh is a wrestler,' Rusty said quickly. "'The mask Mephisto. That's him. I'm a magician. See, we're a traveling show. We go from town to town, and we perform for whatever people can spare to give us. Josh wrestles anybody who wants to take him on, and if the other fellow gets Josh off his feet— the whole town gets a free show. The old man nodded absently, his gaze riveted on Josh. The woman came in with the can she'd opened and dumped their contents into the pot, then stirred the concoction with a wooden spoon. Finally, the old gent said, Looks like somebody beat the ever-loving shit out of you, mister. Guess that town got a free show, huh? He grunted and gave a high, cackling laugh. Rusty's nerves untensed somewhat. He didn't think there would be any gunplay today. "'I'll fetch us a pot of coffee,' the old man said, and he left the room. Josh went over to warm himself at the fire, and the woman scurried away from him as if he carried the plague. Not wanting to frighten her, he crossed the room and stood at the window, looking out at the sea of stumps and the single standing tree. "'Name Sylvester Moody.' the old man said when he returned with a tray bearing some brown clay mugs. Folks used to call me Sly, after that fellow who made all them fightin' movies. He set the tray down on a little pine wood table, then went to the mantel and picked up a thick asbestos glove. He put it on and reached into the fireplace, unhooking a scorched metal coffee pot from a nail driven into the rear wall. Good and hot, he said, and he started to pour the black liquid into the cups. "'Don't have no milk or sugar, so don't ask.' He nodded toward the woman. "'This is my wife, Carla. She's kind of nervous around strangers.' Rusty took one of the hot cups and downed the coffee with pure pleasure, though the liquid was so strong it could have whipped Josh in a wrestling match. "'Why one tree, Mr. Moody?' Josh asked. "'Huh?' Josh was still standing at the window. Why'd you leave that one? Why not cut it down with the others? Sly Moody picked up a cup of coffee and took it over to the masked giant. He tried very hard not to stare at the white spotched hand that accepted the cup. I've lived in this house for near about thirty-five years, he answered. That's a long time to live in one house, on one piece of land, ain't it? Oh, I used to have a fine cornfield back that way. He motioned toward the rear of the house. Used to grow a little tobacco and some pole beans. And every year me and Jeanette would go out in the garden and... He trailed off, blinked, and glanced over at Carla, who was looking at him with wide, shocked eyes. I'm sorry, darling, he said. I mean, me and Carla would go out in the garden and bring back baskets of good vegetables. The woman, seemingly satisfied, stopped stirring the pot and left the room. Jeanette was my first wife, Sly explained in a hushed voice. She passed on about two months after it happened. Then one day I was walking up the road to Ray Featherstone's place, about a mile from here, I guess, and I came across a car that had gone off the road and was half buried in a snowdrift. Well, there was a dead man with a blue face at the wheel— and next to him was a woman who was near about dead. There was a gutted carcass of a French poodle in her lap, and she had a nail file gripped in her hand. I don't want to tell you what she did to keep herself from freezing. 
Anyway, she was so crazy she didn't know anything, not even her own name or where she was from. I called her Carla, after the first girl I ever kissed. She just stayed, and now she thinks she's been living on this farm with me for thirty-five years. He shook his head, his eyes dark and haunted. Funny thing, too. That car was a Lincoln Continental, and when I found her she was decked out in diamonds and pearls. I put all that junk away in a shoebox and traded it for sacks of flour and bacon. I figured she didn't need to ever see him again. People came along and salvaged parts off the car, and by and by there was nothing left. Better that way. Carla returned with some bowls and began to spoon the stew into them. Bad days, Sly Moody said softly, staring at the tree. Then his eyes began to clear, and he smiled faintly. That there's my apple tree. Yes, sir. See, I used to have an apple orchard, clear across that field. Used to bring in apples by the bushel. But after it happened, and the trees died, I started cutting them down for firewood. You don't want to go too far into the forest for firewood, uh-uh. Ray Featherstone froze to death about a hundred yards from his own front door. He paused for a moment and then sighed heavily. I planted them apple trees with my own hands, watched them grow, watched them burst with fruit. You know what today is? No, Josh said. I keep a calendar. One mark for every day. Worn out a lot of pencils, too. Today is the 26th day of April. Springtime, he smiled bitterly. I've cut them all down but the one, and thrown them in the fire piece by piece. But damned if I can put an axe to that last one. Damned if I can. Food's almost ready, Carla announced. She had a northern accent, decidedly different from Sly's languid Missouri drawl. Come and get it. Hold on, Sly looked at Rusty. I thought you said you were with two friends. I did. There's a girl traveling with us. She's... He glanced quickly at Josh, then back to Sly. She's out in the barn. A girl? Well, oh, Christ almighty, fella, bring her in here and let her get some hot food. Uh, I don't think... Go on and get her, he insisted. Barn ain't no place for a girl. Rusty. Josh was peering out the window. Night was fast descending, but he could still see the last apple tree and the figure that stood beneath it. Come here for a minute. Outside, Swan held the blanket around her head and shoulders like a cape and looked up at the branches of the spendly apple tree. Killer ran a couple of rings around the tree and then barked half-heartedly, wanting to get back to the barn. Above Swan's head, the branches moved like skinny, searching arms. She walked forward, her boots sinking through five inches of snow, and placed her bare hand against the tree's trunk. It was cold beneath her fingers, cold and long dead. Just like everything else, she thought. All the trees, the grass, the flowers, everything scorched lifeless by radiation many years ago. But it was a pretty tree, she decided. It was dignified, like a monument, and it did not deserve to be surrounded by the ugly stumps of what had been. She knew that the hurting sound in this place must have been a long wail of agony. Her hand moved lightly across the wood. Even in death, there was something proud about the tree, something defiant and elemental, a wild spirit, like the heart of a flame that could never be totally extinguished. Killer yapped at her feet, urging her to hurry whatever she was doing. Swan said, All right, I'm re— She stopped speaking. The wind whirled around her, tugging at her clothes. Could it be? she wondered. I'm not dreaming this, am I? Her fingers were tingling, just barely enough to register through the cold. She placed her palm against the wood. A prickling pins-and-needle sensation coursed through her hand, still faint, but growing, getting stronger. 
Her heart leaped. Life, she realized. There was life there yet, deep in the tree. It had been so long, so very long, since she'd felt the stirring of life beneath her fingers. The feeling was almost new to her again, and she realized how much she'd missed it. Now what felt like a mild electric current seemed to be rising up from the earth through the soles of her boots, moving up her backbone, along her arm and out her hand into the wood. When she drew her hand away, the tingling ceased. She pressed her fingers to the tree again, her heart pounding, and there was a shock so powerful it felt as if fire had shot up her spine. Her body trembled. The sensation was steadily getting stronger, almost painful now, her bones aching with the pulse of energy passing through her and into the tree. When she could stand it no longer, she pulled her hand back. Her fingers continued to prickle. But she wasn't finished yet. On an impulse, she extended her index finger and traced letters across the tree trunk. S-W-A-N Swan! The voice came from the house, startling her. She turned toward the sound, and as she did, the wind ripped at her makeshift cape and flung it back from her shoulders and head. Sly Moody was standing between Josh and Rusty, holding a lantern. By its yellow light he saw that the figure under the apple tree had no face. Her head was covered by gray growths that had begun as small black warts, had thickened and spread over the passage of years, had connected with gray tendrils like groping, intertwining vines. The growths had covered her skull like a knotty helmet, had enclosed her facial features, and sealed them up, except for a small slit at her left eye, and a ragged hole over her mouth, through which she breathed and ate. Behind Sly, Carla screamed. Sly whispered, Oh, my Jesus. The faceless figure grabbed the blanket and shrouded her head, and Josh heard her heartbreaking cry as she raced to the barn. Chapter 49 Darkness fell over the snow-covered buildings and houses of what had been Broken Bow, Nebraska. Barbed wire surrounded the town, and here and there bits of timber and rags burned in empty oil cans, the wind sending orange sparks spiraling into the sky. On the curving northwest arc of Highway 2, dozens of corpses lay frozen where they'd fallen, and the hulks of charred vehicles still spat flame. In the fortress that Broken Bow had been for the last two days, three hundred and seventeen sick and injured men, women, and children were trying desperately to keep warm around a huge central bonfire. The houses of Broken Bow were being torn apart and fed to the flames. Another two hundred and sixty-four men and women, armed with rifles, pistols, axes, hammers, and knives, crouched in trenches hastily hacked in the earth, along the barbed wire at the western rim of town. Their faces were turned westward into the shrilling sub-zero wind that had killed so many. They shivered in their ragged coats, and tonight they dreaded a different kind of death. There! A man with an ice-crusted bandage around his head shouted. He pointed into the distance. There! They're coming! A chorus of shouts and warnings moved along the trench. Rifles and pistols were quickly checked. The trench vibrated with nervous motion, and the breath of human beings whirled through the air like diamond dust. They saw the headlights weaving slowly through the carnage on the highway. Then the music drifted to them on the stinging wind. It was carnival music. And as the headlights grew nearer, a skinny, hollow-eyed man in a heavy sheepskin coat stood up at the center of the trench and trained a pair of binoculars at the oncoming vehicle. His face was streaked with dark brown keloids. He put the binoculars down before the cold could seal the eye cups to his face. Hold your fire, he shouted to the left. Pass it down. The message began to go down the line. He looked to the right and shouted the same order, and then he waited, one gloved hand on the Ingram machine gun under his coat. The vehicle passed a burning car, and the red glare revealed it to be a truck with the remnants of paint on its sides, advertising different flavors of ice cream. Two loudspeakers were mounted atop the truck's cab, and the windshield had been replaced with a metal plate that had two narrow slits cut for the driver and passengers to see through. The front fender and radiator grill 
were shielded with metal, and from the armor protruded jagged metal spikes about two feet long. The glass of both headlights was reinforced with heavy tape and covered with wire mesh. On both sides of the truck were gun slits, and atop the truck was a crude sheet metal turret and the snout of a heavy machine gun. The armored good humor truck, its modified engine snorting, rolled with chain-covered tires over the carcass of a horse and stopped about fifty yards from the barbed wire. The merry, tape-recorded calliope music continued for perhaps another two minutes, and then there was silence. The silence stretched. A man's voice came through the loudspeakers. Franklin Hayes, are you listening, Franklin Hayes? The skinny, weary man in the sheepskin coat narrowed his eyes, but said nothing. Franklin Hayes, the voice continued with a mocking, lilting note. You've given us a good fight, Franklin Hayes. The Army of Excellence salutes you. Fuck you, a middle-aged, shivering woman said softly in the trench beside Hayes. She had a knife at her belt and a pistol in her hand, and a green keloid covered most of her face in the shape of a lily pad. "'You're a fine commander, Franklin Hayes. We didn't think you had the strength to get away from us at Dunning. We thought you'd die on the highway. How many of you are left, Franklin Hayes? Four hundred? Five hundred? And how many are able to keep fighting?' Maybe half that number? The Army of Excellence has over four thousand healthy soldiers, Franklin Hayes. Some of those used to suffer for you, but they decided to save their lives and cross over to our side. Someone in the trench to the left fired a rifle, and several other shots followed. Hayes shouted, Don't waste your bullets, damn it! The firing dwindled, then ceased. Your soldiers are nervous, Franklin Hayes, the voice taunted. They know they're about to die. We're not soldiers, Hayes whispered to himself. You crazy fucker, we're not soldiers. How his community of survivors, once numbering over a thousand people trying to rebuild the town of Scott's Bluff, had gotten embroiled in this insane war, he didn't know. A van driven by a husky, red-bearded man had come into Scott's Bluff, and out had stepped another, frail-figured man with bandages wrapping his face, all except his eyes, which were covered with goggles. The bandaged man had spoken in a high, young voice, had said that he'd been badly burned a long time ago. He'd asked for water and a place to spend the night, but he wouldn't let Dr. Gardner even touch his bandages. Hayes himself, as mayor of Scott's Bluff, had taken the young man on a walking tour of the structures they were rebuilding. Sometime during the night, the two men had driven away, and three days later Scott's Bluff was attacked and burned to the ground. The screams of his wife and son still reverberated in Hayes's mind. Then Hayes had started leading the survivors east to escape the maniacs that pursued them, but the Army of Excellence had more trucks, cars, horses, trailers, and gasoline, more weapons and bullets, and soldiers, and the group that followed Hayes had left hundreds of corpses in its wake. This was an insane nightmare with no end, Hayes realized. Once he'd been an eminent professor of economics at the University of Wyoming, and now he felt like a trapped rat. The headlights of the armored good humor truck burned like two malevolent eyes. The Army of Excellence invites all able-bodied men, women, and children who don't want to suffer any more to join us, the amplified voice said. Just cross the wire and keep walking west, and you'll be well taken care of. Hot food, a warm bed, shelter, and protection. Bring your weapons and ammunition with you, but keep the barrels of your guns pointed to the ground. If you are healthy and sound of mind, and if you are unblemished by the mark of Cain, we invite you with love and open arms. You have five minutes to decide. The mark of Cain, Hayes thought grimly. He'd heard that phrase through those damned speakers before, 
and he knew they meant either the keloids or the growths that covered the faces of many people. They only wanted those unblemished and sound of mind. But he wondered about the young man with the eye goggles and the bandaged face. Why had he been wearing those bandages if he himself had not been blemished by the mark of Cain? Whoever was guiding that mob of ravagers and rapists was beyond all humanity. Somehow he, or she, had drilled bloodlust into the brains of over four thousand followers, and now they were killing, looting, and burning struggling communities for the sheer thrill of it. There was a shout to the right. Two men were struggling over the barbed wire. They got across, snagging their coats and trousers, but pulling free, and started running west with their rifles pointed to the ground. "'Cowards!' someone shouted. "'You dirty cowards!' but the two men did not look back. A woman went across, followed by another man. Then a man, a woman, and a young boy escaped the trench and fled to the west, all carrying guns and ammunition. Angry shouts and curses were flung at their backs, but Hayes didn't blame them. None of them bore keloids. Why should they stay and be slaughtered? "'Come home,' the voice intoned over the loudspeakers like the silken drone of a revival preacher. Come home to love and open arms. Flee the mark of Cain, and come home, come home, come home. More people were going over the wire. They vanished westward into the darkness. Don't suffer with the unclean. Come home, flee the mark of Cain. A gunshot rang out and one of the truck's headlights shattered. But the mesh deflected the slug, and the light continued to burn. Still people climbed over the fence and scurried west. "'I ain't going nowhere,' the woman with the lily-pad keloid told Hayes. "'I'm set and staying.' The last to go was a teenage boy with a shotgun, his overcoat pockets stuffed with shells. "'It's time, Franklin Hayes,' the voice called. He took out the Ingram gun and pushed the safety off. "'It's time!' the voice roared, and the roar was joined by other roars, rising together, mixing and mingling like a single inhuman battle cry. But they were the roars of engines firing, popping and sputtering, blasting to full-throated life. And then the headlights came on. Dozens of headlights. Hundreds of headlights that curved in an arc on both sides of Highway 2, facing the trench. Hayes realized with numb terror that the other armored trucks, tractor-trailer rigs, and monster machines had been silently pushed almost to the barbed wire barrier, while the good humor truck had kept their attention. The headlights speared into the faces of those in the trenches, as engines were gunned and chain tires crunched forward across snow and frozen bodies. Hayes stood up to yell, Fire! But the shooting had already started. Sparks of gunfire rippled up and down the trench. Bullets whined off metal tire guards, radiator shields, and iron turrets. Still the battle wagons came on, almost leisurely, and the Army of Excellence held their fire. Then Hayes screamed, Use the bombs! But he was not heard over the tumult. The trench fighters didn't have to be told to crouch down, pick up one of the three gasoline-filled bottles they'd all been supplied with, touch the rag wicks to the flames from oil barrels, and throw the homemade bombs. The bottles exploded, sending flaming gasoline shooting across the snow. But in the leaping red light the monsters came on, unscathed, and now some of them were rolling over the barbed wire less than twenty feet from the trench. One bottle scored a direct hit on the view-slit of a Pinto's armored windshield. It shattered and sprayed fiery gas. The driver tumbled out screaming, his face aflame. He staggered toward the wire, and Franklin Hayes shot him dead with the Ingram gun. The Pinto kept going, tore through the barricade, and crushed four people before they could scramble from the trench. The vehicles tore the barbed wire barricade to shreds and suddenly their crude turrets and gun ports erupted with rifle, pistol, and machine-gun fire that swept across the trench as Hayes's followers tried to run. Dozens slithered back in or lay motionless in the dirty, blood-streaked snow. 
One of the burning oil cans went over, touching off unused bombs that began exploding in the trench. Everywhere was fire and streaking bullets, writhing bodies, screams, and a blur of confusion. Move back, Franklin Hayes yelled. The defenders fled toward the second barrier, about fifty yards behind, a five-foot-high wall of bricks, timbers, and frozen bodies of their friends and families stacked up like cordwood. Franklin Hayes saw soldiers on foot, fast approaching behind the first wave of vehicles. The trench was wide enough to catch any car or truck that tried to pass, but the Army of Excellence's infantry would soon swarm across, and through the smoke and blowing snow there seemed to be thousands. He heard their war cry, a low, animalish moan that almost shook the earth. Then the armored radiator of a truck was staring him in the face, and he scrambled out of the trench as the vehicle stopped two feet short. A bullet whined past his head, and he stumbled over the body of the woman with the lily-pad keloid. Then he was up and running, and bullets thunked into the snow all around him, and he clambered up over the wall of bricks and bodies and turned again to face the attackers. Explosions started blasting the wall apart, metal shrapnel flying. Hayes realized they were using hand grenades, something they'd saved until now, and he kept firing at running figures until the Ingram gun blistered his hands. "'They've broken through on the right!' somebody shouted. "'They're coming in!' Swarms of men were running in all directions. Hayes fumbled in his pocket, found another clip, and reloaded. One of the enemy soldiers leapt over the wall— and Hayes had time to see that his face was daubed with what looked like Indian war paint before the man spun and drove a knife into the side of a woman fighting a few feet away. Hayes shot him through the head, kept shooting as the soldier jerked and fell. "'Run! Get back!' somebody yelled. Other voices, other screams pierced the wail of noise. "'We can't hold them! They're breaking through!' A man with blood streaming down his face grasped Hayes's arm. "'Mr. Hayes,' he shouted, "'they're breaking through. We can't hold them back any—' He was interrupted by the blade of an axe sinking into his skull. Hayes staggered back. The Ingram gun dropped from his hands, and he sank down to his knees. The axe was pulled loose, and the corpse fell to the snow. "'Franklin Hayes?' a soft, almost gentle voice asked. He saw a long-haired figure standing over him. Couldn't make out the face. He was tired, all used up. Yes, he replied. Time to go to sleep, the man said, and he lifted his axe. When it fell, a dwarf who had crouched atop the broken wall jumped up and clapped his hands. Chapter 50 a battered jeep with one good headlight emerged from the snow on Missouri Highway 63 and entered what had once been a town. Lanterns glowed within a few of the clabbered houses, but otherwise darkness ruled the streets. "'Stop there!' Sister motioned toward a brick structure on the right. The building's windows were boarded up, but crowded around it in the gravel parking lot were several old cars and pickup trucks. As Paul Thorson guided the jeep into the lot, the single headlight washed over a sign printed in red on one of the boarded windows, Bucket of Blood Tavern. Uh, you sure you want to stop at this particular place? Paul inquired. She nodded, her head cowled by the hood of a dark blue parka. Where there are cars, somebody ought to know where to find gas. She glanced at the fuel gauge. The needle hovered near empty. Maybe we can find out where the hell we are, too. Paul turned off the heater, then the single headlight and the engine. He was wearing his old reliable leather jacket over a red woolen sweater with a scarf around his neck and a brown woolen cap pulled over his skull. His beard was ashen gray, as was much of his hair, but his eyes were still a powerful, undimmed electric blue against the heavily lined, wind-burned skin of his face. He glanced uneasily at the sign on the boards and climbed out of the jeep. Sister reached into the rear compartment, where an assortment of canvas bags, cardboard boxes, and crates were secured with a chain and padlock. Right behind her seat was a beat-up brown leather satchel. 
which she picked up with one gloved hand and took with her. From beyond the door came the noise of off-key piano music and a burst of raucous male laughter. Paul braced himself and pushed it open, walking in with Sister at his heels. The door, fixed to the wall with tight springs, snapped shut behind them. Instantly the music and laughter ceased. Suspicious eyes glared at the new arrivals. At the room's center, next to a freestanding cast-iron stove, six men had been playing cards around a table. A haze of yellow smoke from hand-rolled cigarettes hung in the air, diffusing the light of several lanterns that dangled from wall hooks. Other tables were occupied by two or three men and some rough-looking women. A bartender in a fringed leather jacket stood behind a long bar that Paul noted was pocked with bullet holes. Blazing logs popped red sparks from a fireplace in the rear wall, and at the piano sat a chunky young woman with long black hair and a violet keloid that covered the lower half of her face and exposed throat. Both Sister and Paul had seen that most of the men wore guns and holsters at their waists and had rifles propped against their chairs. The floor was an inch deep in sawdust, and the tavern smelled of unwashed bodies. There was a sharp ping as one of the men at the center table spat tobacco juice into a pail. "'We're lost,' Paul said. "'What town is this?' A man laughed. He had greasy black hair and was wearing what looked like a dogskin coat. He blew smoke into the air from a brown cigarette. "'What town you trying to get to, fella?' "'We're just traveling. Is this place on the map?' The men exchanged amused glances, and now the laughter spread. "'What map do you mean?' the one with greasy hair asked. Drawn up before the 17th of July or after? Before. The before maps ain't no fucking good, another man said. He had a bony face and was shaved almost bald. Four fish hooks dangled from his left earlobe, and he wore a leather vest over a red-checked shirt. At his skinny waist were a holster and pistol. Everything's changed. Towns are graveyards. Rivers flooded over, changed course and froze. Lakes dried up. What was woods is desert. So the before maps ain't no fucking good. Paul was aware of all that. After seven years of traveling a zigzag path across a dozen states, there was very little that shocked him or sister any more. Did this town ever have a name? Moberly, the bartender offered. Moberly, Missouri. Used to be about 15,000 people here. Now I guess we're down to three or four hundred. Yeah, but it ain't the nukes that killed him. A wizened woman with red hair and red lips spoke up from another table. It's the rot-gut shit you serve in here, Derwin. She cackled and raised a mug of oily-looking liquid to her lips while the others laughed and hooted. Oh, fuck you, Lizzie, Derwin shot back. Your gut's been pickled since you was ten years old. Sister walked to an empty table and set her satchel atop it. Beneath the hood of her parka, most of her face was covered by a dark gray scarf. Unsnapping the satchel, she removed the tattered, folded, and refolded Rand McNally Road Atlas, which she smoothed out and opened to the map of Missouri. In the dim light she found the thin red line of Highway 63 and followed it to a dot named Moberly about seventy-five miles north of what had been Jefferson City. "'Here we are,' she told Paul, who came over to look. "'Great,' he said grimly. "'So what does that tell us? What direction do we go from—' The satchel was suddenly snatched off the table, and Sister looked up, stunned. The bony-faced man in the leather vest had it and was backing away with a grin on his thin-lipped mouth. "'Looky what I got me, boys!' he shouted. "'Got me a nice new bag, didn't I?' Sister stood very still. "'Give that back to me,' she said quietly but firmly. "'Got me something to shit in when it's too cold in the woods,' the man responded, and the others around the table laughed. His small black eyes darted toward Paul, daring him to move. "'Quit fucking around, Earl,' Derwin said. "'What do you need a bag for?' 
"'Cause I do, that's why. Let's see what we got in here. Earl dug a hand into it and started pulling out pairs of socks, scarves, and gloves, and then he reached way down, and his hand came up with a ring of glass. It flared with bloody color in his grip, and he stared at it in open-mouthed wonder. The tavern was silent, but for the popping of fireplace logs. The red-haired hag slowly rose from her chair. "'Sweet mother of Jesus!' she whispered. The men around the card table gawked, and the black-haired girl left her piano stool to limp closer. Earl held the glass ring before his face, watching the colors ebb and swell like blood rushing through arteries, but his grip on the ring produced brutal hues, muddy brown, oily yellow, and ebony. "'That belongs to me,' Sister's voice was muffled behind the scarf. "'Please give it back.' Paul took a forward step. Earl's hand went to the butt of his pistol with a gunfighter's reflexes, and Paul stopped. "'Found me a play pretty, didn't I?' Earl asked. The ring was pulsing faster, turning darker and uglier by the second. All but two of the spikes had been broken off over the years. "'Jewels!' Earl had just realized where the colors were coming from. "'This thing must be worth a goddamn fortune!' "'I've asked you to give it back,' Sister said. "'Got me a fucking fortune!' Earl shouted, his eyes glazed and greedy. "'Break this damn glass open and dig them jewels out. I got me a fortune!' He grinned crazily, lifted the ring over his head, and began to prance for his friends at the table. "'Looky here! I got me a halo, boys!' Paul took another step, and instantly Earl spun to face him. The pistol was already leaving his holster. But Sister was ready. The short-barreled shotgun she'd drawn from beneath her parka boomed like a shout from God. Earl was lifted off the floor and propelled through the air, his body crashing over tables and his own gunshot blasting a chunk from a wooden beam above Sister's head. He landed in a crumpled heap, one hand still gripping the ring. The murky colors pulsed wildly. The man in the dogskin coat started to rise. Sister pumped another round into the smoking chamber, whirled and pressed the barrel to his throat. You want some of it? He shook his head and sank down into his chair again. Guns on the table, she ordered. And eight pistols were pushed over the grimy cards and coins to the table's center. Paul had his three fifty seven magnum cocked and waiting. He caught a movement from the bartender and aimed it at the man's head. Derwin raised his hands. "'No trouble, friend,' Derwin said nervously. "'I want to live, okay?' The pulsing of the glass ring was beginning to stutter and slow. Paul edged toward the dying man as Sister held her sawed-off riot gun on the others. She'd found the weapon three years earlier in a deserted highway patrol station outside the ruins of Wichita, and it packed enough punch to knock an elephant down. She'd only had to use it a few times, with the same result as now. Paul tried to avoid all the blood. A fly buzzed past his face and hovered over the ring. It was large and green, an ugly thing, and Paul was taken aback for a few seconds, because it had been years since he'd seen a fly. He'd thought they were all dead. A second fly joined the first, and they swirled in the air around the twitching body and the glass circle. Paul bent down. The ring flared bright red for an instant, and then went black. He worked it from the corpse's grip, and in his hand the rainbow colors returned. Then he shoved it down into the satchel again and covered it over with the socks, scarves, and gloves. A fly landed on his cheek, and he jerked his head because the little bastard felt like a freezing nail pressed to his skin. He returned the road atlas to the satchel. All eyes were on the woman with the shotgun. She took the satchel and retreated slowly toward the door, keeping the weapon aimed at the center of the card table. She told herself she'd had no choice but to kill the man, and that was the end of it. She'd come too far with the glass circle to let some fool break it to pieces. Hey, the man in the dogskin coat said, you ain't going to go without us buying you a drink, are you? What? 
Earl wasn't worth a damn, another man volunteered, and he leaned over to spit tobacco into his pail. Trigger Happy Idget was always killing people. He shot Jimmy Ridgway dead right here a couple months ago, Derwin said. Bastard was too good with that pistol. Till now, the other man said. The card players were already dividing the dead man's coins. Here you go. Derwin picked up two glasses and drew oily amber liquid from a keg. Homemade brew. Tastes kind of funky, but it'll sure get your mind off your troubles. He offered the glasses to Paul and Sister. On the house. It had been months since Paul's last sip of alcohol. The strong, woody smell of the stuff drifted to him like a siren's perfume. His insides were quaking. He'd never used the magnum on a human being before, and he prayed that he'd never have to. Paul accepted the glass, and thought the fumes might sear off his eyebrows, but he took a drink anyway. It was like gargling molten metal. Tears popped from his eyes. He coughed, sputtered, and gasped, as the moonshine, fermented out of God only knew what, slashed down his throat. The red-haired hag cackled like a crow, and some of the men in the back guffawed as well. As Paul tried to regain his breath, Sister set the satchel aside, not too far, and raised the second glass. The bartender said, "'Yeah, you did old Earl Hokut a good deed. He's been wanting somebody to kill him ever since his wife and little girl died of the fever last year.' "'Is that so?' she asked, as she pulled the scarf away from her face. She lifted the glass to her deformed lips and drank without a flinch. Derwin's eyes widened, and he backed away so fast he knocked a shelf of glasses and mugs to the floor. Chapter 51 Sister was prepared for the reaction. She'd seen it many times before. She sipped the moonshine again, found it no better or worse than many bottles she'd drunk from on the streets of Manhattan, and sensed everyone in the bar watching her. What a good look, she thought. What a real good look. She put the glass down and turned to let them all see. The red-haired hag stopped cackling as abruptly as if she'd been kicked in the throat. Good God Almighty, the tobacco chewer managed to say after he'd swallowed his chaw. The lower half of Sister's face was a mass of gray growths, knotty tendrils twisted and intertwined over her chin, jaw, and cheeks. The hard growths had pulled Sister's mouth slightly to the left, giving her a sardonic smile. Under the hood of her parka, her skull was a scabby crust. The growths had completely enclosed her scalp and were now beginning to send out tough gray tendrils across her forehead and over both ears. A leper! One of the card players scrambled to his feet. She's got leprosy! The mention of that dreaded disease made the others leap up, forgetting guns, cards, and coins, and back across the tavern. Get out of here! Another one yelled. Don't give that shit to us! Leper! Leper! The red-haired hag shrieked picking up a mug to throw at Sister. There were other shouts and threats, but Sister was unperturbed. This was a common scene wherever she was forced to expose her face. Over the cacophony of voices there came a sharp, insistent crack, crack, crack. Silhouetted by light from the fireplace, a thin figure stood against the far wall, methodically beating a wooden staff over one of the tabletops. The noise gradually won out until an uneasy silence remained. "'Gentlemen and ladies,' the man with the wooden staff said in a ravaged voice, "'I can assure you that our friend's affliction is not leprosy. As a matter of fact, I don't think it's the least bit contagious, so you don't have to ruin your underdrawers. "'What the hell do you know, scumbag?' the man in the dogskin coat challenged. The other figure paused, then positioned the staff under his left armpit. He began to shuffle forward, his left trouser leg pinned up just above the knee. He wore a ragged dark brown coat over a dirty beige cardigan sweater, and on his hands were gloves so well worn the fingers were poking through. Lamplight touched his face. 
Silver hair cascaded around his shoulders, though the crown of his scalp was bald and mottled with brown keloids. He had a short grizzled gray beard and finely chiseled facial features, his nose thin and elegant. Sister thought he might have been handsome, but for the bright crimson keloid that covered one side of his face like a port wine stain. He stopped, standing between Sister, Paul, and the others. "'My name is not Scumbag,' he said with an air of ruined royalty. His deep-set, tormented gray eyes shifted toward the man in the dogskin coat. "'I used to be Hugh Ryan, Dr. Hugh Ryan, surgeon-in-residence at Amarillo Medical Center in Amarillo, Texas.' "'You a doctor?' the other man countered. "'Bullshit!' My current living standards make these gentlemen think I was born terminally thirsty, he told Sister, and he lifted one palsied hand. Of course, I'm not suited for a scalpel any more. But then again, who is? He approached Sister and touched her face. The odor of his unwashed body almost knocked her down, but she'd smelled worse. This is not leprosy, he repeated. This is a mass of fibrous tissue, originating from a subcutaneous source. How deep the fibroid layer penetrates, I don't know. But I've seen this condition many times before, and in my opinion it's not contagious. We've seen other people with it, too, Paul said. He was used to the way Sister looked, because it had happened so gradually, beginning with the black warts on her face. He'd examined his own head and face for them, but so far he was unaffected. What causes it? Hugh Ryan shrugged, still pressing at the growths. Possibly the skin's reaction to radiation, pollutants, lack of sunshine for so long. Who knows? Oh, I've seen maybe a hundred or more people with it in many different stages. Fortunately... There seems to remain a small breathing and eating space, no matter how severe the condition becomes. It's leprosy, I say, the red-haired hag contended, but the men were settling down again, returning to their table. A few of them left the tavern, and the others continued to stare at Sister with a sickened fascination. It itches like hell, and sometimes my head aches like it's about to split open, Sister admitted. How do I get rid of it? That, unfortunately, I can't say. I've never seen Job's mask regress, but then I only saw most of the cases in passing. Job's mask? Is that what it's called? Well, that's what I call it. Seems appropriate, doesn't it? Sister grunted. She and Paul had seen dozens of people with Job's mask scattered across the nine states they'd traveled through. In Kansas, they'd come upon a colony of forty afflicted people who had been forced out of a nearby settlement by their own families. In Iowa, Sister had seen a man whose head was so encrusted he was unable to hold it upright. Job's mask afflicted men and women with equal savagery, and Sister had even seen a few teenagers with it. But children younger than seven or eight seemed to be immune, or at least Sister had never seen any babies or young children with it, though both parents might be horribly deformed. "'Will I have this for the rest of my life?' Hugh shrugged again, unable to help any further. His eyes locked with hungry need on Sister's glass of moonshine, still atop the bar. She said, "'Be my guest,' and he drank it down, as if it were iced tea on a hot August afternoon. "'Thank you very much.' He wiped his mouth on his sleeve and glanced at the dead man lying in the bloody sawdust. The chunky, black-haired girl was eagerly going through the pockets. "'There is no right and wrong in this world any more,' he said. "'There's only a faster gun and a higher level of violence.' He nodded toward the table he'd been occupying over by the fireplace. "'If you please,' he asked Sister with a note of pleading, "'it's been so long since I've been able to talk to someone of obvious breeding and intellect.' Sister and Paul were in no hurry. 
She picked up her satchel, sliding her shotgun into the leather sheath that hung along her hip beneath the parka. Paul returned his magnum to its holster, and they followed Hugh Ryan. Derwin finally steeled himself to emerge from behind the bar, and the man in the dogskin coat helped him carry Earl's body out the back door. As Hugh got his remaining leg propped up on a chair, Sister couldn't help but notice the stuffed trophies that adorned the wall around the bucket of blood's fireplace. An albino squirrel, a deer's head with three eyes, a boar with a single eye at the center of its forehead, and a two-headed woodchuck. "'Derwin's a hunter,' Hugh explained. "'You can find all sorts of things in the woods around here. Amazing what the radiation's done, isn't it?' He admired the trophies for a moment. "'You don't want to sleep too far from the light,' he said, turning his attention back to Paul and Sister. "'You really don't.' He reached for the half-glass of moonshine he'd been drinking before they'd come in. Two green flies buzzed around his head, and Paul watched them circling. Hugh motioned toward the satchel. "'I couldn't help but notice that glass trinket. May I ask what it is?' "'Just something I picked up.' "'Where? A museum?' "'No, I found it in a pile of rubble.' "'It's a beautiful thing,' he said. "'I'd be careful with it if I were you. "'I've met people who'd behead you for a piece of bread.' "'Sister nodded. "'That's why I carry the shotgun, "'and that's why I learned to use it, too. "'Indeed.' "'He swilled down the rest of the moonshine and smacked his lips. "'Ah, nectar of the gods. "'I wouldn't go that far.' Paul's throat still felt as if it had been scraped with razors. Well, taste is relative, isn't it? Hugh spent a moment licking the inside of the glass to get the last drops before he put it aside. I used to be a connoisseur of French brandies. I used to have a wife, three children, and a Spanish villa with a hot tub and a swimming pool. He touched his stump. I used to have another leg, too. But that's the past, isn't it? And beware of dwelling on the past, if you want to keep your sanity. He stared into the fire, then looked across the table at Sister. So, where have you been, and where are you going? Everywhere, she replied, and nowhere in particular. For the past seven years, Sister and Paul Thorson had been following a dream-walk path a blind man's buff of pictures Sister had seen in the depths of the glass circle. They'd traveled from Pennsylvania to Kansas, had found the town of Matheson. But Matheson had been burned to the ground, the ruins covered with snow. They'd searched Matheson, found only skeletons and destruction, and then they'd reached the parking lot of a burned-out building that might have been a department store or supermarket. And on that snow-swept parking lot, in the midst of desolation, Sister had heard the whisper of God. It was a small thing at first. The toe of Paul's boot had uncovered a card. Hey, Paul had called out, look at this. He wiped the dirt and snow from it and handed it to her. The colors were bleached out, but it showed a beautiful woman in violet robes, the sun shining overhead, and a lion and lamb at her feet. She held a silver shield with what might have been a flaming phoenix at its center, and she wore a blazing crown. The woman's hair was afire, and she stared courageously into the distance. At the top of the card were the faded letters, The Empress. It's a tarot card, Paul had said, and Sister's knees had almost buckled. More cards, bits of glass, clothes, and other debris had been buried under the snow. Sister saw a spot of color, picked it up, and found she was holding an image she recognized, a card with a figure shrouded in black, its face white and mask-like. Its eyes were silver and hateful, and in the center of its forehead was a third scarlet eye. She'd torn that card to pieces rather than add it to her bag along with the empress. And then Sister had stepped on something soft, and as she bent down to brush the snow away, 
and saw what it was. Tears had filled her eyes. It was a scorched, blue-furred doll. As she lifted it in her arms, she saw the little plastic ring hanging down, and she pulled it. In the cold and snowy silence, a labored voice moaned, Cookies! And the sound drifted over the lot where skeletons lay dreaming. The cookie monster doll had gone into Sister's bag, and then it had been time to leave Matheson, because there was no child skeleton in that parking lot, and Sister knew now more than ever that she was searching for a child. They'd roamed Kansas for more than two years, living in various struggling settlements. They had turned north into Nebraska, east into Iowa, and now south to Missouri. A land of suffering and brutality had unfolded itself to them like a continuing, unescapable hallucination. On many occasions, Sister had peered into the glass circle and caught sight of a hazy human face looking back, as if through a badly discolored mirror. That particular image had remained constant over seven years, and though Sister couldn't tell very much about the face, she thought that it had begun as a young face, that of a child though whether male or female she couldn't tell, and over the years the face had changed. The last time she'd seen it was four months ago, and Sister had the impression that the facial features were all but wiped clean. Since then the hazy image had not reappeared. Sometimes Sister felt sure the next day would bring an answer. But the days had passed, becoming weeks, months, and years, and still she continued searching, the roads kept carrying her and Paul across devastated countryside, through deserted towns and around the perimeter of jagged ruins where cities had stood. Many times she had been discouraged, had thought of giving it up and staying in one of the settlements they'd passed through, but that was before her Job's mask had gotten so bad. Now she was beginning to think the only place she might be welcome was in a colony of Job's mask sufferers. But the truth was that she feared staying in one place too long. She kept looking over her shoulder, afraid that a dark figure with a shifting face had finally found her and was coming up from behind. In her nightmares of Doyle Halland, or Dal Hallmark, or whatever he called himself now, he had a single scarlet eye in his forehead, like the grim figure on the tarot card, and it was relentlessly probing for her. Often, in the years past, Sister had felt her skin prickle, as if he was somewhere very near, about to close in on her. At those times she and Paul had hit the road again, and Sister dreaded crossroads, because she knew the wrong turn could lead them to his waiting hands. She pushed the memories out of her mind. "'How about you? Have you been here long? Eight months. After the seventeenth of July, I went north from Amarillo with my family.' We lived in a settlement on the Purgatoire River, south of Los Animas, Colorado, for three years. A lot of Indians live around there. Some of them were Vietnam vets, and they taught us stupid city folks how to build mud huts and stay alive. He smiled painfully. It's a shock to be living in a million-dollar mansion one month, and the next— find yourself under a roof of mud and cow dung. Anyway, two of our children died the first year. Radiation poisoning. But we were warm when the snow started falling, and we felt damn lucky. Why didn't you stay there? Paul asked. Hugh stared into the fire. It was a long time before he answered. We had a community of about two hundred people. We had a supply of corn, some flour and salted beef, and a lot of canned food. The river water wasn't exactly clean, but it was keeping us alive. He rubbed the stump of his leg. Then they came. They? Who? First it was three men and two women. They came in a jeep and a Buick with an armored windshield. They stopped in Purgatoire Flats. That's what we called our town. 
and they wanted to buy half our food. Of course, we couldn't sell it, not for any price. We'd starve if we did. Then they threatened us. They said we'd regret not giving them what they wanted. I remember that Curtis Redfeather, he was our mayor, a big Pawnee who'd served in Vietnam, went to his hut and came back with an automatic rifle. He told them to go, and they left. Hugh paused. He slowly clenched his fists atop the table. They came back, he said softly. That night. Oh, yes, they came back, with three hundred armed soldiers and trucks that they'd made into tanks. They started smashing Purgatoire flats to the ground and killing everybody. Everybody! His voice cracked, and he couldn't go on for a minute. People were running, trying to get away, he said. But the soldiers had machine guns. I ran with my wife and daughter. I saw Curtis Redfeather shot down and run over by a jeep. He didn't, he didn't even look like a human being anymore. Hugh closed his eyes, but there was such torment etched into his face that Sister could not look at him. She watched the fire. My wife was shot in the back, he continued. I stopped to help her, and I told my daughter to run for the river. I never saw her again. But I was picking up my wife when the bullets hit me. Two or three, I think, in the leg. Somebody hit me in the head, and I fell. I remember... I woke up, and the barrel of a rifle was pointed in my face, and someone, a man's voice, said, Tell them the Army of Excellence passed this way. The Army of Excellence, he repeated bitterly, and he opened his eyes. They were shocked and bloodshot. Four or five people were left and they made a stretcher for me. They carried me more than thirty miles to the north, to another settlement. But that one was ashes, too, by the time we got there. My leg was shattered. It had to come off. I told them how to do it, and I hung on, and we kept going. And that was four years ago. He looked at Sister and leaned slightly forward in his chair. For God's sake, he said urgently, don't go west. That's where the battle lands are. The battle lands? Paul asked. What do you mean? I mean they're having war out there. In Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska. The Dakotas, too. Oh, I've met plenty of refugees from the west. They call it the Battlelands because so many armies are fighting out there. The American Allegiance, Nolan's Raiders, the Army of Excellence, Troop Hydra, and maybe five or six others. The war's done, Sister frowned. What the hell are they fighting over? Land? Settlements? Food, guns, gasoline? Whatever's left? They're out of their minds. They want to kill somebody, and if it can't be the Russians, they've got to invent enemies. I've heard the Army of Excellence is on a rampage against survivors with keloids. He touched the scarlet, upraised scar that covered half his face. Supposed to be the mark of Satan. Paul shifted uneasily in his chair. In their travels, he and Sister had heard about settlements being attacked and burned by bands of marauders, but this was the first they'd heard of organized forces. How big are these armies? Who's leading them? Maniacs. So-called patriots. Military men, you name it, you said. Last week, a man and woman who'd seen the American allegiance pass through here. They said it numbered about four or five thousand and a crazy preacher from California is leading it. He calls himself the Savior, 
and wants to kill everybody who won't follow him. I've heard troop hydras executing blacks, Hispanics, Orientals, Jews, and everybody else they consider foreign. The Army of Excellence is supposedly led by an ex-military man, a Vietnam War hero. They're the bastards with the tanks. God help us if those maniacs start moving east. All we want is enough gasoline to get to the next town, Paul said. We're heading south to the Gulf of Mexico. He swatted at a fly that landed on his hand. Again, there was a feeling of being pricked by a freezing nail. Hugh smiled wistfully. The Gulf of Mexico. My God, I haven't seen the Gulf for a long, long time. What's the nearest town from here? Sister asked. I suppose that would be Mary's Rest, south of what used to be Jefferson City. The road's not too good, though. They used to have a big pond at Mary's Rest. Anyway, it's not far. About fifty miles. How do we get there on an empty tank? Hugh glanced over at the bloody sawdust. Well, Earl Hocutt's truck is parked out front, I doubt he'll need the gasoline any more, don't you? Paul nodded. They had a length of garden hose in the jeep, and Paul had become very proficient at stealing gas. A fly landed on the table in front of Hugh. He suddenly upended his moonshine glass over it and trapped the insect. It buzzed angrily around and around, and Hugh watched it circling. You don't see flies too often, he said. A few of them stay in here because of the warmth, I guess. And the blood. That one's mad as the devil, isn't he? Sister heard the low hum of another fly as it passed her head. It made a slow circle above the table and shot toward a chink in the wall. Is there a place we could spend the night here? She asked Hugh. I can find one for you. It won't be much more than a hole in the ground with a lid over it. But you won't freeze to death, and you won't get your throat slit. He tapped the glass, and the large green fly tried to attack his finger. But if I find you a safe place to sleep, he said, I'd like something in return. What's that? Hugh smiled. I'd like to see the Gulf of Mexico. Forget it, Paul told him. We don't have the room. Oh, you'd be surprised what a one-legged old man can squeeze himself into. More weight means using more gasoline, not to mention food and water. No, sorry. I weigh about as much as a wet feather, Hugh persisted. And I can carry along my own food and water. If you want payment for taking me with you, perhaps I can interest you in two jugs of moonshine I've kept hidden for an emergency. Paul was about to say no again, but his lips locked. The moonshine was about the nastiest stuff he'd ever tasted, but it sure had quickened his pulse and kicked on his furnace. How about it? you asked sister. Some of the bridges are broken down between here and Mary's Rest. I can do a lot better for you than that antique map you're carrying. Her first impulse was to agree with Paul. But she saw the suffering in Hugh Ryan's gray eyes. He wore the expression of a once loyal dog that had been beaten and abandoned by a trusted master. Please, he said, there's nothing for me here. I'd like to see if the waves still roll in like they used to. Sister thought about it. No doubt the man could scrunch himself up in the back of the jeep, and they might well need a guide to get to the next town. He was waiting for an answer. "'You find us a safe place to spend the night,' she said. "'And we'll talk about it in the morning. "'That's the best I can do for now. "'Deal?' Hugh hesitated, searching Sister's face. Hers was a strong face, he decided, and her eyes weren't dead like those of so many others he'd seen. It was unfortunate that most likely the Job's mask would eventually seal them shut. "'Deal!' he said, and they shook on it. They left the bucket of blood to get the gas from the dead man's truck. Behind them, 
The red-haired hag scuttled over to the table they'd left and watched the fly buzzing around in the upturned glass. She suddenly picked it up and snatched the fly as it tried to escape, and before it could get loose from her hand, she shoved the fly into her mouth and crunched her teeth down on it. Her face contorted. She opened her mouth and spat a small glob of grayish green into the fire, where it sizzled like acid. Nasty, she said, and she wiped her tongue with sawdust. Chapter 52 He was waiting in the dark for them to come home. The wind was strong. It sang sweetly to his soul of millions dead and the dying not yet done. But when the wind was so strong he couldn't search very far. He sat in the dark, in his new face and his new skin, with the wind shrilling around the shed like a party noisemaker, and thought that maybe, just maybe, it would be tonight. But he understood the twists and turns of time, and so if it was not tonight, there was always tomorrow. He could be very patient, if he had to be. Seven years had passed quickly for him. He had traveled the roads a solitary journeyer, through Ohio, Indiana, Kentucky, Tennessee, and Arkansas. He had sometimes lodged in struggling settlements, sometimes lived by himself in caves and abandoned cars as the mood struck him. Wherever he passed was darkened by his presence. The settlements sucked dry of hope and compassion and left to blow away as the inhabitants killed one another or themselves. He had the knack of showing them how futile life was and what the tragedy of false hope could bring about. If your child is hungry, kill it, he urged starving mothers. Think of suicide as the noble thing, he told men who asked his advice. He was a fountain of information and wisdom that he was eager to share. All dogs spread cancer and must be killed. People with brown keloids have developed a taste for the flesh of children. There's a new city being built in the wilds of Canada, and that's where you should go. You could get a lot of protein by eating your own fingers. After all, how many do you need? He was continually astonished by how easy it was to make them believe. It was a great party, but for one thing, and that one thing gnawed at him day and night, where was the ring of glass? The woman, sister, was surely dead by now. He didn't care about her anyway. Where was the glass thing, and who had it? Many times he'd sensed he was close to it, that the next crossroads would take him right to it. But the instincts had always faded, and he was left deciding to try a new direction. He'd searched the mind of everyone he met, but the woman was not in there, and neither was the ring of glass. So he went on. But with the passage of years his traveling had slowed somewhat, because there were so many opportunities in the settlements, and because even if the glass ring was still out there somewhere, it didn't seem to be of any consequence. It wasn't doing anything, was it? It was still his party, and nothing had changed. The threat he'd felt from it, back in the house in New Jersey, still remained with him, but whatever else the glass ring was, it was surely not making a difference in his existence or in the things he saw around him. No problemo, he thought. But where was it? Who had it? And why had it come to be? Often he recalled the day he'd turned off Interstate 80 on his French racing bicycle and headed south. He'd sometimes wondered what would have happened if he'd gone back east along I-80. Would he have found the woman in the glass ring? Why hadn't the sentries at that Red Cross station seen her by then, if indeed she was still alive? But he couldn't see everything or know everything. He could only see and know what his counterfeit eyes told him, or what he picked from the human mind, or what the searchers brought him back from the dark. They were coming to him right now. He sensed the mass of them gathering together from all points of the compass and approaching against the wind. He pushed himself toward the door, and the wheels beneath him squeaked. The first one touched his cheek, 
and was sucked through the flesh, as if into an opening vortex. His eyes rolled back in his head, and he looked inward, saw a dark forest, heard wind shrieking, and nothing more. Another thing that resembled a fly squeezed through a hole in the wall and landed on his forehead, instantly being drawn into the rippling flesh. Two more joined it and were pulled down. He saw more dark woods, an icy puddle, a small animal of some kind lying dead in the brush. A crow swept in, snapped, and spun away. More flies penetrated his face. More images whirled through him. A woman scrubbing clothes in a lamplit room. Two men fighting with knives in an alley. A two-headed boar, snuffling in garbage, its four eyes glinting wetly. The flies crawled over his face, being sucked through the flesh, one after the other. He saw dark houses, heard someone playing a harmonica, badly, and someone else clapping in time, faces around a bonfire, a conversation of what baseball games used to be like on summer nights, a skinny man and woman entwined on a mattress, hands at work, cleaning a rifle, an explosion of light and a voice saying, Found me a play pretty, didn't? Stop. The image of light and the voice froze behind his eyes like a frame of a movie. He trembled. Flies were still on his face, but he concentrated on the image of the light. It was just a red flare, and he couldn't tell much about it yet. His hands clenched into fists, his long and dirty nails carving half-moons into the skin, but drawing no blood. Forward, he thought, and the film of memory began to unreal. I? The voice, a man's voice, said, and then an awestruck whisper. Jewels! Stop. He was looking down from above, and there in the man's hand was... Forward. The circle of glass, glowing with dark red and brown, a room with sawdust on the floor, glasses, cards on a table. He knew that place. He'd been there before, and he'd sent his searchers there because it was a place where travelers stopped. The bucket of blood was about a mile away, just over the next hill. His inner eye watched it unfold from the perspective of a fly. The blast of a gun, a hot shock wave, a body spewing blood and tumbling over tables. A woman's voice said, You want some of it? Then an order. Guns on the table. I've found you, he thought. He caught a glimpse of her face. Turned out to be a beauty, didn't you? He mused. Was that her? Yes, yes. It had to be her. The glass ring went into a satchel. It had to be her. The scene continued. Another face. A man with sharp blue eyes and a gray beard. Leper! Leper! Someone shouted. And then a silver-haired man was there, and he knew that face as belonging to the one everybody called Scumbag. More voices. Be my guest. Derwin's a hunter. Used to have another leg, too. For God's sake, don't go west. Supposed to be the mark of Satan. He smiled. We're heading south. That would be Mary's rest. Doubt he'll need the gasoline any more, don't you? The voices grew hazy, the light changed, and there were dark woods and houses below. He played the memory movie over again. It was her, all right. We're heading south. That would be Mary's rest. Mary's rest, he thought. Fifty miles to the south. I've found you. Going south to Mary's rest. But what was the point of waiting? Sister and the circle of glass might still be over at the bucket of blood, only a mile away. There was still time to get over there, and— Lester, I've brought you a bowl of— There was a crash of breaking pottery and a gasp of horror. He let his eyes resurface again. At the shed's door stood the woman who'd taken him in three weeks ago as a handyman. She was still very pretty, 
and it was too bad that a wild animal had chewed up her little girl in the woods one evening two weeks ago, because the child had looked just like her. The woman had dropped his bowl of soup. She was a clumsy bitch, he thought. Anybody with two fingers on each hand was bound to be clumsy. The claw of her left hand held a lantern, and by its light she'd seen the rippling, fly-swarmed face of Lester the handyman. "'Howdy, Miss Perry,' he whispered, and the fly thing swirled around his head. The woman took a backward step toward the open door. Her face was frozen into a horrified rictus, and he wondered why he'd ever thought she was pretty. "'You're not afraid, are you, Miss Perry?' he asked her. He reached out his arms, dug his fingers into the dirt floor, and drew himself forward. The wheels squeaked, badly in need of oil. I, I. She tried to speak, but she couldn't. Her legs had seized up, too, and he knew that she knew there was nowhere to run except the woods. Surely you're not afraid of me, he said softly. I'm not much of a man, am I? I do appreciate you having pity on a poor man like me, I surely do. The wheel squeaked, squeaked. Stay away from me. This is old Lester you're talking to, Miss Perry. Just old Lester, that's all. You can tell me anything. She almost broke away then, almost ran, but he said, Old Lester makes the pain go away, don't he? And she settled back into his grip like warm putty. Why don't you put that lamp down, Miss Perry? Let's have us a nice talk. I can fix things. The lantern was slowly put on the floor. So easy, he thought. This one particularly, because she was already walking dead. He was bored with her. I believe I need to fix that there gun, he said, and he nodded silkily toward the rifle in the corner. Will you fetch it for me? She picked it up. Miss Perry, he said, I want you to put the barrel in your mouth and your finger on the trigger. Yes, am go ahead. Just like that. Oh, doing just fine. Her eyes were bright and shining, and there were tears rolling down her cheeks. Now, I need you to test that there gun for me. I want you to pull the trigger and tell me if it works, okay? She resisted him, just a second of the will to live that she probably didn't even know she had any more. Lester's gonna fix things, he said. Little tiny pull, now. The rifle went off. He pulled himself forward, and the wheel squeaked over her body. The bucket of blood, he thought. Got to get over there. But then, no, no, wait, just wait. He knew Sister was on her way to Mary's rest. It wouldn't take him as long to walk cross-country as it would take her to drive over what was left of the road. He could beat her there and be waiting. There were a lot of people in Mary's rest, a lot of opportunities. He'd been thinking of traveling down that way in the next few days, anyway. She might already have left the tavern and be on the road right now. This time I won't lose you, he vowed. I'll get to Mary's rest before you. Old Lester's gonna fix things for you, too, bitch. This was a good disguise, he decided. Some modifications were needed if he was going to walk the distance, but it would do, and by the time the bitch got to Mary's rest, he'd be set up and ready to watusi on her bones until she was dust for the pot. The rest of the flies were sucked into his face, but they brought information that was of no use to him. He stretched his torso, and after a minute or two he was able to stand. Then he rolled down the legs of his trousers, picked up his little red wagon, and began walking, his feet bare, through the snow toward the forest. He began to sing very quietly. Here we go round the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. The darkness took him. 
Chapter 53 A tall figure in a long black overcoat with polished silver buttons stalked through the burning ruins of Broken Bow, Nebraska. Corpses lay scattered across what had been Broken Bow's main street, and the tank-like trucks of the Army of Excellence ran over those that were in the way. Other soldiers were loading trucks with salvaged sacks of corn, flour, beans, and drums of oil and gasoline. A pile of rifles and pistols awaited pickup by the weapons brigade. Bodies were being stripped by the clothing brigade, and members of the shelter brigade were gathering together tents that the dead would no longer need. The mechanics brigade was going over a wealth of cars, trailers, and trucks that had fallen to the victors. Those that could be made to run would become recon and transport vehicles, and the others would be stripped of tires, engines, and everything else that could possibly be used. But the man in the black overcoat, his polished ebony boots crunching over scorched earth, was only intent on one thing. He stopped before a pile of corpses that were being stripped, their coats and clothes thrown into cardboard boxes, and examined their faces by the light of a nearby bonfire. The soldiers around him stopped their work to salute. He quickly returned the salute and continued his examination, then went on to the next scatter of bodies. "'Colonel Macklin!' a voice called over the rumble of passing trucks, and the man in the black overcoat turned around. Firelight fell on the black leather mask that covered James B. Macklin's face. The right eye hole had been crudely stitched up, but through the other Macklin's cold blue eye peered at the approaching figure. Under his coat, Macklin wore a gray-green uniform and a pearl-handled forty-five and a holster at his waist. Over his breast pocket was a black circular patch with the letters A.O.E. sewn into it in silver thread. A dark green woolen cap was pulled over the colonel's head. Judd Lowry, wearing a similar uniform under a fleece-lined coat, emerged from the smoke. An M-16 was slung over his shoulder, and bandoliers of ammunition crisscrossed his chest. Judd Lowry's gray-streaked red beard was closely cropped, and his hair had been clipped almost to the scalp. Across his forehead was a deep scar that ran diagonally from his left temple up through his hair. In seven years of following Macklin, Lowry had lost twenty-five pounds of fat and flab, and now his body was hard and muscular. His face had taken on cruel angles, and his eyes had retreated into their sockets. "'Any word, Lieutenant Lowry?' Macklin's voice was distorted. The word slurred, as if something was not right with his mouth. "'No, sir. Nobody's found him. I checked with Sergeant McCowan over on the northern perimeter, but he can't produce a body either. Sergeant Ulrich took a detail through the southern segment of their defensive trench, but no luck. What about the reports from the pursuit parties? Corporal Winslow's group found six of them about a mile to the east. They tried to fight it out. Sergeant Oldfield's group found four to the north, but they'd already killed themselves. I haven't got word yet from the Southern Patrol. He can't have gotten away, Lowry, Macklin said forcefully. We've got to find the son of a bitch, or his corpse. I want him, dead or alive, in my tent within two hours. Do you understand that? Yes, sir. I'll do my best. Do more than your best. Find Captain Pogue and tell him he's in charge of bringing me the corpse of Franklin Hayes. He's a good tracker. He'll get the job done. And I want to see the casualty counts and captured weapons list by dawn. I don't want the same kind of fuck-up that happened last time. Got it? Yes, sir. Good. I'll be in my tent. Macklin started to move off, then turned back. Where's Roland? I don't know. I saw him about an hour ago over on the south edge of town. If you see him, have him report to me. Carry on. Macklin stalked away toward his headquarters tent. Judd Lowry watched him go, and he couldn't suppress a shudder. It had been more than two years since he'd last seen Colonel Macklin's face. The colonel had started wearing that leather mask to protect his skin against radiation and pollution. 
but it seemed to Lowry that Macklin's face was actually changing shape. From the way the mask buckled and strained against the bones, Lowry knew what it was. That damned disease that a lot of others in the Army of Excellence had gotten as well, the growths that had got on your face and grew together, covering everything but a hole at your mouth. Everyone knew Macklin had it, and Captain Croninger was afflicted with it too, and that was why the boy wore bandages on his face. The worst cases were rounded up and executed, and to Lowry it was a whole hell of a lot worse than the most sickening keloid he'd ever seen. Thank God, he thought, that he'd never gotten it, because he liked his face just the way it was. But if Colonel Macklin's condition was getting worse, then he wasn't going to be able to lead the AOE very much longer, which led to a lot of interesting possibilities. Lowry grunted, got his mind back on his duties, and went off through the ruins. On the other side of Broken Bow, Colonel Macklin saluted the two armed sentries who stood in front of his large headquarters tent, and went in through the flap. It was dark inside, and Macklin thought he remembered leaving a lantern lit on his desk. But there was so much in his mind, so much to remember, that he couldn't be sure. He walked to the desk, reached out with his single hand, and found the lantern. The glass was still warm. It blew out somehow, he thought, and he took the glass chimney off, took a lighter from his overcoat pocket, and flicked the flame on. Then he lit the lamp, let the flame grow, and returned the glass chimney. Dim light began to spread through the tent, and it was only then that Colonel Macklin realized he was not alone. Behind Macklin's desk sat a slim man with curly, unkempt, shoulder-length blonde hair and a blond beard. His muddy boots were propped up on the various maps, charts, and reports that covered the desktop. He'd been cleaning his long fingernails with a knife in the dark, and at the sight of the weapon, Macklin instantly drew the forty-five from his holster and aimed the gun at the intruder's head. Hi, the blond-haired man said, and he smiled. He had a pale, cadaverous face, and at the center of it, where his nose had been, was a hole rimmed with scar tissue. I've been waiting for you. Put the knife down. Now! The knife's blade thunked through a map of Nebraska and stood upright, quivering. No sweat the man said. He lifted his hands to show they were empty. Macklin saw that the intruder wore a blood-spattered AOE uniform, but he didn't appear to have any fresh injuries. That grisly wound at the center of his face, through which Macklin could see the sinus passages and gray cartilage, had healed as much as it ever would. "'Who are you, and how did you get past the sentries?' "'I came in through the servants' entrance.' He motioned toward the rear of the tent, and Macklin saw where the fabric had been slashed enough for the man to crawl through. "'My name's Alvin.' His muddy green eyes fixed on Colonel Macklin, and his teeth showed when he grinned. "'Alvin Mangrum. You ought to have better security, Colonel. Somebody crazy could get in here and kill you if they wanted to.' "'Like you, maybe?' "'No, not me.' He laughed, and air made a shrill whistling sound through the hole where his nose had been. I've brought you a couple of presents. I could have you executed for breaking into my headquarters. Alvin Mangrum's grin didn't waver. I didn't break in, man. I cut in. See, I'm real good with knives. Oh, yes. Knives know my name. They speak to me, and I do what they say to do. Macklin was about a half ounce of trigger pressure away from blowing the man's head off, but he didn't want to get blood and brains all over his papers. Well, don't you want to see your presence? No, I want you to stand up very carefully and start walking. But suddenly Alvin Mangrum leaned over beside the chair to pick up something from the floor. Easy, Macklin warned him, and he was about to call for the sentries when Alvin Mangrum straightened up and set the severed head of Franklin Hayes on the desktop. The face had turned blue, and the eyes had rolled back to show the whites. "'There you go,' Mangrum said. "'Ain't he pretty?' He leaned forward and rapped his knuckles on the skull. "'Knock, knock.' 
He laughed, the air whistling through the crater at the center of his face. Uh-oh, nobody's home. Where do you get that? Macklin asked him. Off the fucker's neck, Colonel. Where do you think I got it from? I came across that wall, and there was old Franklin himself, standing right in front of me. And me with my axe, too. That's what I call fate. So I just chopped his head off and brought it here to you. I would have been here sooner, but I wanted him to finish bleeding so he wouldn't mess up your tent. You've got a real nice, neat place here. Colonel Macklin approached the head, reached out and touched it with the forty-five's barrel. You killed him? No, I tickled him to death. Colonel Macklin, for such a smart man, you sure are slow to figure things out. Macklin lifted the upper lip with the gun barrel. The teeth were white and even. You want to knock those out? Mangrum asked. They'd make a nice necklace for that black-haired woman I've seen you with. He let the lip fall back into place. Who the hell are you? How come I haven't seen you before? I've been around. Been following the AOE for about two months, I guess. Me and some friends of mine have our own camp. I got this uniform off a dead soldier. Fits me pretty good, don't you think? Macklin sensed motion to his left and turned to see Roland Croninger coming into the tent. The young man was wearing a long gray coat with a hood pulled up over his head. At barely twenty years of age, Captain Roland Croninger, at six foot one, stood an inch shorter than Macklin, and he was scarecrow thin, his AOE uniform and coat hanging off his bony frame. His wrists jutted from the sleeves, his hands like white spiders. He'd been in charge of the attack that had crushed Broken Bow's defenses, and it had been his suggestion to pursue Franklin Hayes to the death. Now he stopped abruptly, and beneath the hood he squinted through his thick-lensed goggles at the head that adorned Colonel Macklin's desk. "'You're Captain Croninger, aren't you?' Mangrum asked. "'I've seen you around, too. What's going on here?' Roland's voice was still high-pitched. He looked at Macklin, the lamplight glinting off his goggles. This man brought me a present. He killed Franklin Hayes, or so he says. Sure I did. Whack, whack. Mangrum pounded the table with the edge of his hand. Off went his head. This tent is off limits, Roland said coldly. You could be shot for coming in here. I wanted to surprise the colonel. Macklin lowered his pistol. Alvin Mangrum hadn't come to do him harm, he decided. The man had violated one of the strictest rules of the AOE, but the severed head was indeed a good present. Now that the mission was accomplished, Hayes was dead, the AOE had captured a bounty of vehicles, weapons, and gasoline, and had taken about a hundred more soldiers into the ranks, Macklin felt a letdown, just as he did after every battle. It was like wanting a woman so bad your balls ached for release. And once you'd taken her and could do with her what you pleased, she was tiresome. It was not having the woman that counted. It was the taking of women, land, or life that stirred Macklin's blood to a boil. I can't breathe, he said suddenly. I can't get my breath. He drew in air, couldn't seem to get enough of it. He thought he saw the shadow soldier standing just behind Alvin Mangrum, but then he blinked and the ghostly image was gone. I can't breathe, he repeated, and he took off his cap. He had no hair. His scalp was a ravaged dome of growths, like barnacles clinging to rotten pilings. He reached behind his head and found the mask's zipper. The mask fell away, and Macklin inhaled through what was left of his nose. His face was a misshapen mass of thick, scab-like growths that completely enclosed his features except for the single staring blue eye, a nostril hole, and a slit over his mouth. Beneath the growths, Macklin's face burned and itched fiercely, and the bones ached as if they were being bent into new shapes. He couldn't bear to look at himself in the mirror any more, and when he rutted with Sheila Fontana, she— like any number of other women who followed the AOE, squeezed her eyes shut and turned her head away. But Sheila Fontana was out of her mind anyway, Macklin knew. All she was good for was screwing. 
And she was always screaming in the night about somebody named Rudy crawling into her bed with a dead baby in his arms. Alvin Mangrum was silent for a moment. Then he said, Well, whatever it is, you've got a bad dose of it. You've brought your present, Macklin told him. Now get the hell out of my tent. I said I brought you two presents. Don't you want the other one? Colonel Macklin said he wants you to leave. Roland didn't like this blond-haired son of a bitch, and he wouldn't mind killing him. He was still high on killing, the smell of blood in his nostrils like a delicious perfume. Over the past seven years, Roland Croninger had become a scholar of killing, mutilation, and torture. When the king wanted information from a prisoner, he knew to summon Sir Roland, who had a black-painted trailer where many songs had been sung to the accompaniment of chains, grindstones, hammers, and saws. Alvin Mangrum leaned down to the floor again. Macklin aimed his forty-five, but the blond-haired man brought up a small box tied with a bright blue ribbon. Here, Mangrum said, offering the box. Take it. It's just for you. The colonel paused, glanced quickly at Roland, and then laid the pistol down within reach and took the box. With his nimble left hand, he tore the ribbon off and lifted the lid. I made it for you. How do you like it? Macklin reached into the box and brought out a right hand, covered with a black leather glove. Piercing the hand and glove were fifteen or twenty nails driven through the back of the hand, so their sharp points emerged from the palm. "'I carved it,' Mangrum said. "'I'm a good carpenter. Did you know that Jesus was a carpenter?' Colonel Macklin stared in disbelief at the lifelike wooden hand. "'Is this supposed to be a joke?' Mangrum looked wounded. "'Man, it took me three days to get that just right. See, it weighs about as much as a real hand does.' and it's balanced so well you'd never know it's made out of wood. I don't know what happened to your real hand, but I kind of figured you'd appreciate this one. The colonel hesitated. He'd never seen anything quite like this before. The wooden hand, securely tucked into a tight glove, bristled with nails like the hide of a porcupine. What's it supposed to be? A paperweight? No, you're supposed to wear it. Mangrum explained. On your wrist, just like a real hand. See, somebody takes a look at that hand with those nails sticking right through it, and they say, Whoa, that motherfucker just don't even know what pain is. You wear that, and somebody gives you back talk. You give them a whack across the face, and they won't have lips any more. Mangrum grinned merrily. I made it just for you. You're crazy, Macklin said. You're out of your goddamn mind. Why the hell would I want to wear— Colonel, Roland interrupted. He may be crazy, but I think he's got a good idea. What? Roland pushed his hood back. His face and head were covered with dirty gauze bandages, secured with adhesive strips. Where the windings didn't exactly meet, there were gray growths as hard as armor plate. The bandages were thickly plastered over his forehead, chin, and cheeks and came right up to the edges of his goggles. He pulled loose one of the adhesive strips, unwound about twelve inches of gauze, and tore it off. He offered it to Macklin. Here, he said. Put it on your wrist with this. Macklin stared at him as if he thought Roland had lost his mind as well. Then he took the gauze and the strip of adhesive, and worked at taping the counterfeit hand to the stump of his right wrist. He finally got it in place, so the nail-studded palm was turned inward. It feels funny, he said. Feels like it weighs ten pounds. But other than the weird sensation of suddenly having a new right hand, he realized that it looked very real. To someone who didn't know the truth, his gloved hand with its palm full of nails might well be attached by flesh to the wrist. He held his arm out and slowly swung it through the air. Of course, the hand's attachment to the wrist was still fragile. If he was going to wear it, he'd have to bind it tightly to the stump with a thick wrapping of strong adhesive. He liked the look of it, and he suddenly knew why. It was a perfect symbol of discipline and control. If a man could endure such pain, even symbolically, 
and he had supreme discipline over his own body. He was a man to be feared, a man to be followed. You should wear that all the time, Roland suggested, especially when you have to negotiate for supplies. I don't think the leader of any settlement would hold out very long after he saw that. Macklin was spellbound by the sight of his new hand. It would be a devastating psychological weapon, and a damn dangerous close-quarters weapon as well. He'd just have to be real careful when he scratched what was left of his nose. I knew you'd like it, Mangrum said, satisfied by the colonel's response. Looks like you were born with it. That still doesn't excuse you from being in this tent, mister, Roland told him. You're asking to be shot. No, I'm not, Captain. I'm asking to be made a sergeant on the mechanical brigade. His green eyes slid from Roland back to Colonel Macklin. I'm real good with machines, too. I can fix just about anything. You give me the parts, I can put it together. And I can build things, too. Yes, sir, you make me a mechanical brigade sergeant, and I'll show you what I can do for the Army of Excellence. Macklin paused, his eye examining Alvin Mangrum's noseless face. This was the kind of man the AOE needed, Macklin thought. This man had courage, and he wasn't afraid to take risks to get what he wanted. I'll make you a corporal, he replied. If you do your work well and show leadership— I'll make you a sergeant in the mechanical brigade one month from today. Do you agree to that? The other man shrugged and stood up. I guess so. Corporal's better than private, isn't it? I can tell the privates what to do now, can't I? And a captain can put your ass before a firing squad. Roland stepped in front of him. They stared at each other face to face like two hostile animals. A thin smile crept across Alvin Mangrum's mouth. Roland's bandaged, grotesque face remained impassive. Finally, he said, You step in this tent without permission again, and I'll personally shoot you, or maybe you'd like a guided tour of the interrogation trailer. Some other time, sir. Report to Sergeant Drager at the MB tent. Move it! Mangrum plucked his knife from the desktop. He walked to the slit he'd cut in the tent, then bent down, before he crawled through, he looked back at Roland. Captain, he said in a soft voice, I'd be careful walking around in the dark if I were you. Lots of broken glass out there. You could fall down and maybe cut your head right off. Know what I mean? Before Roland could respond, he'd crawled through the slit and was gone. Bastard, Roland seethed. He'll end up in front of the firing squad. Macklin laughed. He enjoyed seeing Roland, who was usually as controlled and emotionless as a machine, caught off balance for once. It made Macklin feel more in control. He'll make lieutenant in six months, Macklin said. He's got the kind of imagination the AOE thrives on. He walked to the desk and stood looking down at the head of Franklin Hayes. With a finger of his left hand, he traced one of the brown keloids that marred the cold blue flesh. "'Damned by the mark of Cain,' he said. "'The sooner we get rid of that filth, the sooner we can build things back like they were. "'No, better than they were.' "'He reached out with his new hand and brought it down on the map of Nebraska, "'impaling it with the nails. "'He dragged it across the desk to him. "'Send recon patrols out to the east and southeast at first light,' he told Roland. "'Tell them to search until dark before they start back.' How long are we staying here? Until the AOE's rested and up to full strength. I want all the vehicles serviced and ready to move. The main body of trucks, cars, and trailers, including Macklin's own Airstream command trailer, was eight miles west of Broken Bow, and it would be moved to connect with the advance war battalion at daylight. Starting with Freddy Kempke's encampment, Macklin had built a traveling army where everyone had a duty to perform, including foot soldiers, officers, mechanics, cooks, blacksmiths, tailors, two doctors, and even camp prostitutes like Sheila Fontana. All of them were linked by Macklin's leadership, the need for food, water, and shelter, and a belief that those survivors who bore the mark of Cain had to be exterminated. 
It was common knowledge that those with the mark of Cain were infecting the human race with radiation-poisoned genes, and if America was ever going to be strong enough to strike back at the Russians, the mark of Cain had to be erased. Macklin studied the Nebraska map. His eye moved eastward along the red line of Highway 2, through Grand Island and Aurora and Lincoln, to the blue line of the Missouri River. From Nebraska City, the AOE could march into either Iowa or Missouri, virgin land with new settlements and supply centers to take, and then there would be the broad expanse of the Mississippi River, and the entire eastern part of the country would lie ahead of the AOE to be taken and cleansed, just as they had cleansed large sections of Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, and Nebraska. But there was always the next settlement, and the next, and Macklin was restless. He'd heard reports of Troop Hydra, Nolan's Raiders, and the so-called American Allegiance. He looked forward to meeting those armies. The AOE would crush them, just as they'd destroyed the People's Freedom Party during months of warfare in the Rocky Mountains. We're heading east, he told Roland, across the Missouri River. His eye and the growth-stricken face gleamed with the excitement of the hunt. He lifted his right arm and swung the gloved hand through the air. Then faster, and faster still. The nails made a high, eerie whistling sound, like the noise of human screams. Chapter 54 Hey! Hey, come look at this! The barn door flew open, and Sly Moody tumbled in with the morning wind at his heels. Instantly, Killer jumped up from underneath the wagon and began rapid-fire barking. Come look at this! Moody shouted, his face ruddy with excitement, flakes of snow melting in his hair and beard. He had dressed hurriedly, throwing on a brown coat over his long johns, and he still wore slippers on his feet. You gotta come look! What the hell are you jabbering about, mister? Rusty had sat up from the pile of hay in which he'd slept, and now he rubbed his bloodshot eyes. He could only make out the faintest light coming through the barn doorway. Christ Almighty! It's not even dawn yet. Josh was on his feet, arranging the mask he'd just pulled over his head so he could see through the eye hole. He'd slept next to the wagon, and over the years he'd learned that waking up alert was a good way to stay alive. What is it? he asked Moody. Out there, the old man pointed through the doorway with a shaking finger. You gotta come see. Where's the girl? Is she awake? He looked toward the closed folds of the wagon's tent. What's this all about? Josh asked. Last night, Sly Moody had told Josh and Rusty to keep Swan in the barn. They'd taken their bowls of stew and beans and eaten in the barn with her, and she'd been nervous and silent as a sphinx. Now it made no sense to Josh that Sly Moody was wanting to see Swan. Just get her, Moody said. Bring her and come see and then he sprinted through the doorway out into the cold wind, with Killer yapping right behind him. "'Who pulled that fella's string?' Rusty muttered to himself as he shrugged into his coat and pulled his boots on. "'Swan?' Josh called. "'Swan, are you a—' And then the tent opened, and Swan stood there, tall and slim and disfigured, her face and head like a gnarled helmet. She wore blue jeans, a heavy yellow sweater, and a corduroy coat, and on her feet were hiker's boots. She held Crybaby in one hand, but today she'd made no effort to hide her face. Feeling her way with the dowsing rod, Swan came down the stepladder and angled her head so she could see Josh through the narrow slit of her vision. Her head was getting heavier, harder to control. Sometimes she was afraid her neck was about to snap, and whatever was beneath the growths burned so savagely that she often couldn't hold back a scream. Once she'd taken a knife to the ugly, deformed thing that her head had become, and she'd started slashing away in a frenzy. But the growths were too tough to cut, as unyielding as armor plate. She'd stopped looking into the magic mirror several months before. She just couldn't stand it any more, though the figure carrying the glowing circle had seemed to be getting nearer. But then again the hideous moonlike face with its drifting, monstrous features had looked to be drawing closer as well. "'Come on!' 
Sly Moody was urging from the front of the house. Hurry! What does he want us to see? Swan asked Josh in her mangled voice. I don't know. Why don't we go find out? Rusty put on his cowboy hat and followed Josh and Swan out of the barn. Swan walked slowly, her shoulders stooped by the weight of her head. And then, abruptly, Josh stopped. My God, he said softly, wonderingly. You see it? Sly Moody crowed. Look at it! Just look! Swan angled her head in a different direction so she could see in front of her. She wasn't sure what she was seeing at first, because of the blowing snow, but her heart had begun pounding as she walked toward Sly Moody. Behind her, Rusty had stopped as well. He couldn't believe what he was looking at, thought he must surely still be asleep and dreaming. His mouth opened to release a small, awed whisper. "'I told you, didn't I?' Moody shouted, and he began laughing. Carla stood near him, bundled up in a coat and white woolen cap, her expression stunned. "'I told you!' And then Moody started dancing a jig, kicking up whirls of snow as he cavorted amid the stumps where apple trees had been. The single remaining apple tree was no longer bare. Hundreds of white blossoms had burst open on the scraggly limbs, and as the wind carried them spinning away like tiny ivory umbrellas, small bright green leaves were exposed underneath. "'It's alive!' Sly Moody shouted joyously, kicking his heels, stumbling and falling and getting up again with snow all over his face. My trees come back to life! Oh! Swan whispered. Apple blossoms blew past her. She could smell their fragrance in the wind, the sweet perfume of life. She tilted her head forward, looking at the trunk of the apple tree, and there, as if burned into the wood, were the marks of her palm and the finger-drawn letters S-W-A-N. A hand touched her shoulder. It was Carla, and the woman stepped back when Swan finally got her deformed face and head turned. Through the narrow field of her vision, Swan saw the horror in Carla's eyes, but there were tears in them, too, and Carla was trying to speak, but was unable to summon the words. Carla's fingers clutched at Swan's shoulders, and at last the woman said, "'You did this. You put life back into that tree, didn't you?' "'I don't know,' Swan said. "'I think I just woke it up.' "'It's blossomed overnight!' Sly Moody danced around the tree as if it were a maypole festooned with bright streamers. He stopped, reached up, and grabbed a lower limb, pulling it down for all to see. It's got buds on it already. Lord God, we're going to have a bucket full of apples by the first of May. I never seen a tree go so wild before. He shook the limb and laughed like a child as the white blossoms whirled off. And then his gaze fell upon Swan, and his grin faded. He released the limb and stared at her for a silent moment, as the snowflakes and apple blossoms blew between them, and the air was filled with the fragrant promise of fruit and cider. If I hadn't seen this with my own eyes, Sly Moody said, his voice choked with emotion, I never would have believed it. There ain't no natural way a tree can be bare one day and covered with blossoms the next. Hell, that tree's got new leaves on it. It's growing like it used to, back when April was a warm month and you could hear summer knocking at the door. His voice cracked and he had to wait before he spoke again. I know that's your name on that tree. I don't know how it got there, or why this tree's blossomed all of a sudden. But if this is a dream, I don't want to wake up. Smell the air. Just smell it. And suddenly he walked forward and took Swan's hand, pressing it against his cheek. He gave a muffled sob and sank down to his knees in the snow. Thank you, he said. Thank you, thank you so much. Josh recalled the green shoots that had been growing through the dirt in the shape of Swan's body back in the basement of Pawpaw's grocery. He remembered what she'd told him about the hurting sound, about the earth being alive, and everything alive having its own language and way of understanding. 
Swan had spoken often of the flowers and plants she'd once grown in trailer lots and behind motel rooms, and both Josh and Rusty knew that she couldn't stand looking at dead trees where a forest used to stand. But nothing had prepared them for this. Josh walked to the tree and ran his fingers over the letters of Swan's name. They were burned into the wood as if by a blowtorch. Whatever power or energy or force Swan had summoned last night, here was the physical evidence of it. How did you do this? he asked her, not knowing any other way to put it. I just touched it, she answered. I felt like it wasn't dead, and I touched it, because I wanted it to keep living. She was embarrassed that the old man was down on his knees beside her, and she wished he'd get up and stop crying. His wife was looking at Swan with a mixture of revulsion and wonder, as one might regard a toad frog with golden wings. All this attention was making Swan more nervous than when she'd frightened the old man and woman last night. Please, she said, tugging at his coat, please get up, mister. It's a miracle, Carla murmured, watching the blossoms blow. Nearby, Killer ran through the snow, trying to catch them between his teeth. She's made a miracle happen. Two tears crept down her cheeks, freezing like diamonds before they reached her jawline. Swan was jittery and cold, afraid that her misshapen head might tilt over too far to one side and break her neck. She could endure the stinging wind no longer, and she pulled away from Sly Moody's grip. She turned and walked toward the barn, probing in the snow before her with Crybaby, as the old man and the others watched her go. Killer ran circles around her with an apple blossom in his mouth. It was Rusty who got his tongue unstuck first. "'What's the nearest town from here?' he asked Sly Moody, who was still on his knees. "'We're heading north.' The old man blinked heavily and wiped his eyes with the back of his hand. "'Richland,' he said. Then he shook his head. "'No, no, Richland's dead. Everybody either left Richland or died from the typhoid fever last year.' He struggled to his feet. "'Mary's rest,' he said finally. "'That would be the next settlement of any size. It's about sixty miles north of here, across I-44. I've never been there, but I hear Mary's Rest is a real city.' "'I guess it's Mary's Rest, then,' Josh said to Rusty. "'Sounds like as good a place as any.' Moody suddenly snapped out of his daze. "'You don't have to leave here. You can stay with us. We've got plenty of food.' and we'll find room in the house for you. Lord, I wouldn't have that girl sleeping in the barn another night for anything. Thank you, Josh said. But we've got to go on. You need your food for yourself. And like Rusty said, we're entertainers. That's how we get by. Sly Moody gripped Josh's arm. Listen, you don't know what you've got, mister. That girl's a miracle worker. Look at that tree. It was dead yesterday, and now you can smell the blossoms. Mister, that girl's special. You don't know what she could do if she was to set her mind to it. What could she do? Rusty was puzzled by the whole thing and feeling definitely out of his depth, the same as he had whenever he'd picked up Fabrioso's mirror and seen nothing but murk in the glass. Look at that tree and think of an orchard, Sly Moody said excitedly. Think of a cornfield, or a field of beans, or squash, or anything else. I don't know what's inside that girl, but she's got the power of life. Don't you see that? She touched that tree and brought it back. Mister, that swan could wake the whole land up again. It's just one tree, Josh reminded him. How do you know she could do the same thing to a whole orchard? You dumb fool! What's an orchard but one tree after another? He growled. I don't know how she did it or anything about her, but if she can start apples growing again, she can start orchards and crop fields, too. You're crazy to take somebody with a god's gift like that out on the road. The country out there's full of killers, highwaymen, lunatics, and only the devil knows what all. If you stay here— she can start working on the fields, doing whatever she has to do to wake them up again. 
Josh glanced at Rusty, who shook his head, then gently pulled free of Sly Moody. We've got to go on. Why? Where to? What are you looking for that's worth finding? I don't know, Josh admitted. In seven years of wandering from settlement to settlement, the point of life had become wandering instead of settling. Still, Josh hoped that some day they'd find a place that would be suitable to live in for more than a few months at a time, and possibly he might some day make his way south to Mobile in search of Rose and his sons. We'll know it when we find it, I guess. Moody started to protest again, but his wife said, Sylvester, it's getting very cold out here. I think they've made up their minds, and I think they should do what they feel is best. The old man hesitated, then looked at his tree again and finally nodded. All right, he muttered. You have to go your own way, I reckon. He fixed a hard gaze on Josh, who stood at least four inches taller than himself. Now you listen to me, mister, he warned. You protect that girl, you hear me? Maybe some day she'll see her way clear to do what I've said she can do. You protect her, hear? Yes, Josh said, I hear. Then go on, Sly Moody said. Josh and Rusty started walking toward the barn, and Moody said, God go with you. He picked up a handful of blossoms from the snow, held them to his nose, and inhaled. An hour or so after the traveling show wagon had rumbled off northward along the road, Sly Moody put his heaviest coat and boots on and told Carla that he couldn't stand to sit still a minute longer. He was going to walk through the woods to Bill McHenry's place and tell him the story of the girl who could put life back into a tree with her touch, he said. Bill McHenry had a pickup truck and some gasoline, and Sly Moody said that he was going to tell everybody within shouting distance about that girl, because he had witnessed a miracle, and all hope was not yet dead in the world. He was going to find a hilltop to stand on and shout that girl's name, and when those apples came, he was going to cook an apple stew and invite everybody who lived on the desolate farms for miles around to come partake of a miracle. And then he put his arms around the woman he had taken as his wife and kissed her, and her eyes sparkled like stars. Part 9 The Fountain and the Fire Signs and Symbols The Surgeon's Task Bones of a Thousand Candles The Seamstress Chapter 55 The jeep rumbled over a rutted, snow-covered road, passing wrecks and derelict vehicles that had been pulled to both sides. Here and there a frozen corpse lay in a gray snowdrift, and Sister saw one whose arms were lifted as if in a final appeal for mercy. They came to an unmarked crossroads, and Paul slowed down. He looked over his shoulder at Hugh Ryan, who had jammed himself into the rear compartment with the luggage. Hugh was gripping his crutch with both hands and snoring. Hey, Paul said, and he nudged the sleeping man. Wake up! Hugh snorted, finally opened his heavy-lidded eyes. What is it? Are we there yet? Hell no. I think we must have taken the wrong road about five miles back. There's not a sign of life out here. He glanced up through the windshield and saw the threat of new snow in the clouds. The light was just beginning to fade, and Paul didn't want to look at the gas gauge because he knew they were traveling on fumes. I thought you knew the way. I do, Hugh assured him. But it's been a while since I've ventured very far from Moberly. He gazed around at the bleak landscape. We're at a crossroads, he announced. We know that. Now which road do we take? There should be a sign. Maybe the wind's blown it down. He shifted position, trying to find a familiar landmark. The truth, which he had not told Paul and Sister, was that he'd never been this way before. But he'd wanted to get out of Moberly because he feared he'd be murdered in the night for his cache of blankets. Let's see now. I think I remember a big grove of old oak trees that we turned right at. Paul rolled his eyes. On both sides of the narrow road stood thick forests. Look, he said, read my lips. 
We're out in the middle of nowhere, and we're running out of gasoline. And this time there are no fuel tanks around for me to siphon. It's going to be dark soon, and I think we're on the wrong road. Now tell me why I shouldn't wring your damned skinny neck. Hugh looked wounded. Because, he said with great dignity, you're a decent human being. He glanced quickly at Sister, who had turned to deliver a scathing gaze. I do know the way. I really do. I got us around that broken bridge, didn't I? Which way? Sister asked pointedly. Left or right? Left, Hugh said, and immediately wished that he'd said right. But now it was too late, and he didn't want to appear a fool. Mary's rest better be around the next bend, Paul told them grimly, or we're going to be walking real soon. He put the jeep into gear and turned left. The road wound through a corridor of dead trees with branches that interlocked and closed off the sky. Hugh settled back to await judgment, and Sister reached down to the floorboard for her satchel. She unzipped it, felt inside for the glass ring, and drew it out. Then she held it in her lap as the trapped jewels sparkled, and she stared into its shimmering depths. "'What do you see?' Paul asked. "'Anything?' Sister shook her head. The colors pulsed, but they had not yet formed pictures. How the glass ring worked, and exactly what it was, had remained a puzzle. Paul had said that he thought the radiation had melded the glass, jewels, and precious metals into some kind of supersensitive antenna, but what it was tuned to, neither of them could say. But they had come to the agreement that the glass circle was leading them to someone, and that to follow it meant giving up that part of yourself that refused to believe in miracles. Using the glass ring was like a leap in the dark, a surrendering of doubt, fear, and all other impurities that clouded the mind. Using it was the ultimate act of faith. Are we closer to the answer or further away? Sister asked mentally as she peered into the ring. Who are we searching for and why? Her questions, she knew, would be answered with symbols and pictures, sights and shadows and sounds that might have been distant human voices, the creaking of wheels, or the barking of a dog. A diamond flared like a meteor, and light sizzled along threads of silver and platinum. More diamonds burst with light, like a chain reaction. Sister felt the power of the glass circle reaching for her, drawing her inward, deeper, deeper still and all her being was fixed on the bursts of light as they flared in a hypnotic rhythm. She was no longer in the jeep with Paul Thorson and the one-legged doctor from Amarillo. She was standing in what looked to be a snow-covered field, stubbled with the stumps of trees. But there was one tree remaining, and that one was covered with diamond-white blossoms blowing before the wind. On the tree's trunk were palm prints, as if seared into the wood. Slim, long fingers, the hands of a young person, and across the trunk were letters, as if finger-painted in fire. S.W.A.N. Sister tried to turn her head, to see more of where she was standing, but the dreamwalk scene began to fade. She was aware of shadowy figures, distant voices, a moment perhaps trapped in time, and somehow transmitted to Sister like a photograph through spectral wires, and then, abruptly, the dream walk was over, and she was back in the jeep again, with the glass ring between her hands. She released the breath she'd been holding. It was there again, she told Paul. I saw it again. The single tree in a field of stumps. The palm prints and the word swan burned on the trunk. But it was clearer than last night, and this time I think I could smell apples. They'd traveled all day, yesterday, heading for Mary's rest, and had spent last night in the ruins of a farmhouse. It was there that Sister had looked into the glass ring and first seen that tree with the blowing blossoms. The vision was clearer than it had been. She had been able to see every detail of the tree, every scraggly branch, and even the tiny green buds that peeked out from under the blossoms. "'I think we're getting closer,' she said, and her heart was racing. The image was stronger. We must be getting closer. But all the trees are dead, Paul reminded her. Just look around. 
Nothing's in bloom, and nothing's going to be. Why should that thing show you the image of a tree in bloom? I don't know. If I did, I'd tell you. She concentrated on the glass ring again. It pulsated with her quickened heartbeat, but did not invite her to go dreamwalking. The message had been delivered, and at least for now would not be repeated. Swan. Paul shook his head. That doesn't make a damn bit of sense. Yes, it does. Somehow it does. We've just got to put the pieces together. Paul's hands gripped the steering wheel. Sister, he said with a trace of pity, you've been saying the same thing for a long time. You've been looking into that glass ring like you were a gypsy trying to read tea leaves. And here we are, going back and forth, following signs and symbols that might not mean a damned thing. He glanced sharply at her. Have you ever thought about that possibility? We found Matheson, didn't we? We found the tarot cards and the doll. She kept her voice firm, but there had been many days and nights when she'd let herself fear the same thing, but only for a moment or two, and then her resolve returned. I believe this is leading us to someone, someone very important. You mean you want to believe it? I mean I do believe it, she snapped. How could I go on if I didn't? Paul sighed deeply. He was tired, his beard itched, and he knew he smelled like a cage of monkeys in a zoo. How long had it been, he wondered, since he'd had a bath? The best he'd been able to do in the last few weeks was scrub himself half-heartedly with ashes and snow. For the past two years they had danced around the subject of the glass ring's fallibility, like a couple of wary boxers. Paul himself could see nothing in the ring but colors, and he'd asked himself many times if the woman he was traveling with, indeed had come to love and respect, wasn't making the signs up, interpreting them as she saw fit, in order to keep them on this lunatic quest. I believe, she told him, that this is a gift. I believe I found it for a reason. I believe it's leading us for a reason. And everything it shows us is a clue to where we need to go. Don't you under— Bullshit, Paul said, and he almost stomped on the brake. But he was afraid the jeep would skid right off the road. Sister looked at him, her face with its hideous growths mirroring shock, anger, and disillusion. You saw a fucking clown's face in that damn thing, remember that? You saw a beat-up old Conestoga wagon or something. And you saw a thousand other things that just don't make any sense. You said go east, because you thought the visions or dreamwalk pictures or whatever the shit they are were getting stronger. And then you said go back west again, because the visions started fading, and you were trying to focus in on the direction. After that you said go north, and then south, and then north and south again. Sister, you're seeing what you want to see in that damned thing. So we found Matheson, Kansas. So what? Maybe you heard something about that town when you were a kid. Have you ever considered that? She was silent, clasping the glass circle closer to her. And finally she said what she'd wanted to say for a long, long time. I believe, she told him, that this is a gift from God. Right, he smiled bitterly. Well, look around. Just look. Have you ever considered the possibility that God might be insane? Tears burned her eyes, and she looked away from him, because she'd be damned if she'd let him see her cry. This whole thing is you, don't you see that? He continued. It's what you see. It's what you feel, and what you decide. If the damned thing is leading you somewhere, or to somebody... Why doesn't it show you right out where you're supposed to go? Why is it playing tricks with your mind? Why does it give you these clues and bits and pieces? Because, Sister answered with just a slight waver in her voice, just getting a gift doesn't mean you know how to use it. The fault's not with the glass ring, it's with me, because there's a limit to what I can understand. I'm doing the best I can, and maybe— Maybe the person I'm looking for isn't ready to be found yet, either. What? Come on. Maybe the circumstances aren't right yet. Maybe the picture's not complete, and that's why— Oh, Jesus, Paul said wearily. You're raving. Do you know that? 
You're making up things that aren't true because you want them so much to be true. You don't want to admit that we've wasted seven years of our lives searching for ghosts. Sister watched the road unfolding before them, leading the jeep into a dark, dead forest. If you feel that way, she finally asked, then why have you been traveling with me all this time? I don't know. Maybe because I wanted to believe as much as you do. I wanted to think there was some method to this madness. But there's not, and there never was. I remember a short-wave radio, Sister said. What? A short-wave radio, she repeated. The one you used to keep those people in your cabin from killing themselves. You kept them going and gave them hope, remember? Okay, so what? Didn't you yourself at least hope there'd be a human voice on that radio? Didn't you tell yourself that maybe the next day or the next there'd be a signal from some other survivors? You didn't go through all that just to keep a handful of strangers alive. You did it to keep yourself alive, too. And you hoped that maybe one day there'd be something more than static on that radio. Well, this is my shortwave radio. She ran her hands over the smooth glass. And I believe it's tuned to a force that I can't even begin to understand. But I'm not going to doubt it. No. I'm going to keep on going, one step at a time, with you or without— What the hell? Paul interrupted as they came around a curve. Standing in the middle of the road, beneath the overhanging trees, were three large snowmen, all wearing caps and mufflers, with stones for their eyes and noses. One of them appeared to be smoking a corncob pipe. Instantly Paul realized that he could not stop in time, and though he put his foot on the brake, the wheels skidded through the snow, and the jeep's front fender banged into one of the snowmen. The jolt almost threw Paul and Sister through the windshield, and Hugh made a croaking sound in the back as the collision rattled his teeth. The jeep's engine stuttered and died. Sister and Paul saw that where the snowman had been was now a pile of snow around a disguised roadblock of scrap metal, pieces of wood and stones. Shit, Paul said when he could find his voice. Some fools put a damned— A pair of legs and scuffed brown boots slammed down on the jeep's hood from above. Sister looked up and saw a hooded figure in a long, tattered brown coat with one hand wrapped around a rope that was tied in tree branches over the road. In the figure's other hand was a thirty-eight pistol, aimed through the windshield at Paul Thorson. More figures, scurrying from the woods on all sides, were converging on the jeep. "'Bandits!' Hugh bleated, his eyes wide with terror. "'They'll rob us and cut our throats!' "'Like hell they will,' Sister said calmly and she put her hand on the butt of the shotgun that was wedged beside her seat. She pulled it up, aiming it at the figure on the hood, and was about to fire when both of the jeep's doors were wrenched open. A dozen pistols, three rifles, and seven sharpened wooden spears thrust into the jeep at Sister, and an equal number of weapons threatened Paul. "'Don't kill us!' Hugh shouted. "'Please don't kill us. We'll give you anything you want.' Fine for you to say, since you don't own a damned thing. Sister thought as she stared into the bristling wall of firearms and spears. She calculated how long it would take her to turn the shotgun and fire at the bandits, and she knew she'd be history as soon as she made a sudden movement. She froze, one hand on the shotgun and the other trying to protect the glass ring. Out of the jeep, the figure on the hood commanded. It was a young voice, the voice of a boy. The pistol shifted toward Sister. Get your finger off that trigger if you want to keep it. She hesitated, peering up at the boy's face, though she couldn't make out any features because of the coat's cowl. The pistol was aimed as steadily as if the boy's arm was stone, and the tone of his voice was all deadly business. She blinked and removed her finger from the trigger. Paul knew they had no choice. He muttered a curse longing to get his hands around Hugh Ryan's neck, and got out. "'Some guide you are,' Sister told Hugh. She took a deep breath, exhaled, and stepped out. She towered over her captors. They were children. All of them were thin and dirty, the youngest about nine or ten, and the oldest maybe sixteen. 
and all of them stared as one at the pulsing glass ring. Chapter 56 Herded before a yelling, rowdy gang of twenty-seven boy bandits, Paul, Sister, and Hugh were prodded with the barrels of rifles and sharp spear tips through the snowy woods. About a hundred yards from the road they were commanded to stop, and they waited while a few of the boys cleared brush and branches from the mouth of a small cave. A rifle barrel pushed Sister inside, and the others followed. Beyond the opening the cave widened into a large high-ceilinged chamber. It was damp within, but dozens of candles were set about and burning, and at the center of the cavern a small fire glowed, the smoke curling up through a hole in the ceiling. Eight other boys, all of them skinny and sickly-looking, were waiting for their compatriots to return, and when the bags were flung open the boys shouted and laughed as sisters' and Paul's extra clothes were scattered. The bandits grabbed up ill-fitting coats and sweaters, draped themselves with woolen scarves and caps, and danced around the fire like Apaches. One of them uncorked a jug of the moonshine that Hugh had brought along, and the shouts grew louder, the dancing wilder. Adding to the raucous clamor was the noise of woodblocks clapped together, rattling gourds and sticks beating a rhythm on a cardboard box. Hugh balanced himself precariously on his crutch and single leg as the boys whirled around him, stabbing at him with their spears. He'd heard stories of the forest bandits before, and he didn't like the idea of being scalped and skinned. "'Don't kill us!' he shouted over the tumult. "'Please don't!' And then he went down on his rump as a tough-looking ten-year-old with shaggy black hair kicked his crutch out from under him. A gale of laughter followed him down, and more spears and guns poked at Paul and Sister. She looked across the cave and saw through the haze of smoke a small thin boy with red hair and a chalky complexion. He was holding the glass ring between his hands, staring at it intently. And then a second boy grabbed it away from him and ran with it. A third boy attacked that one, trying to get his hands on the treasure. Sister saw a throng of raggedly dressed boys jostling and fighting in the exhilaration of the hunt, and she lost sight of the glass ring. Another boy shoved her own shotgun in her face and grinned at her as if daring her to make a move. Then he whirled away, grabbed the jug of moonshine, and joined the victory dance. Paul helped Hugh up. A spear jabbed Paul in the ribs, and he turned angrily toward his tormentor. But Sister grasped his arm to hold him back. A boy with the bones of small animals tied in his tangled blonde hair thrust a spear at Sister's face and drew it back just short of impaling an eyeball. She stared at him impassively, and he giggled like a hyena and capered away. The boy who'd taken Paul's magnum danced past, hardly able to hold the heavy weapon in a two-handed grip. The jug of moonshine was being passed around, inflaming them to further frenzy. Sister was afraid they were going to start firing their guns at random, and in a confined place like this the ricochets would be deadly. She saw the glimmer of the glass ring as one boy grabbed it from another. Then two boys were fighting for it, and Sister was sick at the thought of the glass ring lying shattered. She took a step forward, but the darting of a half-dozen spears kept her back. And then the horrible thing happened. One of the boys, already dizzy with moonshine, lifted the glass ring over his head, and he was tackled from behind by another boy trying to grab it. The ring flew from his hands and spun through the air, and Sister felt a scream welling up. She saw it falling, as if in terrible slow motion, toward the stone floor, and she heard herself shout, No! But there was nothing she could do. The circle of glass was falling, falling, falling. A hand grasped it before it hit the floor, and the ring glittered with fiery colors as if meteors were exploding within it. It had been caught by the figure in the cowled coat, who'd landed on the jeep's hood. He was taller than the others by at least a foot, and as he approached Sister, the boys around him parted to give him room. His face was still obscured by the cowl. The shouting and noise of clapping woodblocks and drumbeats faltered and began to fade as the tallest boy walked unhurriedly through the others. The glass circle flared with a strong, slow pulse, and then the boy stood in front of Sister. "'What is this?' he asked, holding the ring before him. The others had stopped dancing and shouting, and they began to crowd around to watch. 
It belongs to me, sister answered. No, it used to belong to you. I asked you what it is. It's... She paused, trying to decide what to say. It's magic, she told him. It's a miracle, if you know how to use it. Please. She heard the unaccustomed sound of pleading in her voice. Please don't break it. What if I did? What if I was to let it fall and break? Would the magic spill out? She was silent, knowing the boy was taunting her. He pulled the cowl back to reveal his face. I don't believe in magic, he said. That's just for fools and kids. He was older than the others, maybe seventeen or eighteen. He was almost as tall as she was, and the size of his shoulders said that he was going to be a large man when he grew up and filled out. His face was lean and pallid, with sharp cheekbones and eyes the color of ashes. In his shoulder-length dark brown hair were braided small bones and feathers, and he looked as dour and serious as an Indian chief. The fine light brown hairs of a beard covered the lower part of his face, but Sister could see that he had a strong square jawline. Thick dark eyebrows added to his stern countenance, and the bridge of his nose was flattened and crooked like a boxer's. He was a handsome young man, but certainly dangerous, and Sister realized he was neither a kid nor a fool. He regarded the glass ring in silence. Then, where were you going? Mary's rest, Hugh spoke up nervously. We're just poor travelers. We don't mean any— Shut up, the boy ordered, and Hugh's mouth snapped closed. He locked stairs with Paul for a few seconds, then grunted and dismissed him. Mary's rest, the boy repeated. You're about fifteen miles east of Mary's Rest. Why were you going there? We were going to pass through it on our way south, Sister said. We figured we'd get some food and water. Is that so? Well, you're out of luck, then. The food's almost gone in Mary's Rest. They're starving over there, and their pond went dry about five months ago. They're melting snow to drink, just like everybody else. There's radiation in the snow, Hugh said. Drinking melted snow will kill you. What are you, an expert? No, but I'm... I was a doctor, and I know what I'm talking about. A doctor? What kind of doctor? I was a surgeon, Hugh said, pride creeping back into his voice. I used to be the best surgeon in Amarillo. A surgeon? You mean you operated on sick people? That's right, and I never lost a patient either. Sister decided to take a step forward. Instantly the boy's hand went to a pistol at his belt under the coat. Listen, Sister said, let's cut this screwing around. You've already got everything we own. We'll walk the rest of the way. But I want that glass ring back. I want it now. If you're going to kill me, you'd better do it, because either you give me the ring or I'm taking it from you. The boy remained motionless, his hawk-like stare challenging her. Here goes, she thought, her heart hammering. She started to reach toward him, but suddenly he laughed and stepped back. He held the ring up, as if he might drop it to the cavern's floor. Sister stopped. Don't, she said. Please don't. His hand lingered in the air. Sister tensed, ready to go for it if the fingers opened. Robin? A weak voice called from the back of the cave. Robin? The boy looked into Sister's face for a few seconds longer, his eyes hard and shrewd. Then he blinked, lowered his arm, and offered the ring to her. Here. It's not worth a shit anyway. She took it, relief coursing through her bones. None of you are going anywhere, the boy said. Especially not you, Doc. Huh? Terror lanced him. Walk to the back of the cave, the boy commanded. All of you. They hesitated. Now, he said in a voice that was used to being obeyed. They did as he said, and in another moment Sister saw several more figures at the rear of the chamber. Three of them were boys with Job's mask in varying stages of severity, one of them hardly able to keep his misshapen head upright. On the floor in a corner, lying on a bed of straw and leaves, was a thin brown-haired boy of about ten or eleven, his face shining with the sweat of fever. A dressing of greasy-looking leaves had been plastered on his white chest, just under the heart. 
and blood had leaked out around it. The wounded boy tried to lift his head when he saw them, but he didn't have enough strength. Robin, he whispered, you there? I'm here, Bucky. Robin bent beside him and brushed the wet hair from the other boy's forehead. I'm hurting so bad. Bucky coughed, and foamy blood appeared at his lips. Robin quickly wiped it away with a leaf. You won't let me go out where it's dark, will you? No, Robin said quietly. I won't let you go out where it's dark. He looked up at Sister with eyes that were a hundred years old. Bucky got shot three days ago. With gentle fingers he carefully peeled the plaster of leaves away. The wound was an ugly scarlet hole with puffy gray edges of infection. Robin's gaze moved to Hugh, then to the glass ring. I don't believe in magic or miracles, he said. But maybe it's kind of a miracle that we found you today, Doc. You're going to take the bullet out. Me? Hugh almost choked. Oh, no, I can't. Not me. You said you used to operate on sick people. You said you never lost a patient. That was a lifetime ago, Hugh wailed. Look at that wound. It's too close to the heart. He held up a palsied hand. I couldn't cut lettuce with a hand like this. Robin stood up and approached Hugh until they were almost nose to nose. You're a doctor, he said. You're going to take the bullet out and make him well, or you can start digging graves for you and your friends. I can't. There are no instruments here, no light, no disinfectants, no sedatives. I haven't operated in seven years, and I wasn't a heart surgeon anyway. No, I'm sorry. That boy doesn't have a— Robin's pistol was cocked and pressed against Hugh's throat. A doctor who can't help anybody shouldn't be living. You're just using up air, aren't you? Please, please, Hugh gasped, his eyes bulging. Wait a minute, Sister said. Hugh, the hole's already there. All you have to do is bring the bullet out. Oh, sure, sure. Just bring the bullet out. Hugh giggled on the edge of hysteria. Sister, the bullet could be anywhere. What am I supposed to stop the blood with? How am I supposed to dig the damn thing out? With my fingers? We've got knives, Robin told him. We can heat them in the fire. That makes them clean, doesn't it? There's no such thing as clean in conditions like these. My God, you don't know what you're asking me to do. Not asking. Telling. Do it, Doc. Hugh looked to Paul and Sister for help, but there was nothing they could do. I can't, he whispered hoarsely. Please, I'll kill him if I try to take the bullet out. He'll die for sure if you don't. I'm the leader here. When I give my word, I keep it. Bucky got shot because I sent him out with some others to stop a truck passing through, but he wasn't ready to kill anybody yet, and he wasn't fast enough to dodge a bullet either. He jabbed the pistol into Hugh's throat. I am ready to kill. I've done it before. Now I promised Bucky I'd do whatever I could for him. So, do you take the bullet out, or do I kill all of you? Hugh swallowed, his eyes watering with fear. There's... there's so much I've forgotten. Remember it real quick. Hugh was shaking. He closed his eyes, opened them again. The boy was still there. His whole body was a heartbeat. What do I remember? he asked himself. Think, damn it. Nothing would come together. It was all a hazy jumble. The boy was waiting, his finger on the trigger. Hugh realized he would have to go on instinct, and God help them all if he screwed up. Somebody's going to have to support me, he managed to say. My balance isn't so good. And light. I've got to have light as much as I can get. I need... Think. Three or four sharp knives with narrow blades. Rub them with ashes and put them in the fire. I need rags and... Oh, Jesus, I need clamps and forceps and probes and... I cannot kill this boy, damn you! His eyes blazed at Robin. I'll get you what you need. None of that medical shit, though. 
but I'll get you the other stuff. And moonshine, you said, the jug, for both the boy and myself. I want some ashes to clean my hands with, and I may need a bucket to puke into. He reached up with a trembling hand and pushed the pistol away from his throat. What's your name, young man? Robin Oakes. All right, then, Mr. Oakes. When I start, you're not to lay a finger on me, no matter what I do, no matter what you think I ought to be doing. I'll be scared enough for both of us. Hugh looked down at the wound and winced. It was very, very nasty. What kind of gun was he shot with? I don't know. A pistol, I guess. That doesn't tell me anything about the size of the bullet. Oh, Jesus, this is crazy. I can't remove a bullet from a wound that close to— The pistol swung back up again. Hugh saw the boy's finger ready on the trigger, and something about being so close to death clicked on the facade of arrogance he had worn back in Amarillo. Get that gun out of my face, you little swine, he said, and he saw Robin blink. I'll do what I can. But I'm not promising a miracle, do you understand? Well, what are you standing there for? Get me what I need. Robin lowered the pistol. He went off to get the moonshine, the knives, and the ashes. It took about twenty minutes to get Bucky as drunk as you wanted him. Under Robin's direction, the other boys brought candles and set them in a circle around Bucky. Hugh scrubbed his hands in ashes and waited for the blades to cook. He called you sister, Robin said. Are you a nun? No, that's just my name. Oh. He sounded disappointed, and sister decided to ask. Why? Robin shrugged. We used to have nuns where we were, in the big building. I used to call them blackbirds, because they always flew at you when they thought you'd done something wrong. But some of them were okay. Sister Margaret said she was sure things would work out for me like getting a family and a home and everything. He glanced around the cavern. Some home, huh? It dawned on Sister what Robin was talking about. You lived in an orphanage? Yeah, everybody did. A lot of us got sick and died after it turned cold, especially the really young ones. His eyes darkened. Father Thomas died, and we buried him behind the big building. Sister Lynn died. And then so did Sister May and Sister Margaret. Father Cummings left in the night. I don't blame him. Who wants to take care of a bunch of ratty punks? Some of the others left, too. The last to die was Father Clinton. And then it was just us. Weren't there any older boys with you? Oh, yeah. A few of them stayed. But most took off on their own. Somehow I guess I got to be the oldest. I figured that if I left, who was going to take care of the punks? So you found this cave and started robbing people? Sure. Why not? I mean, the world's gone crazy, hasn't it? Why shouldn't we rob people if it's the only way to stay alive? Because it's wrong, Sister answered. The boy laughed. She let his laugh die, and then she said, How many people have you killed? All traces of a smile left his face. He stared at his hands. They were a man's hands, rough and calloused. Four. But all of them would have killed me, too. He shrugged uneasily. No big deal. The knives are ready, Paul said, returning from the fire. Standing on his crutch over the wounded boy, Hugh took a deep breath and lowered his head. He stayed that way for a minute. All right. His voice was low and resigned. Bring the knives over. Sister, will you kneel down beside me and keep me steady, please? I'll need several boys to hold Bucky securely, too. We don't want him thrashing around. Can we just knock him out or something? Robin asked. No. There's a risk of brain damage in that. And the first impulse a person has after being knocked unconscious is to throw up. We don't want that, do we? Paul! Would you hold Bucky's legs? I hope seeing a little blood doesn't make you sick. It doesn't, Paul said, and Sister recalled the day on I-80 when he'd sliced open a wolf's belly. The hot knives were brought in a metal pot. 
Sister knelt beside Hugh and let him lean his feeble weight against her. She laid the glass ring beside her on the ground. Bucky was drunk and delirious, and he was talking about hearing birds singing. Sister listened. She could only hear the keening of the wind past the mouth of the cave. "'Dear God, please guide my hand,' Hugh whispered. He picked up a knife. The blade was too wide, and he chose another. Even the narrowest of the available knives would be as clumsy as a broken thumb. He knew that one slip could cut into the boy's left ventricle, and then nothing could stop the geyser of blood. "'Go on,' Robin urged. "'I'll start when I'm ready. Not one damned second before. Now move away from me, boy.' Robin retreated, but stayed close enough to watch. Some of the others were holding Bucky's arms, head and body, to the ground, and most of them, even the Job's mask victims, had crowded around. Hugh looked at the knife in his hand. It was shaking, and there was no stopping it. Before his nerve broke entirely, he leaned forward and pressed the hot blade against an edge of the wound. Infectious fluids spattered. Bucky's body jackknifed, and the boy howled with agony. "'Hold him down!' Hugh shouted. "'Hold him, damn it!' The boys struggled to control him, and even Paul had trouble with the kicking legs. Hugh's knife dug deeper, Bucky's cry reverberating off the walls. Robin shouted, "'You're killing him!' But Hugh paid no heed. He picked up the moonshine jug and splashed alcohol in and around the oozing wound. No, the boys could barely hold Bucky down. Hugh began to probe again his own heart pounding as if about to burst through his breast. "'I can't see the bullet,' Hugh said. "'It's gone too deep.' Blood was welling up, thick and dark red. He plucked away bone chips from a naked rib. The red, spongy mass of the lung hitched and bubbled beneath the blade. "'Hold him down, for God's sake!' he shouted. The blade was too wide. It was not a surgical instrument— it was a butchering tool. "'I can't do it! I can't!' he wailed, and he flung the knife away. Robin pressed the pistol's barrel to his skull. "'Get it out of him! I don't have the proper instruments! I can't work without—' "'Fuck the instruments!' Robin shouted. "'Use your fingers, if you have to. Just get the bullet out!' Bucky was moaning, his eyelids fluttering wildly, and his body kept wanting to curl into a fetal position. It took all the strength of the others to restrain him. Hugh was distraught. The metal pot held no blades narrow enough for the work. Robin's pistol pushed at his head. He looked to one side and saw the circle of glass on the ground. He saw the two thin spikes and noted where three more had been broken away. Sister. I need one of those spikes as a probe, he said. Could you break one off for me? She hesitated only a second or two, and then the spike was in his palm, and aflame with color. Spreading the wound's edges with his other hand, he slid the spike into the scarlet hole. Hugh had to go deep, his spine crawling at the thought of what the probe might be grazing. Hold him, he warned angling the piece of glass a centimeter to the left. The heart was laboring, the body passing another threshold of shock. Hurry, hurry, Hugh thought. Find the bastard and get out. Deeper slid the probe, and still no bullet. He imagined suddenly that the glass was getting warm in his hand, very warm, almost hot. Another two seconds, and he was certain. The probe was heating up. Bucky shuddered, his eyes rolled back in his head, and he mercifully passed out. A wisp of steam came from the wound, like an exhaled breath. Hugh thought he smelled scorching tissue. "'Sister, I don't know what's happening, but I think—' The probe touched a solid object deep in the spongy folds of tissue, less than a half inch below the left coronary artery. "'Found it!' Hugh croaked as he concentrated on determining its size with the end of the probe. Blood was everywhere, but it wasn't the bright red of an artery, and its movement was sluggish. The glass was hot in his grip, the smell of scorching flesh stronger. 
Hugh realized that his remaining leg and the lower half of his body were freezing cold, but steam was rising from the wound. It occurred to him that the piece of glass was somehow channeling his body heat, drawing it up and intensifying it down in the depths of the hole. Hugh felt power in his hand, a calm, magnificent power. It seemed to crackle up his arm like a bolt of lightning, clearing his brain of fear and burning away the moonshine cobwebs. Suddenly his thirty years of medical knowledge flooded back into him, and he felt young and strong and unafraid. He didn't know what that power was, the surge of life itself, or something that people used to call salvation in the churches, but he could see again. He could bring that bullet out. Yes, he could. His hands were no longer shaking. He realized he would have to dig down beneath the bullet and lever it up with the probe until he could get two fingers around it. The left coronary artery and the left ventricle were close, very close. He began to work with movements as precise as geometry. Careful, Sister cautioned, but she knew she didn't have to warn him. His face was bent over the wound, and suddenly he shouted, More light! And Robin brought a candle closer. The bullet came loose from the surrounding tissue. Hugh heard a sizzling noise, smelled burning flesh and blood. What the hell? he thought. But he had no time to let his concentration wander. The glass spike was almost too hot to hold now, though he dared not release it. He felt as if he were sitting in a deep freeze up to his chest. I see it, Hugh said. Small bullet, thank God. He pushed two fingers into the wound and caught the bit of lead between them. He brought them out again, clenching what resembled a broken filling for a tooth, and tossed it to Robin. Then he started withdrawing the probe, and all of them could hear the sizzling of flesh and blood. Hugh couldn't believe what he was witnessing. Down in the wound, torn tissue was being cauterized and sealed up as the spike emerged. It came out like a wand of white-hot fire. As it left the wound, there was a quick hissing, and the blood congealed, the infected edges rippling with blue fire that burned for four of sister's rapid heartbeats and went out. Where a hole had been a few seconds before was now a brown, charred circle. Hugh held the piece of glass before his face, his features washed with pure white light. He could feel the heat, yet the hottest of the healing fire was concentrated right at the tip. He realized it had cauterized the tiny vessels and ripped flesh like a surgical laser. The probe's inner flame began to weaken and go out. As the light steadily waned, Sister saw that the jewels within it had turned to small ebony pebbles, and the interconnecting threads of precious metals had become lines of ash. The light continued to weaken until finally there was just a spark of white fire at the tip. It pulsed with the beat of Hugh's heart once, twice, and a third time, and winked out like a dead star. Bucky was still breathing. Hugh, his face streaked with sweat and a bloody mist, looked up at Robin. He started to speak, couldn't find his voice. His lower body was warming up again. I guess this means, he finally said, that you won't be killing us today. Chapter 57 Josh nudged Swan. You doing okay? Yes. She lifted her misshapen head from the folds of her coat. I'm not dead yet. Just checking. You've been pretty quiet all day. I've been thinking. Oh. He watched as Killer ran ahead along the road, then stopped and barked for them to catch up. Mule was walking as fast as he was going to go, and Josh held the reins loosely. Rusty trudged alongside the wagon, all but buried in his cowboy hat and heavy coat. The traveling show wagon creaked on, the road bordered by dense forest. The clouds seemed to be hanging right in the treetops, and the wind had all but stopped, a merciful and rare occurrence. Josh knew the weather was unpredictable. There could be a blizzard and a thunderstorm the same day, and the next day calm winds could whirl into tornadoes. For the past two days they'd seen nothing living. They'd come upon a broken-down bridge and had to detour several miles to get back to the main road. 
A little further on, that road was blocked by a fallen tree, so another detour had to be found. But today they'd passed a tree about three miles back with To Mary's Rest painted on its trunk, and Josh had breathed easier. At least they were headed in the right direction, and Mary's Rest couldn't be much further. Mind if I ask what you're thinking about? Josh prodded. She shrugged her thin shoulders beneath the coat and didn't reply. The tree, he said. It's that, isn't it? Yes. The apple blossoms blowing in the snow and stumps continued to haunt her. Life amid death. I've been thinking about it a lot. I don't know how you did it, but... He shook his head. The rules of the world have changed, he thought. Now the mysteries hold sway. He listened to the creaking axles and the crunch of snow under mules' hooves for a moment, and then he had to ask it. What did... what did it feel like? I don't know. Another shrug. Yes, you do. You don't have to be shy about it. You did a wonderful thing, and I'd like to know what it felt like. She was silent. Up ahead, about fifteen yards, Killer barked a few times. Swan heard the barking as a call that the way was clear. It felt like I was a fountain, she replied. And the tree was drinking. It felt like I was fire, too. And for a minute... She lifted her deformed face toward the heavy sky. I thought I could look up and remember what it was like to see the stars, way up in the dark, like promises. That's what it felt like. Josh knew that what Swan had experienced was far beyond his senses, but he could fathom what she meant about the stars. He hadn't seen them for seven years. At night there was just a vast darkness as if even the lamps of heaven had burned out. Was Mr. Moody right? Swan asked. Right about what? He said that if I could wake up one tree, I could start orchards and crop fields growing again. He said, I've got the power of life inside me. Was he right? Josh didn't answer. He recalled something else Sly Moody had said. Mister, that swan could wake the whole land up again. I was always good at growing plants and flowers, Swan continued. When I wanted a sick plant to get better, I worked the dirt with my hands. And more often than not, the brown leaves fell off and grew back green. But I've never tried to heal a tree before. I mean, it was one thing to grow a garden, but trees take care of themselves. She angled her head so she could see Josh. What if I could grow the orchards and crops back again? What if Mr. Moody was right, and there's something in me that could wake things up and start them growing? I don't know, Josh said. I guess that would make you a pretty popular lady. But like I say, one tree isn't an orchard. He shifted uncomfortably on the hard board beneath him. Talking about this made him jittery. Protect the child he thought. If Swan could indeed spark life from the dead earth, then could that awesome power be the reason for Pawpaw's commandment? In the distance, Killer barked again. Swan tensed. The sound was different, faster and higher pitched. There was a warning in that bark. Stop the wagon, she said. Huh? Stop the wagon. The strength of her voice made Josh pull Mule's reins. Rusty stopped, too. The lower half of his face shielded with a woolen muffler under the cowboy hat. Hey, what are we stopping for? Swan listened to Killer's barking, the noise floating around a bend in the road ahead. Mule shifted in his traces, lifted his head to sniff the air, and made a deep grumbling sound. Another warning, Swan thought. Mule was smelling the same danger Killer had already sensed. She tilted her head to see the road. Everything looked okay, but the vision blurred in and out in her remaining eye, and she knew its sight was rapidly failing. What is it? Josh asked. I don't know. Whatever it is, Killer doesn't like it. Could be the town's just around the bend, Rusty said. I'll mosey ahead and find out. His hands thrust into his coat pockets. 
He started walking toward the bend in the road. Killer was still barking frantically. Rusty, wait! Swan called, but her voice was so garbled he didn't understand her, and kept going at a brisk pace. Josh realized that Rusty wasn't carrying a gun, and no telling what was around that bend. Rusty! he shouted. But the other man was already taking the curve. Oh, shit! Josh unzipped the wagon's flap, then opened the shoebox with the thirty-eight in it and hastily loaded it. He could hear Killer's yap-yap-yapping echoing through the woods, and he knew that Rusty would find out what Killer had seen in just a matter of seconds. Around the bend, Rusty was faced with nothing but more road and woods. Killer was standing in the center of the road about thirty feet away, barking wildly at something off to the right. The terrier's coat was bristling. "'What the hell's bit your butt?' Rusty asked, and Killer ran between his legs, almost tripping him. "'Crazy fool dog!' He reached down to pick the terrier up, and that was when he smelled it. A sharp, rank odor. He recognized it. The heady spoor of a wild animal. There was a nerve-shattering shriek, almost in his ear, and a gray form shot from the forest's edge. He didn't see what it was, but he flung an arm up over his face to protect his eyes. The animal slammed into his shoulder, and for an instant Rusty felt entangled by live wires and thorns. He staggered back, trying to cry out, but the breath had been knocked from his lungs. His hat spun away, spattered with blood, and he sank to his knees. Dazed, he saw what had hit him. Crouched about six feet away, its spine arched, was a bobcat almost the size of a calf. The thing's extended claws looked like hooked daggers, but what shocked Rusty almost senseless was the sight of the monster's two heads. While one green-eyed face shrieked with a noise like razor blades on glass, the second bared its fangs and hissed like a radiator about to blow. Rusty tried to crawl away. His body refused. Something was wrong with his right arm, and blood was streaming down the right side of his face. Bleeding he thought. I'm bleeding bad. Oh, Jesus, I'm... The bobcat came at him like a spring unwinding, its claws and double set of fangs ready to rip him to pieces. But it was hit in midair by another form, and Killer almost took one of the monster's ears off. They landed in a clawing, shrieking fury, hair and blood flying. But the battle was over in another instant, as the massive bobcat twisted Killer on his back and one of the fanged mouths tore the terrier's throat open. Rusty tried to get to his feet, staggered and fell again. The bobcat turned toward him. One set of fangs snapped at him while the other head sniffed the air. Rusty got a booted foot up in the air to kick at the monster when it attacked. The bobcat crouched back on its hind legs. Come on, Rusty thought. Get it over with, you two-headed bass. He heard the crack of a pistol and Snow jumped about six feet behind the bobcat. The monster whirled around, and Rusty saw Josh running toward him. Josh stopped, took aim again, and fired. The bullet went wild again, and now the bobcat began to turn one way and then the other, as if its two brains couldn't agree on which way to run. The heads snapped at each other, straining at the neck. Josh planted his feet, aimed with his single eye, and squeezed the trigger. A hole plowed through the bobcat's side, and one head made a shrill wailing, while the second growled at Josh in defiance. He fired again and missed, but he hit with his next two shots. The monster trembled, loped toward the woods, turned and streaked again toward Rusty. The eyes of one head had rolled back to show the whites, but the other was still alive, and its fangs were bared to plunge into Rusty's throat. He heard himself screaming as the monster advanced, but less than three feet from him the bobcat shuddered and its legs gave way. It fell to the road, its living head snapping at the air. Rusty scrambled away from the thing, and then a terrible wave of weakness crashed over him. He lay where he was as Josh ran toward him. Kneeling beside Rusty, Josh saw that the right side of his face had been clawed open from hairline to jaw and in the torn sleeve of his right shoulder was mangled tissue. But the farm, Josh! Rusty summoned a weak smile. Sure did, didn't I? Hang on. 
Josh tucked the pistol under one arm and lifted Rusty off the ground, slinging him over his back in a fireman's carry. Swan was approaching, trying to run, but being thrown off balance by the weight of her head. A few feet away, the mutant bobcat's fangs came together like the crack of a steel trap. The body shook, and then its eyes rolled back like ghastly green marbles. Josh walked past the bobcat to kill her, and the terrier's pink tongue emerged from its bloody mouth to lick Josh's boot. "'What happened?' Swan called frantically. "'What is it?' Killer made an effort to rise to all fours when he heard Swan's voice, but his body was beyond control. His head was hanging limply, and as Killer toppled back on his side, Josh could see that the dog's eyes were already glazing over. "'Josh!' Swan called. Her hands were up in front of her, because she could hardly see where she was going. "'Talk to me, damn it!' Killer gave one quick gasp, and then he was gone. Josh stepped between Swan and the dog. "'Rusty's been hurt,' he said. "'It was a bobcat. We've got to get him to town in a hurry.' He grasped her arm and pulled her with him before she could see the dead terrier. Josh gently laid Rusty in the back of the wagon and covered him with the red blanket. Rusty was shivering and only half conscious. Josh told Swan to stay with him, and then he went forward and took Mule's reins. "'Get up!' he shouted. The old horse, whether surprised by the command or by the unaccustomed urgency of the reins, snorted steam through his nostrils and bounded forward, pulling with newfound strength. Swan drew the tent's flap open. "'What about Killer? We can't just leave him!' He couldn't yet bring himself to tell her that the terrier was dead. "'Don't you worry,' he said. He'll find his way. He snapped the reins against Mule's haunches. Get up now, Mule. Go, boy. The wagon rounded the bend, its wheels passing on either side of Killer, and Mule's hooves threw up a spray of snow as the horse raced toward Mary's rest. Chapter 58 The road spooled out another mile before the woods gave way to bleak rolling land that might have once been plowed hillsides. Now it was a snow-covered waste, interrupted by black trees twisted into shapes, both agonized and surrealistic. But there was a town of sorts. Clustered along both sides of the road were maybe three hundred weather-beaten clabbered shacks. Josh thought that seven years ago a sight like this would have meant he was entering a ghetto. But now he was overjoyed to the point of tears. Muddy alleys cut between the shacks and smoke curled into the bitter air from stovepipe chimneys. Lanterns glowed behind windows, insulated with yellowed newspapers and magazine pages. Skinny dogs howled and barked around Mule's legs as Josh drew the wagon up amid the shacks. Across the road and up a ways was a charred pile of timbers, where one of the buildings of Mary's Rest had burned to the ground. The fire had been some time ago, because new snow had collected in the ruins. "'Hey!' Josh shouted. "'Somebody help us!' A few thin children in ragged coats came out from the alleys to see what was going on. "'Is there a doctor around here?' Josh asked them, but they scattered back into the alleys. The door of a nearby shack opened, and a black-bearded face peered cautiously out. "'We need a doctor!' Josh demanded. The bearded man shook his head and shut the door. Josh urged Mule deeper into the shantytown. He kept shouting for a doctor, and a few people opened their doors and watched him pass, but none offered assistance. Further on, a pack of dogs that had been tearing at the remains of an animal in the mud snarled and snapped at Mule, but the old horse kept his nerve and held steady. From a doorway lurched an emaciated old man in rags, his face blotched with red keloids. "'No room here, no food. We don't want no strangers here,' he raved, striking the wagon's side with a gnarled stick. He was still babbling as they drew away. Josh had seen a lot of wretched places before, but this was the worst. It occurred to him that this was a town of strangers where nobody gave a shit about who lived or died in the next hovel. There was a brooding sense of defeat and fatal depression here, and even the air smelled of rank decay. If Rusty hadn't been so badly hurt, Josh would have kept the wagon going right through the ulcer of Mary's rest, 
and out where the air smelled halfway decent again. A figure with a malformed head stumbled along the roadside, and Josh recognized the same disease that both he and Swan had. He called to the person, but whoever it was, male or female, turned and ran down an alley out of sight. Lying on the ground a few yards away was a dead man, stripped naked, his ribs showing and his teeth bared in what might have been a grin of escape. A few dogs were sniffing around him, but they had not yet begun feasting. And then Mule stopped, as if he'd run into a brick wall, neighed shrilly and almost reared. "'Whoa! Settle down now!' Josh shouted, having to fight the horse for control. He saw that someone was in the road in front of them. The figure was wearing a faded denim jacket and a green cap, and was sitting in a child's red wagon. The figure had no legs, the trousers rolled up and empty below the thighs. "'Hey!' Josh called. "'Is there a doctor in this town?' The face turned slowly toward him. It was a man with a scraggly light brown beard and vague, tormented eyes. "'We need a doctor.' Josh said. Can you help us? Josh thought the man might have smiled, but he wasn't sure. The man said, Welcome. A doctor. Can't you understand me? Welcome, the man repeated. And he laughed. And Josh realized he was out of his mind. The man reached out, plunged his hands into the mud, and began to pull himself and the wagon across the road. Welcome! he shouted as he rolled away into an alley. Josh shivered, and not just from the cold. The man's eyes, they were the most awful eyes Josh had ever looked into. He got Mule settled down and moving forward again. He continued to shout for help. An occasional face looked out from a doorway and then drew quickly back. Rusty's going to die, Josh feared. He's going to bleed to death, and not a single bastard in this hellhole will raise a finger to save him. Yellow smoke drifted across the road, the wagon's tires moving through puddles of human waste. "'Somebody help us!' Josh's voice was giving out. "'Please! For God's sake! Somebody help us!' "'Lord! What's all the yelling about?' Startled, Josh looked toward the voice. Standing in the doorway of a decrepit shack was a black woman with long iron-gray hair, she wore a coat that had been stitched from a hundred different scraps of cloth. "'I need to find a doctor. Can you help me?' "'What's wrong with you?' Her eyes, the color of copper pennies, narrowed. "'Typhoid? The dysentery?' "'No. My friend's been hurt. He's in the back.' "'Ain't no doctor in Mary's rest. Doctor died of typhoid. Ain't nobody can help you.' He's bleeding bad. Isn't there some place I can take him? You can take him to the pit, she suggested. She had a sharp-featured, regal face. About a mile or so down the road, it's where all the bodies go. The dark face of a boy about seven or eight years old peeked through the doorway at her side, and she rested a hand on his shoulder. Ain't no place to take him but there. Rusty's not dead, lady. Josh snapped. But he's sure going to be, if I don't find some help for him. He flicked Mule's reins. The black woman let him get a few yards further down the road, and then she said, Hold on! Josh reined Mule in. The woman walked down the cinder block steps in front of her shack and approached the rear of the wagon, while the little boy nervously watched. Open this thing up, she said. And suddenly the rear flap was unzipped, and she was face to face with Swan. The woman stepped back a pace, then took a deep breath, summoned her courage again, and looked into the wagon at the bloody white man lying under a red blanket. The white man wasn't moving. "'He's still alive?' she asked the faceless figure. "'Yes, ma'am,' Swan replied. "'But he's not breathing very good.' She could make out the yes, but nothing more. "'What happened?' "'Bobcat got him.' Josh said, coming around to the back of the wagon. He was shaking so much he could hardly stand. The woman took a long, hard look at him with her piercing, copper-colored eyes. Damn thing had two heads. Yeah, 
Lots of them out in the woods like that. Kill you for sure. She glanced toward the house, then back at Rusty. He made a soft moaning noise, and she could see the terrible wound on the side of his face. She let the breath leak out between her clenched teeth. Well, bring him on inside, then. Can you help him? We'll find out. She started walking toward the shack and turned back to say, I'm a seamstress, pretty good with a needle and catgut. Bring him on. The shack was as grim inside as it was out, but the woman had two lanterns lit, and on the walls were hung bright pieces of cloth. At the center of the front room stood a makeshift stove constructed from parts of a washing machine, a refrigerator, and various pieces of what might have been a truck or car. A few scraps of wood burned behind a grate that was once a car's radiator grill, and the stove only provided heat within a two- or three-foot radius. Smoke leaked through the funnel that went up into the roof, giving the shack's interior a yellow haze. The woman's furniture, a table and two chairs, were crudely sawn from worm-eaten pine wood. Old newspapers covered the windows, and the wind piped through cracks in the walls. On the pine wood table were snippets of cloth, scissors, needles, and the like, and a basket held more pieces of cloth, and a variety of colors and patterns. It ain't much, she said with a shrug, but it's better than some has. Bring him in here. She motioned Josh into a second, smaller room, where there was an iron-framed cot and a mattress stuffed with newspapers and rags. On the floor next to the cot was a little arrangement of rags, a small patchwork pillow, and a thin blanket, in which Josh presumed the little boy slept. In the room there were no windows, but a lantern burned with a shiny piece of tin behind it to reflect the light. An oil painting of a black Jesus on a hillside, surrounded by sheep, hung on a wall. "'Lay him down,' the woman said. "'Not on my bed, fool, on the floor.' Josh put Rusty down with his head cradled by the patchwork pillow. "'Get that jacket and sweater off him so I can see if he's still got any meat left on that arm.' Josh did as she said, while Swan stood in the doorway with her head tilted way to one side so she could see. The little boy stood on the other side of the room, staring at Swan. The woman picked up the lantern and put it on the floor next to Rusty. She whistled softly. "'Bout scraped him to the bone. Aaron, you go bring the other lamps in here. Then you fetch me the long bone needle, the ball of catgut, and a sharp pair of scissors. Hurry on now.' "'Yes, Mama,' Aaron said, and he darted past Swan. "'What's your friend's name?' "'Rusty.' He's in a bad way. Don't know if I can stitch him up, but I'll do my best. Ain't got nothing but snow water to clean those wounds with, and you sure as hell don't want that filthy shit in an open— She stopped, looking at Josh's mottled hands as he took off his gloves. You black or white? she asked. Does it matter any more? No, don't reckon it does. Aaron brought the two lanterns, and she arranged them near Rusty's head, while he went out again to get the other things she needed. "'You got a name?' "'Josh Hutchins. The girl's name is Swan.' She nodded. Her long, delicate fingers probed the ragged edges of the wound at Rusty's shoulder. "'I'm Glory Bowen. Make my living by stitching clothes for people. But I ain't no doctor.' The closest I ever come to doctrine was helping a few women have their babies. But I know about sewing cloth, dog skin, and cowhide, and maybe a person's skin ain't too much different. Rusty's body suddenly went rigid. He opened his eyes and tried to sit up, but Josh and Glory Bowen held him down. He struggled for a minute, then seemed to realize where he was and relaxed again. Josh? he asked. Yeah, I'm here. Bastard got me, didn't he? Old two-headed bastard of a bobcat. Knocked me right on my ass. He blinked, looked up at Glory. Who are you? I'm the woman you're going to despise in about three minutes, she answered calmly. 
Aaron came in with a thin, sharpened splinter of bone that must have been three inches long, and he laid it in his mother's palm, along with a small, waxy-looking ball of catgut thread and a pair of scissors. Then he retreated to the other side of the room, his eyes moving back and forth between Swan and the others. "'What are you going to do to me?' Rusty made out the bone needle as Glory put the end of the thread through the needle's eye and tied a tiny knot. "'What's that for?' "'You'll find out soon enough.' She picked up a rag and wiped the sweat and blood from Rusty's face. "'Gonna have to do a little sewing on you. Gonna put you together just like a fine new shirt. That suit you?' "'Oh, Lord,' was all Rusty could manage to say. "'We gonna have to tie you down, or are you gonna be a man about this? Don't have nothing to kill the pain. Just talk to me,' Rusty told her. "'Okay. Sure. What you want to talk about?' She positioned the needle near the ripped flesh at Rusty's shoulder. "'How about food? Fried chicken?' A big bucket full of Colonel Sanders with them hot spices. That sound good to you? She angled the needle in the precise direction she wanted, and then she went to work. Can't you just smell that Kentucky fried heaven? Rusty closed his eyes. Yeah, he whispered thickly. Oh, yeah, I sure can. Swan couldn't bear to watch Rusty in pain. She went to the front room, where she warmed herself by the makeshift stove. Aaron peeked around the corner at her, then jerked his head out of sight. She heard Rusty catch his breath, and she went to the door, opened it, and stepped outside. She climbed into the back of the wagon to get Crybaby, and then she stood rubbing Mule's neck. She was worried about Killer. How was he going to find them? And if a bobcat had hurt Rusty that badly, what might one do to kill her? Don't you worry, Josh had said. He'll find his way. You got a hade inside there? A small, curious voice asked beside her. Swan made out Aaron standing a few feet away. You can talk, can't you? I heard you say something to my mama. I can speak, she answered. I have to talk slowly, though, or you won't be able to understand me. Oh, your head looks kind of like a big old gourd. Swan smiled, her facial flesh pulling so tight it felt about to tear. She knew the youngster was being honest, not cruel. I guess it does. And yes, I have a head inside here. It's just covered up. I seen some people look like you. Mama says it's a real bad sickness. Says you get that thing, and you got it your whole life. Is that so? I don't know. She says it ain't catching, though. Says if it was, everybody in town would have it by now. What kind of stick is that? It's a dowsing rod. What's that? She explained how a dowsing rod was supposed to find water if you held the forked ends of it just right, but she'd never found any water with it. She recalled Leona Skelton's gentle voice, as if drifting through time, to whisper, "'Cry baby's work isn't done yet, not by a far sight. "'Maybe you ain't holding it right, then,' Aaron said. "'I just use it like a walking stick.' I don't see too well. I reckon not. You ain't got no eyeballs. Swan laughed and felt muscles in her face unfreeze. The wind brought a new whiff of a sickening odor of decay that Swan had noticed as soon as they'd entered Mary's rest. Aaron, she asked, what's that smell? What smell? He was used to it, she realized. Human waste and garbage lay everywhere. But this was a fouler odor. It comes and goes, she said. The wind's carrying it. Oh, I reckon that's the pond. What's left of it, I mean. It ain't too far. Want to see? No, Swan thought. 
She didn't want to get near anything so awful. But Aaron sounded eager to please, and she was curious. All right, but we'll have to walk real slow. And don't run off and leave me, okay? Okay, he answered, and he promptly ran about thirty feet up a muddy alley before he turned and waited for her to catch up. Swan followed him through the narrow, filthy alleys. Many of the shacks had been burned down, people still digging shelters in the ruins. She probed ahead with Crybaby and was frightened by a skinny yellow dog that lunged out of an intersecting alley. Aaron kicked at it, and it ran off. Behind a closed door, an infant wailed with hunger. Further on, Swan almost stumbled over a man lying curled up in the mud. She started to reach down and touch his shoulder, but Aaron said, He's a dead un. Come on, it ain't too far. They passed between the miserable clabbered shacks and came upon a wide field covered with gray snow. Here and there the frozen body of a human being or an animal lay contorted on the ground. Come on! Aaron called, jumping up and down impatiently. He'd been born amid death, had seen so much of it that it was a commonplace sight. He stepped over a woman's corpse and continued down a gently sloping hill to the large pond that over the years had drawn hundreds of wanderers to the settlement of Mary's Rest. There it is, Aaron said when Swan reached him. He pointed. About a hundred feet away was what had indeed been a very large pond, nestled in the midst of dead trees. Swan saw that maybe an inch of yellow-green water remained right at its center, and all around was cracked, nasty-looking yellow mud. And in that mud were dozens of half-buried human and animal skeletons, as if they'd been sucked down as they'd tried to get the last of that contaminated water. Crows perched on the bones, waiting, Heaps of frozen human excrement and garbage lay in the mud as well, and the smell that wafted from that mess where a pond used to be turned Swan's stomach. It was as rank as an open sore or an unwashed bathroom bucket. This is about as close as you can stand without getting sick, Aaron said. But I wanted you to see it. Ain't it a peculiar color? My God! Swan was fighting the urge to throw up. Why doesn't somebody clean that up? Clean what up? Aaron asked. The pond. It wasn't always like that, was it? Oh, no. I remember when the pond had water in it. Real drinking water. But Mama says it just gave out. Says it couldn't last forever anyway. Swan had to turn away from the sight. She looked back the way they'd come, and could make out a solitary figure on the hill, scooping dirty snow into a bucket. Melting the gray snow for water was a slow death, but it was far better than the poisonous pond. "'I'm ready to go back now,' she told him, and she started walking slowly up the hill, probing before her with Crybaby. Once over the hill, Swan almost tripped over a body in her path. She stopped, looking down at the small form of a child— whether it had been a boy or a girl, she couldn't tell, but the child had died lying on its stomach, one hand clawing at the earth, and the other frozen into a fist. She stared at those little hands, pallid and waxy against the snow. "'Why are these bodies out here?' she asked. "'Cause this is where they died,' he told her, as if she was the dumbest old gourdhead in the whole world. This one was trying to dig something up. Roots, probably. Sometimes you can dig roots up out of the ground, sometimes you can't. When we can find them, Mama makes a soup out of them. Roots? What kind of roots? You sure ask a lot of questions, he said, exasperated, and he started to walk on ahead. What kind of roots? Swan repeated slowly but firmly. Corn roots, I reckon, Aaron shrugged. Mama says there used to be a big old cornfield out here, but everything died. Ain't nothing left but a few roots. If a body's lucky enough to find them. Come on now, I'm cold. Swan looked out across the barren field that lay between the shacks and the pond. Bodies lay like strange punctuation marks scrawled on a gray tablet. 
The vision in her eye faded in and out, and whatever was under the thick crust of growths burned and seethed. The child's white frozen hands took her attention again. Something about those hands, she thought, something, but she didn't know what. The smell of the pond sickened her, and she followed Aaron toward the shacks again. Used to be a big old cornfield out here, Aaron had said, but everything died. She pushed snow away from the ground with Crybaby. The earth was dark and hard. If any roots remained out here, they were far beneath the crust. They were still winding their way through the alleys when Swan heard Mule neigh. It was a cry of alarm. She quickened her pace, stabbing ahead of her with the dowsing rod. When they came out of the alley next to Glory Bowden's shack, Swan heard Mule make a shrill, whickering sound that conveyed anger and fear. She tilted her head to see what was happening, and finally made it out. People in rags were swarming all over the wagon, tearing it apart. They were shredding the canvas tent to pieces and fighting over the remnants, grabbing up blankets, canned food, clothes, and rifles from the rear of the wagon, and running with them. Stop, she told them, but of course they paid no attention. One of them tried to untie Mule from his harness, but the horse bucked and kicked so powerfully the scavenger was driven off. They were even trying to take the wheels off the wagon. Stop it! Swan shouted, stumbling forward. Someone collided against her, knocked her into the cold mud, and almost stepped on her. Nearby, two men were fighting in the mud over one of the blankets, and the fight ended when a third man grabbed it and scuttled away. The cabin's door opened. Josh had heard Swan shout, and now he saw the traveling show wagon being ripped apart. Panic shook him. That was all they had in the world. A man was running with a bundle of sweaters and socks in his arms, and Josh went after him but slipped in the mud. The scavengers scattered in all directions, taking away the last of the canvas, all the food, the weapons, blankets, everything. A woman with an orange keloid covering most of her face and neck tried to strip the coat off Swan, but Swan doubled up and the woman struck at her, screaming in frustration. When Josh got to his feet, the woman ran down one of the alleys. Then they were all gone, and so were the contents of the traveling show wagon, including most of the wagon itself. Damn it! Josh raged. There was nothing left but the frame of the wagon and mule, who was still snorting and bucking. We're up shit creek now, he thought. Nothing to eat, not even a damned sock left. You okay? He asked Swan, going over to help her up. Aaron was standing beside her, and he reached out to touch her gourd of a head, but drew his hand back at the last second. Yes. Her shoulder was just a little sore where she'd been struck. I think I'm all right. Josh gently helped Swan up and steadied her. They took just about everything we had, he fretted. In the mud lay a few items that had been left behind a dented tin cup, a tattered shawl, a worn-out boot that Rusty had planned to mend and never got around to. You leave things sitting out round here, they gonna get stole for sure, Aaron said sagely. Any fool knows that. Well, Swan said, maybe they need those things more than we do. Josh's first impulse was an incredulous laugh, but he held it in check. She was right. At least they had good heavy coats and gloves, and they were wearing thick socks and sturdy boots. Some of those scavengers had been a few threads away from their Genesis suits, except this was surely as far from the Garden of Eden as a human could fall. Swan walked around the wagon to Mule and settled the old horse down by calmly rubbing his nose. Still he continued to make an ominous, worried rumbling. "'Better get inside,' Josh told her. Wind's picking up again. She came toward him, then stopped when Crybaby touched something hard in the mud. She bent down carefully, groped in the mud, and came up with the dark oval mirror that somebody had dropped. The magic mirror, she thought as she straightened up again. It had been a long time since she'd peered into it, but now she wiped the mud off on the leg of her jeans and held it up before her grasping it by the handle with the two carved masks that stared in different directions. "'What's that thing?' Aaron asked. "'Can you see yourself in there?' 
She could only see the faintest outline of her head, and thought that indeed it did look like a swollen old gourd. She dropped her arm to her side, and as she did, something flashed in the glass. She held it up again and turned so the mirror was facing in another direction. She hunted for the flash of light, but couldn't find it. Then she shifted, turning a foot or so to the right, and caught her breath. Seemingly less than ten feet behind her was the figure holding the glowing circle of light. Close now, very close. Swan was still not quite able to make out the features. She sensed, however, that something was wrong with the face. It was distorted and deformed, but not nearly like her own. She thought that the figure might be a woman, just from the way whoever it was carried herself. So close, so close! Yet Swan knew that if she turned around, there would be nothing behind her but the shanties and alleys. "'What direction is the mirror facing?' she asked Josh. "'North,' he answered. "'We came in from the south. That way.' He motioned in the opposite direction. "'Why?' He could never understand what she saw when she looked into that thing. Whenever he asked, she would shrug her shoulder and put the mirror away. But the mirror had always reminded him of a verse his mother liked to read from the Bible. "'For now we see in a glass darkly, but then face to face.' The figure with the glowing ring of light had never been so close before. Sometimes it had been so far away that the light was barely a spark in the glass. She didn't know who the figure was or what the ring of light was supposed to be, but she knew it was someone and something very important. And now the woman was close, and Swan thought that she must be somewhere to the north of Mary's Rest. She was about to tell Josh when the face with the leprous parchment-like flesh rose up over her left shoulder. The monstrous face filled up the whole glass, its gray-lipped mouth cracking open in a grin, one scarlet eye with an ebony pupil emerging from its forehead. A second mouth full of sharp-edged teeth opened like a slash across its cheek, and the teeth strained forward as if to bite Swan on the back of the neck. She turned so fast that the weight of her head almost spun her like a top. Behind her, the road was deserted. She lowered the mirror. She had seen enough for one day. If what the magic mirror showed her was true, the figure bearing the ring of light was very near. But nearer still was the thing that reminded her of the devil on Leona Skelton's tarot card. Josh watched Swan as she went up the cinderblock steps into Glory Bowen's shack, then looked north along the road. There was no movement but chimney smoke scattering before the wind. He regarded the wagon again and shook his head. He figured that Mule would kick the sauce out of anybody who tried to steal him, and there was nothing left to take. That's all our food, he said, mostly to himself, every damn bit of it. Oh, I know a place you can catch some big uns, Aaron offered. You just got to know where they are and be quick to catch them. Quick to catch what? Rats, the boy said, as if any fool knew that that was what most of the people in Mary's Rest had been surviving on for the last few years. That's what we'll be eating tonight if you're staying. Josh swallowed thickly, but he was no stranger to the gamey taste of rat meat. I hope you've got salt, he said as he followed Aaron up the steps. I like mine real salty. Just before he reached the door, he felt the flesh at the back of his neck tighten. He heard Mule snort and whinny, and he looked toward the road again. He had the unnerving sensation of being watched. No, more than that, of being dissected. But there was no one, no one at all. The wind whirled around him, and in it he thought he heard a squeaking sound, like the noise of wheels in need of grease. The sound was gone in an instant. The light was quickly fading, and Josh knew this was one place he wouldn't walk the alleys at night, even for a T-bone steak. He went into the shack and shut the door. Part 10. Seeds. The Hand Revealed, Swan and the Big Dude, A Decent Wish, The Savage Prince, Fighting Fire with Fire. Chapter 59. Swan awakened from a dream. She'd been running through a field of human bodies that moved like stalks of wheat before the wind. 
and behind her advanced the thing with the single scarlet eye, its scythe lopping off heads, arms, and legs as it sought her out. Only her head was too heavy, her feet weighted down by yellow mud, and she couldn't run fast enough. The monster was getting nearer, its scythe whistling through the air like a shriek, and suddenly she had fallen over a child's corpse, and she was looking at its white hands, one clawing the earth and the other clenched into a fist. She lay on the floor of Glory Bowen's shack. Embers behind the stove's grate still cast a little light and a breath of heat. She slowly sat up and leaned against the wall, the image of the child's hands fixed in her mind. Nearby, Josh lay curled up on the floor, breathing heavily and deeply asleep. Closer to the stove, Rusty lay sleeping under a thin blanket, his head on the patchwork pillow. Glory had done a fine job of cleaning and stitching the wounds, but she'd said the next couple of days would be rough for him. It had been very kind of her to let them spend the night and share her water and a little stew. Aaron had asked Swan dozens of questions about her condition, what the land was like beyond Mary's rest, and what all she'd seen. Glory had told Aaron to stop pestering her, but Swan wasn't bothered. The boy had a curious mind, and that was a rare thing worth encouraging. Glory told them her husband had been a Baptist minister back in Wynn, Arkansas, when the bombs hit. The radiation of Little Rock had killed a lot of people in the town, and Glory, her husband, and their infant son had joined a caravan of wanderers looking for a safe place to settle. But there were no safe places. Four years later they'd settled in Mary's Rest, which at that time was a thriving settlement built around the pond. There'd been no minister or church in Mary's Rest, and Glory's husband had started building a house of worship with his own hands. But then the typhoid epidemic came, Glory told them. People died by the score, and wild animals skulked in from the woods to gut the corpses. When the last of the community's stockpile of canned food gave out, people started eating rats, boiling bark, roots, leather, even the dirt itself, into soup. One night the church had caught fire, and Glory's husband had died trying to save it. The blackened ruins were still standing, because nobody had the energy or will to build it back. She and her son had stayed alive, because she was a good seamstress, and people paid her with extra food, coffee, and such, to patch their clothes. That was the story of her life, Glory had said. That was how she'd gotten to be an old woman when she was barely thirty-five. Swan listened to the sound of the roving wind. Was it bringing the answer to the magic mirror's riddle closer, she wondered, or was it blowing it further away? And quite suddenly— as the wind faltered to draw another breath, Swan heard the urgent noise of a dog barking. Her heart thudded in her chest. The barking ebbed away, was gone, then began to swell again from somewhere very near. Swan would know that bark anywhere. She started to reach over and rouse Josh to tell him that Killer had found his way, but he snorted and muttered in his sleep. She let him alone, stood up with the aid of the dowsing rod, and walked to the door. The barking faded as the wind took a different turn, but she understood what it said. Hurry, come see what I've got to show you. She put on her coat, buttoned it up to her neck, and slipped out of the shack into the tumultuous dark. She couldn't see the terrier. Josh had unbridled mule to let the horse fend for himself, and he'd wandered off to find shelter. The wind came back, and with it the barking. Where was it coming from? The left, she thought. No, the right. She walked down the steps. There was no sign of killer, and now the barking was gone, too. But she was sure it had come from the right, maybe from that alley over there, the same alley Aaron had taken her along to show her the pond. She hesitated. It was cold out here, and dark, except for the glow of a bonfire a few alleys away. Had she heard killer's barking or not? she asked herself. It wasn't there now, just the wind shrilling through the alleys and around the shacks. The image of the child's frozen hands came to her. What was it about those hands that haunted her, she wondered? It was more than the fact that they belonged to a dead child, much, much more. She didn't know exactly when she made the decision or when she took the first step. 
but suddenly she was entering the alley, questing with Crybaby before her, and she was walking toward the field. Her vision blurred, her eyes stinging with pain. She went blind, but she didn't panic. She just waited it out, hoping that this wasn't the time when her sight would go and not return. It came back, and Swan kept going. She fell once over another corpse in the alley, and heard an animal growling somewhere nearby, but she made it through, and then there was the field stretched before her, only faintly illuminated in the reflection of the distant bonfire. She began to walk across it, the odor of the poisonous pond thick in her nostrils, and hoped she remembered the way. The barking returned from off to her left. She changed her direction to follow it, and she called, Killer, where are you? But the wind snatched her voice away. Step by step, Swan crossed the field. In some places the snow was four or five inches thick, but in others the wind had blown it away to expose the bare ground. The barking ebbed and faded, returned from a slightly different direction. Swan altered her course by a few degrees, but she couldn't see the terrier anywhere on the field. The barking stopped. So did Swan. "'Where are you?' she called. The wind shoved at her, almost knocked her down. She looked back at Mary's rest, could see the bonfire and a few lanterns burning in windows. It seemed a long way off, but she took one more step in the direction of the pond. Crybaby touched something on the ground right in front of her, and Swan made out the shape of the child's body. The wind shifted. The barking came again. Just a whisper now, from an unknown distance. It continued to fade, and just before it was gone, Swan had a strange impression that the sound no longer belonged to an old, weary dog. It had a note of youth in it, and strength, and roads yet to be traveled. The sound was gone, and Swan was alone with the corpse of the child. She bent down and looked at the hands, one clawing the earth, the other clenched into a fist. What was so familiar about that? And then she knew. It was the way she herself had planted seeds when she was a little girl, one hand digging the hole, the other. She grasped the bony fist and tried to pry it open. It resisted her, but she worked at it patiently, and thought of opening a flower's petals. The hand slowly revealed what was locked in its palm. There were six wrinkled kernels of corn. One hand digging the hole, she thought, and the other nestling the seeds. Seeds! The child had not died digging for roots. The child had died trying to plant shriveled seeds. She held the kernels in her own palm. Was there untapped life in them? Or were they only cold bits of nothing? Used to be a big old cornfield out here, Aaron had told her. But everything died. She thought of the apple tree bursting into new life, thought of the green seedlings in the shape of her body, thought of the flowers she had grown in dry, dusty earth a long time ago. Used to be a big old cornfield out here. Swan looked at the body again. The child had died in a strange posture. Why was the child lying on its stomach on the cold ground instead of curling up to save the last bit of warmth? She gently grasped the shoulder and tried to turn it over. There was a faint crackling noise as the ragged clothes unstuck from the ground, but the body itself was as light as a husk, and underneath the body was a small leather pouch. She picked it up with a trembling hand, opened it, and reached in with two fingers. But she already knew what she'd find. In the pouch were more dried kernels of corn. The child had been protecting them with body heat. She realized she would have done the same thing, and that she and the child might have had a lot in common. Here were the seeds. It was up to her to finish the job the dead child had begun. She scraped away snow and thrust her fingers into the dirt. It was hard and clay, full of ice and sharp pebbles. She brought up a handful and worked warmth into it. Then she put one kernel into it and did what she had done when she planted seeds in the dust of Kansas. She gathered saliva in her mouth and spat into her handful of dirt. 
She rolled it into a ball, kept rolling it until she felt the tingling running up through her backbone, through her arm and fingers. Then she returned the dirt to the ground, pressing it into the hole she'd scooped it from. And that was the first seed planted. But whether it would grow in this tormented earth or not, Swan didn't know. She picked up Crybaby, crawled a few feet away from the body, and clawed up another handful of dirt. Either sharp ice or a stone cut her fingers, but she hardly noticed the pain. Her mind was concentrated on the task. The pins and needles sensation was strengthening, starting to flow through her body in waves, like power through humming wires. Swan crawled ahead and planted a third seed. The cold was chewing down through her clothes, stiffening her bones. But she kept on going, scraping up a handful of dirt every two or three feet, and planting a single seed. In some places the earth was frozen solid, and as unyielding as granite. So she crawled on to another place, finding that the dirt cushion beneath the snow was softer than the dirt where the covering snow had blown away. Still her hands quickly became raw, and blood began to seep from cuts. Drops of blood mingled with the seeds and dirt as Swan continued to work, slowly and methodically, without pause. She didn't plant any seeds near the pond, but instead turned back toward Mary's rest to lay down another row. An animal wailed off in the distant woods, a high, shrill, lonely cry. She kept her mind on her work, her bloody hands searching through the snow to find pliable dirt. The cold finally pierced her, and she had to stop and huddle up. Ice was clogging her nostrils, her eye with its fragile vision almost frozen shut. She lay shivering, and it occurred to her that she'd feel stronger if she could sleep for a while, just a short rest, just a few minutes, and then she'd get back to work again. Something nudged her side. She was dazed and weak, and she didn't care to lift her head to see what it was. She was nudged again, much harder this time. Swan rolled over, angled her head, and looked up. A warm breath hit her face. Mule was standing over her, as motionless as if carved from gray dappled stone. She started to lie back down again, but Mule nudged her in the shoulder with his nose. He made a deep rumbling sound, and the breath floated from his nostrils like steam from a boiler. He was not going to let her sleep, and the warm air that came from his lungs reminded her of how very cold it was and how close she'd been to giving up. If she lay there much longer she would freeze. She had to get moving again, get her circulation going. Mule nudged her more firmly, and Swan sat up and said, "'Okay, okay.' She lifted a blood-and-dirt-caked hand toward his muzzle, and Mule's tongue came out to lick the tortured flesh. She started planting seeds from the leather pouch again as Mule followed along a few paces behind her, his ears pricking up and quivering at the approaching cries of animals in the woods. As the cold closed in, and Swan forced herself to keep working, everything became dreamlike and hazy, as if she were laboring under water. Every once in a while Mule's steamy breath would warm her, and then she began to sense furtive movement in the dark all around them, drawing closer. She heard the shriek of an animal nearby, and Mule answered with a husky grumble of warning. Swan kept pushing herself on kept scraping through the snow to grip handfuls of dirt and replace them in the earth with seeds at their centers. Every movement of her fingers was an exercise in agony, and she knew the animals were being lured from the woods by the scent of her blood. But she had to finish the job. There were still perhaps thirty or forty kernels left in the leather pouch, and Swan was determined to get them planted. The tingling currents coursed through her bones, continuing to grow stronger, almost painful now, and as she worked in the dark, she imagined that she saw an occasional tiny burst of sparks fly from the bloody mass of her fingers. She smelled a faint burned odor, like an electric plug beginning to overheat and short-circuit. Her face, beneath the mask-like crust of growths, seethed with pain. When her vision would fade out, she would work for a few minutes in absolute blindness until her sight returned. She pushed herself onward, three or four feet, and one seed at a time. An animal, a bobcat she thought it was, growled somewhere off to the left, dangerously near. She tensed for its attack, heard Mule whinny, and felt the pounding of his hooves against the earth as he galloped past her. Then the bobcat shrieked, 
There was the noise of turbulence in the snow, and a minute or so later Mule's breath warmed her face again. Another animal growled a challenge, off to the right this time, and Mule whirled toward it as the bobcat leapt. Swan heard a high squeal of pain, heard Mule grunt as he was struck. Then there was the jarring of Mule's hooves against the ground, once, twice, and again. He returned to her side, and she planted another seed. She didn't know how long the attacks went on. She concentrated only on her work, and soon she came to the last five seeds. At the first spear of light in the east, Josh sat up in the front room of Glory Bowen's shack and realized that Swan was gone. He called the woman and her son, and together they searched the alleys of Mary's Rest. It was Aaron who ran out to the field to look, and he came back yelling for Josh and his mama to come quick. They saw a figure lying on the ground, huddled up on its side. Pressed close to it was Mule, who lifted his head and whinnied weakly as Josh ran toward them. He almost stepped on the crushed carcass of a bobcat with an extra clawed foot growing from its side, saw another thing that might have once been a bobcat lying nearby, but it was too mangled to tell for sure. Mule's flanks and legs were crisscrossed with gashes, and in a circle around Swan were three more animal carcasses, all crushed. Swan! Josh shouted as he reached her and dropped to his knees at her side. She didn't stir, and he took her frail body into his arms. Wake up, honey, he said, shaking her. Come on now, wake up! The air was bitterly cold, but Josh could feel the warmth that radiated from Mule. He shook her harder. Swan! Wake up! Oh, my Lord Jesus! Glory whispered, standing just behind Josh. Her hands! Josh saw them, too, and he winced. They were swollen, covered with dried black blood and dirt. The raw fingers contorted into claws. In the palm of her right hand was a leather pouch, and in her left palm was a single withered kernel of corn, mired in the dirt and blood. Oh, God! Swan! Is she dead, Mama? Aaron asked, but Glory didn't answer. Aaron took a step forward. She ain't dead, mister. Pinch her and wake her up. Josh touched her wrist. There was a weak pulse, but it wasn't much. A tear fell from the corner of his eye onto her face. Swan drew a sharp breath and slowly released it in a moan. Her body trembled as she began to come up from a place that was very dark and cold. Swan? Can you hear me? A voice, muffled and far away, was speaking to her. She thought she recognized it. Her hands were hurting. Oh, they were hurting so much. Josh? The voice had been barely a whisper, but Josh's heart leapt. Yes, honey, it's Josh. You just be still now. We're going to get you to where it's warm. He stood up with the girl in his arms and turned to the clawed-up, exhausted horse. I'm going to find you a warm place, too. Come on, mule. The horse struggled to his feet and began to follow. Aaron saw Swan's dowsing rod lying in the snow and retrieved it. He prodded curiously at a dead bobcat, with a second neck and head growing out of its belly. Then he ran on after Josh and his mama. Up ahead, Swan tried to open her eye. The lid was sealed shut. A viscous fluid leaked from the corner, and her eye burned so fiercely she had to bite her lip to keep from crying out. The other eye, long sealed, throbbed in its socket. She lifted a hand to touch her face, but her fingers wouldn't work. Josh heard her whisper something. We're almost there, honey. Just a few minutes more. You hang on now. He knew she'd been very close to death out there in the open, and might still be. She spoke again, and this time he understood her, but he said, What? My eye, Swan said. She was trying to speak calmly, but her voice shook. Josh, I've gone blind. Chapter 60 Lying on her bed of leaves, Sister sensed movement beside her. She came up from sleep and clamped her hand like a manacle on somebody's wrist. 
Robin Oakes was kneeling, his long brown hair full of feathers and bones, and his eyes full of light. The colors of the glass circle pulsated on his sharp-boned face. He'd opened the satchel and was trying to slip the ring out of it. They stared at each other for a few seconds, and Sister said, No. She put her other hand on the ring, and he let her have it. Don't get bent out of shape, he said tersely. I didn't hurt it. Thank God. Who said you could go rummaging around in my bag? I wasn't rummaging. I was looking. No big deal. Sister's bones creaked as she sat up. Murky daylight was showing through the cave's entrance. Most of the young highwaymen were still asleep, but two of the boys were skinning a couple of small carcasses. Rabbits? Squirrels? And another was arranging sticks to build the breakfast fire. At the rear of the cave, Hugh was sleeping near his patient, and Paul was asleep on a pallet of leaves. This is important to me, she told Robin. You don't know how important. Just leave it alone, okay? Screw it, he said, and he stood up. I was putting that weird thing back, and I was going to tell you about Swan and the big dude. But forget it, deadhead. He started to walk over to check on Bucky. It took a few seconds for what the boy had said to register. Swan. Swan and the big dude. She hadn't told any of them about her dreamwalking, hadn't said anything about the word swan and the handprints burned into the trunk of a blossoming tree. How then could Robin Oakes know, unless he had gone dreamwalking too? Wait! she cried out. Her voice echoed like a bell within the cavern. Both Paul and Hugh were jolted from their sleep. Most of the boys awakened at once, already reaching for their guns and spears. Robin stopped in mid-stride. She started to speak, couldn't find the words. She stood up and approached him, holding the glass circle up. What did you see in this? Robin glanced over at the other boys, then back to sister, and shrugged. You did see something, didn't you? Her heart was pounding. The colors of the ring pulsated faster as well. You did. You went dreamwalking, didn't you? Dream what? Swan. "'Sister said. "'You saw that word written on the tree, didn't you? "'The tree that was covered with blossoms. "'And you saw the handprints burned into the wood.' "'She held the glass in front of his face. "'You did, didn't you? "'Uh-uh,' he shook his head. "'Not any of that stuff.' "'She froze because she could see that he was telling the truth. "'Please,' she said, "'tell me what you saw.' "'I—' "'Slipped it out of your bag about an hour ago when I woke up,' he said in a quiet, respectful voice. "'I just wanted to hold it, just wanted to look at it. I've never seen anything like it before, and after what happened with Bucky, I knew it was special.' He trailed off, was silent for a few seconds, as if mesmerized again. "'I don't know what that thing is, but it makes you want to hold it.' and look down inside it, where all those lights and colors shine. I took it out of your bag, and I went over and sat down. He motioned toward his own bed of leaves on the far side of the cave. I wasn't going to keep it very long, but the colors started changing. They started making a picture. I don't know. I guess it sounds kind of crazy, right? Go on. Both Paul and Hugh were listening, and the others were paying close attention as well. I just held it and kept watching the picture form, kind of like one of those mosaics they used to have on the walls of the orphanage chapel. If you looked at them long enough, you could almost swear they came alive and started moving. That's what this was like. Only it suddenly wasn't just a picture anymore. It was real. And I was standing on a field covered with snow— the wind was blowing, and everything was kind of hazy. But damn, it was cold out there. I saw something lying on the ground. At first I thought it was a bundle of rags, but then I realized it was a person. And right next to it was a horse, lying down in the snow, too. He looked sheepishly over at the listening boys, then returned his gaze to sister. Weird, huh? What else did you see? The big dude came running across the field. He was wearing a black mask, and he passed about six or seven feet right in front of me. 
scared the hell out of me, and I wanted to jump back, but then he'd gone on. I swear I could even see his footprints in the snow, and I heard him yell, Swan! I heard that as sure as I hear my own voice right now. He sounded scared. Then he knelt down beside that person, and it looked like he was trying to wake her up. Her? What do you mean, her? A girl. I think he was calling her name, Swan. A girl, sister thought. A girl named Swan. That's who the glass ring was leading them to. Sister's mind was reeling. She felt faint, had to close her eyes for a moment to keep her balance. When she opened them again, the colors of the glass circle were pulsating wildly. Paul had stood up. Though he'd ceased to believe in the power of the ring before Hugh had saved the young boy, he was now almost trembling with excitement. It didn't matter any more that he couldn't see anything in a glass. Maybe that was because he was blind and would not look deeply enough. Maybe it was because he had refused to believe in anything much beyond himself, or his mind was locked to a bitter wavelength. But if this boy had seen a vision in the glass, if he'd experienced the sensation of dream-walking that Sister talked about, then might they be searching for someone who really was out there somewhere? What else? he asked Robin. Could you see anything else? When I was going to jump back from that big dude in the black mask, I saw something on the ground almost in front of me, some kind of animal, all crushed and bloody. I don't know what it was, but somebody had done a number on it. The man in the mask, sister said anxiously. Did you see where he came from? No. Like I say, it was kind of hazy. Smoky, I guess. I could smell a lot of smoke in the air, and there was another smell, a sick kind of smell. I think there might have been a couple of other people there, too, but I'm not sure. The picture started fading and drifting apart. I didn't like that sick smell, and I wanted to be back here again. Then I was sitting over there with that thing in my hands, and that was all. Swan, sister whispered. She looked at Paul. His eyes were wide and amazed. We're looking for a girl named Swan. But where do we look? My God, a field could be anywhere. One mile away or a hundred miles. Did you see anything else? Sister asked the boy. Any landmarks? A barn? A house? Anything? Just a field. Covered with snow in some places. And in others the snow had blown away. Like I said, it was so real I could feel the cold. It was so real it was spooky. And I guess that's why I let you catch me putting that thing back in your bag. I guess I wanted to tell somebody about it. How are we supposed to find a field without landmarks? Paul asked. There's no way. Uh, excuse me. They looked over at Hugh, who was getting up with the aid of his crutch. I'm really in the dark about all this he said, once he'd gotten himself steadied. But I know that what you believe you see in that glass you take to be a place that truly exists. I imagine I'm the last person in the world to understand such things. But it seems to me that if you're looking for that particular place, you might start with Mary's rest. Why there? Paul asked him. Because back in Moberly I had the opportunity to meet travelers he replied, just as I met you and sister. I assume travelers might show some pity for a one-legged beggar. Unfortunately, I was usually incorrect, but I remember one man who'd come through Mary's Rest. He was the one who told me the pond there had gone dry, and I remember he said the air in Mary's Rest smelled unclean. He turned his attention to Robin. You said you smelled a sick odor, and you also smelled smoke. Is that right? Yeah, there was smoke in the air. Hugh nodded. Smoke, chimneys, fires for people trying to keep warm. I think the field you're searching for, if there is such a place, may be near Mary's Rest. How far is Mary's Rest from here? Sister asked Robin. Seven or eight miles, I guess. Maybe more. I've never been there, but we've sure robbed a lot of people who were going in and out. 
That was a while back, though. Not so many travel this way any more. There's not enough gas in the jeep to make that distance, Paul reminded Sister. I doubt if we'd make a mile. I don't mean seven or eight miles by road, Robin corrected. I mean that far overland. It's southwest of here, through the woods, and the going's rough. Six of my men scouted a trail over there about a year ago. Two of them made it back, and they said there wasn't anything worth stealing in Mary's Rest. They'd probably rob us if they could. If we can't drive, we'll have to walk. Sister picked up her satchel and slipped the glass ring into it. Her hands were shaking. Robin grunted. Sister, he said, I don't mean any disrespect, but you're crazy. Seven miles on foot wouldn't be what I'd call a real fun thing to do. You know, we probably saved your lives stopping your jeep like we did. You'd be frozen to death by now if we hadn't. We have to get to Mary's rest. Or at least I do. Paul and Hugh can decide for themselves. I've come a hell of a lot further than seven miles to get here, and a little cold's not going to stop me now. It's not just the distance or the cold. It's what's out there in the deep woods. What? Hugh asked uneasily, hobbling forward on his crutch. Oh, some real interesting wildlife. Things that looked like they were hatched in some mad doctor's zoo. Hungry things. You don't want one of those things to catch you out in the woods at night. I should say not, Hugh agreed. I have to get to Mary's rest, Sister said firmly, and her set expression told Robin her mind was made up. All I need is some food, warm clothes, and my shotgun. I'll make out okay. Sister, you won't make a mile before you get lost or eaten. She looked at Paul Thorson. Paul, she asked. Are you still with me? He hesitated, glanced toward the gloomy light at the cave's entrance, and then at the fire the boys were starting by rubbing two sticks together. Damn, he thought. I never could do that when I was a Cub Scout. It might not be too late to learn, though. Still, they'd come so far, and they might be so close to finding the answer they sought. He watched the fire spark and catch, but he'd already decided. I'm with you. Hugh? she prompted. I want to go with you, he said. I really do, but I have a patient. He glanced at the sleeping boy. I want to know what and who you find when you get to Mary's rest, but I think I'm needed here, sister. It's been a long time since I felt useful. Do you understand? Yes. She'd already decided to talk Hugh out of going anyway. There was no way he could make the distance on one leg, and he'd only slow them down. I do understand. She looked at Robin. We'll want to be leaving as soon as we can get our gear together. I'll be needing my shotgun and the shells, if that's all right with you. You'll need more than that to make it. Then I'm sure you'll want to return Paul's gun and bullets to him, too. And we can use whatever food and clothes you can spare. Robin laughed, but his eyes remained hard. We're supposed to be the robbers, sister. Just give us back what you stole from us, then. We'll call it even. Anybody ever tell you you were crazy? he asked. Yes, tougher punks than you. A faint smile spread slowly across his face, and his eyes softened. Okay, he said. You'll get your stuff back. I guess you'll need it more than us. He paused thoughtfully, then said, Hold on and he went over to his bed of leaves. He bent down and started going through a cardboard box full of tin cans, knives, watches, shoelaces, and other items. He found what he was looking for and returned to Sister. Here, he said, placing something in her hand. You'll need this, too. It was a small metal compass that looked like it might have come from a crackerjack box. It works, too, he told her. At least it worked when I took it off a dead man a couple of weeks ago. Thanks. I hope it's luckier for me than it was for him. Yeah. Well, you can have this, too, if you want it. Robin unbuttoned the brown coat from around his throat. Against his pallid skin he was wearing a tarnished little crucifix on a silver chain. He started to take it off, but Sister touched his hand to restrain him. That's all right. And she pulled her woolen muffler away from her neck to show him the crucifix-shaped scar— that had been burned there in the 42nd Street Theater long before. I've got my own. Yeah, Robin nodded. 
I guess you do. Their coats, sweaters, and gloves were returned to Paul and Sister, along with their guns, bullets for Paul's magnum, and shells for Sister's shotgun. A can of baked beans and some dried squirrel meat, wrapped up in leaves, found their way into a duffel bag that was returned to Sister, along with an all-purpose knife and a bright orange woolen cap. Robin gave both of them wristwatches, and a search of another cardboard box of booty yielded three kitchen matches. Paul siphoned the last of the gasoline from the jeep's tank into a small plastic milk jug, and it barely wet the bottom, but the jug was securely sealed with tape and put down into the duffel bag to be used to strengthen a fire. It was as light as it was going to get outside. The sky was dingy, and there was no way to tell where the sun was. Sister's watch said 10.22. Paul said 3.13. It was time to go. Ready? Sister asked Paul. He looked longingly at the fire for a moment, and then said, Yeah. Good luck! Hugh called, hobbling to the mouth of the cave as they started out. Sister lifted a gloved hand, then pulled her collar up around the muffler at her throat. She checked the compass, and Paul followed her toward the woods. Chapter 61 There it is! Glory pointed to the hulk of a gray-boarded barn half-hidden within a grove of trees. Two other structures had collapsed, and from one of them protruded a crumbling red-brick chimney. Aaron found this place a while back, she said, as Josh walked with her toward the barn and mule tagged along. Nobody lives out here, though. She motioned toward a well-worn trail that went past the decayed structures and deeper into the forest. The pit's not too far. The pit, as Josh understood it, was the community's burial ground, a trench into which hundreds of bodies had been lowered over the years. Jackson used to say a few words over the dead. Glory said. Now that he's gone, they just toss him in and forget him. She glanced at him. Swan came mighty close to joining him last night. What did she think she was doing out there? I don't know. Swan had lapsed into unconsciousness when they'd gotten her to the shack. Josh and Glory had cleaned her hands and bandaged them with strips of cloth, and they could feel the fever radiating from her. They'd left Aaron and Rusty to watch over her, while Josh fulfilled his promise to find shelter for Mule, but he was half crazy with worry. Without medicine, proper food, or even decent drinking water, what hope did she have? Her body was so broken down with exhaustion that the fever might kill her. He remembered her last words to him before she had faded away. Josh, I've gone blind. His hands gripped into fists at his sides. Protect the child, he thought. Sure. You've done a real fine job of that, haven't you? He didn't know why she'd slipped out of the shack last night, but it was obvious she'd been digging in the hard earth. Thank God Mule had had the sense to know she was in trouble, or today they'd be taking Swan's body to the— No. He refused to think about that. She'd get better. He knew she would. They passed the rusted remains of a car, minus doors, wheels, engine, and hood, and Glory pulled the barn's door open. It was dark and chilly inside, but at least the wind was blunted. Soon Josh's vision grew accustomed to the gloom. There were two stalls with a little straw on the floor and a trough in which Josh could melt some snow for Mule to drink. On the walls hung ropes and harness gear, but there were no windows an animal might crawl through. It seemed a safe enough place to leave him, and at least he'd be sheltered. Josh saw what looked like a pile of junk on the other side of the barn and walked over to examine it. He found some broken-up chairs, a lamp without bulb or wiring, a small lawnmower, and a coil of barbed wire. A mouse-eaten blue blanket covered more junk, and Josh lifted it away to see what was underneath. Glory, he said softly, come take a look. She walked over beside him, and he ran his fingers across the cracked glass screen of a television set. I haven't seen one of these in a while, he said wistfully. I guess the ratings are pretty low these days, huh? He punched the on-off button and started to turn through the channels, but the knob came off in his hand. Not worth a damn, Glory said, just like everything else. The TV was supported on some sort of desk with rollers on it, and Josh picked up the set, 
turned it around and pulled the pressboard off to reveal the tube and the jungle of wires within. He felt about as dumb as a caveman, peering into a magic box that had once been a commonplace luxury. No, necessity, for millions of American homes. Without power it was as useless as a stone. Probably less so, really, because a stone could be used to kill rodents for the stew pot. He set the TV aside, along with the other junk. It was going to take a smarter man than he to make juice run through wires and boxes show pictures that moved and spoke again, he mused. He bent down to the floor and found a box full of what looked like old wooden candlesticks. Another box held dusty bottles. He saw some pieces of paper scattered on the floor and picked up one. It was an announcement, and the faded red letters said, Antique Auction, Jefferson City Flea Market, Saturday, June 5th. Come early, stay late. He opened his hand and let the announcement drift back to the floor and settle with a noise like a sigh amid the other pieces of yesterday's news. Josh, what's this thing? Glory was touching the desk with the rollers on it. Her hand found a small crank, and as she turned it, there was the rattling noise of a chain moving over rusted gears. The rollers turned as achingly as old men revolving in their sleep. A number of rubber-cushioned pads were activated by the hand crank, coming down to press briefly against the rollers and then return to their original positions. Josh saw a small metal tray affixed to the other end of the desk. He picked up a few of the flea market announcements and put them in the tray. "'Keep turning the crank,' he said, and they watched as the rollers and pads grasped one piece of paper at a time, fed them through a slot into the depths of the machine, and delivered them to another tray at the opposite end. Josh found a sliding panel, pushed it back, and looked into an arrangement of more rollers, trays of metal type, and a dried-up series of spongy surfaces that Josh realized must have once been ink pads. "'We've got us a printing press,' he said. "'How about that? Must be an old knocker, but it's in pretty good shape.' He touched the close-grained oak of the press's cabinet, this was somebody's labor of love. Sure is a shame to let it sit out here and rot. Might as well rot here as anywhere else, she grunted. That's the damnedest thing. What is? Before Jackson died, he wanted to start up a newspaper, just a little handout sheet. He said having some kind of town newspaper would make everybody feel like more of a community. You know, people would take more of an interest in everybody else— instead of shutting themselves away. He didn't even know this thing was out here. Of course, that was just a dream. She ran her hand across the oak next to Josh's. He had a lot of dreams that died. Her hand touched his and quickly pulled away. There was a moment of uncomfortable silence. Josh could still feel the heat of her hand against his own. He must have been a fine man, he offered. He was. He had a good heart and a strong back, and he didn't mind getting his hands dirty. Before I met Jackson, I had a pretty rough life. I was full up with bad men and hard drinking. Been on my own since I was thirteen. She smiled slightly. A girl grows up fast. Well, I guess Jackson wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty on me, cause I'd sure be dead if he hadn't turned me around. What about you? You have a wife? Yes. An ex-wife, I mean. And two sons. Glory turned the hand crank and watched the rollers work. What happened to them? They were in South Alabama, when the bombs hit, I mean. He drew a deep breath, slowly released it. Down in Mobile. There's a naval station in Mobile. Nuclear submarines, all kinds of ships. Was a naval station there, at least. He watched Mule chomping at the straw on the floor. Maybe they're still alive. Maybe not. I... I guess it's bad for me to think this, but... I kind of hope they died on the 17th of July. I hope they died watching television or eating ice cream or lying in the sun at the beach. His gaze found glories. I just hope they died fast. Is that a bad thing to wish for? No. It's a decent wish, Glory told him, and this time her hand touched his and did not retreat. 
Her other hand wandered up and gently brushed the black ski mask. What do you look like under that thing? I used to be ugly. Now I'm downright loathsome. She touched the hard gray skin that sealed the right eye hole. Does that stuff hurt? Sometimes it burns. Sometimes it itches so much I can hardly stand it. And sometimes... He trailed off. Sometimes what? He hesitated, about to tell her what he had never told either Swan or Rusty. Sometimes, he said quietly, it feels like my face is changing. It feels like the bones are moving, and it hurts like hell. Maybe it's healing. He managed a weak smile. Just what I need, a ray of optimism. Thank you, but I think I'm way beyond healing. These growths are about as hard as concrete. Swan's got the worst I've ever seen. She sounds like she can hardly draw a breath. Now, with that high fever she is running. She stopped because Josh was walking toward the door. You and she have been through a lot together, haven't you? She asked. Josh stopped. Yes. If she dies, I don't know what I'll... He caught himself, lowered his head, and then lifted it again. Swan won't die, he resolved. She won't. Come on, we'd better get back. Josh, wait, okay? What is it? She worked the printing press's hand crank, rubbing her fingers against the smooth oak. You're right about this thing. It's a shame for it to sit out here and rot. Like you said, here's as good a place as any. My shack would be a better place. Your shack? What do you want that thing for? It's useless. Now, yes. But maybe not always. Jackson was right. It'd do wonders for Mary's rest to have some kind of newspaper. Oh, not the kind people used to get thrown in their yards every afternoon. But maybe just a sheet of paper to tell folks who's being born, who's dying, who's got clothes to spare, and who needs clothes. Right now, people who live across the alley from each other are strangers. But a sheet of paper like that might bring the whole town together. I think most people in Mary's Rest are more interested in finding another day's worth of food, don't you? Yes, for now. But Jackson was a smart man, Josh. If he'd known this thing was sitting here in a junk pile, he'd have toted it home on his back. I'm not saying I know how to ride or anything. Hell, I have a hard enough time speaking right. But this thing might be a first step toward making Mary's Rest a real town again. What are you going to use for paper? Josh asked. And how about ink? Here's paper. Glory picked up a handful of auction announcements. And I've made dye from dirt and shoe polish before. I can figure out how to make ink. Josh was about to protest again, but he realized a change had come over Glory. Her eyes were excited and their sparkle made her look five years younger. She has a challenge, she thought. She's going to try to make Jackson's dream come true. Help me, Glory urged. Please. Her mind was set. All right, Josh answered. You take the other end. This thing's going to be heavy. Two flies lifted off from the top of the printing press and darted around Josh's head. A third sat motionlessly on the television set, and a fourth buzzed slowly just below the barn's roof. The press was lighter than it looked, and getting it out of the barn was relatively easy. They set it down outside, and Josh went back in to tend to mule. The horse nickered nervously, walking around and around the stall. Josh rubbed his muzzle to calm him the way he'd seen Swan do so many times. He filled the trough with snow and put the blue blanket over mule to keep him warm. A fly landed on Josh's hand, its touch stinging him as if the thing had been a wasp. Damn, Josh said, and he slapped his other hand down on it. A twitching green-gray mess remained, but it still stung, and he wiped it off on his trousers. You'll be okay out here, Josh told the jittery horse as he rubbed its neck. I'll check on you later, how about that? As he closed the barn door and latched it, he hoped he was doing the right thing, leaving Mule out there alone. But at least this place, such as it was, would protect Mule from the cold and the bobcats, 
Mule would have to hold his own against the flies. Together, Glory and Josh lugged the press down the road. Chapter 62 Under a darkening sky, two figures struggled through a forest of dead pines where the wind had sculpted snowdrifts into barriers five feet high. Sister kept close watch on the crackerjack compass and pointed her nose toward the southwest. Paul followed at a few paces, carrying the duffel bag slung over his shoulder and watching their rear and flanks for the furtive movements of animals. He knew they were being tracked, and had been tracked since they'd left the cave. He'd seen only quick glimpses of them, hadn't had time to tell what they were or how many. But he could smell the spoor of beasts. He kept the three fifty seven gripped in his gloved right hand, with his thumb on the safety. Sister figured they had less than an hour of light left. They'd been traveling for almost five hours, according to the wristwatch Robin had given her. She didn't know how many miles they'd covered, but the going was excruciating, and her legs felt like stiff lengths of timber. The effort of struggling across rocks and over snowdrifts had made her sweat and now the sound of the ice in her clothes brought up the memory of Rice Krispies' cereal, snap, crackle, and pop. She remembered that her daughter used to like Rice Krispies. Make it talk, Mama. She forced the ghosts of the past away. They had seen no sign of life but the things that prowled around them, watching them hungrily in the deepening twilight. When darkness fell, the beasts would get bolder. One step, she told herself, one step and then the next gets you where you're going. She said it mentally over and over again, while her legs continued to carry her like the laboring movement of a machine. She held her satchel close, and her left arm had cramped and locked in that position, but she could feel the outline of the glass ring through the leather, and she drew strength from it as surely as if it was her second heart. Swan, she thought, who are you? Where do you come from, and why have I been led to you? If indeed it was a girl named Swan that the dream-walk path had brought her to, Sister had no idea what she'd say to the girl. Hello, she practiced. You don't know me, but I've come halfway across this country to find you. And I sure hope you're worth it, because, Lord, I want to lie down and rest. But what if there was no girl named Swan and Mary's rest? What if Robin had been wrong? What if the girl was only passing through Mary's rest, and might be gone by the time they arrived? She wanted to pick up the pace, but her legs wouldn't allow it. One step, one step, and then the next gets you where you're going. A scream from the woods to her left almost shocked her out of her boots. She whirled to face the noise, heard the scream become the shrill wail of a beast, and then a muttering, chuckling noise like a hyena might make. She thought she saw a pair of greedy eyes in the gloom, they gleamed balefully before receding into the forest. "'We haven't got much more light,' Paul told her. "'We should find a place to camp.' She gazed toward the southwest. Nothing but a tortured landscape of dead pines, rocks, and snowdrifts. It looked like a cold day in hell. Wherever Mary's rest was, they were not going to reach it today. She nodded, and they started searching for shelter. The best they could find was a narrow niche and a hollow surrounded by rough-edged boulders. They pushed the snow away to expose the earth and form a three-foot-high snow wall circling them. Then Paul and Sister went to work gathering dead branches to start a fire. Around them shrill cries echoed from the woods as beasts began to gather like lords at a feast table. They made a small pile of branches and ringed them with stones and Paul dribbled a little gasoline on the wood. The first match he scraped across a stone flared, fizzled, and went out. That left them with two. Darkness was falling fast. "'Here goes,' Paul said tersely. He scraped the second match across the rock he was kneeling over, his other hand ready to cup the flame. It flared, hissed, and immediately began to die. He quickly held the weakening flame against a stick in the pile of branches, kneeling over it like a savage praying at the altar of a fire spirit. "'Catch you, little bastard,' he whispered between clenched teeth. "'Come on, catch!' The flame was all but gone, just a tiny glint dancing in the dark. And then there was a pop, as a few drops of the gasoline caught, 
and flame curled up around the stick like a cat's tongue. The fire sputtered, crackled, and began to grow. Paul added more gas. A gout of flame leapt up, fire jumping from stick to stick. Within another minute they had heat and light, and they held their stiff hands toward the warmth. "'We'll get there in the morning,' Paul said, as they shared the dried squirrel meat. The stuff tasted like boiled leather. I'll bet we've only got about another mile. Maybe. She pried the lid off the can of baked beans with the all-purpose knife and scooped some out with her fingers. They were oily and had a metallic taste, but seemed okay. She gave the can to Paul. I just hope this kitty compass works. If it doesn't, we could be walking in circles. He'd already considered that possibility. But now he shrugged his shoulders and scooped the beans into his mouth. If that compass was one hair off, he realized, they could have already missed Mary's rest. We haven't gone seven miles yet, he told her, though he wasn't even sure of that. We'll know tomorrow. Right, tomorrow. She took first watch while Paul slept next to the fire, and she kept her back against a boulder with the magnum on one side of her and the shotgun on the other. Under its hard carapace of Job's mask, Sister's face rippled with pain. Her cheekbones and jaw were throbbing. The searing pain usually passed within a few minutes, but this time it intensified to a point where Sister had to lower her head and stifle a moan. Again, for the seventh or eighth time in the last few weeks, she felt sharp, cracking jolts that seemed to run deep beneath the Job's mask, down through the bones of her face. All she could do was clench her teeth and endure the pain until it passed, and when it was finally gone it left her shivering in spite of the fire. That was a bad one, she thought. The pains were getting worse. She lifted her head and ran her fingers across the Job's mask. The knotty surface was as cool as ice on the slopes of a dormant volcano, but beneath it the flesh felt hot and raw. Her scalp was itching maddeningly and she put her hand under the hood of her parka to touch the mass of growths that encased her skull and trailed down the back of her neck. She longed to dig her fingers through the crust and scratch her flesh until it bled. Slap a wig on my bald head, she thought, and I'd still look like a graduate of gargoyle school. She balanced precariously between tears and laughter for a few seconds, but the laughter won out. Paul sat up. Is it my watch yet? No. Couple of hours to go. He nodded, lay back down, and was asleep again almost at once. She continued to probe the Job's mask. Feels like my skin's on fire underneath there. Whatever skin I've got left, she thought. Sometimes, when the pain was acute and her flesh beneath the Job's mask felt like it was boiling, she could almost swear that the bones shifted like the foundations of an unsteady house. She could almost swear that she felt her face changing. A glimpse of movement on the right brought her attention back to the business of survival. Something made a deep guttural barking noise off in the distance, and another beast replied with a sound like that of a baby crying. She laid the shotgun across her lap and looked up at the sky. Nothing but darkness up there, and a sensation of low, hanging clouds like the black ceiling of a claustrophobic's nightmare. She couldn't remember when she'd last seen the stars. Maybe it had been on a warm summer's night when she was living in a cardboard box in Central Park. Or maybe she'd stopped noticing the stars a long time before the clouds had blanked them out. She missed the stars. Without them, the sky was dead. Without them, what was there to make a wish on? Sister held her hands toward the fire and shifted against the boulder to get more comfortable. A hotel suite this was not. But her legs weren't aching so much now. She realized how tired she was, and she doubted she could have continued another fifty yards. But the fire felt good, and she had a shotgun across her lap, and she would blast hell out of anything that came within range. She put her hand on the satchel and traced the glass ring's outline. Tomorrow, she thought, tomorrow we'll know. She leaned her head against the rock and watched Paul sleeping. Good for you, she thought. You deserve it. The fire's soft heat soothed her, the forest was silent, and Sister's eyes closed. Just for a minute, she told herself. It won't do any harm if I just rest for a... 
She sat bolt upright. Before her the fire was down to a few red embers, and the cold was slipping through her clothes. Paul was huddled up, still sleeping. Oh, Jesus, she thought, as panic snapped at her, how long was I out? She was shivering, her joints throbbing with the cold, and she got up to add more branches to the fire. There were only a few small ones left, and as she knelt down and arranged them in the embers, she sensed a quick cat-like movement behind her. The flesh tightened across the back of her neck, and she knew with sickening certainty that she and Paul were no longer alone. Something was behind her, crouched on a boulder, and she'd left both weapons where she was sitting. She took a deep breath, made up her mind to move, turned and lunged for the shotgun. She picked it up and spun around to fire. The figure sitting cross-legged atop the boulder lifted his gloved hands in mock surrender. A rifle lay across his knees, and he was wearing a familiar patched brown coat with a cowl protecting his head. "'Hope you enjoyed your nap,' Robin Oakes said. "'What's it?' Paul sat up, blinking. "'Huh?' "'Young man,' Sister said hoarsely, "'I was about one second from sending you to a much warmer place than this. How long have you been sitting there?' "'Long enough so that you ought to be glad I don't have four legs. If one person goes to sleep, the other has to keep watch or you're both dead,' he looked at Paul. And by the time you woke up, you'd be bobcat meat. I thought you two knew what you were doing. We're okay. Sister took her finger off the trigger and put the weapon aside. Her insides felt like quivering jelly. Sure. He glanced over his shoulder and called toward the forest. Come on in. Three bundled-up figures emerged from the woods and scrambled up onto the boulder with Robin. All of the boys carried rifles, and one of them lugged another of the canvas bags that Robin's highwayman had stolen from Sister. "'You two didn't make such a good distance, did you?' Robin asked her. "'I thought we did damned fine.' Paul was shaking the last of the sleep out of his head. "'I figure we've got about another mile in the morning.' Robin grunted disdainfully. "'More like three, most likely. Anyway, I sat down and started thinking back at the cave.' I knew you'd make camp somewhere, probably screw that up, too. He appraised the boulders and the wall of snow. You've got yourselves trapped in here. When that fire went down, the things in the woods would have jumped you from all sides. We saw a lot of them, but we stayed downwind and low to the ground, and they didn't see us. Thanks for the warning, Sister said. Oh, we didn't come out here to warn you. We followed you to keep you from getting killed. Robin climbed down the boulder, and the other boys did the same. They stood around the fire, warming their hands and faces. It wasn't hard. You left a trail that looked like a plow had gone through. Anyway, you forgot something. He opened the other duffel bag, reached into it, and brought out the second jug of moonshine that Hugh had given Paul. Here. He tossed it to Sister. I think there's enough left for everybody to have a swig. There was— and the moonshine's fire heated Sister's belly. Robin sent the three boys out to stand guard around the camp. The trick is to make a lot of noise, Robin said after they'd gone. They don't want to shoot anything, because the blood would drive the other animals crazy out there. He sat down beside the fire, pulled his hood back, and took his gloves off. If you want to sleep, Sister, you'd better do it now. We'll have to relieve them on watch before light. Who put you in charge? I did. The firelight threw shadows in the hollows of his face, glinted off the fine hairs of his beard. His long hair, still full of feathers and bones, made him look like a savage prince. I've decided to help you get to Mary's rest. Why? Paul asked. He was wary of the boy, didn't trust him worth a damn. What's in it for you? Maybe I want some fresh air. Maybe I want to travel. His gaze flicked toward Sister's satchel. Maybe I want to see if you find who you're looking for. Anyway, I pay my debts. You people helped me with one of mine, and I owe you. So I'll get you to Mary's rest in the morning, and we'll call it even, right? Okay, Sister agreed, and thank you. Besides, if you two get killed tomorrow, I want the glass ring. You won't be needing it. He leaned against the boulder and closed his eyes. You'd better sleep while you can. A rifle shot echoed from the woods, followed by two more. 
Sister and Paul looked at each other uneasily, but the young highwayman lay motionless and undisturbed. The noise of rifle fire continued intermittently for another minute or so, followed by the angry shrieks of what sounded like several animals, but their cries were fading as they retreated. Paul reached for the moonshine jug to coax out the last drops, and Sister leaned back to contemplate tomorrow. Chapter 63 Fire! Fire! The bombs were falling again the earth erupting into flames, humans burning like torches under a blood-red sky. Fire! Something's on fire! Josh shook loose from his nightmare. He could hear a man's voice shouting, Fire! out in the street. At once he was on his feet and striding to the door. He threw it open, looked out, and saw an orange glow reflected off the clouds. The street was empty, but Josh could hear the man's voice off in the distance, raising the alarm. Fire! Something's on fire! What is it? What's on fire? Glory's face was stricken as she peered out the door beside him. Aaron, who could not be separated from Crybaby, pushed between them to see. I don't know. What's over in that direction? Nothing, she said. Just the pit, and— She stopped suddenly, because both of them knew. The barn where Josh had left Mule was on fire. He pulled his boots on, put on his gloves and his heavy coat— Glory and Aaron raced to bundle up as well. Red embers burned in the stove's grate, and Rusty was sitting up from his bed of rags. His eyes were still dazed, and cloth bandages were plastered to the side of his face and the wound at his shoulder. Josh, he said, what's going on? The barn's on fire. I locked the door, Rusty. Mule can't get out. Rusty stood up, but his legs were weak, and he staggered against the wall. He felt like a deballed bull and he was furious at himself. He tried again, but still didn't have the strength to even get his damned boots on. No, Rusty, Josh said. He motioned toward Swan, who lay on the floor under the thin blanket that Aaron had given up. You stay with her. Rusty knew he'd collapse before he got ten paces from the shack. He almost wept with frustration. But he knew also that Swan needed to be watched over. He nodded and sank down wearily to his knees. Aaron darted on ahead, and Josh and Glory followed as fast as they could. Josh found some of the speed he had once shown on the football field at Auburn University in making the two hundred yards between the shack and the barn. Other people were out on the street, running toward the fire as well, not because they wanted to extinguish it, but because they could get warm. Josh's heart almost cracked. Over the roar of flames that covered all but the structure's roof, he could hear Mule's frantic cries. Glory screamed, "'Josh, no!' as he barreled at the barn door. Swan said something in a soft, delirious voice, but Rusty couldn't make it out. She tried to sit up, and he put his hand on her shoulder to restrain her. Touching her was like putting his hand to the stove's grate. "'Hold on,' he said. "'Easy now. Just take it easy.' She spoke again, but her speech was unintelligible. He thought she said something about corn, though that was all he could even halfway understand. Now the remaining eye-hole in the mask of growths was almost sealed over. She had been fading in and out of consciousness since Josh had brought her in at daylight from the field, and she had alternately shivered and thrashed free of the blanket. Glory had wound cloth bandages around Swan's raw hands and tried to feed her some watery soup, but there wasn't a thing any of them could do for her now except try to make her more comfortable. Swan was so far gone she didn't even know where she was. She's dying, Rusty thought, dying right in front of me. He eased her back down again, and he heard her say something that might have included mule. It's all right, Rusty told her, his own swollen jaw making speech difficult. You just rest now. Everything's going to be all right in the morning. He sure wished he could believe that. He'd come too far with Swan to watch her fade away like this, and he cursed his own weakness. He felt about as sturdy as a wet sponge, and his mama sure hadn't raised him to live on rat meat soup. The only way he could get that stuff down was to pretend it came off the bones of little bitty steers. A loose board popped out on the shack's porch beyond the closed door. Rusty looked up. He expected either Glory, Aaron, or Josh to enter. 
But how could that be? They'd just been gone a few minutes. The door did not open. Another board popped and whined. Josh! Rusty called. There was no reply. But he knew someone was standing out there. He was too familiar with the noise the loose boards made when stepped on, and he'd already sworn he was going to find a hammer and nails somewhere when he got his strength back and tightened those bastards down before they drove him batty. "'Anybody there?' he called. He realized somebody might be coming to steal the few items Glory possessed, her needles, her cloth, or even the furniture. Maybe the hand-cranked printing press that occupied a corner of the room. "'I've got a gun in here,' he lied, and he rose to his feet. There was no more sound of movement beyond the door. He walked to it on unsteady legs. The door was unlatched. He reached for the latch, and he sensed a terrible gnawing cold on the other side of the door. A dirty cold. He started to slip the latch home. "'Rusty!' he heard Swan rasp. The entire door suddenly crashed inward, tearing off its wooden hinges and catching him squarely on his bad shoulder. He cried out in pain as he was flung backward and to the floor halfway across the room. A figure stood in the doorway, and Rusty's first impulse was to leap to his feet to protect Swan. He got as far as his knees before the agony of his reopened shoulder wound made him pitch forward on his face. The man walked in, a pair of muddy hiking boots clumping on the floor. His gaze swept the room, saw the wounded man lying in spreading blood. The thinner figure curled up and shivering, obviously near death. And there it was, over in the corner. The printing press. That wasn't a good thing, he decided, when the flies had brought him back images and voices from all over Mary's rest. No, not good at all. First you had a printing press, and then you had a newspaper, and after that you had opinions and people thinking and wanting to do things, and then, and then, he thought, you are right back to the situation that had gotten the world where it was right now. Oh, no, not good at all. They had to be saved from making the same mistake twice, had to be saved from themselves. And that was why he'd decided to destroy the printing press before anything was printed on it. That thing was as dangerous as a bomb, and they didn't even realize it. And that horse was dangerous, too, he'd reasoned. A horse made people think about traveling and wheels and cars, and that led right up to air pollution and wrecks, didn't it? They'd thank him for setting the barn on fire, because they could eat cooked horse meat in just a little while. He was glad he'd come to Mary's rest, and just in time, too. He'd seen them come to town in their traveling show wagon, had heard that big one hollering for a doctor. Some people just had no respect for a quiet, peaceful town. Well, respect was going to be taught right now. His boots clumped toward Swan. Josh hit the flaming barn door with the full force of two hundred and fifty pounds, Glory's scream still ringing in his head. For a bone-jarring second, he thought he was back on the football field, and had run smack-dab into one of those huge linebackers. He thought the door wasn't going to give, but then wood split and the barn door caved in, carrying him into the midst of an inferno. He rolled away from burning timbers and got to his feet. Smoke churned before his face, and the awful heat almost crushed him. Mule! he shouted. He could hear the horse bucking and shrieking, but couldn't see him. Flames leapt at him like spears, and fire was starting to fall like orange confetti from the roof. He charged toward Mule's stall, his coat beginning to smolder, and the smoke took him. "'My, my,' the man said softly. He'd stopped just past the thin figure on the floor, his attention drawn to an object on the pine-wood table. He reached out with a slender hand and picked up a mirror with two carved faces on its handle, each looking in a different direction. He intended to admire the new face he'd created, but the glass was dark. A finger traced the carved faces. What kind of mirror had a black glass? he wondered, and his new mouth twitched just a fraction. This mirror gave him the same sensation as the ring of glass. It was a thing that should not be. What was its purpose, and what was it doing here? 
He didn't like it. Not at all. He lifted his arm and smashed the mirror to pieces against the table, and then he twisted the double-faced handle and flung it aside. Now he felt so much better. But there was another object on the table, too, a small leather pouch. He picked it up and shook its contents into his palm. A little kernel of corn, stained red with dried blood, fell out. "'What is this?' he whispered. A few feet away the figure on the floor quietly moaned. He gripped the kernel in his hand and slowly turned toward the sound, his eyes red and gleaming in the low firelight. His gaze lingered on the figure's bandaged, clawed hands. A swirl of heat shimmered around the man's right fist, and from within it there was a muffled pop. He opened his hand and pushed the bit of popcorn into his mouth, chewing thoughtfully on it. He'd seen this figure yesterday, after he'd watched their wagon being torn apart. Yesterday the hands had not been bandaged. Why were they bandaged now? Why? Across the room Rusty lifted his head and tried to focus. He saw a tall, slender man in a brown parka approaching Swan, saw him standing over her. Pain racked him, and he was lying in a puddle of blood. Got to pass out again, he knew. Got to move. Got to move. He began crawling through his blood. His good eye almost blinded by the smoke, Josh saw a swirl of motion ahead. It was Mule, panicked, rearing and bucking, unable to find a way out. The blanket on his back was smoking, about to burst into flames. He ran to the horse and was almost trampled under Mule's hooves as the horse frantically reared and came down again, twisting in one direction and then the other. Josh could only think of one thing to do. He lifted both hands in front of the horse's muzzle and clapped them together as hard as he could, like he'd seen Swan do at the Jaspin farm. Whether the noise brought Swan to mind, or just snapped his panic for a second, Mule stopped thrashing and stood steady, his eyes watering and wide with terror. Josh wasted no time. He grabbed Mule's mane and pulled him out of the stall, trying to lead him to the door. Mule's legs stiffened. "'Come on, you dumb fool!' Josh yelled the heat scorching his lungs. He planted his boots in burning straw, his joints cracking as he hauled Mule forward. Pieces of flaming wood fell from above, striking him on the shoulder and hitting Mule's flanks. Cinders spun before his face like hornets. And then Mule must have gotten a whiff of outside air, because he lunged so fast Josh only had time to throw his arms around the horse's neck. His boots were dragged across the floor as Mule plowed through the flames. They burst through the opening where the barn door had been, out into the cold night air, with sparks trailing from Josh's burning coat and the flames in Mule's mane and tail. The man in the brown parka stood looking at those bandaged hands. "'What have y'all been up to while my back's been turned?' he asked in a deep south drawl. The printing press was forgotten for the moment. A mirror that showed no reflection— a single kernel of corn, bandaged hands. Those things bothered him, just like the glass ring did, because he didn't understand them. And there was something else, too, something about the figure on the floor. What was it? This is a nothing, he thought, a less than zero, a piece of shit passing through the sewage pipe of Mary's rest. But why did he sense something different about this figure, something threatening? He lifted his right hand. Heat shimmered around the fingers. One of them burst into flame, and the flame spread. In another few seconds his hand was a glove of fire. The solution to things he did not understand was very simple. Destroy it. He began to reach down toward the growth-encrusted head. No! It was a weak whisper, but the hand that clamped around the man's ankle still had strength in it. The man in the brown parka looked at him incredulously and by the light of the flaming hand Rusty saw his face, heavily seamed and weather-beaten, a thick gray beard, eyes that were so blue they were almost white. Touching the man sent freezing waves through Rusty's bones, and he wanted more than anything on earth to draw his hand back, but the cold shocked his nerves and kept him from passing out. Rusty said, No, don't you touch Swan, you bastard. He saw the man smile faintly. It was a pitying smile, but then it passed the point of pity. The man reached down and clamped his burning hand to Rusty's throat, and Rusty's neck was encircled with a noose of fire. 
The man lifted him off the floor, as Rusty screamed and kicked, and the fire pumped out of that hand and arm like napalm, sizzling Rusty's hair and eyebrows. His clothes caught, and he realized at a cold center within his pain and panic that he was becoming a human torch, and that he had only seconds to live, and that after him it would be Swan's turn. Rusty's body jerked and fought, but he knew he was finished. The smell of himself of fire made him think of the greasy French fries at the Oklahoma State Fair when he was a kid. The flame was going bone deep now, and as his nerves began to sputter, the pain locked up, as if a point of no return had been passed. Mama said something, Rusty thought. Said, said. Mama said fight fire with fire. Rusty embraced the man with the burning sticks of his arms, entwining his fingers at the man's back. The fingers melded like chains, and Rusty thrust his flaming face into the man's beard. The beard caught fire. The face bubbled, melting and running like a plastic mask, exposing a deeper layer the color of modeling clay. Rusty and the man whirled around the room like participants in a bizarre ballet. "'Lord God!' shouted one of two men who were looking in, drawn by the open doorway on their jaunt to the burning barn. "'Lord God Almighty!' the second man screamed, backed up, and fell on his rump in the mud. Other people were running over to see what was happening, and the man in the burning rags of a brown parka could not thrust the flaming dead man away from him, and his new disguise was ruined, and they were about to see his true face. He gave a garbled roar that almost shook the cabin, and ran through the doorway out into the midst of them. He was still roaring as he ran up the street on melting legs, in the embrace of a charred cowboy. Glory helped Josh pull out of his burning coat. His ski mask was smoking, too, and before she could think twice about it, she reached up and yanked it off. Dark gray growths, some the size of Aaron's fists, almost completely covered Josh's face and head. Tendrils had interlocked around his mouth, and the only clear area, except for his lips, was a circle in the crust through which his left eye now bloodshot from the smoke, stared at Glory. His condition wasn't as bad as Swan's, but it still made Glory gasp and retreat a step. He had no time to apologize for not being a beauty. He ran for Mule, who was bucking wildly as other onlookers scattered, and grabbed up a handful of snow. He clutched Mule's neck and crushed out the flames in his mane. Then Glory had a handful of snow and was pressing it to the horse's tail, and Aaron had some, too, and many of the other men and women were scooping up snow and rubbing it against Mule's sides. A thin, dark-haired man with a blue keloid grabbed Mule's neck opposite Josh, and after a minute of struggle they got the horse calmed down enough to stop bucking. Thanks, Josh told the man, and then there was a roaring and a rush of heat, and the barn's roof fell in. Hey! A woman standing closer to the road called out. There's some kind of commotion back there. She pointed toward the shacks, and both Glory and Josh could see people out on the street. Shouts and cries for help drifted to them. Swan, Josh thought. Oh, God, I left Swan and Rusty alone. He started to run, but his legs betrayed him, and he went down. His lungs were grabbing for air, black motes spinning before his eyes. Someone took his arm, started helping him up. A second person supported his other shoulder, and together they got Josh to his feet. Josh realized Glory stood on one side of him, and on the other was an old man with a face like cracked leather. "'I'm all right,' he told them. But he had to lean heavily on Glory. She stood firm and started guiding him along the road. A blanket had been thrown on the ground about thirty feet from Glory's shack. Smoke curled from under it. A few people stood around it, motioning and talking, Others were crowded around Glory's front door. Josh smelled burned meat, and his stomach clenched. "'Stay here,' he told Aaron. The boy stopped. Crybaby gripped in his hand. Glory went with Josh into the shack. She put her hand over her mouth and nose. Hot currents still prowled back and forth between the walls, and the ceiling was scorched black. He stood over Swan, trembling like a child. She had pulled her knees up to her chest, and now she was motionless. He bent down beside her, took one wrist, and felt for her pulse. Her flesh was cold. But her pulse was there, faint but steady, like the rhythm of a metronome that would not be stilled. 
Swan tried to lift her head, but had no strength. Josh! It was barely audible. Yes, he answered, and he pulled her to him, cradling her head against his shoulder. A tear scorched his eye and ran down along the growths on his cheek. It's old Josh. I had a nightmare. I couldn't wake up. He was here, Josh. He, he found me. Who found you? Him, she said. The man with the scarlet eye from Leona's pack of cards. On the floor a few feet away were fragments of dark glass. The magic mirror, Josh knew. He saw Rusty's cowboy boots, and he wished to God that he didn't have to go outside and see what was smoking under that blanket in the mud. Swan, I've got to go out for a minute, he said. You just rest, all right. He eased her down and glanced quickly at Glory, who had seen the puddle of blood on the floor. Then Josh stood up and made himself go. We threw snow on him, one of the onlookers said as Josh approached. We couldn't get the fire out, though. He was too far gone. Josh knelt down and lifted the blanket, looked long and hard. The corpse was hissing as if whispering a secret. Both arms had snapped off at the shoulders. I seen it, another man offered excitedly. I looked in through that door and seen a two-headed demon a-running around and around in there. God Almighty, I ain't never seen such a sight. Then Perry and me started hollering, and that thing come a-running right at us. Looked like it was fighting itself. Then it split in two, and the other one run that way. He pointed up the street in the opposite direction. It was another man on fire, a third witness explained, in a calmer voice. He had a hooked nose and a dark beard, and he spoke with a northern accent. I tried to help him, but he turned up an alley. He was too fast for me. I don't know where the hell he went, but he couldn't have gotten too far. Yeah, the second man nodded vigorously. The skin was melting right off of him. Josh lowered the blanket and stood up. Show me where he went, he told the man with the northern accent. A trail of burned cloth turned into an alley, continued for about forty feet, turned left at another alley, and ended at a pile of ashy rags behind a shack. There was no corpse, and the footprints were lost in the ravaged ground. Maybe he crawled under one of these shacks to die, the other man said. There's no way a human being could live through that. He looked like a torch. They searched the area for another ten minutes, even squeezing under some of the shacks, but there was no sign of a body. I guess wherever he is, he died naked, the man said as they gave up the search and went back to the street. Josh looked at Rusty again. You dumb cowboy, Josh whispered. You sure pulled a magic trick this time, didn't you? He was here, Swan had said. He found me. Josh wrapped Rusty up in the blanket, lifted the remains in his arms, and got to his feet. Take him to the pit, one of the men said. That's where all the bodies go. Josh walked to what was left of the traveling show wagon and laid Rusty in it. Uh-uh, mister. A husky woman with a red keloid covering her face and scalp scolded him. That'll draw every wild animal for miles. Let them come, then, Josh replied. He turned toward the people, swept his gaze across them, and stopped at glory. I'm going to bury my friend at first light. Bury him? A frail teenage girl with close-cropped brown hair shook her head. Nobody buries anybody any more. I'm going to bury Rusty, Josh told Glory. At first light in that field where we found Swan. It'll be hard work. You and Aaron can help me if you like. If you don't want to, that's all right, too. But I'll be damned if I'll... His voice cracked. I'll be damned if I'll throw him into a pit. He sat up on the wagon's frame beside the body to wait for daylight. There was a long silence. Then the man with the northern accent said to Glory, Lady, do you have any way to fix your door? No. Well, I've got a few tools in my shack. They're not much. I haven't used them in a while, but if you like, I'll take a shot at fixing your door. Thank you. Glory was stunned by the offer. It had been a very long time since anyone had offered to do anything in Mary's rest. I'd appreciate whatever you could do. If you're going to stay out here in the cold, 
the woman with the red keloid told Josh. You'd better get yourself a fire lit. Better build one right here on the road. She snorted. Bury a body. That's the damnedest thing I ever heard of. I got a wheelbarrow, another man offered. I reckon I could run it up there and pluck some hot coals out of that fire. I mean, I got better things to do, but sure would be a shame to let all those good hot coals go to waste. I sure would like a fire, a short man with one eye missing piped up. It's cold as hell in my shack. Listen, I've got some coffee grounds I've been saving. If somebody's got a tin can and a hot stove, I guess we could brew it up. Might as well. All this excitement's got me as jumpy as a flea on a griddle. The woman with the red keloid brought a small gold watch from the pocket of her coat, held it with loving reverence, and squinted closely at the dial. Four twelve. First light won't show for five hours yet. Yep, if you're going to watch over that poor soul, you're going to need a fire and some hot coffee. I got a coffee pot at my mansion. Ain't been used in a while. She looked at Glory. We can use it now, if you like. Glory nodded. Yes, we can brew the coffee on my stove. I have a pickaxe and shovel, a gray-bearded man in a plaid coat and a tan woolen cap said to Josh. Part of the shovel blade's broken off, but it'll do to bury your friend. I used to be a woodcarver, someone else spoke up. If you're going to bury him, you'll need a marker. What was his name? Rusty. Josh's throat choked up. Rusty Weathers. Well, the feisty woman put her hands on her hips. We got things to do, seems like. Let's quit shirking and get to working. Almost three miles away, Robin Oak stood in the twilight at the campfire's edge where the three boys slept. He was armed with a rifle and had been carefully watching for the movement of animals too close to the fire. But now he stared toward the horizon, and he called out, Sister? Sister, come over here. It was a minute or so before she made her way to him from her sentry post on the other side of the fire. What is it? There. He pointed, and she followed the line of his finger to see a faint orange glow in the sky above the seemingly endless expanse of forest. I think that's Mary's rest. Nice of them to start a fire and show us the way, huh? It sure is. That's the direction we'll be headed when it gets light enough to see. If we keep a good pace, we ought to make it in a couple of hours. Good. I want to get there as fast as we can. I'll see to it. His sly smile promised a rough march. Sister started to return to her area of patrol, but she had a sudden thought and stopped at the edge of the firelight. She took the crackerjack compass from her pocket, lined herself up with the glow on the horizon, and checked the needle. It was far enough off southwest that they might have bypassed Mary's Rest by six or seven miles. Sister realized that they'd been very close to being lost if Robin hadn't seen that glow in the sky. Whatever it was, she was thankful for it. She continued her patrol, her eyes searching the darkness for any lurking beasts, but her mind was on a girl named Swan.